Hello and welcome to the Amagi. Today we have a treat for you. We're speedrunning the entire Naruto universe without filler. That's right, only the good stuff, the creme de la creme, the meat and potatoes of the Naruto storyline as fast as humanly possible. Let's see how quickly we can get through it. Prologue, Land of Waves. 12 years ago, there was once an evil monster known as the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox. One night it attacked the village of Konoha and killed many innocent people that night. None of the ninja of Konoha could stop it, so the village leader, the fourth Hokage, cast a jutsu on the Nine-Tails that sealed it into a newborn boy and caused the fourth Hokage's life. 12 years after the Nine-Tails' attack at the Ninja Academy, Naruto Uzumaki's reputation as a delinquent and a troublemaker had earned him much infamy among the teachers and students. Iruko Umino, and to a lesser extent, the third Hokage, were the only two positive influences on him. Despite this, Naruto continued to fail the graduation exam, which required students to demonstrate how much they had learned by performing the clone technique. While Naruto was decently skilled, most of the basic techniques taught at the academy, for some reason he had never been able to perform this one correctly, causing him to fail the final exam for graduation. Mizuki, another academy examiner, used Naruto's depression after his most recent failure to trick Naruto into stealing the scroll of seals, a collection of forbidden techniques housed within the Hokage's study that could be dangerous in the wrong hands, claiming that Naruto could be automatically passed by simply learning a technique from the scroll and performing it successfully. Not when to pass up such an opportunity, Naruto immediately did so, using his sexy technique to distract the third Hokage long enough to escape with the scroll. Once he had fled to the neighboring woods, Naruto began his efforts in learning a technique from the scroll, the first of which happened to be the multiple shadow clone technique, something he wasn't happy about given his former failures with the ordinary clone technique. As search parties were sent out to find Naruto and retrieve the scroll, Iruka got to him first and found him to have been training the entire time. Ignorant of what he had done, Naruto simply repeated to Iruka what Mizuki had told him earlier, causing Iruka to realize that Mizuki was just trying to use Naruto to help him steal the scroll and later steal for himself. Just as Iruka realized this, Mizuki showed up to attack them both. After he injured Iruka, who had pushed Naruto out of the way of an attack, Mizuki tried to get Naruto to give him the scroll while Iruka tried to convince Naruto to keep it. Their argument led to Mizuki to tell Naruto the truth everyone would be keeping from him, that he was the container of the nine-tailed demon fox. Start Naruto ran off, leaving Iruka and Mizuki to fight each other. Naruto watched from a distance, eventually learning what Mizuki was after, as well as the true level of Iruka's devotion to Naruto. Just before Mizuki could kill Iruka, Naruto attacked Mizuki, threatening to kill him if he should ever touch his sensei again. Confident in his superiority, Mizuki claimed that he could beat Naruto with one attack, only for the exact opposite to happen. Using his newly learned multiple shadow clone technique, Naruto beat Mizuki to a bloody pulp. Impressed that Naruto could master such a difficult technique, Iruka let Naruto graduate, ironically fulfilling Mizuki's original promise. Upon graduating, Naruto was required to have his picture taken for identification purposes. Rather than having a standard picture, Naruto decided to paint his face and point at the camera in a menacing way. When the third Hokage learned of this, he told Naruto to retake the picture. To express his disagreement on this matter, Naruto used his sexy technique in an attempt to convince the third otherwise. Meanwhile, a young boy was watching the discussion and he used the opportunity to attempt an attack on the Hokage, only to fall flat upon his face. His sensei, Ebisu, pursued the boy into the room and caught a glimpse of Naruto, whom he recognized as the container of the demon fox. The boy accused Naruto of setting a trap for him and Naruto responded by grabbing hold of the boy. Ebisu ordered Naruto to let the boy go, informing Naruto that the boy is none other than the third Hokage's grandson. The boy, certain that Naruto, fearing the Hokage's wrath, will do no harm to him, taunted Naruto, who whacked the boy in the head due to his lack of fear towards the boy's relatives. Ebisu ran to the boy's side, informing him that if he wanted to be Hokage someday, he should avoid people like Naruto. Later on, Naruto found the boy to be following him and at the same time doing a bad job of disguising himself. The boy, his cover blown, introduced himself as Konohamaru and expressed his desire to be taught the sexy technique due to his prior success at defeating the third Hokage in the hopes that using it will make him Hokage. Naruto agreed and took Konohamaru on as his disciple. To learn the technique, Naruto tried to improve Konohamaru's transformation technique by showing him naked women via pornographic magazines and taking him to women's bathhouses. Eventually, they arrived in the woods for the refinement of the technique where Konohamaru explained that the people of the village didn't recognize him by his name, and instead referred to him only as the Hokage's grandson, which he grew tired of. Because of this, he hoped to become the Hokage himself so that people would finally recognize him properly. Soon after, Ebisu arrived to take Konohamaru home, lecturing all the while. At that moment, Konohamaru performed a perfect sexy technique, which only caused Ebisu to lecture Konohamaru further since he is not weak to such derogative techniques. Perplexed by the technique's apparent failure, Naruto used his harem technique, which succeeded in putting Ebisu out of commission. Konohamaru questioned why he was unable to defeat Ebisu by himself, and Naruto replied that becoming Hokage required a great deal of work for which there were no shortcuts. Konohamaru denounced their student-teacher relationship on the grounds that they were both rivals for the title of Hokage. Naruto made the observation that, since he was an actual ninja, he would be one step ahead of Konohamaru, but that he would look forward to the day that they meet in battle. In order to officially obtain the rank of Genin, academy students must be organized into groups of three to undergo a field evaluation administered by Jonin, who would be their squad leader should they pass. On the day of organization, Naruto made sure to have a good breakfast and headed off to the academy, where the groups were to be decided. Upon arriving there, Naruto showed off his forehead protector to the other students who thought he had failed. To Naruto's delight, Sakura Haruno started to approach him, however his glee was quickly stifled when Sakura pushed him out of the way so that she might sit next to Sasuke Uchiha, which would anger all the other girls in the room. Naruto, jealous of Sakura's affection for Sasuke, leaped out of the desk where they were sitting so that he could look Sasuke in the eye. To the disgust of Naruto, Sasuke, and every girl in the room, Naruto was bumped by another student and accidentally kissed Sasuke, earning him a beating from Sakura. As Naruto recovered, Iruka arrived to announce the three-man teams, and as he started listing the members of Team 7, Naruto was pleased and Sakura was sad to learn that the two would be on the same team. As the third member was revealed, Sakura was pleased and Naruto was sad to learn that Sasuke was that member, who happened to 
dislike being teamed with the both of them. As Irika announced their remaining teams, Hinata Hyuga, Kiba Inazuka, and Shino Abarame were revealed to compose Team 8. Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi, and Ino Yamanaka were revealed to compose Team 10. Later, Sakura went off to look for Sasuke, ignoring Naruto, who wanted to have lunch with her. Angered that Sakura had yet again picked Sasuke over himself, Naruto formulated a plan to be with Sakura. Upon finding Sasuke alone in a room, Naruto leaped inside where an unseen fight ensued. As things settled down, Sasuke was shown to be the only one leaving. Later on, Sasuke approached Sakura, who expressed her feelings for him and her distaste for Naruto. As the two were about to kiss, Sasuke, who was revealed to be a transformed Naruto, suffered a violent stomach ache and ran off to the nearest bathroom. While Naruto dealt with his mysterious case of diarrhea, the real Sasuke approached Sakura. When she expressed her jealousy of Naruto for having no parents to tell what to do, Sasuke stated that those without parents grew up lonely, and Sakura made him sick. Sasuke left the crush Sakura by herself, and she began to consider treating Naruto better. As Naruto finally exited the bathroom, he ran into Sasuke, and it seemed as though revenge on Sasuke's part was imminent. Elsewhere, the third Hokage took Kakashi Hatake, Team 7's reluctant Tony leader, on a tour of Naruto's home, and the latter noted that the milk Naruto seemed to have had for breakfast was expired, causing him to frequently head for the bathroom. Soon afterwards, the members of Team 7, after a long wait, finally met their Jonin Sensei, who used the meeting as an opportunity for them to get to know one another. Kakashi went first and said he didn't feel like telling him anything about himself. Naruto proclaimed that he wanted to become Hokage one day and that he loved ramen. Sakura implied that she loved Sasuke and stated that she hated Naruto. Lastly, Sasuke asserted that he hated a lot of things, didn't like anything, and that he would someday kill a certain man that wronged him long ago. Kakashi ended the meeting by telling the others to be at the training grounds the next day with their ninja gear and advised them not to have breakfast. The next day, Kakashi arrived at the training ground last, four hours later than they planned. Kakashi then explained how the evaluation would work. It would be a survival battle in which the aim was to get each of the prospective students to take one of the two bells from Kakashi. It would be a survival battle in which the aim was for each of the prospective students to take one of the two bells from Kakashi. Anyone who didn't get a bell before noon would receive no lunch, which, as the others realized, was why he told them not to have breakfast. He then explained that because there were only two bells, at least one person would fail and return to the academy. He did, however, allow the others to use shuriken if they would like and inform them that they would fail if they attempted the mission with anything less than the intent to kill him. Naruto laughed at the suggestion, saying that Kakashi had no talent. Kakashi rebutted this, stating that class clowns were often the weakest link and that they didn't normally pose a threat, causing Naruto to attack Kakashi before the test had officially begun. Kakashi easily countered the attack and noted that he was starting to like the team due to Naruto's attack having the intent to kill. He then set off Team 7 to begin the test. As the test got underway, Sasuke and Sakura applied stealth methods, staying hidden from Kakashi. Naruto, however, decided that attacking Kakashi would work just as well, and called him out. As Naruto charged at Kakashi, the latter pulled out a book, Make Up Paradise, causing Naruto to hesitate slightly, though Kakashi assured him that the book wouldn't prevent him from defending against Naruto. Naruto began a series of attacks, each of which was dodged by Kakashi. Eventually, Kakashi ended up behind Naruto and used his 1,000 years of death to send Naruto into the nearby lake. Naruto recovered and attacked Kakashi with a number of shadow clones, whose quantity impressed Sasuke and Sakura. Kakashi evaded all the clones' attacks with body replacement technique, leaving them to fight amongst themselves, believing one of them is Kakashi. Upon realizing this, Naruto dismissed his clones and then noticed a bell lying under a nearby tree. When he went to pick it up, however, he was trapped in a snare set by Kakashi, leaving the young ninja dangling upside down. Kakashi retrieved the bell and lectured Naruto about falling for obvious traps. At that moment, Sasuke, believing Kakashi to be distracted, attacked Kakashi with a barrage of shuriken and kunai, apparently killing Kakashi. This, too, was revealed to be a trap, as the attack Kakashi turned into a log, a result of another body replacement technique. Sasuke, his location revealed, went off to find a new hiding spot, while Sakura went looking for Sasuke. As she searched for him, she was tricked by Kakashi's genjutsu, demonic illusion, hell viewing technique, and as she recovered, Sasuke fell prey to Kakashi's earth release double suicide decapitation technique. Naruto, using Kakashi's absence to his advantage, released himself from the snare and attempted to eat the lunches that Kakashi had left behind. However, Kakashi caught him in the act and tied Naruto to a wooden post. Nude eventually rolled around, and all three students had failed to get a bell. After their failure, Kakashi berated them for their lack of teamwork. He explained to them that the purpose of the exam was to work together and not to act independently as they had all done. He said that he would give them all a second chance after lunch and allowed Sakura and Sasuke to eat. However, he ordered that Naruto, because of his attempt to eat all the food himself, should be barred from eating at all, and that anyone who gave him food would fail automatically. After he left, Sakura and Sasuke realized that they'd need Naruto in top shape if they were to retrieve the bells and decided to defy Kakashi by feeding him. Kakashi, who had been watching, appeared before the Genin in a puff of smoke, a furious look upon his face. At this moment, the third Hokage elsewhere revealed to Iruka that Kakashi had never passed a team of Academy students, and that although the failure percentage was astounding, the reasons behind it were perfectly just. Back at the training, grounds, Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke claimed that they were a team, and that therefore if one of them failed, then they all failed. Quickly changing his attitude, Kakashi informed them that they had passed, reciting the exact message he was trying to get across as his reason. In the ninja world, those who don't follow the rules are scum, but those who abandon their friends are worse than scum. While Genin were normally assigned D-rank missions, Naruto insisted on doing something more exciting, and the third Hokage agreed to send them on a C-rank mission to escort Tazuna, a master bridge builder, back to the Land of Waves. During their mission, the team was attacked by two Chunin, enemies at a level that wasn't supposed to be encountered on a C-rank mission. Naruto, surprised by the Chunin's appearance, panicked and was struck by one of the Chunin's poisonous metal gauntlets. Sasuke, in Naruto's absence, dealt with the attackers quite efficiently, and rubbed it in by one-upping Naruto and calling him a scaredy cat. Once the attackers had been restrained, Naruto bled out the poison he'd received by stabbing his wound of the kunai, swearing upon the pain in his hand to never freeze up and leave his friends to fend for themselves ever again. Kakashi, his suspicions raised by the attack, asked Tazuna for the truth about the circumstances of the mission. Tazuna explained that the land of ways had been taken over by a shipping magnate called Gato, who'd effectively bankrupted all the people in the country, and that the only way to revitalize the economy was by building a bridge to the mainland that could render moot Gato's shipping monopoly. However, Gato did not want that to happen and used shinobi gangs to assert his control. Team 7's actual mission was to support and protect the bridge building efforts that had been thwarted thus far. Upon arrival at the Land of Waves and on the way to Tazuna's home, Naruto, b
scared out of its mind with the kunai only an inch from its head. Naruto apologized to it and sympathized profusely with the rabbit, picking it up and hugging it to an extreme. While the others dismissed these antics as Naruto's usual idiocy, Kakashi noticed something strange about this rabbit. Its fur was white. Snow rabbits are only white during winter, meaning that this rabbit had been raised indoors and therefore belonged to somebody nearby. Kakashi suddenly told everyone to duck as a giant sword spun past and nearly killing them all. The sword embedded itself in a tree, and Zabuza Momochi, the missing din from Kirigakure, jumped onto its handle, intent on killing Tazuna. Kakashi, recognizing Zabuza as a formidable opponent, revealed his Sharingan, saying that he will need to use it. Zabuza, honored by Kakashi's willingness to go all out for their battle, stated that he would consider it a testament to his own skill if he were to kill Kakashi. Zabuza ended the conversation with his hiding a mist technique, summoning a thick veil of mist from the nearby lake in order to hide himself from the Sharingan. Kakashi ordered Team 7 to protect Tazuna, though Zabuza asserted that such protection was useless, instantly appearing at the center of their formation. As Zabuza was about to make an attack with the sword, Kakashi raced towards him and stabbed Zabuza in the stomach with his kunai just before his stroke could fall. Water poured out of Zabuza's body and it collapsed into a puddle as the real Zabuza appeared behind Kakashi, revealing that Zabuza had used his water clone technique to fool Kakashi. Zabuza proceeded to slice Kakashi in half, but Kakashi's body too dissolved into water, surprising Zabuza as he realized that Kakashi's sharing gun must have copied his water clone technique as Zabuza charged towards him. Kakashi appeared behind Zabuza, mocking him by saying that it was over. To everyone's surprise, a second Zabuza appeared behind Kakashi and grabbed him, and the first Zabuza reverted to a pool of water. Kakashi attempted to break free of Zabuza's grasp, but was instead thrown into the nearby lake. As he emerged, Zabuza trapped him within his water prison technique, leaving Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura to defend against another of Zabuza's clones. Kakashi told the Genin to run, but Naruto remembered the oath that he had made to himself, and entered the fight so they could save Kakashi and keep Tazuna alive. Naruto created a number of shadow clones that proceeded to completely surround Zabuza's water clone. Zabuza's clone swung his sword, and the shadow clones scattered and disappeared, forcing the only remaining Naruto to reach into his backpack and pull out a Fuma Shuriken, which he gave to Sasuke. Sasuke, sensing Naruto's plan, hurled the Fuma Shuriken at Zabuza, who easily grabbed it from the air. To his surprise, a second Shuriken was hiding in the shadow of the first due to Sasuke's shadow Shuriken technique, and Zabuza was forced to leap over it to avoid being damaged. Once past Zabuza, the second Shuriken turned into Naruto, who had transformed himself. Naruto threw a kunai at Zabuza, who, unable to dodge it while maintaining the water prison technique, was forced to release Kakashi from his prison in order to avoid the attack. With Kakashi free, Zabuza was forced to commence their battle, and the two used multiple water release techniques against each other. Due to a Sharing Gun, Kakashi was able to take the upper hand and defeat Zabuza with Zabuza's own attack. Just as Kakashi was about to make the final blow, a masked ninja, later revealed to be named Haku, appeared to kill Zabuza by impaling Zabuza's neck with several Senbon. After revealing himself to be a hunter nin sent to kill Zabuza, he disappeared with Zabuza's body. Kakashi, momentarily satisfied with this turn of events, decided that it was time to continue escorting Tazuna home, only to collapse due to chakra exhaustion seconds later as a result of overuse of his Sharing Gun. Kakashi is later seen bedridden, with a crutch as a result of his battle. Kakashi was taken to Tazuna's home for recovery, and as he rested, he made the observation that Zabuza's apparent death was odd. When the hunter didn't kill their target, they usually destroyed it on the spot. On the other hand, the ninja who they met had taken Zabuza's body elsewhere instead of operating immediately. This, coupled with the fact that Zabuza had been killed with Senbon, weapons that were rarely fatal and also useful to knocking people out, led Kakashi to believe that Zabuza was still alive and that he'd be back to finish Tazuna's assassination. Elsewhere, Zabuza was revived by Haku, and although he would need time to recover, he promised to crush Kakashi when the next met. With Zabuza's return a likely outcome, Kakashi took Team 7 to the nearby woods for chakra training, and told them that the training would require them to learn to climb trees without using their hands. Naruto made the observation that this is impossible, but Kakashi, in crutches, manages to climb a tree with ease, and explained that the way they do it was focusing chakra on the soles of the feet. The three Genin all made an attempt. Naruto, not using enough chakra, took only one step before falling back into the ground. Sasuke was able to make it a good distance up the trunk, though he damaged it as a result of using too much chakra, and Sakura, having perfect control over her chakra, made it to a high branch on her first attempt, finishing her training. For the boys, however, the training continues, and Naruto, still unable to make it far up the tree, asked Sakura for advice. Sakura complied, and Kakashi made the observation that Naruto was finally getting a good grasp on teamwork. Sakura was left in charge of protecting Tazuna while Naruto and Sasuke continued their training. As Naruto began to catch up to Sasuke, Sasuke casually asked to know what advice Sakura had given Naruto, but Naruto, determined to beat Sasuke, refused to give it away. During dinner one night, Sakura asked about a torn picture that Inari, Tazuna's grandson, had been looking at. Tazuna explains that the man in the missing portion of the picture was Kaiza, Inari's father, whom Inari had idolized and thought of as his biological parent, though Kaiza had adopted him. One day, years prior, a flood had threatened to destroy the village, and Kaiza had single handedly managed to close the floodgates, earning him the title of hero amongst the villagers. Once Gato came to the country, however, Kaiza's heroic deeds angered Gato, and therefore Gato had him executed in front of the villagers, including Inari. From that day forth, the villagers lost hopes and Inari was crushed, disbelieving the impossible existence of a hero. Naruto, determined to prove to Inari that there was such thing as a hero, rushed off to continue his training. As Naruto rested in the woods one day, he encountered Haku, though he was unaware of Haku's identity and thought of him to just be a pretty girl. The two discussed their dreams. Naruto wished to become the Kage of his village, while Haku wanted to protect the person most precious to him, explaining that when he was protecting a precious person, one's strength reached its maximum. Naruto agreed with the statement, remembering all the people that protected him. With that, Haku left, but not before confusing Naruto to no end by asserting that he was a boy. Training for Naruto and Sasuke continued, and eventually the two were able to climb the very tops of their trees, though Naruto was exhausted as a result. Seeing Naruto in this condition, a tearful Inari proclaimed that Naruto was wasting his time and that Gato would still defeat him. Naruto replied that he will win and sarcastically congratulated Inari for always crying, calling him a brat. As Inari sulked, Kakashi explained to Inari how Naruto had also grown up without a father, and that he had no mother and therefore had a sad life. Kakashi also mentioned that despite these conditions, he'd never seen Naruto cry and theorized that Naruto one day grew tired of crying over himself. This explanation and the suggestion that Naruto was the only person present who knew what Inari was going through touched Inari. The next morning, Kakashi, Sasuke, and Sakura escorted Tuzun to work at the bridge,
thugs were after kidnap Inari's mother. Inari, inspired by Naruto's story, attempted to save his mother by himself. As he was just about to be cut down by the thugs, Naruto appeared and defeated the two single-handedly. Naruto congratulated Inari for finally standing up for himself and left to join the rest of his team. Back at the bridge, Sasuke battled with Haku, and Zabuzo was surprised to find that Sasuke could keep up with Haku's speed. Haku, also noticing Sasuke's capabilities, decided to use his trump card, demonic mirroring ice crystals, which trapped Sasuke in a cage of ice. Haku proceeded to pummel Sasuke with wave after wave of Senbon barrages, which were made effectively undodgeable as a result of Haku's technique. Eventually, Naruto arrived and managed a sneak attack on Haku. Just as Zabuzo was about to attack Naruto, Haku asked to be the one to fight him, to which Zabuzo agreed. Sasuke began to formulate a plan, thinking that it'd be easier to defeat Haku with Naruto attacking from the outside. To his dismay, Naruto entered the cage of ice to see how Sasuke was doing, and he too became a prisoner of Haku's technique. Naruto and Sasuke both attempted to destroy the ice mirrors, but were unsuccessful. This turn of events led Kakashi to believe that Haku was using a Keke Genkai, and that Naruto and Sasuke had no chance of winning. Because of this, he once again revealed his Sharingan, expressing his desire to finish the battle quickly. Zabuza explained that he had learned how to defeat the Sharingan and disappeared into the mist. As Kakashi instructed Sakura to guard Tazuna, Zabuza struck, revealing to Kakashi that Zabuza was now attacking with his eyes closed, making the Sharingan's ocular genjutsu useless. Zabuza, explaining that his specialty is killing people based on purely sound, attempted to finish off Tazuna, but Kakashi made himself into a human shield at the last second. Heavily injured, Kakashi resorted to using an attack that he himself had created. Meanwhile, the fight between Haku and Naruto and Sasuke continued, with the two Genin having sustained heavy wounds. Sasuke, however, was starting to dodge Haku's attacks. Haku, noticing this, attempted to attack an exhausted Naruto instead, but Sasuke managed to pull Naruto out of the way. A shocked Haku noticed Sasuke's eyes, and it was revealed that as a member of the Uchiha clan, Sasuke had finally awoken his own Gekagenkai, the Sharingan, which allowed him to see Haku's movements with ease. Haku, fearing for his success at winning the battle, goes for a finishing blow upon Naruto, but Sasuke rushes Naruto's side to stop the attack with his own body. When Naruto woke up, he found a severely wounded Sasuke standing over him. When Naruto asked Sasuke why he had saved him, he replied that it was merely instinct and fell into Naruto's arms. After admitting that he had promised not to die before killing his brother, Sasuke fell unconscious, and Haku asked Naruto whether it was the first time he'd witness death. Naruto, enraged by the apparent loss of Sasuke, began to emit a visible chakra, and Haku noted that it was pure evil. As the chakra poured out, Naruto's wounds began to heal, and he acquired claws, fangs, and slitted pupils. Zabuza and Kakashi both sensed this new chakra, and each initially wondered whether it belonged to the other Jonin, but Zabuza noted that the chakra was far too powerful to belong to Kakashi, and Kakashi was able to recognize it as that of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Kakashi, worried about the seal keeping the Nine-Tailed Fox within Naruto would break soon, decided to pull out all the stops, and drew a scroll, smeared his blood on it, and told Zabuza that they should now end the battle. The transformed Naruto began to attack Haku, who attempted to counter with a barrage of needles, which were easily repelled by Naruto's roar. Haku attempted a physical attack, but Naruto was able to dodge it and grab a now fleeing Haku in an instant. After releasing a large amount of chakra, Naruto gave Haku a deafening punch in the face, sending him flying through a nearby mirror and destroying all the other mirrors as a result. Once Haku's body came to a stop, he rose, and Naruto charged at him so he could give the finishing blow. As he did so, Haku's mask began to crack and break away, revealing the face of the boy whom Naruto bent in the woods. Mere inches from Haku's face, Naruto stopped his attack and returned to his normal form. Haku questioned why Naruto spared him, only to receive a weak punch to the face. Haku explained that with his defeat had come his uselessness to Zabuza, and that because he could no longer protect Zabuza, his most precious person, he should die. Naruto didn't understand the reason for wanting death, but Haku began to plead for it nonetheless. With the bloodstained scroll, Kakashi summoned a number of dogs to find and restrain Zabuza. Explaining that he had allowed Zabuza to injure him so he could acquire Zabuza's scent, Kakashi proclaimed that he would finally be the end of Zabuza. With that, Kakashi gathered chakra in his hand and readied his lightning cutter for use on Zabuza. Meanwhile, Haku had finally managed to persuade Naruto to kill him, using Sasuke's apparent death as a reason for revenge. Naruto prepared a kunai and charged at Haku, hoping that death would make Haku's dreams come true, but at the last moment, Haku stopped the attack. He apologized, saying he couldn't die yet, and disappeared. Kakashi charged towards Zabuza while at the same time, a number of mirrors begin to surround Zabuza as protection. As Lightning Cutter made contact with flesh, Needle struck the bloody scroll, and the dogs holding Zabuza in place disappeared. Kakashi surprised, he impaled Haku, who had used the last of his strength to grab hold of Kakashi. Elsewhere, Inari was going door to door in an attempt to rally support for taking down Gato and his men. The villagers, not wanting to fight back anymore, refused, to which Inari replied that he would protect those that he loved, as crying wouldn't save anyone. Once he got home, Inari's mother pleaded for him not to go, but Inari insisted that as Kaiza's son, he must. As he left the house, Inari was startled to find many shadowy figures surrounding his door. Naruto, confused by Haku's disappearance, rushed towards the figures he could see in the now fading mist. Upon his arrival, he found the gruesome scene of Haku's death, and Zabuza preparing to make good use of the opportunity Haku had given him. As Zabuza was about to finish the swing of his sword, Kakashi jumped out of the way, taking Haku's body with him. After removing his hand from Haku's body and laying the body down, Kakashi ordered Naruto to stay out of the fight. Sakura, now noticing Naruto, asked where Sasuke was. When Naruto looked away and didn't reply, she guessed at what had happened and quickly escorted Tazuna to Sasuke's body, where she broke the shinobi rules and cried. Zabuza, meanwhile, was unable to touch Kakashi, and every attempt to strike him down, he was now thrown backwards. With one such parry, one of Zabuza's arms was made useless, and with another attack by Kakashi, the other arm was put out of commission. As Zabuza's defenselessness was made apparent, Gato and his forces arrived to take the assassination of Tazuna into their own hands. As Zabuza and Kakashi decided that they no longer have a reason to fight each other, Gato noticed Haku's body and defiled it as vengeance for an injury Haku had earlier given him. This, coupled with Zabuza's indifference, infuriated Naruto, leading him to decide that Zabuza was still his enemy. Naruto explained how Haku had felt about Zabuza and how Haku would have done anything within his power to serve Zabuza. As Naruto decried how Haku had died as a tool and then never achieved his dreams, Zabuza broke 
broken into tears, admitting defeat to Naruto. As he began to reflect on the pureness of Haku's heart and the devotion that Haku had held towards him, Zabuza tore away the cloth covering his mouth and borrowed a kunai from Naruto. Catching the kunai in his mouth, Zabuza charged through Gato's forces, slaying anyone who got in his way while even being stabbed many times. Upon reaching Gato, Zabuza proclaimed that he would not be able to go to the same resting place as Haku, and that he would be taking Gato with him to hell. With that, Zabuza ended Gato's life. Using the last of his energy, he thanked Haku for everything and apologized, falling to the ground with exhaustion. As Zabuza's life began to fade, Sasuke awakened, overjoying Sakura to no end. After asking Sakura to release him, Sasuke asked of Haku's fate. Learning that he died, Sasuke realized that Haku had never meant to kill him or Naruto. Sakura called out to Naruto that Sasuke was alright, and Naruto was overwhelmed by the good news. Gato's men, meanwhile, were now without a paycheck and decided to loot the town as their payment for coming. As Naruto and Kakashi both exhausted tried to figure out what to do, an arrow fell to the ground in front of the imposing forces. Everyone's attention was drawn to its source, Inari and the entirety of the town's population would come to start protecting themselves. To contribute to the already intimidating forces, Naruto and Kakashi used what little chakra they have left to create what appears to be a large number of shadow clones, causing the mercenary to flee to the boat that they used to get to the bridge. Kakashi approached Zabuza, who asked to see Haku one last time. Kakashi complied and laid Zabuza's broken body alongside Haku's. As snow began to fall, Zabuza asked Haku whether he was crying, and asserted that, just as Haku had always been by his side in life, he was now by Haku's side in death. With his last breath, he expressed his desire to go to the same afterlife as Haku, if he only could. Kakashi remarked that Zabuza would be able to be with Haku in death, as they would go to the afterlife together. Haku and Zabuza were buried side by side, and Naruto, having witnessed the fate of the shinobi, decided to live his life his own way, not letting others tell him how. The bridge was completed, and Team 7 prepared to leave. As they bade farewell to Tazuna and his family, Naruto told Inari that it was okay to cry. Inari, saying that he didn't want to, said the same thing to Naruto, who also said that he didn't want to. As Naruto walked away, both broke into tears, causing Sakura to call them both idiots. As they all disappeared in the distance, Tazuna proclaimed that the bridge would be called the Great Naruto Bridge to signify the strength that Naruto gave Inari, who in turn spread it to the whole town. Chunin exams. Team 7 returned to Konoha to continue with their lives as regular Genin. One day, whilst playing with Konohamaru, Udon, and Moegi, Naruto met three Genin from Sunagakure, Gara, Konkoro, and Tamari, and learned that they were in Konoha to participate in the Chunin selection exams. Meanwhile, Kakashi, Asuma, and Kuranai all volunteered their teams to the exam as well. Naruto was thrilled with the possibility of becoming a Chunin. The first part of the exam, proctored by Ibiki Marina, was written, but it was not a test of knowledge as much as a test of information gathering and willpower. The first nine questions were supposed to be obtained by cheating, where the Genin must use any techniques to find out the correct answer of being caught. Naruto, who did not realize this, went into a traumatic state in which he felt that he would cause his entire team to be eliminated as he did not know the answer to any of the questions. Sasuke realized that he too did not know the answers, but immediately activated his shotgun to copy someone else's answers. Sakura, as a testament to her incredible intellect, answered all the questions quickly, a feat that the examiner later said could not be accomplished at Genin level. The last question was a do or die question. If one didn't answer, one's entire team failed the tuning exams, but if one answered incorrectly, one would remain a Genin forever. Naruto showed that he was not a quitter when he exclaimed that he didn't care if he said a Genin forever and that, even if it came to pass, he would still become Hokage. The Genin who chose to answer the first question all passed the first part of the tuning exams, including Naruto who didn't answer a single question on the written part of the exam. The second part of the exam, proctored by Uncle Midorashi, was a survival exam in the 44th training ground also known as the Forest of Death. During this part, Naruto found himself in a desperate situation against Orochimaru, an s rank missing in from Konoha so powerful that the third Hokage later mentioned there was nobody in Konoha that could fight him equally. It turned out that Orochimaru used to be one of the third Hokage's pupils, also known as the Sanin. Naruto and Sasuke's reaction to the situation were a complete reversal of what happened in the Land of Waves mission. Sasuke was frozen with fear while Naruto fought on fearlessly, at one point stopping Orochimaru's huge summon snake in its tracks on his own, with the help of some demon fox chakra, and muttering to Sasuke in a moment of glorious retribution that marked another milestone of the rivalry, you're not hurt, are you, scaredy cat? Naruto eventually snapped Sasuke out of his panic. However, Orochimaru used the five element seal on Naruto, disrupting the flow of the demon fox's chakra as well as Naruto's own. However, Orochimaru was too much for Sasuke as well. In the end, Orochimaru put a curse seal of heaven onto Sasuke's neck, saying that Sasuke would eventually come to him for the power he needed to kill his brother, Itachi Uchiha. Orochimaru then left, sending his three Genin, Team Dosu from Otogakure, to go after Sasuke. Meanwhile, Anko was informed of the corpses of three Genin from Kusagakure. She recognized one of them as Shiore. She found out that someone must have killed the Genin and used their faces to disguise themselves and enter the exams. She suspected that the Shiore who took the exams was actually Orochimaru. She ran off to confront Orochimaru only to have her curse seal of heaven reactivated by him. Orochimaru warned her not to stop the exams. While both Naruto and Sasuke were unconscious from the fight against Orochimaru, Sakura had to take care of them. It was there that Sakura's personality reached a turning point. As Kintsuchi of Team Dosu trapped her by roughly holding her by her hair, Sakura realized how pathetic her behavior was, always blindly praising and criticizing others when she was the one who hadn't improved at all. She reflected on herself, thinking of how she was always telling Naruto that she was better than him when he was the one who had been consistently improving, and telling Sasuke she loved him when she couldn't even muster up enough strength to protect him as a teammate, before she symbolically freed herself by cutting off her long hair with a kunai, which she initially kept long because it had been rumored that Sasuke liked girls with long hair. She also decided to fight against the Oto Genin and resolved to no longer be dependent on her teammates. At this point, Team 10 arrived on the scene. Rock Lee fought the Oto Ninja and used the front Lotus on Dosu, who was saved by Zaku, but admitted that the Lotus still almost killed him. Rock Lee is then defeated by Dosu. Team 10 fights the Oto Ninja to save Sakura, but ultimately fails. The rest of Team 9 arrives at the scene. Dosu Kanuda, leader of Team Dosu, mentioned that Edgy could see through them, but before an Edgy could attack, an awakened Sasuke intervened. The curse seal on Sasuke had by now started to take effect, and in a state of insanity and murderous intent, Sasuke defeated Zaku Abumi of Team Dosu, going as far as to dislocate his shoulders for no other reason to cause him pain. Before he could do any more damage to anyone else, however, Sakura hugged Sasuke, crying and begging him to stop. 
allowing Sasuke to regain control of the seal. Dosu left with his teammates, wondering why Orochimaru had sent him to kill Sasuke if he had known that Sasuke would have the cursed seal. Team 7 still managed to make it past the second stage by defeating Team Oboro of Amagakure. With a little help from Kabuto Yakushi, a fellow ninja from Konoha, seven teams managed to pass, which was more than twice as many as had been expected. To cut down the prevailing Genin from the second exam, a preliminary round was staged before the third and final stage of the Junior exams. The 21 people, or 20 after Kabuto withdrew, were to be matched up with each other in a fight that lasted until somebody gave in or was unable to continue fighting. The proctor of the third exam, Hayate Gekko, did reserve the right to step in and stop the fight when he felt that there was a clear winner. Sakura at first attempted to tell the examiners that the cursed seal that Orochimaru had placed on Sasuke was seriously debilitating him, but Sasuke stopped her and told her to mind her business. At that point, Naruto stepped in to stand up for Sakura, but was swiftly silenced by Sasuke, who acknowledged Naruto by declaring that he was one of the people he wanted to fight. Later on, Naruto would return the sentiment. The first matchup was Sasuke Uchiha against a member of Kabuto's team, Yorai Okado. Before the fight started, Kakashi warned Sasuke that if his cursed seal got out of control, he would have to intervene and stop the match to control the seal. This barred Sasuke from using any technique, as the seal responds to the flows of chakra. The match started with Yorai stealing Sasuke's chakra with his chakra absorption. The match seemed hopeless for Sasuke until he heard Naruto's taunts. Next to him was Rock Lee, which gave Sasuke an idea. He used the Lion Combo, a partial copy of Rock Lee's Front Lotus which had been captured by Sasuke's Sharingan. Yorai was knocked unconscious, and Sasuke advanced in the next round. After the fight, Kakashi took Sasuke away to seal the cursed seal. Up next were Zaku Abumi and Shino Aburame of Konohagakure's Team 8. Zaku apparently only had one functional arm, but he bet he could win regardless. Elsewhere, the cursed seal was sealed by Kakashi, but then Orochimaru showed up for Sasuke, asserting that all the Genin he currently had at his command were disposable. As Kakashi readied his lightning cutter, Shino commanded a multitude of insects to attack Zaku from behind, leaving the one-armed Zaku unable to defend himself with his unidirectional technique. Zaku then revealed that he used both arms, but it was too late. The insects had blocked the tubes in Zaku's arms, building up the chakra he was trying to use and making the arms explode, thus ending the fight. Orochimaru left, saying that Sasuke would be his someday. The match with Misumi Surugi against Konkuro of Tsunagakure's three sand siblings began. Misumi quickly used soft physique modification to restrain Konkuro and threatened to snap his neck, until it was revealed that the Konkuro Misumi was fighting was just a puppet. The real Konkuro was disguised, controlling the puppet with the puppet technique. He used the puppet Karasu to crush Misumi's bones, defeating him. The fourth match, Sakura vs. Ino of Konohagakure's Team 10, was particularly meaningful as the two were rivals. The match dragged down for a very long time, since they seemed to be quite on par until Ino tried to possess Sakura's body to force her to forfeit the match. However, Sakura's will expelled Ino from her mind. Exhausted and out of chakra, they both went for a final attack, hitting each other at the exact same time and rendering each other unconscious. Hayate declared that neither of them would move on to the next round. The fifth match was Tenten of Konohagakure's Team Guy against Tamari of Tsunagakure's Sen siblings. The match was over quickly, as all the projectile weapons used by Ten Ten were completely countered by with the wind release techniques used by Tamari, who won without taking as much as a single scratch. Rock Lee jumped down to avenge Tamari's treatment of Ten Ten, but Mike Guy stopped what would have turned into a fight. The sixth match, Shikamaru Naru of Konohagakure's Team Ten against Kintsuchi was next, with Shikamaru aware that he was at a disadvantage. Since Kid had seen him use the Shadow Imitation Technique in the Force of Death without showing her own fighting style, Kin started by dodging the Shadow Imitation Technique and throwing Senbun with and without bells, using strings to ring the bells from unexpected positions to divert Shikamaru's attention and attack from behind. Shikamaru, however, managed to join his Shadow with its, using the shadows of the strings that she was holding. With Kin matching Shikamaru's movements, each drew a Shuriken and them at each other. When it came time for them to duck, Shikamaru ducked successfully, but Kin, having previously retreated, banged her head against the wall and knocked herself out, which turned out to be the true goal of Shikamaru's battle strategy. Shikamaru emerged as the winner. Naruto, still impaired by the five element seal, was matched up with Kiba of Konohagakure's team 8 in the seventh match. The fight went poorly for Naruto at first, especially after Kiba's Ninken Akamaru joined the fight and transformed into Kiba with the human beast clone technique. Naruto made a comeback by transforming in a layered fashion into Akamaru and then Kiba, so that when Kiba attacked Naruto, the second transformation as Kiba gave way to the first as Akamaru, leading Kiba to attack Akamaru, still affected by a beast human clone. Kiba then focused on attacking intensively to keep Naruto from counter attacking until Naruto accidentally broke wind, which stunned Kiba, whose sense of smell was magnified a thousand times at the time. Naruto then beat Kiba by using Shadow Clones to perform a new technique, the Naruto Uzumaki combo. The eighth match brought a family rivalry to the forefront, as Hinata and Neji of the Hyuga clan battled. Kiba, being born away on a stretcher, urged Hinata to forfeit. At first, Neji assaulted Hinata psychologically, using her fears to convince her that she had no possibility of winning. However, after being inspired by Naruto's courage, Hinata decided to fight and prove that she could be brave as well. They both fought using the Hyuga Gentle Fist style and the Byakugan, a Kekai Genkai which Kakashi had studied to surpass the Sharingan. While they initially seemed to the observers to be equally matched, Neji managed to interrupt Hinata's chakra flow in her arms, saving her ability to use Gentle Fist. Hinata still tried to go on, and it was only the exam proctor's intervention that stopped Neji from killing her. Hinata's bravery still managed to inspire Naruto, as he vowed to battle and win against Neji in the third exam. The ninth match pitted Lee against Gara of Tsunogakure's Sand siblings. At first, none of Rock Lee's Taijutsu attacks managed to penetrate or circumvent Gara's shield of sand until Lee removed the weights he was wearing around his legs. The boost of speed was such that Gara's sand couldn't follow Lee's movements, and Gara was hit for the first time in his life. However, Gara was revealed to be using armor of sand to keep Lee's attacks from working on him. Realizing that his normal attacks would no longer work, Lee then used his front lotus on Gara, but in the end it was revealed that he had been a sand clone. Having no other way to end the match, and with Guy's permission, Lee opened five of the inner chakra gates. The result being Lee's strength was multiplied immensely for a short time, but also severely injured him. He then proceeded to continuously beat Gara with his reverse lotus. However, as Gara fell to the ground, he dispersed his sand gourd as a cushion to break his fall. Gara then used his sand binding coffin to crush Rock Lee's left arm and leg. My guy jumped down to prevent Gara from killing Lee and regretted having taught Lee how to open the inner gates after learning from Medical Ninja that Lee could no longer be a ninja due to his intense injuries. Gara won the match. The last match was Choji Akamichi of Konohagakure's Team 10 vs. Dosa Kanuda.
After the preliminary ends and drawing loss to determine the first round matchups in the main tournament, there was a one month period in which the remaining Genin could prepare themselves. Various dignitaries were also invited to watch the main matches. During this month, Naruto met Jiraiya, another Sanian, for the first time. Jiraiya agreed to be a sensei and was the one who taught him the most advanced techniques he learned during that time. Under Jiraiya, Naruto improved his chakra control by practicing walking on water, learning to call upon the Demon Fox's energy at will after Jiraiya used the five elements on seal to cancel Ojimaru's five element seal, and had to use the summoning technique to call the giant toad Gamabunta to his aid, but was so exhausted after completing his training that Gamabunta carried him to the hospital. Also during a month of training, Dosu, who was trying to sneak up on and kill Gara, was ripped to shreds by him. Hayate was murdered by Baki, the Jonin of the Sand siblings, after he overheard Baki talking with Kabuto about their plans to invade Konoha. Gara also attempted to assassinate Lee in the hospital on the day before the finals, but was stopped by Naruto and Chikamaru. Gara revealed his past, which led to Naruto's realizing that they had similar histories of prejudice before Guy stepped in and forced Gara to leave. Due to the fact that Hayate Gekko was murdered during the one month break, Genma Shiranui became the new proctor for the final exam. The first match was Naruto against Neji. Naruto's fight with Neji in the first match of the finals was a very dramatic one. During that fight, Neji lectured Naruto as he had done with Hinata during the preliminaries, telling Naruto that failures remained failures and that this could not change. Naruto eventually won the battle through a combination of the Demon Fox's power sealed within him and sheer belief in victory. In the process, he changed Neji's outlook on life and inspired him to create his own fate, thus forming another important bond. Naruto was able to make Neji understand that destiny could be changed, and they became very good friends from that point on. The second match, which featured Sasuke vs. Gara, was moved to be the last, as Sasuke hadn't arrived yet. Normally, he would have been disqualified on the spot, but his match had been highly anticipated. In fact, some of the crowd commented that they mostly came to just see him fight, forcing the third Hokage to give in to Kazakage's request to post by the match. The third match, which featured Shino vs. Konkuro, was given to Shino on default, since Konkuro forfeited to keep his technique secret before the invasion was launched. The fourth match was Tamari vs. Shikamaru, as both Tamari and Shikamaru were excellent strategists, but Shikamaru was better. Although it appeared throughout the match that Shikamaru was using pointless attacks, he was actually five steps ahead. And managed to skillfully manipulate Tamari into a position where he could attack from behind, using the tunnel which Naruto had dug during his match with Neji to stealthily extend his shadow imitation technique. This took control over Tamari's body and forced her to imitate every one of Shikamaru's movements. Although Shikamaru could have won, he quit instead, saying that he's too low on chakra. His real reason for quitting, however, seems to be because he's incredibly lazy and saw no point in winning, which would have only led to having to fight in further matches. He also didn't want to hurt a girl. Gara vs Sasuke came around again. This is the battle that the crowd had been looking forward to. Sasuke arrived right in time, and the match was about to begin. Sasuke demonstrated that his speed had vastly increased to the point where the sand guarding Gara could not keep up. Sasuke also demonstrated Chidori, a technique that he had learned from Kakashi and Kakashi's only original technique to injure Gara. Before the match could finish, however, a smoke bomb was set off in the Kage's box. Kabuto, who was actually working for Rochimaru, used Genjutsu to put almost everyone in the crowd to sleep, and the Konoha crush commenced. Konoha crush. With the invasion of Konoha's start, Suna and Oto ninja poured into Konoha using giant snakes to topple the village's protective wall. As this goes on, the fourth Kazakage holds a kunai to the third Hokage his neck, holding him hostage and allowing them both to get to the roof of their sitting area without confrontation. As Anbu members try to come to the third's rescue, the Kazakage's minions erect the four violet flames formation, preventing anyone from getting in or out. As the Kazakage begins to mock the third for getting so old and even going so far as to call him Sensei, the third realizes that the Kazakage is actually Orochimaru in disguise, who sheds his disguise so that he can face his former master face to face. The third Hokage, knowing that Orochimaru has come to kill him, removes his Hokage outfit, revealing his fighting gear underneath. Orochimaru comments that the third came prepared for the battle and the two stare each other down. When one of the tiles on the roof cracks, they begin their battle. The third starts by sending hundreds of shuriken at Orochimaru, who blocks them by summoning three coffins to shield himself. The third, recognizing the coffins, deduces what Orochimaru is trying to do and attempts to stop the coffin summonings. However, only two coffins open, and the reanimated corpses of the first and second Hokage step out. The two deceased Hokages greet the third and comment on the impressiveness of Orochimaru being able to summon them. In response, the third states that he regrets having to see the two again as opponents and tells him to prepare for defeat. Orochimaru prepares the two Hokages for battle, removing the effects that death has had on their bodies and erasing their personality. Angered by Orochimaru's use of his former teachers, the third attacks the group, though his efforts are neutralized and he's thrown back and restrained by the first Hokage's ability to summon trees. Realizing he's outnumbered, the third summons Enma to help him in battle, who transforms into a large staff to give the third a weapon. With Enma in hand, the third tries to attack Orochimaru, though he's repelled by the other two Hokages. Using this failure as an opportunity, the third plants explosive tags in the two Hokages, taking away each of their legs. The legs, however, regenerate, showing the third that conventional attacks are useless. Out of options, the third prepares to use the only jutsu that will work, though Orochimaru first decides to show him something. Removing the mask he had been wearing, Orochimaru reveals his true face, that of a young woman whose body Orochimaru had stolen and begun to occupy. Recognizing this as Orochimaru's success in finally achieving a path to immortality, the search for which he had been expelled from Konoha for, the third begins to understand why Orochimaru had come to Konoha, to take the body of Sasuke Uchiha. Determined not to let this happen, it to rectify his mistake of allowing Orochimaru to escape years earlier, the third creates two shadow clones. All the thirds prepare to use dead demon consuming seal, a technique that the third claims Orochimaru, despite his extensive knowledge of jutsus, has never seen before. As the demon called forth by the seal, only able to be seen by the third, readies itself, the third is forced to endure the other two Hokage's blows, weakening his old body even more. As soon as the seal is ready for use, the third's shadow clones each grab hold of a Hokage, and the demon plunges his hands into each. Momentarily regaining their senses, the Hokages all apologize to each other, the first and second for the trouble they've caused the third, and the third for the fate he sends them to. The demon pulls the souls of the first and second from their body and seals them within the bodies of the third shadow clones, causing the clones to disappear in a puff of smoke. No longer inhabited, the first and second's bodies dissolve, revealing themselves to be in actuality the bodies of Zaku Abumi and Kinsuchi, two Genin Orochimaru had entered the Chunin exam 
damage and now sacrifice for his means. Angered by Orochimaru's careless use of his subordinates, the third grabs Enma and exchanges blows with Orochimaru and his Kusanagi sword. Throwing the Kusanagi and Enma aside, the third grabs onto Orochimaru and the demon of the seal plunges his hand into Orochimaru. Sensing that his soul is being removed from his body, Orochimaru calls his Kusanagi to him, stabbing the third in the back. This chain of events forces the third to halt the removal of Orochimaru's soul, the latter of which questions why he didn't block the attack. The third explains that in exchange for using the sealing technique, the user is sentenced to death, as was demonstrated by its use by the fourth Hokage of the demon fox years earlier. Due to the large amount of his soul that has been removed, Orochimaru is now able to see the demon of the seal, just in time to witness the consumption of the Hokage's soul affected by it. Once eaten by the demon, the souls are trapped in its belly, forever to spend eternity in a constant battle of hate with one another. This revelation brings fear to Orochimaru's eyes, who tries to ensure the third dies before he can be given that same future. As the Okage battle goes on, the Jonin in the audience that managed to repel out Kabuto's genjutsu begin to confront the invading ninja, determined to protect the audience from stray attacks. Meanwhile, Baki informs Kankuro and Tamari to take Gara elsewhere, his injury making him useless for the planned invasion. Sasuke, confused about what's going on, falls the three wanting to finish his fight with Gara. Kakashi watches Sasuke go off, unable to leave his current duty protection. He does, however, notice that Sakura too has managed to shake the genjutsu, and tells her to wake Naruto and Shikamaru so they can follow Sasuke. She does so, though she finds that Shikamaru was also unaffected by the genjutsu, choosing to pretend that he had been so he could avoid being drawn into battle. To help in their pursuit of Sasuke, Kakashi summons Paku to guide them, and the four set off. As the group leaves the stadium and enters the forest, Pakun senses that they're being followed by Nai and Oto Ninja. To act as a distraction and buy the others some time, Shikamaru stays behind to slow down the ninja. After altering his surroundings to give the impression that the group went in a different direction, Shikamaru lies and wait for the following invaders. Once they catch up and take notice of the apparent change in course, Shikamaru traps the group with the shadow imitation technique. Shikamaru notices, however, that he's only managed to catch eight of nine, indicating that one ninja had been following behind to protect the others. Running low on chakra, and therefore running at a time where he can restrain the ninja with, Shikamaru throws Shuriken at the group so he can find out the location of the ninth. The Shuriken are all stopped by the free ninja's needles, and Shikamaru tries to extend his shadow to the ninja's location, but he doesn't have enough shadows to work with. After keeping the eight at bay for a while longer, Shikamaru's chakra runs out, and he's forced to release the group. Freed, the group encourages the ninth ninja to be the one to kill their captive, and in response, a ninja appears behind Shikamaru. The ninja, however, catches everyone by surprise, as it's revealed to be Asuma Saratobi with the ninth ninja in tow. In a flash, Asuma takes out the other eight and tells Shikamaru to take a rest. Sasuke eventually manages to catch up with Gara, Konkuro, and Tamari. As Konkuro prepares to fight Sasuke in hopes of giving Tamari and Gara time to escape, Shino Alborama arrives to fight Konkuro in Sasuke's stead, wanting to have the fight he'd been denied during the finals. As Sasuke goes off to continue his pursuit of Gara, Konkuro unveils his puppet, Karasu, and Shino readies his bugs for battle. Konkuro uses Karasu's new arsenal of weapons to try and poison Shino, though Shino's bugs allow him to make a number of otherwise impossible evasions. As Konkuro continues to direct Karasu, Shino is able to navigate his bugs in secret to Konkuro's location, which consume his chakra and prevent him from moving. With Konkuro no longer able to move, Shino collapses, Karasu's one successful strike finally taking effect. As Konkuro and Shino's fight draws to a close, Sasuke again manages to catch up with Gara, who having sensed Sasuke's arrival, swipes Tamari out of the way. As Gara's contemplations of killing Sasuke increase, his transformation begins with his sand forming new monster's arm. With the arm, Gara is given increased speed and strength, forcing Sasuke to begin his assault with another Chidori, a technique he's only capable of using twice a day. As Gara charges at Sasuke, Sasuke unleashes his jutsu, slicing Gara's arm in two. Though the technique is successful in injuring Gara, it does nothing but increase his desire to fight, causing him to sprout a tail of the same nature as the arm. As Gara charges again, his speed once again increased, Sasuke is forced to use Chidori a third time, pushing him to his limits and forcing him to activate the cursed seal given to him by Orochimaru. Though Sasuke's attack once again slices Gara's arm in two, Sasuke's use of the cursed mark drains the remaining energy and causes him to collapse. As Gara makes the finishing blow, Naruto arrives and kicks Gara away. As Sakura and Paku and start to tend to Sasuke, Naruto attempts to figure out who Gara is, his face now partially transformed as well. Upon learning that the beast is Gara and remembering Gara's vow to kill to prove its existence, Naruto yells at the others to run away. Gara, however, has already made his move and charges at the downed Sasuke. Sakura, her willingness to help others strengthen during the tuning exams, shields Sasuke and prepares to attack Gara if necessary. Due to the look in Sakura's eyes, Gara is unable to bring himself to harm her, instead, using his arm to pin her to a nearby tree. To save Sakura, Naruto charges at Gara, although only manages to get himself spotted aside. To help him in his battle, Naruto attempts to summon Gamabunta, although is only able to summon Gamakichi, a considerably smaller toad that does nothing but taunt Naruto. Unimpressed by Naruto's attempt at a summon, Gara gives the battle a stipulation. Using his sand to keep Sakura pinned to the tree, Gara causes the sand to slowly form a tighter hold on her, forcing Naruto to defeat him before Sakura suffocates. With the new incentive for battle made, Gara hurls sand shuriken at Naruto, who grabs Gamakichi to shield him from the attack. This onslaught allows Gara to find another chance to further his transformation, now having two beastly arms and his face being that of his final transformation. His attacks ineffective against his new form, Naruto decides that to save Sakura and Sasuke, he will battle with his life, and pulls out all the stops for the battle. After creating a number of shadow clones, Naruto uses the clones to launch himself at Gara. Though Gara swats him aside once again, Naruto manages to plant an explosive kunai under Gara's tail, something that just so happens to be Gara's weak spot. Before Naruto can collide with the surrounding trees, Sasuke catches him and tells him to save Sakura and run. Naruto, remembering the time that Sasuke risked his life to save him, says that he'll be the one to fight Gara, since the two are much alike. Repeating his promise to protect those precious to him, Naruto taps into the demon fox's chakra, enabling him to create 1,999 shadow clones. With his army of shadow clones, Naruto uses Uzumaki Naruto 2000 combo, sending wave after wave of attacks at Gara and pushing Gara to his limits of endurable damage. Not wanting to lose, Gara completes his transformation, destroying all of Naruto's shadow clones and transforming into a tanuki that stands many times higher than the tallest tree. 
Determined to make Naruto pay for forcing him into his final form, Gaara begins to encase Naruto in his sand-biting coffin. Before the compacting effects of the sand can begin, Naruto again taps into the power of the Demon Fox, and again attempts the summoning technique. Finally successful, Gaara's coffin expands and bursts, with Naruto riding upon Gamabuta's head ready for battle. Gamabuta, having yet to find Naruto worthy of commanding him, is reluctant to help fight for Naruto. Gamakichi, revealed to be Gamabuta's son, encourages the giant toad to accept Naruto due to Naruto's earlier protection of him from Gaara. Upon learning that Naruto helped his son, and that Gaara had picked on a member of the Gama family, Gamabunta decides to help Naruto and unsheathes his equally giant sword. Judging at Gaara, Gamabunta puts all of his might into his sword swing, though he's barely successful at cutting Gaara's arm off. Impressed with Naruto's display of abilities, Gaara emerges from the sand Tanuki's forehead and puts himself to sleep, awakening the personality of the one-tailed Shukaku sealed with Gaara. Now freed from the restraints imposed upon it by Gaara's consciousness, Shukaku is able to use its more devastating abilities, each of which Gamabunta is unable to counter completely. Because toads lack natural weapons such as fangs or claws, Gamabunta asks Naruto to help him transform into something more capable of close combat. Choosing the first animal that comes to mind, Naruto transforms Gamabuta into a giant fox, allowing the latter to bite and tear at Shukaku. With Gamabuta locked in combat with Shukaku, Naruto leaves from Gamabuta's head to that of Shukaku, punching Gaara and waking him up, forcing Shukaku back into submission. With Gaara awake again, his first priority becomes protecting himself from Naruto. As Gaara's sand tries again to encase Naruto, a now untransformed Gamabuta uses his tongue to shield Naruto. Naruto, determined to now defeat Gaara and save Sakura who's running out of time, taps into the Demon Fox's powerful more attack. With chakra radiating from him, Naruto breaks free of Gaara's shackles and charges at Gaara, who manages to use his sand to restrain Naruto's hands and legs. Using the only weapon he has left, Naruto puts all of his energy into a headbutt. Naruto's last desperate attack being right on the mark, Gaara's strength is sapped and the giant Tanuki disintegrates. Gamabuta, worn out by battle, returns home with Gamakichi, though not before complimenting Naruto's outstanding fighting abilities. As the two Genin fall through the air, each manages to land on neighboring treetops and each prepares for what will be their last exchange of blows. Once each is ready, the two leap at one another, their destiny is about to be decided. Back at the stadium, the Journey of Konoha observe the feel of victory, the bodies of Oto and Suna Ninja strewn across the arena. The battle between the third Hokage and Orochimaru has over the past hour not changed, as each is still locked in place. The Kusanagi in the third's back and the soul partially removed from Orochimaru's body. The third, wise as he is, has used his time to come to the conclusion that he no longer has the strength needed to completely remove Orochimaru's soul, and decides to instead make this Orochimaru's last battle. Having the demon of the seal turn its attention to Orochimaru's arms, the third prepares to complete the only seal he can now make. Hoping to break the third's will to go on, Orochimaru reminds his former master of the casualties Konoha has suffered at the hands of his invasion, saying that Konoha will crumble. Disheartened that Orochimaru would so quickly forget the abilities of Konoha's ninja, the third reminds the former student of the Konoha ninja's desire to protect their village. All throughout the village, battles between Konoha's elite and the invading forces rage on, and despite the overwhelming forces united against them, the fighting few of the village utterly defeat the enemy. Determined to prove his point and finally prove to Orochimaru that power does not lie within the knowledge of techniques, the third seals Orochimaru's arms, taking away his ability forevermore of using jutsu. As Orochimaru's arms fall useless to his sides, the third bids his final farewells in unison with Naruto's defeat of Gaara. Naruto and Gaara fall to the earth, and the third Hokage falls over dead with a grin on his face. Enraged that, even in death, the old man could manage to smile, Orochimaru calls for assistance, and Enma, now free, honors his old friend by removing the blade from his back before disappearing. As Orochimaru's subordinates gather their leader and flee, the Jonin in the stadium confront the only two remaining invaders. With Kakashi's encouragement, Kabuto removes his Anbu disguise and whispers to Baki that they should retreat. As the two disappear, other battles conclude. Tamari picks up a defeated Konkuro, Sakura is free from Gaara's sand, and Naruto approaches a defeated Gaara. Fearing that Naruto means to do more harm, Gaara beckons him to stay away. Upon getting close enough, instead of harming Gaara, Naruto displays pity, stating that he too knows the pain of being alone. Naruto, however, was able to find people to nurture his pain and bring him hope, and states that if Gaara ever tries to hurt these people who have brought him happiness, he will again be forced to take action. Gaara, in disbelief, realizes that Naruto's strength comes not from his desire to help himself, but to help those who are dear to him, which begins to change Gaara's outlook on life. Sasuke gathers up Naruto, extremely impressed and jealous of Naruto's display of strength. Likewise, Tamari and Konkuro retrieve a beaten Gaara, who for the first time ever apologizes to them. As the last of the invading Oto and Suna Nin flee the village, the elite of Konoha gather upon the resting spot of their Hokage's body. During the Hokage's funeral a few days later, the ninja of Konoha vowed to remember his sacrifice forever. Search for Tsunade. After their failed invasion of Konoha Kakure, the ninja of Tsunagakure look for their now missing fourth Kazakage. After finding the Kazakage's body and the body of his assistants in the neighboring desert, the people of Tsuna realize that Orochimaru, the man who originally proposed the invasion of the village, killed and impersonated the Kazakage to give the impression of support for the invasion. This revelation, coupled with Tsuna's devastating losses at the hands of Konoha Ninja, forces the village to surrender unconditionally, which Konoha accepts. Konoha Kakure, through having managed to repel the invading forces, was also heavily affected by the invasion as well, losing many of its ninja forces and its third Hokage. Because the village is now without a leader, the village elders approach Jiraiya, one of the third Hokage's former pupils, and ask him to become the fifth Hokage. Jiraiya declines the offer, saying that another one of the third's pupils would be better suited for the job, Tsunade. Because Tsunade's whereabouts are unknown, Jiraiya offers to help go find her with the stipulation that he be allowed to bring Naruto as Maki. The elders agree, and after Jiraiya's promise of teaching him a new jutsu, so does Naruto, and the two head out to find Tsunade. Meanwhile, two outsiders have entered the village and caught the attentions of Asuma Saratobi and Kurana Yuhi. Once confronted about their presence in Konoha, the two reveal themselves to be Kisame Hoshigaki, a renegade ninja from Kirigakure, and Itachi Uchiha, the man who single-handedly murdered the entire Jiha clan. Because the two are wanted criminals, Asuma and Kuranai try to apprehend them through battle, but quickly found themselves outclassed by their enemies. Just as the two Konoha ninja are about to be defeated, Kakashi Harake arrives to save them both, his Sharingan making it easier for him to battle Kisame, so Itachi asks Kisame to step down to let him personally take on Kakashi. Despite Kakashi's own formidable abilities and advanced proficiency with the Sharingan, Itachi quickly proves to be the superior ninja, displaying his far greater speed and superior Sharingan abilities, and Kakashi is only barely able to block his attack. 
attacks. Realizing that Itachi is only using a fraction of his abilities, although he still praises Kakashi for being so skilled with the Sharingan despite not being of Ichiha blood, the moment Itachi activates the Monkey Kyo Sharingan, Kakashi immediately instructs Asuma and Kurenai to close their eyes so as to avoid falling prey to Itachi's ultimate technique. Because Kakashi has a Sharingan, he believes he will be able to withstand Itachi's jutsu, only to be swiftly proven wrong as Itachi's Tsukiyomi quickly overpowers Kakashi's Sharingan and renders him helpless. With the little strength he has, Kakashi asks why the two have come to Konoha, which Itachi replies that they're after the fourth Hokage's legacy, Naruto Uzumaki. Remembering what Jiraiya told him earlier, Kakashi recognized their reason as their organization, Akatsuki's goal to gain the power of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox sealed with the Naruto. Because of Kakashi's knowledge of their organization and its motives, Itachi instructs Kisame to kill Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurenai. Before Kisame can land a fatal blow, however, Might Guy appears and repels Kisame. With Guy's arrival, Kakashi collapses, exhausted from Itachi's previous attack. Itachi, recognizing Guy as a threat as well as the fact that reinforcements are on their way, leaves with Kisame, wanting to avoid starting a war. Taking Kakashi away to rest, Guy, Asuma, and Kurenai decide that it'd be best if Sasuke Uchiha, Itachi's brother, didn't know that Itachi had returned. When Sasuke arrives to find out what had put Kakashi in the state he's in, the truth of Itachi's return in the search for Naruto slips out when Aoba accidentally spills the truth. Sasuke, having an everlasting desire to kill his brother due to the latter's murder of their entire family and also wanted to protect Naruto, runs off in search of Naruto. Meanwhile, Jiraiya and Naruto arrive at a nearby town's hotel with a rest for the night. Jiraiya, being a pervert through and through, notices an attractive woman that's showing interest in him. So that he can get acquainted with the woman, Jiraiya sends Naruto up to their room. As Naruto sits on his bed cursing Jiraiya, someone knocks at the door. Thinking it's an already rejected Jiraiya, Naruto opens the door, finding instead Kisame and Itachi. Perplexed by Itachi's Sharingan and the two's knowledge of the demon fox within him, Naruto leaves the safety of the room to find out what's going on. As Kisame readies his sword to cut off Naruto's leg, thereby making him easier to carry, Sasuke arrives, vowing to kill Itachi. To act on his promise, Sasuke prepares his Chidori and lunges at Itachi. Before Sasuke can land a blow, Itachi grabs and crushes his arm, sending the attack into a nearby wall. To help Sasuke, Naruto taps into the demon fox's chakra, ready to summon a toad to help in battle. Kisame's sword, however, absorbs Naruto's chakra, preventing him from using any jutsu. As Kisame again prepares to cut off Naruto's leg, a toad appears to block the attack, with Jiraiya appearing behind Naruto. Scolding Itachi and Kisame for not doing proper research on him, Jiraiya explains that he's much better at getting women than they are at getting him, though Naruto dismisses that that's a bad excuse for his pervertedness. Realizing that Itachi put the girl under a genjutsu to draw him away, Jiraiya learns for certain that the two really are after Naruto. As Jiraiya proclaims that he'll kill the two, Sasuke rises, repeating that he'll be the one to kill Itachi. Having no interest in their brotherly quarrel, Itachi kicks Sasuke aside and proceeds to beat him into submission. Once Sasuke is unable to fight back, astounded by how much he's still at class by his older brother, Itachi uses Tsukiyomi to show Sasuke the murder of their parents while also mocking him for lacking the hate needed to be strong enough. As Naruto makes to help Sasuke and Kisame makes to stop Naruto, Jiraiya encases the area in a layer of a sticky substance, preventing anyone from moving. Knowing that they cannot win, Itachi and Kisame flee, though not before Jiraiya attempts to further ensnare them with his jutsu. Surprised that they are successful in escaping, Jiraiya finds that a black flame was used to destroy his normally impenetrable technique. With Itachi and Kisame gone, Naruto checks up on Sasuke, whose mind has been broken by his own brother. At that moment, Guy arrives and kicks Jiraiya in the face, having mistaken him for an enemy. After Guy apologizes, he informs Jiraiya that Kakashi is in the same state as Sasuke, and that nothing can be done to help him recover. As Guy takes Sasuke back to Konoha to rest, Jiraiya realizes that only Tsunade can help Kakashi and Sasuke, strengthening his resolve to find her. Because Akatsuki will henceforth be after Naruto, Jiraiya decides to start teaching Naruto the technique that is supposedly stronger than Sasuke's Chidori, the Rasengan, the jutsu that took the fourth Hokage three years to master. As the pair goes from place to place in search of Tsunade, Naruto rapidly progresses through the Rasengan's leaning steps, coming up with a number of shortcuts along the way. Just as Naruto gets to the final stages of learning the jutsu, Jiraiya learns of Tsunade's location, and the two go out to meet her. Meanwhile, Orochimaru is suffering from his last encounter with the third Okage, his arms unable to perform jutsu and constantly bringing him pain at the same time. Knowing that his assistant, Kabuto Yakushi's medicine, will do nothing to help him, Orochimaru concludes that the only person who can restore his arms is Tsunade. Knowing where Tsunade is currently located, he and Kabuto go to find her. Elsewhere, Tsunade, an avid and very unlucky gambler, hits a winning streak, indicating to her that something bad is about to happen, and as such, she tries to flee the city. Her assistant, Shizune, asks Tsunade if they can go and see the local landmarks first, which Tsunade reluctantly agrees. As Shizune admires an ancient castle, with Tsunade repeatedly asking her to hurry up, the castle collapses, and from the rubble emerges Orochimaru and Kabuto riding a giant snake. Unhappy to see her old teammate, Tsunade refuses to heal Orochimaru, deducing what his ailment is from his appearance alone. After Kabuto states that only Tsunade can help Orochimaru, Tsunade inquires how he got the injury, recognizing it as being far above an average wound. Nonchalantly, Orochimaru explains that it was nothing more than his own carelessness when he was killing the third Hokage, the revelation of which shocks Shizune and Tsunade. Noting the expressions on the two's faces, Orochimaru comments that all people die and reminds Tsunade of her two deceased loved ones. This observation enrages Shizune, who attempts to strike Orochimaru, though Kabuto blocks the attack. After calming Shizune down and casually scolding Orochimaru for what he said, Tsunade punches the wall next to it, reducing it to gravel, and vows to kill him if he ever says it again. After repeating her refusal to help Orochimaru, Tsunade prepares to fight them in the event that they won't leave. Just as she's about to attack, Orochimaru offers to revive her dead brother and lover if she helps him, stopping Tsunade before she can act. Finally considering the offer, Tsunade asks what Orochimaru will do if his arms are healed, to which he replies he will destroy Konoha. Elsewhere, Jiraiya and Naruto have arrived in the city, and the two visit Tsunade's last known location. When they hear reports of a giant snake destroying a castle, Jiraiya recognizes this is one of Orochimaru's acts, and as such, 
Sakusai rushes to the castle. Shizune, meanwhile, is infuriated by Orochimaru's proposal of destroying Konoha and tries to persuade Tsunade in helping her kill the weakened Orochimaru. Although Tsunade refuses, Orochimaru sheds some of his own blood to make sure she keeps her word, knowing Tsunade suffers from a fear of blood. With Tsunade forced into submission by the sight of blood, Orochimaru gives her a week to consider his offer, and he and Kabuto disappear. When Jirai and Naruto arrive at the scene, Tsunade and Shizune have already left. Deciding to give up on the search for the day, Jiraiya takes Naruto to a local bar for dinner, where he surprisingly finds Tsunade and Shizune already having theirs. As Naruto eats his dinner, Jiraiya asks Tsunade what Orochimaru wanted from her, to which she replies nothing, quickly changing the subject to what Jiraiya wants from her. As he tells her that Konoha needs her to be the next Hokage, Naruto begins to choke on his food with surprise, and Tsunade and Shizune use as a confirmation that Orochimaru really had killed the third Hokage. Tsunade declines the position, saying that only a fool would become Hokage, and goes on to ridicule the past Hokages. Tsunade's words anger Naruto, spurring him into attempting to strike her, though Jiraiya holds him back. Impressed that Naruto was willing to challenge her, Tsunade offers to fight him, going so far as to say she'll only use one finger. After the two step outside, Naruto charges at Tsunade with a kunai in hand, though Tsunade is able to take it from him, use it to remove his forehead protector, and launch him backwards with the promised single finger. Tsunade, expecting Naruto to pass out from her attack, asks why being Hokage is such a sensitive subject for Naruto, to which he replies that becoming Hokage is his dream. As he says so, Tsunade sees in Naruto her dead brother and lover, both of whom would want to be Hokage, and both of whom look similar to Naruto. While Tsunade is momentarily off balance, Naruto uses the opportunity to use his still to be mastered Rasengan on Tsunade. Recognizing the technique and the danger it imposes, Tsunade slams her finger into the ground, creating a large fissure that Naruto falls into, forcing the Rasengan into the ground. Noticing that Naruto's version of the jutsu is dramatically weaker than what it was capable of doing, Tsunade proposes a bet with Naruto. If he can amass the Rasengan in a week, she'll give him her grandfather, the first Hokage's necklace, something she claims that could buy three mountains. If he can't, she gets all the money in his wallet. Naruto accepts the offer and goes off to the hotel with Shizune while Tsunade and Jiraiya chat over drinks. During the discussion, Jiraiya reveals that he's aware that Tsunade has some sort of deal with Orochimaru, though he doesn't know what it is. He goes on to say, however, that if Tsunade helps Orochimaru with whatever it is that he wants, he will kill her as a traitor of Konoha. Looking to change the subject, Tsunade asks why Jiraiya brought Naruto with him, to which he replies that Naruto looks remarkably similar to Tsunade's dead brother, Nawaki. Meanwhile, at the hotel, Shizune explains Naruto the history of Tsunade's necklace, and how Tsunade had given it to each her brother and her lover, Dan, in turn in the hopes that it would help them achieve their goals of becoming Hokage. Soon after receiving the necklace, however, each of them died a bloody death, giving Tsunade a fear of blood and leading many to believe that the necklace was cursed. After hearing the story, Naruto leaves to finish his training, determined to prove that when he wins the necklace, he really will become a Hokage. But the next week, Naruto trains, and each day he puts larger and larger dents into the trees he's training with, indicating that Rasengan is getting more powerful. All the while, Tsunade watches him in the background, remembering her dead loved ones and contemplating the offer Orochimaru gave her. On the final day, Naruto doesn't return home at his usual time, and Shizune goes to see what happened to him. After finding the tree to be broken and Naruto passed out on the ground, Shizune takes him home to rest. At the same time, Jiraiya and Tsunade meet again for drinks and discuss Naruto's progress. While Jiraiya is not looking, Tsunade subs a powder into his drink, and after drinking it, he passes out. Tsunade returns to the hotel to see if Naruto has perfected the jutsu and only finds him in bed, causing him to realize what a ridiculous bet it was that she had made. Shizune, meanwhile, pleads for Tsunade not to go through with Orochimaru's deal, willing to kill herself in order to stop her. Tsunade knocks Shizune unconscious and leaves to meet Orochimaru. As Orochimaru and Kabuto head towards the meeting place, Orochimaru comments that it may be easy to persuade Tsunade to heal his arms if Shizune weren't around, and so Kabuto heads off to kill her. Naruto, meanwhile, wakes Shizune up having found her on the floor. Realizing what happened, Shizune rushes to the window to go after Tsunade, but a weakened Jiraiya stops her before she can leave. Cursing Tsunade for drugging his drink, Jiraiya explains that the drug makes it difficult for him to move and that he can't control Chakra very well. Kabuto watches the conversation in the background, and knowing that he can't take on Shizune, Jiraiya, and to his surprise, Naruto by himself, leaves to report to Orochimaru. Jiraiya notices Kabuto's departure and asks what deal Tsunade made with Orochimaru. Along the way to the meeting spot, Shizune explains the offer, and Jiraiya realizes that he may need to kill Tsunade. Tsunade and Orochimaru, meanwhile, meet at the site of their last conversation, and Tsunade agrees to heal Orochimaru's arms if he promises to leave Konoha alone. Orochimaru agrees to the stipulation, and Tsunade approaches him, preparing her healing jutsu. Before she can make contact with Orochimaru, Kabuto appears and throws a kunai between them, forcing the two to separate. Orochimaru, realizing what Kabuto has done, asks why after coming so far, Tsunade was betraying him. Kabuto notes that because both he and Tsunade are medic nin, he could notice the subtle amounts of killing intent within her jutsu. Orochimaru laments Tsunade's decision, even saying that he really had intended to stay away from Konoha. Tsunade dismisses this as a lie, yet says she's been willing to believe it if it meant she could see her loved ones again. Because of Naruto, however, the dreams of Nawaki and Dan returned to her, and thus she couldn't bring herself to turn a blind eye to Orochimaru's goals of effectively destroying the hopes that they had had. With that, Tsunade attempts to attack Orochimaru, though because of his timely dodge, her attack misses, creating a large crater where he had been. As Orochimaru prepares to fight Tsunade, he comments that he never battled her before. Although Kabuto quickly questions this observation since he would actually be the one who will fight her. As Kabuto informs Orochimaru of Jiraiya's presence, they lead Tsunade away, not wanting to fight in the city in case Jiraiya shows up. After retreating to an empty field, Kabuto and Tsunade begin their fight. Because Kabuto isn't very good at taijutsu, Tsunade's specialty, he resorts to using his mystical palm technique to give his attacks an extra boost in strength. Although Tsunade is initially able to avoid many of his attacks, her old age causes her to tire quickly, allowing Kabuto to catch her off guard and strike. Because of the nature of his mystical palm technique, Kabuto is able to sever some of Tsunade's muscles upon contact, preventing her from moving. Using this to his advantage, Kabuto punches her in the chest, which also allows him to sever some of her respiratory muscles, making it difficult for her to breathe. Thinking this should be enough to force Tsunade into submission, Kabuto begins to gloat at its success. 
Tsunade, her large breasts having weakened Kabuto's attack, uses his cockiness to her advantage by striking him in the neck, forcing him to the ground. As he attempts to get up, Kabuto discovers that Tsunade's attack disrupted the electric currents of his nervous system, causing his hand to move when he tries to stand up. With Kabuto unable to move, Tsunade heals her injuries. As she does so, Kabuto begins to compensate for Tsunade's last attack, learning what actions lead to what outcomes. After regaining the ability to move 80% of his body, Kabuto gets up, surprising Tsunade due to his rapid ability to adapt. Just as Kabuto is about to attack a steel healing Tsunade, Naruto, Jiraiya, and Shizune appear before him, blocking the way. Tsunade is unappreciative of the group's arrival and pushes pushes Jiraiya to the ground so she can charge at Kabuto. Before she can commence an attack on Kabuto, however, Kabuto slits his wrists, covering Tsunade with blood and causing her to become paralyzed with fear. With Tsunade incapacitated, Kabuto punches her away, leaving Shizune to catch Tsunade and take her aside to recover. Naruto, meanwhile, tries to understand why Kabuto, a person he had befriended during the Chunin exams and had believed to be a ninja of Konoha, is fighting against Tsunade with an Otogakure forehead protector on. To help Naruto out, Kabuto explains he was a spy for Orochimaru who entered the Chunin exams to gather information on Sasuke Uchiha, a person he claims is far more talented than Naruto. Enraged by Kabuto's treachery, Naruto creates a number of shadow clones to help him attack Kabuto from the side of his injured hand. As Naruto closes in, however, Kabuto uses the blood seeping from his wrist to blind the Narutos, allowing him to easily defeat them all. Shizune, using Kabuto's distraction to her advantage, launches a poisonous needle at Kabuto, although Kabuto is able to block it in time by having the needle deflect off his forehead protector. Returning to Orochimaru's side, Kabuto takes a pill to stop his bleeding. As he does so, Jiraiya hands out assignments. He will fight Orochimaru, Shizune will fight Kabuto, Naruto will protect Tsunade while she recovers. With that, Jiraiya and Kabuto, with Orochimaru's assistance, perform the summoning technique, allowing Kabuto to summon two giant snakes while Jiraiya, still in his drugged condition, can only manage to summon Gamakichi. As Orochimaru ridicules Jiraiya for failing to summon anything formidable, his attention is brought to Naruto, who is giving his own attempt at a summon. Just as Orochimaru considers whether he should have killed Naruto when they first met due to how formidable the power of the demon fox could be, Naruto summons Gamatatsu, causing Orochimaru's worries to vanish. Orochimaru and Kabuto charge their respective opponents, each riding upon a different snake. Jiraiya uses his swamp of the underworld on Orochimaru, though in his drug state he is only able to submerge the snake in a shallow swamp. No longer able to use the snake, Orochimaru charges at Jiraiya, lengthening his neck so we can get close enough to bite the others. In response, Jiraiya creates a defense by extending the hair on its head and turning it into spikes, creating a stalemate between the two. Shizune, meanwhile, battles with Kabuto, but Kabuto is able to evade her attacks and burrow beneath her, allowing him to sever the muscles in her ankles and causing her to collapse. At the same time, Naruto deals with Kabuto's snakes, escaping from its mouth only briefly enough for it to fall upon his leg, pinning him in place. As Tsunade regains her senses, she finds Shizune and Naruto lying on the ground, defeated. Remembering the deaths of Nawaki and Dan, she attempts to defend herself against the approaching Kabuto, though he easily starts to beat her into submission. Just as he's about to give her a finishing blow, Naruto appears in front of Tsunade, blocking Kabuto's punch with his forehead protector. Surprised by Naruto's sudden intervention, Kabuto was left momentarily stunned. Using this to his advantage, Naruto tries to use the Rasengan on Kabuto, but because of the slow sweeping motion that Naruto puts into the attack, Kabuto is easily able to avoid it. As Naruto lays on the ground due to his lack of speed, Kabuto taunts him by detailing how talentless he is and how hopeless his dreams are. As he does so, Tsunade sees these insults as applying to Nawaki and Dan, and remembers her earlier words of a similar meaning to Naruto. As Naruto rebuts these claims, he reminds Tsunade of the bet they had and how she will need to give him her necklace, and then proceeds to create a shadow clone. As Kabuto charges towards Naruto with the kunai in tow, Tsunade begs Naruto to run so he can accomplish his dreams, but Naruto simply stands his ground. In doing so, Naruto allows Kabuto to attack him, although he blocks the worst of it by catching the kunai with his hand. As Naruto grabs a hold of Kabuto's hand, he begins to create a Rasengan with his free hand and uses a shadow clone for assistance in its creation. Once completed, Naruto forces the sphere into Kabuto's stomach, the latter unable to avoid it. With only enough time to clutch Naruto's chest, Kabuto is hurled back by the attack and into a rock. As the dust settles, Kabuto emerges with a deep wound in his gut, though it immediately begins to heal as a result of the chakra he gathered in his abdomen just before the attack. Although the exterior damage is almost completely healed, Kabuto collapses from the internal injuries caused by Naruto's attack. His chakra reserves too low to fully heal. Kabuto's last attempt at defeating Naruto, however, proves to be effective as Naruto passes out. As Tsunade rushes to his side to investigate, she finds that Kabuto weakened Naruto's heart muscles, giving him an erratic heartbeat. Tsunade desperately tries to heal him in an attempt to not only save Naruto, but also in an attempt to save Nawaki and Dan's dream. As she does so, the demon fox within Naruto notices the fading life force of its host and contributes its power in an attempt to save Naruto and in turn itself. As Tsunade continues her healing effort, a tired Naruto comes to and grabs her necklace, claiming it is his. After he slips into a tired sleep, Tsunade puts her necklace around his neck, hoping just once more that its wearer will someday become Hokage. Orochimaru, having just witnessed Naruto's potential, worries about what may happen if Naruto ever falls into the hands of the Akatsuki and decides to kill Naruto in his weakened state. After throwing Jiraiya to the ground, Orochimaru lunges at Naruto with his Kusanagi sword sticking out of his mouth. Tsunade, realizing Orochimaru's intended target, leaps in front of Naruto as a human shield, allowing the sword to impale her through the heart. As Orochimaru tells Tsunade that he had intended to kill her, Tsunade replies that she won't let anything happen to Naruto. As Orochimaru removes his sword from the blood-trembling Tsunade, he questions why she would save Naruto, to which she replies that she's protecting Konoha but protecting Naruto, the future Hokage. As Orochimaru ridicules the title for its holder's willingness to sacrifice their lives for the prosperity of Konoha, Tsunade states that she too will sacrifice her life for the same reason. Disappointed that Tsunade would waste her life in such a way, Orochimaru slashes her across the chest and she falls to the ground. Believing Tsunade to be at the very least out of the fight, Orochimaru makes for a finishing blow on Naruto, though Tsunade blocks the attack again. Upon falling to the ground in fatigue, Tsunade's trembling stops, her fear of blood finally overcome. 
As she rises, Tsunade throws Orochimaru back, explaining that her commitment to protect Naruto is because she is henceforth the fifth Hokage. As her first order of business, Tsunade activates the seal on her forehead to completely regenerate the wounds induced by Orochimaru. Realizing that Tsunade is now back in top shape, Orochimaru retreats to Kabuto for assistance. In unison, Orochimaru, Tsunade, and Jirai use the summoning technique, summoning Manda, Katsuyu, and Gamabunta respectively. As Gamabunta expresses excitement in finally getting the chance to kill Manda, Manda reprimands Orochimaru for not having any human sacrifices ready for him. After Jiraiya and Tsunade denounce Orochimaru as their comrade and give him promises of death, the final battle begins. Katsuyu starts the fight by spitting some of her acid at Manda, the latter of which quickly evades the attack. Using Katsuyu's vulnerability between attacks to his advantage, Manda wraps himself around Katsuyu and prepares to bite the giant slug. Before he can do so, however, Gambuta forces his sword between Manda's jaws, saving Katsuyu from the snake bite. Still having Katsuyu in his clutches, Manda tightens the hold of her in an attempt to suffocate her, but she breaks apart into a number of smaller slugs in order to escape the attack. As she regenerates, Manda throws Gambuta around, allowing the toad to, with the help of Jiraiya, engulf Manda in an enormous cloud of fire. When the smoke clears, Manda's shed skin is all that can be found, the real snake in the process of burrowing underneath Gambabunta. Although Gambabunta is able to catch Manda's tail, Manda is able to get behind the giant toad and prepares to bite the ladder. Before he can do so, however, Tsunade appears the Gamabuta's sword and toe and forces it through Manda's mouth to keep it shut. Orochimaru, hoping to even the playing field, extends his tongue towards Tsunade in an attempt to break her neck, but Tsunade uses the tongue to her advantage by using it to bring Orochimaru to her. After connecting her fist with Orochimaru's jaw, Tsunade allows the defeated Orochimaru to crash to the ground. Manda, disgusted with Orochimaru for losing, promises that if he could open his mouth, he'd eat him, and disappears after promising to do so next time they meet. As Manda departs, Orochimaru frees his tongue from Tsunade's grasp and returns to Kabuto's side, where he says there's still one way to get his arms back, the mask covering the face of the body he had stolen peeling away. With a promise to destroy Konoha, Orochimaru disappears with Kabuto. After returning to the city and Naruto's recovery, Jiraiya, Tsunade, Shizune, and Naruto have lunch at the same bar they met at only a week earlier. After learning that Tsunade had taken the title of 5th Hokage, Naruto begins to find her inadequate for the position, listing all the ways that the 3rd Hokage was better than her. Angered by his words, Tsunade tells Naruto to step outside so the two can fight, where Tsunade once again says she'll only need one finger. As Naruto charges at her, she once again removes his forehead protector and prepares to strike up with one finger. Fearing the outcome of the strike, Naruto closes his eyes. To his surprise, however, Tsunade kisses his forehead rather than hitting him, telling him to become a good man. After Naruto agrees, the group heads back to Konoha. Upon their return, Naruto heard that the village of Konoha must continue their missions as normal. Iruka explained to Naruto over a bowl of ramen, of course, that they must not show other villages that they were currently weak. So they must do as many missions as they had done before Orochimaru's invasion, even though their strength had been cut in half. Tsunade was well known as a great medical nin, so she healed Sasuke and Kakashi of their ailments received during the fight with Itachi. She visited Lee, who was badly injured from his fight with Gar in the Chunin exam preliminary round, after persistent nagging for many characters, and told him that he should give up on being a ninja. There were fragments of bone in his spine, and the one operation that could be done, and could only be done by her, had a 50% chance of either curing or killing him. Naruto and Konohamaru walked down the street when they overheard Shizune talking to Tsunade. They heard the fifth Okage state her concern and her motivation to help Lee. This convinced Konohamaru that Tsunade really was a good replacement for his grandfather. Just minutes before Tsunade was inaugurated as the fifth Okage in front of the villagers, Shizune stumbled upon an open book on Tsunade's desk. It showed a series of mathematical equations surrounded by a chart of a body. 50% was written and crossed out, followed by an arrow pointing to a circle which contained 58%, and Shizune could only smile. Sasuke Recovery Mission Naruto's influence on Sasuke, though profound, was powerless to prevent Sasuke from leaving his village and friends to receive training from Rojimaru. Sasuke's decision to leave was the result of a chain of events that rekindles hatred for his brother and his desire to avenge his clan. To do so, he must claim a great amount of power, which became the center of his entire life. Humiliated by Itachi's declaration that he was disappointingly weak and aware of the fact that Naruto might be superior, Sasuke challenged Naruto to a fight after Naruto returned to Konoha. They engaged in a heated duel on the rooftop of the hospital where Naruto told Sasuke that he had never considered himself inferior to Sasuke. Kakashi leapt in to stop the fight when Naruto and Sasuke were about to use their Rasengan and Chidori on each other, reflecting both their attacks into adjacent water towers. While Sasuke Chidori made a larger dent in the front of the water tower than Naruto's Rasengan, Sasuke was shocked to find that the back of Naruto's water tank had been completely blown up with the power of his Rasengan. Sasuke realized that he might have lost the fight and received major injuries if Kakashi hadn't stopped the fight. This only made Sasuke even angry that Naruto was getting stronger with the day and could actually be able to defeat him in battle. Ever since the Chunin exams and the fight against Gar of the Sand Waterfall, Sasuke had felt that Naruto had been improving immensely. Naruto only wanted recognition from Sasuke, recognition that he'd really got stronger. However, Sasuke would never recognize Naruto because by doing so, he would also have to admit that he was weaker than him. Despite a lecture from Kakashi about the pointlessness of revenge, the appearance of Orochimaru's sound four with an offer of greater powers and yet another humiliating pummeling tipped Sasuke over the edge. Sasuke went to leave the village that night but was distracted by Sakura, who then tried to convince him not to leave Konoha. During this conversation, a crying and desperate Sakura confessed her love to Sasuke and begged him not to leave the village, but he rejected her. Once she realized that he was going to leave either way, she offered to go with him to enact his revenge, which she refused. After a long resort, Sasuke threatened to scream and alert the village guards if Sasuke left, and finally, having hit a nerve, Sasuke moved from several feet in front of Sakura to directly behind her in a flash of speed. He sincerely thanks her for everything she has done for him thus far before knocking her unconscious and laying her on a nearby bench, then leaving the village. A five-man squad was gathered by Shigamaru, including himself, Kiba, Naruto, Choji, and Neji. Naruto also recommends Shino, however, Shino was on a special mission with his father at the time. Sakura arrives just before they're leaving and explains while crying that she failed to stop Sasuke, and asks Naruto, who she believes to be the only one capable of doing so, to do it as a once-in-a-lifetime request. Naruto makes a lifetime promise to her to bring Sasuke back to the village. They easily caught up to the Sound Four, who were escorting Sasuke to Orochimaru. Strategies were not used, rather the team split up. The same happening on the part of the Sound 4, they dropped people one by one, and Choji ended up fighting Jiroba by himself. Using two of these secret pills of the Akamichi clan, Choji was able to increase his ch
After getting his revenge on Jirobo for eating the last chip and calling him fat, Choji put all of his chakra and power into his fist and killed Jirobo for insulting his best friend, Shikamaru. Next, Neji ended up fighting Kitamaru. Kitamaru had trouble at short range since Neji's Byakugan and Gentle Fist were too powerful to penetrate. Kitamaru ended up fighting from long range, but the battle was locked in his stalemate until Kitamaru discovered a weakness of the Byakugan. It has a blind spot behind Neji's first thoracic vertebrae. Knowing that he would be hit in the area, Neji intentionally allowed Kitamaru to hit him with a powerful arrow, to which Kitamaru had affixed a chakra string to ensure accuracy. However, Neji used the chakra string to use his gentle fist to damage Kitamaru's internal organs. Neji then caught up with Kitamaru, used his eight trigrams to close Kitamaru's Tenketsu, chakra points. Kitamaru died shortly after. Neji was left in a critical state after the fight. Shikamaru was matched up with Tayuya, while Kiba and Akamaru with Sakon and Ukon. Kiba and Akamaru did an amazing tag team on Sakon, but Sakon split with Ukon right before Kiba and Akamaru could lay a devastating blow. Sakon and Ukon activated their cursed seals to level 2, which made them far too powerful for Kiba and Akamaru to cope with. Meanwhile, Shikamaru, despite all his prowess forming strategies, simply couldn't kill Tayuya because of his sheer force. He managed to use a shadow imitation technique in her three summons, but she quickly dispelled the both. Then he caught her in a shadow imitation technique, then hit shadow neck binding technique, while at the same time, Akamaru got injured and Kiba refusing to leave him. Without Akamaru to do the combination attacks, however, Kiba and Akamaru were forced to retreat. Kiba was forced to stab himself in order to escape, and Shikamaru, for the first time, couldn't come up with any ideas to defeat Toyuya, and was forced to keep his shadow neck binding technique on her. Finally, Shikamaru and Kiba were ready to accept their deaths. However, before the finishing strikes could be executed, the Saiyan Ninja arrived to help. Right before Shikamaru and Kibo were about to die, they were aided by Tamari and Konkuro, respectively, who had been ordered to help the Konoha Ninja. Konkuro's puppets were unaffected by Sakon and Ukon's ability to fuse with cells. When Sakon arrived, he attempted to do the same thing he had almost done with Kiba, but Konkuro turned out to be his new puppet, Kuroari, to injure Sakon, forcing him to fuse back and Ukon to take over. Konkuro then trapped Sakon and Ukon inside his puppet, Kuroari. Konkuro then used Karasu to stab them through holes in Kuroari, and used Karasu and Kuroari to do a devastating and deadly combo, Black Secret Technique Machine One Shot, thus killing the brothers. Meanwhile, since Toyuya used Sand to attack, Tamari's wind was a natural enemy. Tamari used her sickle weasel technique, which blew away Tayuya and cut her flute in half. Shikamaru uses time to tell Tamari about Tayuya's strategies. After a while, Tayuya fixed her flute and was ready to kill Shikamaru and Tamari. But Tamari used her summoning technique and used summoning quick beheading dance, and was able to kill Tayuya by destroying an entire tract of forest in which the sliced debris crushed the ladder. Last, Kimimaro, who was stronger than all the sound four combined, came to aid the escort mission. At first, he was faced with Naruto, but even Naruto's massive amounts of shadow clones proved to be no match for Kimimaru, whose taijutsu skills were more than a match for Naruto's superior numbers. Naruto even used the nine tailed demon fox's chakra, but was still losing. During the fight, Sasuke emerged from the coffin, which caused Naruto to return to normal and begin wondering why Sasuke was with the Sound 4. Naruto began urging Sasuke to return home with him, stating how everyone was worried about Sasuke. Unfortunately, Sasuke, who had fallen deeper into darkness, responded by cackling madly before fleeing with Naruto, calling Sasuke's name. Kimimaro attempted to kill Naruto, but was stopped by Rock Lee, allowing Naruto to chase after Sasuke while Lee fought Kimimaro. Both Lee and Kimimaro were taijutsu experts, but since Lee had only recently recovered from his surgery, he was not in top shape. Lee drank some sake that he thought was medicine and became intoxicated, and began fighting with the drunken fist style. With this added unpredictability, Lee gained an upper hand against Kimimaro. However, he clearly had no idea what he was doing, who he was fighting, and why he felt so drunk. After a while, Kimimaro was forced to do his dance with the Camellia, but Rock Lee then appeared to be virtually invincible and laid a devastating blow to Kimimaro. Seeing that there was no chance of him defeating Lee in his present state, Kimimaro used his curse seal level 1 and overpowered Lee, manifesting his horrific ability to manipulate all his bones at will. Not only this, but Lee began to sober up. Lee would have been killed if Gara had not arrived in time and used his sand to protect him. For obvious reasons, Kimimaro was at a disadvantage since Gara was capable of blocking all physical attacks and Kimimaro could only use physical attacks. However, like the Sound 4, Kimimaro was able to get past Gara's defense and offense by sheer force. Kimimaro's bones were so tough they simply forced their way through Gara's sand. Even Sand Waterfall Funeral and other crushing forces couldn't bring him down, as he created a film of bone beneath his skin to protect himself. Kimimaro would have defeated and killed Gara with his last attack, but before Kimimaro could finish Gara, his terminal illness ended his life. Naruto caught up with Sasuke and began battling. Sasuke's cursed seal of heaven, which had been powered up by a pill given to him by the Sound 4, this is why he was in the coffin, gave Sasuke inhuman strength, which he used to reduce Naruto to almost ragdoll levels. Meanwhile, Sasuke recalled his experience with Itachi and his parents up to the point of the Uchiha clan downfall. It was in these moments that the Mangekyo Sharingan and how Itachi obtained it by killing his best friend Shisui Uchiha was revealed. It was also revealed that Itachi had encouraged Sasuke to gain the Mangekyo Sharingan, which he claimed to be the only way to exact revenge on Itachi by any means necessary, and this became Sasuke's motivation for killing Naruto, who he claimed to be his best friend. Back in Konoha, Kakashi Harake brought up to speed on the situation, summoned his Ninken, including Paku, to track down Naruto and Sasuke. Meanwhile, Naruto and Sasuke unleashed their Rasengan and Chidori respectively, causing each other to fly backwards. Activating his cursed seal, Sasuke uses his enhanced speed and strength to overcome Naruto and strike him with the Chidori. Naruto managed to block the attack, but Sasuke, still intent on killing Naruto, tried to strangle Naruto, only to have himself thrown aside by a Nine Tails powered opponent. With his enhanced abilities, Naruto was able to easily overwhelm Sasuke, all the while trying to reason with him, only to have Sasuke ultimately reject his efforts. Despite this, Sasuke finally admitted that they were fighting as equals. In this moment, Sasuke's Sharingan finally matured, enabling him to predict Naruto's movements and once again turn the tables. Upset by Naruto's persistence, Sasuke
Sasuke knocked him unconscious with Peregrine Falcon Drop. The Nine Tails, probably to save itself, gave Naruto even more of its chakra, creating for the first time Naruto's one-tailed transformation, complete with the Demon Fox Cloak that surrounds him. With one arm of the cloak, Naruto unleashed powerful short and long-range attacks, which Sasuke, even with the Sharingan Gun, was unable to keep up with. Feeling he had no choice, Sasuke increased his Cursed Seal of Heaven to level 2, once again evening the playing field. Both Sasuke and Naruto realized the cost of their respective abilities at that point, but both decided they had no other choice. Sasuke revealed the location of their fight was the Valley of the End, and determining the end of the battle, forced the use of the third Jidori. Naruto created using one hand and the Demon Fox Cloak's Chakra as a shell, the Demon Fox Rasengan. Sasuke's Chidori, after a moment, warped into the Flapping Chidori. The two ninjas collided their attacks. Sasuke, planning to punch Naruto in the heart, deliberately missed and targeted the gut instead, while Naruto, referring to one of Sasuke's insults, scratched his forehead protector. A black dome of energy formed around them, which eventually dissipated, reeling the two ninjas as their current forms and then as their younger selves, who held hands and smiled at each other. When the dust settled, Sasuke was revealed to be victorious. Sasuke pondered whether or not to kill an unconscious Naruto, but decided to leave in the end. Kakashi took Naruto back to Konoha. At the same time, Sasuke decided to gain the power to kill Itachi in his own way, through Orochimaru, as he walked off to Otogakure. It was then revealed that Akatsuki member Zetsu had been watching the fight the whole time. As Kakashi took Naruto back to Konoha, several medical men appeared to update him on the situation, and to take care of Naruto and Sasuke, which Kakashi deemed unnecessary for obvious reasons in both cases. Neji and Choji both underwent intensive medical treatment, both were successfully healed thanks to the Nara clan's medical tome, Tsunade's medical prowess, and Shizune and a team of medical men. Kiba and Akamaru were also here to their moderate injuries under the care of Hana Inazuka, his elder sister. Shikamaru, with only his finger injured, decided to end his ninja career, as he put his team's life in danger and the mission failed regardless. But Shikaku convinced him to persevere. Sasuke was shown walking with Orochimaru and Kabuto in one of Orochimaru's lairs. Shikamaru paid Naruto a visit in his room, while Sakura decided to visit Naruto and Sasuke only to be severely disappointed by Naruto's failure to bring Sasuke back, as she overheard Naruto and Shikamaru's conversation. Naruto, however, declared his intent to keep to the original promise, to which Sakura gratefully responded. After her visit to Naruto, Sakura, realizing how useless she had been in keeping Sasuke and Konoha, requested for Tsunade to take her on as her apprentice, to which Tsunade consented. Naruto's next visitor was Jiraiya, who revealed that Orochimaru had already taken a body before Sasuke arrived, so he had to wait another three years to take another body, and tried to convince Naruto to give up on Sasuke, based on his similar experience with Orochimaru. Naruto, however, refused to quit his efforts. Jiraiya, who figured it pointless to change Naruto's mind, decided to train Naruto for two and a half years, to prepare Naruto for the Akatsuki, which Naruto readily accepted. After recovering and having one last bowl of ramen with Iruka, Naruto finally set off with Jiraiya to begin his training, vowing to become strong enough to free Sasuke from Orochimaru when he returned. Kazukage Rescue Mission To prepare for the eventual confrontation with both Akatsuki and Orochimaru, Naruto left the village and underwent intensive training under Jiraiya. At the same time, Sakura became Tsunade's apprentice and Sasuke trained under Orochimaru. Thus, the three members of the original Team 7 were now training individually under each of the legendary Sanin. When Naruto returned to the village two and a half years later, he was reacquainted with his friends, who had all risen in rank in his absence. Most of his comrades had since become Chunin, Kankuro and Tamari became Jonin, as well as Neji. Gara had even become the fifth Kazakage. Meanwhile, Naruto is the only Genin left aside from Sasuke, who never became a Chunin because of his leaving the village and becoming a missing nin. Jiraiya left Naruto with Kakashi Hatake, and along with Sakura, the three of them became a new team. To commemorate the event, they conducted another bell test, with Naruto and Sakura succeeding by attempting to reveal the ending of Icha Icha tactics, forcing Kakashi to close his eyes because his Sharingan could read Naruto's lips and block his ears. When he opened his eyes, he realized that Naruto and Sakura were holding the bells. In Sunagakure, the Akatsuki duo of Deidara and Sasori made their way to the village in search of Gara. Deidara went off to fight Gara alone while Sasori guarded the entrance. Gara intercepted Deidara during the battle and managed to crush one of Deidara's arms using his sand binding coffin. Despite his improved ability, Gara's newfound desire to defend Sunagakure proved to be his downfall. When Deidara tried to destroy the village with his explosive clay, Gara absorbed the blast by levitating the sand below. A direct attack by Deidara forced him to recall the sand which crushed Deidara's arm which contained a small portion of explosive clay within. The clay then detonated, incapacitating Gara. After Deidara departed with Gara, Konkuro attempted to stop the Akatsuki members alone, but his puppets were easily fought off and destroyed by Sasori, who was revealed to be the maker of Konkuro's puppets. Sasori poisoned Konkuro in the process leaving him to die. The Akatsuki duo took Gara back to their lair, where their leader summoned a giant statue to extract and seal Gara's demon. The sealing ritual took three days. Upon hearing of Gara's kidnapping, Team Kakashi left for Sunagakure. On the way, they were met with and joined by Tamari, who was on her way back from being Suna's representative at the Chunin exams in Konoha. On their way, Naruto told Sakura and Tamari that he is the host from the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox and that Akatsuki are after the demon inside Gara. After learning this, Sakura vowed to do everything she could to protect Naruto from being a victim of Akatsuki. Tamari was thankful that there was finally someone who could understand Gara and grateful to Naruto for changing Gara and attempting to save him. After arriving at Sunagakure, Team Kakashi learned of the attack on Konkuro. Despite the failed attempts by the medics on hand, Sakura cured Konkuro, thus demonstrating her skill with medical techniques. Sakura also developed several portable antidotes rather quickly. Using a piece of Sasori's clothing found in one of Konkuro's destroyed puppets, Team Kakashi was able to track him, thus leading him to Gara. Tamari offered to assist them, but Chiyo, another puppeteer in Sasori's grandmother, went in her place. Back in Konoha, Sonata decided to send Team Guys back up for Team Kakashi. While Team Kakashi tracked Sasori through the piece of clothing, the Akatsuki leader sent Itachi Uchiha and Kisume Hoshigaki to deal with Team Kakashi and the approaching Team Guy, respectively. In a forest, Kakashi and Naruto were able to defeat Itachi after some effort using one of Kakashi's clones and Naruto's new Big Ball Rasengan. Meanwhile, Team Guy was largely disabled by Kisame, leaving Guy himself to fight Kisame alone. Guy emerged victorious by opening six of the eight chakra gates to perform his morning peacock technique, which allowed him to pummel Kisame to death. However, both Akatsuki members were actually revealed to be entirely different people in disguise. 
They were made into weaker copies of those who they were impersonating through the leader's shape-shifting technique. Despite their victories, the two teams realized their battles were distractions to buy time for Akatsuki to extract Shukaku from Gara, which would kill him if they completed. At the Akatsuki hideout, a barrier was blocking the entrance. Directed by Kakashi, Team Guy removed the four seals maintaining the barrier, but a failsafe created clones of them as a further distraction. Ultimately, the many delaying tactics employed by Akatsuki are successful as Naruto, Kakashi, Sakura, and Chiyo found Deidara and Sasuke regarding Gara's lifeless body. This led to Naruto entering Tail Beast State Rage upon seeing Deidara sitting on the Katsukake's corpse. While Chiyo and Sakura fought Sasori, Deidara flew up on a clay bird with Gara's body with Naruto and Kakashi in pursuit. Although Sasori wore his puppet and controlled from the inside, this technique of puppeteer fighting soon proved to be futile against Sakura and Chiyo. By controlling Sakura like a puppet, Chiyo was able to get Sakura close enough to demolish the puppet with one punch. With his first puppet destroyed, Sasori is revealed, looking just as young as he did when he left the village. He summoned another puppet to continue the battle, the third Kazukage. It is here that Sasori reveals that he not only killed the third Kazukage, but actually made his body into a puppet. Likewise, he has done the same to 297 other people, and planned to do the same with Sakura and Chiyo after winning. With his unique Iron Sand ability mixed with Sasori's poison, the Kazukage puppet is exceptionally dangerous. Chiyo summoned two more puppets to fight against it. These puppets were puppet versions of Sasori's parents, which he had made to remind him of them after they were killed by Sakuma Hatake early in his childhood. The puppets were left for the village when Sasori deserted it. Using the iron sand of poison, the Kazukage puppet was a tough fight for Sakura and Chiyo. However, the antidote Sakura had developed before departing from Tsunagakure allowed them to continue the fight. Having been trained by Tsunade to pick up the enemy's attack patterns, Sakura was able to easily dodge Sasori's subsequent attacks and demolish the Kazukage puppet. Down another puppet, Sasori revealed the secret of his youth. He had made himself into a puppet. In response, Chiyo used white secret technique, the Chikamatsu collection of 10 puppets. To summon Monsai Monchi Matsu's 10 masterpiece puppets. To mock the display, Sasori used his red secret technique, performance of 100 puppets, to summon 100 of his human puppets. During the fight between these puppets, Sakura used a chakra sealing orb on Sasori. Though it appeared successful at first, Sasori revealed another ability he had. As a puppet, Sasori did not only have numerous weapons to fight with, he could also reassemble himself when destroyed, making him seem impossible to defeat. However, it was revealed that the only part of him that remained alive and thus able to use chakra was his heart, which contained a talisman labeled Sasori, literally meaning scorpion. When trapped in a seal performed before of Chikomatsu's puppets, Chiyo used the mother and father puppets to stab through his heart. In spite of the victory, Chiyo believed that Sasori allowed himself to be killed. He saw the attack coming and chose not to react and died in a way similar to how his parents used to embrace him. At the end of the battle, Chiyo, Sasori, and Sakura were all fatally wounded, but Chiyo used a technique she originally developed for Sasori to save Sakura's life. The technique uses the user's own life energy, making it fatal to use to animate a puppet or reanimate the deceased, but Chiyo survives since Sakura was still alive. Sasori's last words, as a reward to Sakura for defeating him, were that he had a spy in Orochimaru's ranks, whom he was supposed to meet in Kusagakure ten days later. During the time of the fight with Sasori, Naruto and Kakashi were chasing after Deidara. Kakashi activated his own version of the Mangekyo Sharingan and aimed to use it to take Deidara's head. However, it was difficult to aim and all he managed to remove was his arm. Deidara tried to retreat, but Naruto destroyed his clay bird with Rasengan and retrieved Gara's body. Enraged and powered by the Ninetales' powers, Naruto seemed to be defeating Deidara with Rasengan, but it turned out to be a clay clone. Still enraged, Naruto started to appear feral as he transformed into his two-tailed form. Kakashi recognized the bad sign and used a seal tag he'd received from Jiraiya to stop the transformation from proceeding any further. Naruto subsequently reverted back to his normal form. As the rest of Team Kakashi and Team Guy caught up with Naruto and Kakashi, Deidara found himself unable to escape. He swallowed some clay, turning himself into a human bomb. Neji saw this and tells everyone to get away. Data were then swelled up and detonated. As the dust settled, Kakashi collapsed from exhaustion, explaining that when he uses Mangekyo Sharingan to send the explosion to another dimension. With Naruto carrying Gara's body, the two teams headed back to Tsunagakure. Stopping in a grassy field near the village, Sakura checked on Gara and pronounced him dead, making Naruto very upset. Chiyo moved towards Gara and tried to use her reincarnation technique, but didn't have enough life force to bring Gara back to life. Naruto gladly lent his own chakra, and Chiyo was able to revive Gara at the cost of her own life while the shinobi of Tsuna watched. Back at the battleground, Deidara emerged from the ground, revealing that it was his clone that destroyed itself. He went off looking for the right arm that he lost. After finding it, he encountered Zetsu and Tobi, a mysterious individual who wished to take Sasori's place in Akatsuki. Tobi's carefree attitude about Deidara's condition angered Deidara, and he attempted to strangle Tobi in a comical fashion with his feet after one too many callous remarks. After paying their respects to Chiyo and bidding Gara and his siblings farewell, the Konoha Shinobi returned home. Naruto stated that these situations were always a bit awkward right before Gara extends his hand to him in gratitude. Not too sure how to react, a small trail of sand wraps itself around Naruto's hand and brings it to Gara's. As the Konoha didn't prepare to leave, Kakashi was still exhausted from his overuse of the Nankekyo Sharingan and had to be carried by Gai. Gai does so piggyback style as he found it easier to carry him for an extended period of time, disturbing everyone present except Lee, who remarked that Gai was training. Lee then proceeded to offer to carry Neji, who bluntly refused. Tenchi Bridge Reconnaissance Mission Upon arriving at Konoha, Kakashi was confined to the hospital, making him unable to leave the team for a while. While reporting to Tsunade, they informed about the meeting with Sasori's spy in 10 days. In order to be able to go, Naruto needed to find a replacement for Sasuke. While searching, Naruto was attacked by his third man before actually learning who he was. The ninja, later introduced as Sai, had attacked to test Naruto's power, since he had been sent by Danzo to replace Sasuke. Sai is a member of the now defunct independent subdivision of Anbu called the Root. It is also discovered that some of the village elders were worried about the possibility of Naruto being captured by Akatsuki. Tsunade convinced him to let him go by summoning Yamato, an Anbu captain, as the temporary leader of Team Kakashi, under the codename Yamato. They were to travel to the Tenchi Bridge in Kusagakure to meet Sasori's spy. Team Kakashi took on their new mission, and a great amount of tension began to build in the team, especially between Naruto and Sai. Naruto disliked Sai since their interactions were similar to those between himself and Sasuke in the beginning of the series. 
Making matters worse, Sai nonchalantly mentioned Sasuke's treachery, greatly irritating both of his teammates to the point that Sakura punched him in the face. Yamato, disguised as Sasori, went to meet the spy. The spy was revealed to be Kabuto Yakushi, but the technique binding him to Sasori had been dispelled long ago. Orochimaru appeared, and Kabuto attacked Yamato, destroying the disguise. Orochimaru revealed that he had performed experiments in Yamato and 59 other children, giving them the first Hokage's DNA in an attempt to replicate his wood release Kaike Genkai. Yamato was the only survivor. Orochimaru then called out the rest of Yamato's team and taunted Naruto by speculating who was now stronger, Naruto or Sasuke. Naruto, provoked by the mere mention of Sasuke's name, transformed first into his three-tailed fox state and then into the four-tailed state shortly thereafter. It is then revealed that during the time skip while training with Jiraiya, Naruto entered a four-tailed state due to his frustration. The berserk Naruto went on a rampage, destroying everything in sight while Jiraiya was nearly killed by it before managing to stop it. The Nine-Tails chakra becomes so intense that it simultaneously burns Naruto's skin and rapidly heals the burnt tissue. This speeds up cell division dramatically, decreasing Naruto's overall lifespan. In his four-tailed state, Naruto fought Orochimaru to a draw. In the end, Orochimaru was only able to throw Naruto back to the bridge. Naruto was unable to distinguish friend from foe and attacked Sakura, which tried to calm him down. Yamato finally got close enough to use the Hokage style 60 year old technique, Kakuan entering Sasaidu Bliss Bringing Hands technique to revert Naruto back to human form. With Naruto's transformation reversed, Sakura used her medical skills to heal Naruto's severe injury, still suffering herself from previous injury. Meanwhile, Sai revealed to Orochimaru that he was a messenger from Danzo. Sai, Orochimaru, and Kabuto left to a secret hideout. Yamato watched the encounter with a wood clone and pursued Sai. Yamato wasn't fooled when he found a decoy disguised as Sai's corpse. Naruto woke up to find Sakura injured and the surrounding landscape destroyed. Yamato stepped in to inform Naruto about the real cause of the destruction when Sakura hesitated to tell Naruto the real cause of her injury. In addition, Yamato told Naruto that the only way to save Sasuke and protect the village was to rely on his own chakra, not that of the Ninetales. Meanwhile, Sakura went through Sai's belongings and found his art book. The sketchbook contained drawings of Sai and what the team assumed was his older brother growing up and going through a gauntlet of enemies. On each subsequent page, Sai took the weapons and armor of his previous opponent, as did his presumed brother from the other side of the book. The center pages where the two brothers were supposed to meet were unfinished. Sai's face was incomplete and his brother's picture was missing. At Orochimaru's hideout, Yamato revealed that he was able to track Sai through a special plant seed he'd hidden in his meal the night before, which responded to an increase in chakra, leading Yamato to him. He gave Naruto and Sakura similar seeds to make sure he could find them if they were separated while infiltrating Orochimaru's base. Once inside, Yamato led the team to a room where Sai was being kept hostage. Sai tried to lie about his mission, but an accidental smile allowed Naruto to call his bluff. Sai then stated that his mission was a failure and confirmed that Danzo was indeed planning another strike at Konoha. However, he was also acting as a spy for Danzo since Danzo knew that as soon as Konoha was destroyed, Orochimaru would turn on him. Team Kakashi captured him and bound him outside of the base with Yamato's wood release technique. Sai questioned why Naruto was willing to go so far as to rescue Sasuke, saying that Sasuke didn't see Naruto as a brother and that Orochimaru was too powerful for them. Naruto replied that he and Sasuke had a special bond and that he would fight Orochimaru with everything he had to get Sasuke back, even if it meant sacrificing his own life. At this point, Kabuto showed up and freed Sai, but Sai shocked everyone by helping Yamato immobilize Kabuto. Kabuto was forthcoming, providing information about the interior of the lair, but not about Sasuke's actual location. Team Kakashi split up to search for Sasuke, with Naruto teaming with Sai and Sakura with Yamato. Naruto, still tired from his injuries, collapsed, and Sai suggested taking a rest. Naruto was notably less hostile towards Sai at this point. Sai began to talk about his brother, who had resembled Naruto. The short chat soon ended as Orochimaru appeared. Naruto told Sai to find Sasuke, but he held off Orochimaru. As Yamato and Sakura arrived to back Naruto up, Orochimaru again mentioned that he did not wish to kill them since both parties opposed Katsuki. Orochimaru then left in order to locate Sai. Yamato found a bingo book, a list of people who were marked for assassination, in Sai's bag, with Sasuke's name in it. Naruto and Sakura realized that another part of Sai's mission was to kill Sasuke, who had been listed as an enemy of Konoha by Danzo. Naruto was speechless, realizing that Sai had duped him with his fake smiling act. Sai managed to find Sasuke in his room and woke him up. Sasuke, angry at Sai's mention of bonds, blew up the room. Sakura spotted Sai in the hallway and ran to him. Although she meant to attack Sai, Sasuke quietly said Sakura's name, stopping her in her tracks. Naruto, in his weakened state, finally caught up, coming face to face with Sasuke again. As Sasuke observed the new team Kakashi, Sai explained to Naruto and Sakura that his desire to protect the bond between Naruto and Sasuke had overridden his mission that Danzo had given to him. Sasuke replied that he had broken his bond of friendship with Naruto and that the only bond he had left was a bond of hatred with his brother. As both Sai and Yamato moved to try to protect Naruto, Sasuke used a Chidori current, which projected electricity around his body and his new Kusanagi to repel them. He managed to stun Naruto and Sai and then wounded Yamato. As Sasuke fought Yamato, Naruto underwent a partial initial Jinchuriki transformation. In Naruto's mind, the imprisoned Ninetales implored him to release his seal. When Naruto refused, the demon scoffed, saying that Naruto would always come to it in times of need, and that Naruto was worthless without its power. Suddenly, Sasuke appeared in front of the Ninetales, stunning them both. Sasuke marveled at the source of Naruto's power. As Sasuke began to push the Ninetales back into his cage, the Ninetales then remembered his past history with the Uchiha clan. It stated that Sasuke possesses chakra even more evil than its own, and that he is just like Madara Uchiha. The Ninetales also warned Sasuke not to kill Naruto, stating he would regret it. Outside of Naruto's mind, Yamato pushed the sword out of his wound and tried to trap Sasuke in a wooden prison. Sasuke blew a hole through the roof of the prison just to escape. Naruto yelled out to Sasuke that Orochimaru just wanted to use him as the next container for his soul, but Sasuke replied that he didn't care as long as it helped to kill Itachi. Yamato then told Naruto and Sakura that he didn't want to hurt Sasuke in front of them, but he had no choice and would finish the confrontation. Sasuke planned to do the same, but Orochimaru returned just in time to stop Sasuke from performing a certain technique. Kabuto told Sasuke to leave the Konoha Shinobi alive so they might continue to oppose Akatsuki. Sasuke told Kabuto that was a poor excuse not to kill Naruto, but left them anyway. Naruto was upset by the meeting and by a week he was in comparison to Sasuke, but Sakura and Sai both assured him that they helped bring Sasuke back. The team reported back to Konoha, during which Naruto told Tsunade they had not given up and that they would continue. Pleased by this response, Tsunade assigned the team a new mission. Sai reported to Danzo, who was displeased that Sai had failed his mission. Sai asked to remain
Sakura and Kakashi smiling, him and Sasuke arguing. Akatsuki's suppression mission. Two newly introduced Akatsuki members, Hidan and Kakuzu, were chasing after the two-tailed Junchuriki, Yugito Ni. Despite fully transforming into a two-tailed state, Hidan and Kakuzu defeated Yugito. After the battle, Hidan performed a gruesome religious ritual, greatly annoying Kakuzu, who was a money-obsessed bounty hunter. Zetsu appeared and took charge of Yugito, ordering the pair to proceed to the land of fire in the next target. Hidan and Kakuzu stopped by a nearby temple and killed the head monk, Chiriku, a former bodyguard for the land of fire's nobility. One monk managed to escape and informed Tsunade of the incident. Tsunade ordered Shizune to mobilize a new task force, the Niju Shotai. Asuma's group, consisting of himself, Shikamaru, Kotetsu Hagane, and Izuma Kamizuki, left for the temple. Asuma's team arrived at the ruins of the temple and realized that the Akatsuki pair had taken Chiriku's body to a bounty station. The team prepared to intercept the killers at the station, and a monk prayed for the team's safety. When the monk expressed concern for their safety, Asuma revealed that his bounty was 5 million ryo higher than Chiriku's. Meanwhile, Hidan and Kakuzu collected the bounty on Chiriku's head, turned over the corpse as proof. Elsewhere, Deidara, having regained his limbs and now paired with Toby, confronted the Three Tails. Toby acted strangely flippant before the battle with the immense aquatic beast. After subduing the monster, Toby claimed he'd single-handedly won the battle, provoking another comedic attack from Deidara after commenting Senpai, you talk a lot. After the encounter with Sasuke, Naruto realized that Sasuke was far too strong for him to possibly defeat. Kakashi revealed a special training method which took advantage of Naruto's high chakra. It involved the multiple shadow clone technique. Unlike an ordinary clone, a shadow clone passes back any experience against the original. Naruto could create a comparatively large number of shadow clones, thus allowing him to train hundreds of times faster than a normal shinobi. Yamato also assisted Naruto's training by helping restrain the Nine Tails. Kakashi explained that there are five basic types of elemental chakra fire, wind, water, lightning, and earth. He pulled out special cards which reacted differently to each person's chakra. It would burn for fire, split for wind, crumble for lightning, turn to dust for earth, and turn wet for water. Naruto flowed his chakra into the card and it split, indicated that he had an affinity for wind, a type that is very well suited for combat because of his ability to blow past anything and slice things to bits. Meanwhile, Asuma and Shikamaru were playing shogi. Shikamaru noticed that Asuma was playing differently from normal and asked if something was wrong. In describing things, Asuma described Shikamaru in terms of shogi as a knight, being weak in terms of power but having a unique style of movement which resembled Shikamaru in his flexibility and his thinking. Shikamaru then asked what piece Asuma resembled. Asuma answered that he was just a pawn. Shikamaru guessed that Hokage was the king, but Asuma told him that it wasn't, and that someday Shikamaru would understand. The first phase in the training was for Naruto and his clones to cut a leaf with his chakra. Naruto asked if there was anyone in Konoha that could give him advice, and Kakashi told him to find Asuma. Asuma gave Naruto a few pointers, using his trench knives as an example. They're made of metal that absorbs chakra, the effect of which is determined by the user's chakra nature. Asuma explained that wind chakra must be sharpened like a blade by splitting the chakra in two and bringing the parts together to form a tight edge. He demonstrated this by having Naruto toss a knife at a tree with him. Naruto was stuck in the tree while Asuma's went straight through it and pierced a rock. If he'd used his full chakra, the knife would have also gone through the rock. Using this advice, Naruto was able to completely split a leaf, but passed out after dispersing his clones. Kakashi warned him that this training was going to wear him down quickly and that he needed rest for his next phase of training, slicing a waterfall in half. The next step in Naruto's training progressed slowly. When Naruto complained, Kakashi noted that even Sasuke had taken several days to learn to manipulate an element, while Naruto had done it in a few hours. By nightfall, Naruto still had managed to cut the waterfall. Naruto reflected on his fonder members of Sasuke and decided to train through the rest of the night. By the next day, he and his clones were all able to cut the waterfall. Yamato was surprised by Naruto's progress, but Kakashi wasn't, since he understood how Naruto felt about Sasuke. Kakashi declared that they could finally move into the final stage of Naruto's unique technique creation. However, the constant training had exhausted Naruto once more. Kakashi immediately rushed to his side, concerned that he might have pushed Naruto too far this time. However, when Naruto moaned that he was hungry, Kakashi relaxed. After enjoying a meal at Ichiraku Ramen, Naruto was anxious to continue his training. Kakashi and Yamato explained nature manipulation and form manipulation to Naruto again. Kakashi reminded Naruto that until now, all the training had been shape manipulation, and that the Rasengan was an example of extremely advanced shape manipulation. By adding nature manipulation to Together with form manipulation, ninja's powers can grow by leaps and bounds. However, this is an extremely difficult task. Even the fourth Hokage was unable to complete the Rasengan by combining nature and form manipulation. Kakashi believed that Naruto was the one who could do it. At the bounty station, Kakuzu explained to Zange that Hidan, an immortal, was the only ninja capable of surviving Kakuzu's indiscriminate attack strategies. This was the reason for their partnership, despite their ideological differences and dislike for one another. As Asuma's group moved towards the bounty station, Asuma explained that he and Chiriku both belonged to the 12th Guardian Ninja, and the relationship was akin to Shikamaru's relationship with Choji. Asuma stopped smoking because he needed no distractions if he was to fight Chiriku's killers. Naruto was again training with his clones, trying to infuse the Rasengan with Wind Chakra. Unfortunately, the Jutsu consistently exploded, frustrating him to such degrees that a clone would start drawing upon the Ninetales Chakra. Yamato reversed the transformations, and Kakashi reminded him that success or failure rested on Yamato's ability to control the Ninetales. At the bounty station, Asuma's team attacked Hidan. Izumu and Kotetsu stabbed him in the chest with their large kunai. However, Hidan was merely annoyed by the attack. Asuma's team quickly realized that Hidan could be killed by normal means. Kakuzu appeared and prepared to join the fight, but Hidan told him to stay out of it. Asuma proceeded to fight Hidan alone. Hidan managed to cut Asuma's cheek and lick the blood off his scythe as the latter used to fire jutsu. Hidan drew a seal behind him just as the technique hit. It burnt Hidan's robe, but he emerged unscathed. Instead, Asuma's right arm was badly burned. The damage meant for Hidan had somehow been turned back upon himself. Hidan had also physically transformed. His skin was black with white accents, giving him the appearance of a grim reaper. Hidan told Asuma that any pain he felt was transferred to Asuma. Since he was immortal, Hidan needed only to inflict a fatal wound on himself to kill Asuma. Luckily, Shikamaru caught Hidan in another shadow bind before he could do so. Kakuzu offered to help, but Hidan waved him off, claiming he could beat all four by himself. Going over every motion Hidan made to start the ritual, Shikamaru figured out his ability. He first needed to consume his opponent's blood and then stand within his ceremonial circle. Shikamaru explained that in order to save Asuma, that all he needed to do was move Hidan out of his circle. After Shikamaru tested this theory, he trapped Hidan with shadow
Rather than killing Hidon as expected, the head started talking, scolding Kakuzu for allowing him to be decapitated. Hidon asked Kakuzu to bring him to his body, but Kakuzu grabbed his head instead, saying that it was lighter. Shigamaru fell from exhaustion as Hidon complained about the pain of being decapitated. Asuma, Kotetsu, and Izumo stood frozen in amazement, then plotted the next move. Kakuzu suddenly attacked Asuma and then grabbed Hidon's body. He reattached Hidon's head using threads from his arms. Kotetsu and Izumo attempted to strike Kakuzu, whose forearms extended, grabbing both of them by the throat. Meanwhile, Hidon jumped back into the circle, linking himself back to Asuma, and dealt himself a fatal blow in order to kill Asuma. Asuma collapsed as his team looked on helplessly. Hidon reverted to his normal form as Kakuzu prepared to finish off the others. A flock of crows suddenly appeared, distracting the Akatsuki pair. Ino and Choji appeared to assist, in which they moved Shigamaru and Asuma to safer location as Redo Namiyashi and Aoba Yamashiro backed them up. Shigamaru sensed Asuma's pulse and told Ino and Choji to take him back to Konoha. Kakuzu wasn't willing to let a bounty like Asuma go, however, and Hidon was similarly unwilling to let his enemies live. But the Akatsuki leader contacted them telepathically and forced the pair to retreat, wanting to seal the two tails they had captured recently along with the three tails. Despite the timely rescue, Asuma's wounds were fatal. Asuma died, but not before smoking his last cigarette and sharing some final words with Ino, Shigamaru, and Choji. Shigamaru lit another of his cigarettes which he began to smoke himself. He tearfully mumbled that he hated cigarettes as they made his eyes water, a reference to when Team 10 first met their sensei. As Akatsuki commenced with sealing the two-tailed beast, the leader explained their goals to Hidon and Tobi. Akatsuki's overall goal was world domination. To achieve that goal, the leader had set up a three-step process to work their way to it. First, they planned to obtain a large amount of money to support their organization. Second, they planned to set up a mercenary group loyal to no village. Because there hadn't been any wars in some time, they could convince smaller countries to hire them over the large asking prices of the five main villages. By using the tailed beast, they could start wars and then immediately quell them, convincing every country to depend on them and monopolizing the shinobi market. Finally, after they're the only major force of Shinobi in existence, they could easily conquer the world. Team 10 returned to Konoha and informed Tsunade of what had happened. Tsunade sent out the message for the funeral to everyone, but Shikamaru had a message for Kurenai from Asuma, and would tell her what would happen himself. Naruto had nearly created the jutsu when they were informed of Asuma's death and rushed back to the village. Shikamaru told Kurenai the message, and she collapsed from grief. At the funeral, Konoha Maru wept for his uncle while Naruto comforted him. Shikamaru didn't attend the funeral, and spent his time seemingly formulating a strategy and learning how to use Asuma's trench knives. He also picked up Asuma's smoking habit. The new three-man Team 10 prepared to leave and continue Asuma's mission. However, Tsunade refused to let Team 10 go since they lacked a captain. Kakashi volunteered to temporarily fill the gap. The four-man team headed off. Later in the woods, Shikamaru devised a new attack strategy that included Kakashi. About three days later, Sakura volunteered her team to back up Team 10. Tsunade told Yamato that Naruto had 24 more hours to complete his new jutsu or she would send another team as backup. After Akatsuki finished sealing Sanbi and Nibi, Kakuzu and Hidan were allowed to leave. Realizing the likeliness of an ambush, Hidan and Kakuzu took another route. Ino used her mind-body switch technique on a crow in order to find the two. Team 10 then went to ambush the Akatsuki. Shikamaru snuck his shadow near Hidan and Kakuzu who both managed to jump out of the way. Shikamaru then threw two explosive kunai, followed by Asuma's chakra blades. Shikamaru poured his own chakra into the blades, allowing him to trap the two Akatsuki members with them. Shikamaru then used his shadow imitation to make Hidon attack Kakuzu. However, Kakuzu thought a step ahead and detached his arm, setting it underground. Just before Hidon's attack landed, Kakuzu freed himself with a detached arm. Just as the two were about to counterattack, Kakashi snuck up on Kakuzu and stabbed him through the heart with his lightning cutter. Kakashi then moved to finish off Hidon, but Kakuzu, somehow still alive, surprised Kakashi and knocked him back. Kakuzu then removed his shirt to reveal four masks. He then split his back apart and four beasts came out to fight for him. However, one of the beasts died immediately. This mask broke when he released it, as this was the one Kakashi had stabbed. It turned out that Kakuzu had a total of five hearts, four of which were stolen from the bodies of fallen shinobi, and the one that allowed him to use his earth element attack was his. Each heart prolonged Kakuzu's life and allowed him access to the heart's elemental affinity. Hidon then attacked Kakashi as a distraction, which allowed Kakuzu enough time to attack with a powerful gust of wind. He then fired two powerful bolts of lightning at Shikamaru and Choji, but Kakashi blocked it with a lightning cutter in each hand. He then attacked with fire, which was dodged by Team 10, and Kakashi. Shikamaru then decided to separate Hidon and Kakuzu from each other. Once again capturing Hidon with a shadow imitation technique, Shikamaru dragged Hidon to an isolated location rigged with booby traps. However, Shikamaru's chakra ran out, which freed Hidon from the technique. Hidon successfully attacked him and began the voodoo ritual. Kakuzu revealed that the first Konoha ninja he'd ever fought was the first Hokage. As Kakashi was about to be killed, Kakuzu grabbed his chest in pain. This was due to Hidon stabbing himself as part of his curse ritual. The blood he consumed was actually Kakuzu's. Hidon did not immediately realize what had happened, but Shikamaru attacked him to illustrate the point. However, Shikamaru was weakened from the extended use of his shadow technique and couldn't hold down Hidon for long. He watched Hidon advance to strike the final blow. Kakuzu continued battling Kakashi. However, as Kakuzu prepared to strike with his fire and wind combo attack, Naruto and Yamato intervened. Combining both Naruto's wind release Rasengan and Yamato's water release tearing torrent, they formed the Typhoon Water Vortex technique to block the attack. Kakashi, Ino, and Choji were relieved at Team Kakashi's arrival under Yamato's leadership. Yamato ordered Sai and Sakura to back up Shikamaru while Kakashi summoned Pakun to lead them. Naruto resolved to defeat Kakuzu on his own. Hinan failed to kill Shikamaru as the latter insane him with a shadow once more. Having prepared the area in advance, Shikamaru used his shadows to pull the explosive tags onto Hidon and then opened a deep pit beneath him. Hidon insisted that he would survive the attempt, even if only his head remained attacked, and he would kill Shikamaru in turn. Shikamaru calmly explained that they were in his clan's land and that his clan would keep Hidon buried for eternity. Lighting a cigarette, Shikamaru saw a vision of Asuma, who congratulated him before disappearing. Saying his last goodbye, Shikamaru tossed a lit cigarette at Hidon, igniting the explosive tags and causing a massive explosion. Hidon survived the explosion and insisted that he would bite Shikamaru to death, all while proclaiming that his god, Jashin, would punish Shikamaru. Shikamaru ignored the threat and tossed a kunai with explosive tags into the hole. The explosion caused the hole to cave in, burying Hidon in rubble. Meanwhile, Naruto began preparing an extremely powerful technique. 
Kakashi realized through a flashback that Naruto might indeed surpass the fourth Okage. Naruto then used his Wind Release Rasen Shuriken. Kakuzu was visibly concerned by the new technique. Kakuzu jumped into the air, but Naruto left behind him. Kakuzu was forced to sacrifice two of his hearts, and through that, he was able to shield himself against the attack using his Earth Element Shield. However, this left him unable to move. Kakashi realized that Naruto had surpassed him and went to finish Kakuzu by stabbing the last heart. Team Kakashi and Team Ten returned, triumphant to Konoha. Shikamaru visited Asuma's grave with Kuranai, who had been revealed to be pregnant with Asuma's child. Later, while playing Shogi with his father, Shikamaru commented that the identity of the King Piece was the next generation of Konoha Ninja. Despite this revelation, he lost the game to his father. Itachi Pursuit Mission At Orochimaru's lair, a sick Orochimaru was confined to his bed. As Kabuto exited to get more medicine, a blade made a lightning chakra shot towards Orochimaru through the door. Orochimaru quickly blocked it with his arms and thought to himself that he did not recognize the shape of manipulation, although the chakra itself seemed familiar. The blade belonged to Sasuke, who had stopped by to finish Orochimaru off before he left to take on Itachi. He claimed that he had nothing more to learn from Orochimaru and then continued by mocking him for wasting his power and time, which angered Orochimaru. Sasuke finished by expressing his utter disgust at Orochimaru for his horrific experiments, all just to become all powerful, as it reminded him of Itachi's hunger for power before attacking him directly. After pinning Orochimaru's arms to the wall, Sasuke attempted to deliver a finishing blow, forcing Orochimaru to abandon his body and reveal his true form, a composite serpent like entity made up of small white snakes. Sasuke activated his curse to level 2 and began to fight Orochimaru. He compared Orochimaru's ambitions to how his snake dreams of flying and told him how he would only get that chance to the talents of a hawk, as he sprouted his curse wings. After he severed Orochimaru's head from his body, Sasuke believed he'd won. However, Orochimaru's poison paralyzed Sasuke, and the former then lunged at him, swallowing him whole. Sasuke found himself inside Orochimaru, the place where the body transfer technique took place. Orochimaru relived the flashback when he confronted Itachi with Anakatsuki. He found Sasuke's eyes to be similar to those of Itachi's on that day and anticipated taking possession of those eyes. However, Sasuke took over the dimension with his Sharingan and cursed Seal and proceeded to turn the technique against Orochimaru. After the fight, Kabuto returned with the medicines, but viewed a scene consisting of Sasuke standing over Orochimaru. Kabuto asked Sasuke to which one he was, to which Sasuke replied by showing Kabuto what had just happened. Sasuke stated he had merely taken over and left triumphantly. After defeating his mentor, Sasuke freed Suigetsu, whom Orochimaru had imprisoned in a glass tank filled with water. Sasuke led Suigetsu to the Land of Waves to retrieve Sabazama Mochi's sword from his grave. Upon their arrival, Sasuke noticed the bridge that was being built during his time there as a Konoha Genin, which was now named the Great Naruto Bridge. Upon retrieving the sword, Suigetsu explained that he had trained under the Seven Ninja Swordsman of the Mist, which his senior, Zabuza, had belonged to. With the sword, he claimed he might be able to beat Sasuke. After picking it up, they headed for the next target. In the anime, it turned out that the sword was not beside Zabuza's grave, and that a man named Tenzet had claimed for herself. Sasuke and Suigetsu asked the residents of the village where they could find him. Eventually, they discovered that he resided in a castle southeast of the village. Overnight, Sasuke intruded the castle and threatened Tenzen to prepare an army of over a thousand men. The next day, Sasuke and Suigetsu prepared to invade the castle. Sasuke offered a wager with Suigetsu to whoever could retrieve the sword first. Suigetsu later suggested that this had merely been a chance for Sasuke to witness Suigetsu's abilities, which Sasuke neither confirmed nor denied. After a successful attempt at retrieving the sword, they both departed the next target, Karin. After arriving at the base, Sasuke and Suigetsu met Karin, who sensed their arrival. Sasuke told Karin to join him, which surprised her. Sasuke replied that since Orochimaru was now gone, there was no need for her to continue to keep watch of the prisoners that she was currently guarding, and told an annoyed Suigetsu to free them. Karin relented, but still refused to go. Sasuke decided that he would have to find someone else. However, Karin had a quick change of personality and agreed to go if he really wanted her to. Suigetsu advised that they leave, since Karin clearly didn't want to go. When Sasuke said she had changed her mind, Karin put her glasses on after attempting to flirt with Sasuke, and denied this in a rather embarrassed manner, saying that she was coincidentally going the same way they were, at least for the moment. As the three made their way to the northern hideout, Karin explained that Sasuke's next target, Jugo, was the means behind Orochimaru's development of the Cursed Seals. When the group got their prisoners infected with the Cursed Seal surrounded Sasuke's group. When Karin informed them that Jugo was not among the prisoners, Sasuke and Suigetsu disposed of them without killing them, as instructed by Sasuke. Having found the keys to Jugo's cell, Karin used her tracking ability to find him, misleading Suigetsu in the wrong direction while at it. At Jugo's cell, Karin unlocked the door and Sasuke went in first. Jugo, who had decided that if the first person opened the door was a male, he would kill him, seemed delighted to see Sasuke and rushed in for the kill. Sasuke failed in his attempts to reason with Jugo. Jugo and Sasuke had a quick curse sealed battle before it was interrupted by the arrival of Sugetsu. Sugetsu then appeared to take over the fight, explaining that beating Jugo to a pulp was the only way to calm him. Jugo morphed his piston arm into a massive forearm blade to deal with Sugetsu. After they ignored Sasuke's request to stop, Sasuke wrapped the two in summoned snakes and exuded an enormous amount of killing intent. Jugo's transformation receded, and he suddenly rushed back to his cell, demanding that they lock it. Karin explained that while the rage-driven Jugo might be violent and bloodthirsty, Jugo himself had no desire to harm anyone. Jugo finally agreed to go with Sasuke after hearing that Kimimaro, who was consistently able to stop Jugo's rage-driven rampages, had died to bring Sasuke to Orochimaru. With his team gathered and dubbed Hebi by Sasuke, Sasuke revealed their goal, to kill his brother Itachi. Spigetsu, who wanted to take Kisame's sword for himself, was willing to participate, as Kisame was currently partnered with Itachi. Karin, being enamored with Sasuke, also agreed to help, although she was unwilling to admit that her admiration was the reason. Spigetsu teased her about it, saying that he knew about something Karin did to Sasuke a while before. However, Karin punched Spigetsu in the face before he could reveal her secret. Finally, Jugo acquiesced to see how strong Sasuke was, believing that he was Kimimaru's reincarnation. Sakura arrived at Naruto's home to tell him to wash up and get ready. They met up with Sonata and Jiraiya, and Sonata informed them of Orochimaru's death at Sasuke's hands, with Jiraiya's most trusted source confirmed. Both Naruto and Sakura seemed very happy to hear that news, expecting that, now that Orochimaru was dead, Sasuke would finally return to Konoha. However, Jiraiya told them that, that was not exactly the case. In Konoha, Naruto and Sakura came to the same conclusion as Sasuke, reasoning that his desire for revenge would drive him to kill Itachi. Therefore, they decided that the simplest path to Sasuke was to find Itachi. As both teams resolved to find Itachi, both he and Kisame waited for the leader to contact them after capturing Roshi, the host of the Four Tales.
In Konoha, Kakashi discussed the overall plan to find Itachi and Kisame, since simply killing Itachi first would make finding Sasuke impossible, they needed to capture him, and for that purpose, Team Kakashi was run by Team 8. Meanwhile, Sasuke took his team to an old Uchiha outpost run by allies of the Uchiha clan in order to stock up on supplies. After Akatsuki finished stealing the Four Tails, Data and Toby decided to either track down Kakashi and Naruto or go after Sasuke. As Data and Toby searched for either of their two targets, the two teams split up. The Konoha ninja split into groups of three, one ninja and two of Kakashi's ninken. Naruto was accompanied by Hinata and Yamato due to Akatsuki's pursuit of him. Meanwhile, Sasuke's group split up to gather information on Akatsuki. As they searched, the Ninken accompanying Sakura caught Sasuke's scent. Her search led her into a city, but she was unable to find Sasuke. As she walked through a crowd, the Ninken commented on how the scent was moving away, just as Karin was walking past her. Kabuto revealed himself to Naruto's group and gave them a book that detailed everything they had learned about the Akatsuki. He thanked Naruto for inspiring him to find his own purpose in life and revealed that he had absorbed Orochimaru's remains into himself, about one third of his body was now Orochimaru's. With it, he planned to become stronger than Orochimaru. After evading Naruto and Yamato, he explained that he needed to control Orochimaru's power, which was slowly taking over his body, after which he would come after Sasuke for killing Orochimaru. Elsewhere, Deidara and Tobi attacked Sasuke. Deidara attempted to attack from above using a bomb, but Sasuke used hidden shadow snake hands to wrap himself with the snake as a shield. Tobi also attempted an attack, but he was scared of Sasuke and fled from him. Deidara told Tobi he was to handle Sasuke, and tested him with small C1 spiders. Sasuke used Chidori Senbon to stop the bombs. He then jumped behind Deidara, he used a bomb to distance himself, but Sasuke managed to avoid the bomb. Realizing Sasuke's abilities were great, Deidara used C2 next, summoning a clay dragon as a battle partner. That dragon then regurgitated a cluster of landmines, to which Tobi said they were going with that. Sasuke attacked with Chidori Sharp Spear, but Deidara was out of range. While Sasuke was busy with Deidara, Tobi planted the latter's mines around the field. Deidara set a new C2 bomb after Sasuke, and he activated his Curse Seal level 2 to block the blast, at the cost of one of his wings. He shot two giant shuriken at Deidara. Deidara avoided them, but Sasuke attached wires to them. They impaled Deidara's arms against the dragon, and Sasuke flew up with his Judori sword and severed one of the dragon's wings. Deidara fell to the ground towards his landmines, but subsequently destroyed the dragon. Tobi cried out for Deidara, but Deidara, who easily had dislodged the shuriken and was now safely atop one of his clay birds, told him to be quiet. He looked into Sasuke's sharing gun and remembered when he first saw the Itachi. He was once approached by Itachi, Kisame, and Sasori for a proposal. Deidara was chosen to be an Akatsuki, but had refused, loving his position as a terrorist bomber, claiming his works as art and as invincible, and how their beauty came when they exploded. Sasori was interested in Deidara for being an artist and having guts, but claimed he was arrogant and could get himself killed quickly. Itachi decided to fight Deidara, claiming that if Itachi won, Deidara would join Akatsuki. If he lost, Deidara was free to go. Itachi shielded himself from Deidara's bombs with shadow clones, and after a short fight, finished him off with a Sharingan Genjutsu, making it seem like Itachi had gained control of Deidara's bombs and was about to finish Deidara with one. He stopped the Genjutsu and freed Deidara, but Deidara was still forced to join for his loss. As the battle between Sasuke and Deidara continued, Deidara used his C4, his most powerful bomb. It exploded and appeared to have killed Sasuke, but it was simply a Sharingan Genjutsu from Sasuke, the same one Itachi had used. Sasuke then appeared to have constricted him with one of his bombs, but the Genjutsu was dispelled by Deidara. As he revealed his left eye could dispel Genjutsu, and since Sasuke had held back when using the technique, unlike Itachi, Deidara was able to dispel it. Deidara tried another C4 on Sasuke using his last bit of chakra and went to a safe distance, but Sasuke shielded it one last time with his Judori current. He then jumped right next to Deidara and gave him a powerful punch to the face. Realizing Deidara was out of chakra and could not get up, Sasuke asked where Itachi was. Deidara did not answer and became enraged due to Sasuke being indifferent and uncaring towards his art. He then turned himself into a bomb in a suicide attempt to kill Sasuke. However, Sasuke summoned the snake, Manda, as a shield and teleported both of them with a the technique at the cost of Manda's life. His team found him after seeing the explosion and he went with them to rest, explaining what had happened. After seeing the explosion, Naruto's team headed to it as Kiba tracked Sasuke's scent. Back with Hebi, Sasuke asked everyone what they had found about Itachi. Spaghetti so and Karina had found nothing, but Jugo had communicated with the birds and they were able to sense Katsuki's chakra coming from one of their hideouts. They marked it a map. They decided to go to the most recently used one to find Itachi. Meanwhile, Itachi headed to an Uchiha hideout and sent two clones, one to find Naruto, the other to find Sasuke. As Naruto's team went to find Sasuke, Karin could sense that they were coming and informed Sasuke. Hebi then left and went to the Akatsuki hideout. Before that, Karin realized the team possessed scent trackers, and so she asked Jugo to have the birds tear up one of Sasuke's shirts, which had a very strong amount of Sasuke's scent on it, and scattered the pieces to throw off Naruto's team. It succeeded, and Kiba could no longer track Sasuke's scent. Naruto realized they needed to split up, and Naruto encountered Itachi's clone. Itachi claimed that he only wished to talk, but Naruto knew he needed to catch Itachi. Naruto created a shadow clone that attacked with a big ball or Sengon, but Itachi was a clone as well. The real Itachi caught Naruto in a Sharingan Genjutsu. In the illusion, Itachi asked why Naruto cared for Sasuke so much, to which Naruto claimed that Sasuke was like a brother to him and that he was more of a brother to Sasuke than Itachi was. When Itachi went in the offensive with his Genjutsu, Naruto dispelled it. Itachi then dispelled the clone, having run out of time to talk. The other clone encountered Sasuke at the Akatsuki hideout. After a short greeting, Sasuke attacked the clone with a Chidori Sharp Spear, but Itachi substituted himself with a Shadow Clone as a shield. Sasuke was then caught in the clone's Sharingan Genjutsu, but he easily dispelled it. Itachi then destroyed the clone, telling Sasuke to go to the nearby Uchiha hideout so they could end their dispute. Sasuke and the rest of Hebi go to the hideout. Sasuke encounters two Naruto Shadow Clones, who destroys him with the Chidori current punches, and the team continues on. Naruto figures out where Sasuke is, so Naruto's team goes in pursuit of him. Unfortunately, Naruto's team encounters Tobi. Naruto attempts two big ball or Sengon with Shadow Clones, but the attacks are absorbed by Tobi. Naruto's team then prepares to finish Tobi off. Meanwhile, Sasuke encounters Kisame, who tells Sasuke to continue on by himself, since Itachi doesn't want interferences. Sasuke had no argument and left his team with Kisame. Suigetsu and Kisame then prepared to fight for the Samahara. Sasuke then went to the hideout and prepared to battle Itachi. The Tale of Jiraiya the Gallant. Jiraiya told Tsunade that he was going to personally gather information regarding the Akatsuki in the most probable place, Amagakure.
Unsuccessful in gathering information, he captures two ninja of the village who tell him about their mysterious new leader, Pain, who single-handedly defeated Hanzo, the former leader of Ame. Before acting further, Jiraiya summoned Garatora and instructed him to destroy himself and Naruto should anything happen to him, speculating that Madara Uchiha was responsible for the Ninetales attack on Konoha in the past. Meanwhile, Pain, knowing that an intruder has infiltrated the village, orders Conan to search for the intruder. She then transforms into multiple origami papers to seek the intruder out. She locates Jiraiya and informs Pain, who then changes bodies in a secret chamber. Conan then went ahead and attacked Jiraiya, who fought evenly matched with her for a short while. Jiraiya then spoke with his history with Yahiko and Nagato. When Pain arrives, they discuss Pain's personal ideology and Akatsuki's goals. Pain, who is convinced Jiraiya is to die anyways, reveals the reasoning behind his collecting the tailed beast, which was to create a kinjutsu which could wipe away entire nations, so the world could mature and develop aversion from war. Finishing their talk, Pain summons a crustacean to attack Jiraiya, who defeats it and summons Gamaken. Having no choice left, Jiraiya and Gamaken begin their battle against Pain. Camouflaging himself, Pain summons multiple creatures to defeat Jiraiya. Realizing that he's up against a powerful foe, Jiraiya uses a barrier and prepares to enter Sage Mode. Due to the predicament Gamaken has, he sustains deep wounds from the battle. As Jiraiya has his technique ready to use, Gamaken leaves the battle and enters Sage Mode after summoning Fukusaku and Shima. Jiraiya soon finds Pain, who summons two of his other paths to enter the battle. Jiraiya blinds one of the new Pains with a kick to the face, and Fukusaku suspects that all three Pains share the same eyes and vision after they countered all their attacks, while Jiraiya realizes that each of the bodies has only one specific purpose. Jiraiya stalls for time while Fukusaku and Shima prepare a powerful Genjutsu to defeat the bodies and are successful in doing so. Jiraiya had a flashback to when he met the Toad Sage, who had told him that he would be a pervert, travel the world, write a book, and would train the destined child who would either save or destroy the world. Leaving the bodies behind, another pain attacked Jiraiya from behind and severed his arms off. Being confronted by the full attendance of the six paths of pain, Jiraiya was able to discover that all of Pain's bodies belonged to ninja he once knew, amongst them being his old student, Yahiko, functioning as Pain's diva path. With this information, Jiraiya was able to discover the truth, but his throat was crushed by the Asura path, before he was stabbed by the other six paths of pain. Pinned back to the ground, Jiraiya was unable to tell Fukusaku what he had learned. As Jiraiya lay dying, he remembered a conversation they had with Minato and Kushina about how they wanted to name their son after the character in his book, thereby making him Naruto's godfather. Remembering this, forced himself back to life with his own willpower, and he writes a message on Fukusaku's back. Thinking to himself, he decides that Naruto was the child of prophecy and that it was up to him to decide his future. The sewer path then shot his fist at Jiraiya and Fukusaku destroyed the slab of concrete that Jiraiya was lying on. Jiraiya then drifted into the water to his death while thinking about what he'd name his next book. He then decided to name it the Tale of Naruto Uzumaki and said it had a nice ring to it. Meanwhile, Pain deduced that Jiraiya was dead, but Fukusaku had gotten away. Faded battle between brothers. Sasuke arrived at the Uchiha hideout and confronted Itachi. The battle began with both of them seemingly using Taijutsu, soon ending with Sasuke cornering Itachi and deciding to ask him one last question before killing him off. Sasuke asked, Who is he? Sasuke recalled when Itachi had said that three of the Uchiha clan would have the ability to use the Mangekyo Sharingan, including himself, if Sasuke would be able to awaken his. Itachi explained that the person who had assisted him when he murdered the entire clan was none other than Madara Uchiha, one of the founders of Konoha, and revealed that one of the purposes of the Mangekyo Sharingan was to control the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, which he had done 16 years ago when it attacked Konoha. He also revealed that once the Mangekyo Sharingan was activated, it would progressively lead to blindness. Itachi referred to Madara as the founder of Akatsuki and his mentor. It turned out that Sasuke and Itachi's battle so far had been pure genjutsu. Itachi finally activated his Mangekyo Sharingan and revealed that the only way to stop the blindness was to take the eyes of another Sharingan user. He stated that this was the reason that he left Sasuke alive, and why he had pushed him to become stronger. After a flashback of his childhood, Sasuke stated, finally, it all ends here. During their talk, Zetsu watched hidden from the ceiling and his halves began to comment in the battle. After securing him in place with a shadow clone, Itachi then proceeded to rip out Sasuke's eyes. It was revealed that the whole fight so far had been a genjutsu, namely Itachi's Tsukiyomi, which Sasuke had overcome. Sasuke shortly lectured Itachi about the tools of a ninja and how a tool is only as powerful as the ninja who used it. Itachi told Sasuke he would make his dream of ripping out his eyes a reality and readied the Amaterasu. Itachi and Sasuke both used the Great Fireball technique, and Sasuke held a slight advantage until Itachi used Amaterasu, which burnt out Sasuke's fireball immediately and melted through his remaining cursed seal level 2 wing, as well as scorching his body. Itachi prepared to rip the eyes out of the half-burned Sasuke, but the corpse was shown to be an empty shell left behind, and the real Sasuke had dropped into the floor below. He used a new ninjutsu named Fire Release Great Dragon Fire Technique from down below. Itachi dodged, but it still burned his arm. Soon it began to rain, and Sasuke said that his new technique was unavoidable. Zetsu continued watching the fight, narrating their movements and adding background to mysterious moves. Sasuke charged his final technique, Kirin. A huge creature made of lightning appeared, fueled by the Great Dragon Fire technique, which had dumped a huge amount of residual heat into the upper atmosphere, and Sasuke's chakra remained suspended in a usable form, changing with the atmosphere from a simple fire chakra into a bolt of lightning characterized in the same form as the earlier Great Dragon Fire technique, but cast instead from lightning. Sasuke hit Itachi, who appeared to be dead. Itachi was then shown to be alive somehow, and revealed a third Mangekyo technique, Susano, which pulled out the legendary sword of Tatsuka. Giant snakes suddenly appeared at Sasuke. One of them revealed Orochimaru inside of his mouth. Sasuke, having used up nearly all of his chakra in fighting Itachi, could no longer suppress Orochimaru, who had been inside of Sasuke since his failed attempt at taking over his body. The snakes were all killed, and Orochimaru was stabbed by the Sword of Tatsuka, sealing him in an eternal dream state, and the remains were subsequently sucked into the sake dry that the Sword of Tatsuka was sheathed in. Itachi then asked Sasuke if that was all he had. Sasuke then proceeded to attack Itachi, again ending in a futile attempt as all his attacks were reflected by another effect of Susano, the Yada Mirror, which reflected all attacks directed at Itachi. Sasuke was knocked back down by his own attacks and laid on the ground. Itachi seemed to be invincible when Susano began to fade. Itachi walked towards his brother, seeking his eyes. When Itachi reached Sasuke, he poked Sasuke's forehead, saying, I'm sorry, Sasuke, there won't be a next time, a reference to his constant unfulfilled promises to train Sasuke in their youth. Itachi then died of exhaustion. 
Setsu figured that Itachi must have been injured before the battle started, also noting that Itachi was unable to dodge attacks he normally would have been able to. Sasuke then smiled and closed his eyes before collapsing himself, as Itachi's Amaterasu continued to burn around them. Meanwhile, Naruto and the other members of the eight-man squad continued to fight Tobi. Shino attacked with his bugs and even managed to completely swarm Tobi with them. Tobi escaped from the swarm unharmed, however. Zetsu arrived to tell him that Sasuke had won the battle and that Itachi was dead. This was no surprise to Tobi. Zetsu said that Sasuke was probably dying as well. Just before Tobi and Zetsu left, Kakashi noticed Tobi's Sharingan. Kakashi commented on this while Tobi and Zetsu fled to the battle site. Hinata saw storm clouds and the flames of Amaterasu with their Byakugan. Naruto and the group pursued them. Meanwhile, Tobi and Zetsu reached Sasuke. Tobi told Zetsu to take Itachi's corpse. Naruto's team reached the flames, and Yamato used Earth Release, Earth Flow Divide to create a path through it. Naruto became angry when he realized that they were too late. Sasuke woke up in a large room. Tobi appeared from the shadows and said that he would tell Sasuke the truth about Itachi. He then began to take off his mask. As Tobi's, whose true identity is none other than Madara, Sharingan was shown, Sasuke's Sharingan was turned into a Mangekyo Sharingan. His eyes bled, and Amaterasu appeared around Tobi. Tobi said that Itachi had implanted his abilities into Sasuke and that it activated as soon as Tobi's Sharingan was shown. Tobi then said that Itachi had done this to kill Tobi, to protect Sasuke. Sasuke didn't believe him and yelled at Tobi to go away. Tobi then began to tell Sasuke the secret about how Itachi had tried to protect the village as well as Sasuke, but for things to make sense, he would have to go back before the founding of Konoha. At the time, there were many clans that existed, and the Uchiha clan was one of the strongest, only rivaled by the Senju clan, with whom they constantly battled. Madara was noticed as the leader of the Uchiha clan because of his powerful chakra, but as Itachi said before, Madara plucked out his brother Izuna's eyes so he could gain an eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. In order to end their fighting, Hashirama Senju, the leader of the Senju clan, decided to make a peace offering with the Uchiha, which ended up forming the village of Konoha. Madara became infuriated when Hashirama became the first Okage because he feared the Uchiha clan would be put down. But the Uchiha did not believe their leader's warning, so Madara decided to abandon his own clan and defect from Konoha. Madara used the power of his eternal Mangekyo Sharingan to take control of the Ninetales to take his revenge, and battled Hashirama, which tore up the landscape, and this land would eventually be called the Valley of the End, the same place where Sasuke battled Naruto before he left Konoha. At the end of the battle, Madara lost control of the Ninetales, and everyone, even the Uchiha and Hashirama, believed that Madara had died. Afterwards, little by little, the Uchiha clan began losing their powers as the village recognized the Senju clan more, and everything Madara had warned his clan about was beginning to come true when the final straw occurred. 16 years ago, the Ninetales attacked Konoha, and due to the Uchiha's reputation back when Madara controlled the Ninetales against his fight against Hashirama, the leaders of Konoha believed that the Uchiha were responsible. Itachi was ordered by the elders of Konoha to annihilate the Uchiha because they were planning a coup d'etat against Konoha, and Itachi had done this because he detested war and wanted to maintain Konoha's stability. When Itachi was not even 4 years old, he had seen the bloodshed of the Third Shinobi War, which had caused him to develop a pacifist nature. Coincidentally, Tobi was attempting to destroy Konoha when he encountered Itachi, so Itachi made a deal. If he were to help Itachi wipe out their clan, Madara must leave Konoha alone, which Madara accepted. Sasuke began to believe that Tobi was the real bad guy because Itachi said that Madara was controlling the Ninetales every move, but Madara denies his involvement and Itachi only said that because he did not want Sasuke to trust Madara. This triggered a flashback to moments before Itachi's death, revealing that he was not seeking his brother's eyes, but in his final stance with Sasuke had poked him on the forehead, as he did in Sasuke's childhood, and smiled at him. After this, Sasuke joined back up with Heavy and his new Mangekyo Sharingan. He told the group that they would be called Taka from now on and that their goal was the complete and utter destruction of Konoha. After the failed mission to find Sasuke or Itachi, Naruto remembered his encounter with Itachi. Itachi asked Naruto why he insisted on saving Sasuke, who didn't want to be saved, and Naruto replied that he was more of a brother to him than he ever was. Satisfied with this answer, Itachi departs, but not before performing a technique on Naruto, to prepare him for the chance that Sasuke attacks Konoha. Soon after, Naruto is called to the Hokage office, where he's told by Fukusaku that Jiraiya was killed in Amagakure by pain. Naruto, devastated, left to mourn, while Tsunade, who was equally hurt, had the decoders decode Jiraiya's dying message on Fukusaku's back. Devastated and unable to focus, even after encouraging words from Iruka Umino, Naruto was taken by Shikamaru Naruto to the hospital to see a pregnant Kurna Yuhi, whose child Shikamaru will instruct. Shikamaru reminded Naruto that there will come a time where all their masters will be gone and they'll be the new masters of the new students. With this in mind, Naruto opts to help the decoders decode the message, and saw that the message was written in Jiraiya's unique, if somewhat sloppy, katakana script. With this knowledge, they discovered Pain's secrets is that the real one isn't there. After deciphering the code, Fukusaku asked that Naruto come with him to learn Senjutsu like Jiraiya. After a reverse summon sent Naruto and Fukusaku to Mount Myobaku, the two began the difficult Senjutsu training. The training required Naruto to first be completely still as to allow himself to mold the natural chakra surrounding him. To speed up the process, a special frog oil was smeared on Naruto that would allow him to use natural chakra, but at a higher risk of turning into a toad statue. After several days to weeks, Naruto successfully learned how to remain perfectly still in order to mold enough natural chakra to enter sage mode, and even trained himself in Secret to Master's Wind Release Rasen Shuriken. However, when it came to learn Sage Art Amphibian Technique to allow Shima and Fukusaku to gather the natural chakra while in combat, the Ninetale Demon Fox prevented the fusion, requiring Naruto to come up with an alternative method of entering Sage Mode in battle. Meanwhile, Sasuke decided not to take Itachi's eyes to awaken his internal Mangekyo Sharingan, opting to restore their clan his own way. Tobi ordered Taka to find the Jinchuriki of the Eight Tails, Killer B of Kumagakure. They find him at the Valley of Clouds and Lightning and begin a battle. Taka proves to be a challenge to B, and he proceeds to go all out. Pain's Assault Killer B easily disarms Suigetsu Hozuki and defeats Jugo with Suigetsu's own sword. Sasuke challenges him alone, and despite him using his Mangakyo Sharingan, Killer B is able to fatally injure Sasuke twice. First, when he was stabbed multiple times by Killer B's swords, from which he was saved by a second Kareen's chakra, and later by a hit from a three tailed Killer B's lightning release Lariat, blowing open his chest, which Jugo restored, infusing his own flesh in Sasuke's body. Annoyed, Killer B fully transformed into the Eight Tails. Suigetsu tried to blow Killer B away with a gi
Out of desperation and seeing Taka resemble his former team, Sasuke used a Matarasu to stop the giant ox. Sasuke cut off one of the beast's tentacles when it almost crushed Karin, but she was hit by another one igniting her with Matarasu. Sasuke managed to put out the flames on her and Killer B. After collecting the injured and their captive, Sasuke and Jugo head back to Ukatsuki's base. When Sasuke delivered Killer B to Tobi, he informed him that his true intentions were not to destroy Konoha's elders, but the entire village for making the Uchiha destroy themselves, vowing to destroy anyone who gets in his way. His task completed, Sasuke departs to a hideout, not knowing that they were being followed by Kumon and Jay. When he was discovered, he was attacked by Taka before he could retreat. During the sealing of the Eight Tails, which is taking longer due to losing most Akatsuki members, Killer B's body turns back into a tentacle. Killer B, still at the battlefield, climbs out of a tentacle at the bottom of the lake, relieved that Akatsuki kidnapped him and allowed him a chance to leave the village. The Eight Tails cautions that Akatsuki will still be pursuing him and asks why B used up nearly all of his energy going all out, to which B responds that he got carried away because Sasuke is one of the strongest opponents he ever faced. Upon reaching Konoha, Pain discussed the battle plans for the invasion. The Asura Path, Preta Path, and New Animal Path will act as diversions while the Diva Path, Naraka Path, Human Path, and Conan interrogated villagers and the whereabouts of Naruto Uzumaki, the Jachuriki of the Nine Tailed Demon Fox, either through mind reading or threat of death. Once preparations were complete, the Asura Path threw the Animal Path into the village where it summoned the other six paths of pain, and the invasion began. Because Konoha only expected one invader, multiple points of attack made it difficult for Konoha to react. The fifth Okage called for Naruto to return to the village to aid in its defense, but the messenger told Kosuke was killed by Danzo before he could leave, to prevent Akatsuki a chance of capturing the Ninetales, as well as in the hope that Tsunade would lose her position in the attack. Meanwhile, Tsunade arrived at the Ninja Academy to summon and use Katsuyu to heal any villager who was injured during the attack. Kakashi Hadake engaged with the Diva Path, who was quickly backed up by the Asura Path. Choza and his team of Shinobi, along with his son Choji Akamichi, came to Kakashi's aid and discovered that the Diva Path's unique gravity manipulation had a 5 second window. Despite discovering the secret and the Asura Path defeated, Choza along with his team were critically wounded and Kakashi incapacitated, leaving only Choji to deliver the information to Tsunade. Konohamaru Sarutobi engaged and defeated the Naraka Path, while Sume and Kiba Inazuka engaged the Preta Path. As the invasion continued, Konan interrogated several Konoha Shinobi on Naruto's whereabouts. However, by this time, Naruto had earned the respect of every single Konoha Shinobi to the point that not one Shinobi is willing to give away Naruto's location and would rather be killed. One such Shinobi told Konan to go to hell with a smile on his face, despite the hopeless situation he was in. As the Diva Path confronted Tsunade to question her about Naruto, Shizuna, Inoichi, and Ino Yamanaka discovered the secret of Pain's six paths. The black receivers planted into the body Jiraiya sent back revealed that each body was merely an animated corpse powered by Chakra and that Pain's real body was elsewhere. As Shizune summarized their analysis, the human path found and read her mind, discovering Naruto was at Mount Myoboku. Upon finding out and angered by Tsunade's perceived lack of pain, the Diva Path recalled Conan and the other five paths out of the village where he detonated a powerful Shinra Tensei, destroying most of the village. Having caught word of Pain's attack, the Toads at Mount Myoboku prepared for the counterattack. Shima, who was in Konoha at the time, was told to prepare a reverse summoning to bring Naruto, Fukusaku, Gamabuta, Gamaken, Gamakira, and Gamakichi to Konoha, moments after the Shinra Tensei leveled the village. After using the Naraka Path to repair the destroyed Asura Path, the animal was launched back into the village and resummoned the rest of the paths back to the village to fight the Jinchuriki. Using his newly learned Senjutsu techniques and a perfected wind release Rasen Shuriken, Naruto saved Tsunade and handily defeated the Asura, Human, Animal, and Naraka paths before the Diva Path regained enough strength to fight on its own again. When he was finally caught and held by the energy absorbing Preta Path, Naruto used the Senjutsu Chakra to disrupt the Preta Path's Chakra flow, turning it into a frog statue before finally facing the Diva Path, Pain's last and most often used body. Pain quickly dispatched the other toads and gained the upper hand, killing Fukusaku in the process. Using another gravity manipulation technique to grab and immobilize Naruto, Pain then pinned him to the ground with his chakra disruption blades in order to take him away. Before departing, Naruto asked Pain why he'd done everything, to which Pain replied that the world would never have the peace Jiraiya fought for because the world was too full of hatred and therefore the only way to create world peace was through force. By using the tailed beasts, Pain planned on making a weapon strong enough to destroy a country and the fear of that weapon would prevent more fighting. Shikamaru Nara, having survived the destruction of Konoha, met with the Yamanaka group carrying Shizune's body. When they were told what information she knew, Shikamaru concluded that Pain's real body was somewhere close to the village, at a high enough place where he could send his chakra across a large enough distance to control the six paths with no difficulty. As Pain was describing his quest for world peace, his true body, Nagato, emaciated and with several chakra blades sticking out of his back, was shown in his and Conan's hiding place, a makeshift tree on a high mountain close to the village. Hinata Hyuga came to his rescue after confessing her love for Naruto, but was quickly struck down and critically wounded. Believing that Pain had killed her, Naruto lost control of his anger and slipped into his Six Tails transformation. The first Okage's necklace reacted to this and tried to suppress Naruto's Nine-Tailed Chakra, but was removed and destroyed. With the Nine-Tails in control of Naruto's body, it fought and overwhelmed Pain, causing him to retreat from the village in order to get close enough to Naruto to use Chibaku Tensei. With the Nine-Tails controlling Naruto and Pain out of the village, Sakura Haruna ordered all those who could help to tend to the wounded and for a team including herself to help the critically wounded Hinata. Team Guy, who was returning from a mission, passed the injured Gamabunta, who informed them that Konoha was in danger. Elsewhere, Yamato, who was with Sai and Anko Midarashi on a mission hunting Kappa Yakushi, sensed that Naruto had released six of the Nine Tails and headed back to stop Naruto. While still being pursued by the Nine Tails, Pain, through the great strain of Nagato, used the Jibaku Tensei to create a giant miniature moon in an attempt to capture the Nine Tails. During this time, Naruto, locked in his own subconscious and lost in despair, called up for help to a response of Pain's visions of peace. In the end, while the apparently evil Pain had a plan to deal with the hatred of the world, Naruto did not. Taking advantage of his pain, the Nine Tails convinced Naruto to destroy everything in the world by releasing the seal. This caused the seal to disort. 
Despite the strength of the miniature moon, the distorted seal allowed the eighth tail to grow, partially breaking free of the sphere. In his mind, just as he was about to remove the seal and release the ninth tail, Minato Namakaze, the fourth Hokage, appeared and spoke with Naruto. Minato revealed to Naruto that he was his father, and he sealed the nine tails into him because he too felt the nine tails was forced to come to Konoha, and believed a masked being within Akatsuki was behind the attack. After easing Naruto's fears that he couldn't change the world, Minato repaired the seal and sent Naruto back to finish his battle with Pain. With the Ninetales chakra suppressed, Naruto and Pain resumed their battle, with Naruto tricking Pain into using a Shinra Tensei on dozens of Shadow Clones, giving Naruto enough time to strike him with the Rasengan during the 5 second window. The last body of Pain was defeated, and Naruto used its black receivers to track down and confront Nagato himself. Having reached the makeshift tree, Naruto asked Nagato why he hated Konoha, and what had made him the way he was. Nagato, still wanting to know Naruto's reply to his question, answered with two stories. The first was how his parents were killed during the Second Shinobi World War, which led to the activation of his Rinnegan. The second he began with how he met his friends, Konan and Yahiko, the boy whose body would later become the Diva Path. Yahiko had revealed the small makeshift family that he wanted to rule the world to stop the world's wars. After the dog Chibi was killed by an explosive tag as collateral damage from the Sunning's battle with Salamander Hanzo, Yahiko declared he wouldn't just rule the world but would become a god, a dream that sparked the same desire in Nagato. Nagato then revealed how Yahiko approached Jiraiya to ask him to train himself, Nagato, and Conan to be ninja. During the training, Nagato would use the Rinnegan to save Yahiko. Seeing this, Jiraiya told Nagato about the time of never-ending wars, when a messiah, the Sage of Six Paths, appeared and spread his religion across the world, which came to be the ninja techniques that the shinobi used today. Jiraiya thought the sage had been reborn as Nagato and entrusted him to find the answer and spread peace in the world before leaving the three orphans. Years later, the three formed a gang in Amagakure, yet by Yahiko to abolish wars and bring peace to the world. Their fame captured the attention of Hanzo, who approached Yahiko to join hands and work together to bring peace among the war-torn countries of Earth, Wind, and Fire. But this association turned out to be a trap laid by Hanzo, as he feared that Yahiko's group would take over the leadership of Amagakure. He lured Yahiko and Nagato to an area which was surrounded by many Konoha Anbu root shinobi, with Danzo leading them. Hanzo had kidnapped Konan, and then proposed for Yahiko to die to save Konan's life. He threw a kunai in Nagato's direction and ordered him to kill Yahiko. Yahiko agreed to die, but Nagato refused to kill him. Seeing this, Yahiko forcibly held Nagato's hand with the kunai and slit his own throat with it. A dying Yahiko told Nagato that he had to live, and that he was the messiah. Nagato told Naruto that Yahiko's death was the second great source of pain for him. This incident led Nagato to go berserk, as he used his Rinnegan's abilities to subdue and backfire all attacks on him by Hanzo's men. But in the midst of this, Nagato's legs were horribly burned by Hanzo's fire release technique while he was saving Conan. He ultimately summoned a large animated statue for battle which imbued several chakra rods from its body into Nagato's back in order to use the latter's chakra. The statue then released a soul removing dragon which killed many of Hanzo's men, but as Nagato was about to target Hanzo himself, he fled the scene with the body flicker technique. Nagato told Naruto that he had become the leader of their gang and carried on Yahigo's agenda to bring peace to the world. After hearing Nagato's story, Naruto reflected on everything that he had heard. Naruto agreed that some of the things that Nagato mentioned were true but he also said that Jiraiya had believed in him, and that he would believe in what Jiraiya had believed in, and that was why he would not kill Nagato. Nagato questioned this, and Naruto pulled out the book that Jiraiya had written. He began reading from it, and told Nagato the main character's name was Naruto. Naruto then said that he would become Hokage, and he promised peace for Amagakure as well. Nagato then stated that Naruto was like him when he was younger. He said that he would believe in Naruto, and prepared to use a technique. Upon using the technique, Nagato used his outer path to release all the souls that had been captured, and used it to also revive those who had died, including Kakashi, Fukusaku, and Shizune. At Mount Myoboku, the Great Toad Sage was shown telling Gamabunta that everyone had been revived, and that he found it surprising that it was two of Jiraiya's pupils that would bring about the revolution of the ninja world. Nagato then entrusted his will to Naruto and passed away. Konan decided to leave the Akatsuki and took both Nagato and Yahiko's bodies, telling Naruto that she would believe in him. She then used her paper to create a bouquet of flowers as a sign of peace and gave them to Naruto. Naruto erected a shrine in the forest in honor of his sensei and started to make his way back to the ruins of Konoha. He almost succumbed with exhaustion, but was caught by a newly revived Kakashi, who carried Naruto on his back to the border of the village. Awaiting them were his friends and companions. As the villagers congratulated Naruto, Ebisu and Iruka thought about how their opinion of Naruto has undergone an immense change over the years. He was once considered a nuisance and a demon, but as his deeds were recognized, he became a true hero through the eyes of many. Naruto's ultimate dream of acknowledgement had come true at last. In the anime, this takes place during this arc, but in the manga, it takes place during the Five Kage Summit. Tsunade was left in a comatose state after using all of her chakra to protect the villagers. Meanwhile, during the council meeting after the invasion, Danzo was able to persuade the Fire Daimyo to make him the acting 6th Hokage. Having finally acquired the title, he labeled Sasuke Uchiha a missing nin and ordered his assassination. Team Samui of Kumagakure arrived in Konoha with news that Sasuke's team had kidnapped Killer B, and was looking for whatever information Konoha had on Sasuke. Meanwhile, on their way to Konoha, Taka, having abandoned Akatsuki after capturing the Eight Tails, was stopped by Tobi. Tobi, angered that Taka had failed to actually capture the Eight Tails, assigned Taka a new mission, to kill Danzo, the new Hokage, at the summit. Zetsu's white half led to lead the way. Toby told Black Zetsu that Pain's defeat was a major hindrance to his plans, and that Sasuke would be of no use to him if he could be controlled properly. Toby decided to finally separate the shadows and commence his Eye of the Moon plan. Five Kage Summit When Karui revealed her intention of killing Sasuke to avenge her fallen master, Killer B, Naruto offered to be beaten in order to relieve Karui of her pain. She brutally beat Naruto until Sai stepped in to protect his teammate. 
Omoe remarked that Naruto would never betray Sasuke. Though unsatisfied with what they gathered, Team Samui had to leave Konoha to report to the 4th Hokage. When they left, they unknowingly stepped on Yamato's tracking seed, which allowed Yamato, Kakashi, and Naruto to follow them into the Land of Iron. After receiving medical care, Naruto recounted his conversation with his late father, the 4th Hokage, when he was on the verge of fully transforming into the Nine Tails. He convinced Kakashi and Yamato to accompany him to the Land of Iron to ask A's pardon for Sasuke's actions. Gara, the 5th Kazukage of Tsunagakure, Onoki, the 3rd Suchikage of Iwagakure, Mei Terumi, the 5th Mizukage of Kirigakure, departed from their villages with two guards each. As requested, by the 4th Raikage to the location of the summit, the Land of Iron. Before leaving for the Land of Iron, Danzo ordered root members Dajimu and Torai to find Kabuto before Anko did, believing Kabuto's information might be useful for restoring his right arm and eye. On the way to the summit, Danzo and his bodyguards, Fu Yamanaka and Torune, were attacked by assassins. Danzo uncovered the bandages over his right eye, revealing a bloodshot Sharingan, and quickly dispatched the attackers. Kakashi put two root members watching Naruto under Genjutsu and told Sai to report to Danzo that Naruto had not left Konoha. Yamato planted tracking seeds on Team Samui and followed him to the Raikage in the Land of Iron. Despite Naruto's desperate pleas, even Kakashi and Yamato's assistance, A refused to call off the hunt for Sasuke Uchiha and scolded Naruto for being weak and defending a criminal. Mifune, the leader of the Land of Iron, started the five Kage summit with each Kage's bodyguards looking on. The Kage quickly began to argue due to ideological differences. Danzo mentioned Killer B, sending A into a rage, and prompting all the Kage's bodyguards to assume already stance. A claimed that each of the other Kage was in some way responsible for the Akatsuki's rise to power. The fourth Kazakage may have used Akatsuki to facilitate the Konoha crush, the Tsuchikage hired Akatsuki to avoid sending an inexperienced ninja of his village into battle, and the fourth Mizukage, Yagata Katatachi, was probably manipulated by Akatsuki. When Danzo stated that Akatsuki's leader is almost certainly Madara Uchiha, Mifune proposed that the five countries unite to eliminate Akatsuki, and that Danzo lead the alliance. Ao, Terumi's bodyguard, with his Byakugan, discovered Danzo's secret use of Shisui Uchiha's Sharingan to manipulate Mifune's decision. Suddenly, White Zetsu appeared before the Kage, announcing that Sasuke Uchiha was near. In Konoha, the Konoha 11 discussed the turn of events and came to the conclusion that they had to hunt down Sasuke before his actions or a death from other ninjas sparked an all-out war between countries. Shikamaru asked Team 7 for consent. Sakura, left guilt-ridden and distraught after being talked to by Sai and Shikamaru, decided to find Naruto in the Land of Iron and talk to him herself. She left Konoha with Kiba, Lee, and Sai. While resting at an inn after speaking to A, Naruto was greeted by Tobi, who proceeded to tell the Konoha Nin about how Itachi Uchiha had sacrificed for Konoha and for his little brother Sasuke. Tobi stated that while Naruto inherited the Senju clan's will of fire, Sasuke had embraced the Uchiha clan's hatred, and the battle between the two would be inevitable. Enraged, A choked Zetsu, snapping his neck when he failed to answer his inquiries about Sasuke before storming out of the meeting room with his guards. Outside, Sasuke had defeated all the Land of Iron's guards. However, the Kage proved to be stronger than Sasuke imagined. A's immense physical strength allowed him to snap Suigetsu's sword in half and fend off a fully transformed Jugo. Against A's superior lightning-based technique, which is capable of nullifying even the Chidori, Sasuke activated his Monkikyo Sharingan and used an incomplete Susano wrapped in the inextinguishable flames of Amaterasu to defend himself. A smashed through Sasuke's defense at the cost of an arm. Before A could injure himself further, Gara the Kazakage intervened, wishing to talk to Sasuke. Gara tried to persuade Sasuke to abandon the path in darkness, but failed. Using Susano, Sasuke stood immune to simultaneous attacks from Gara, Konkuro, Tamari, and Darui, A's bodyguard. After collapsing the structures outside the meeting room, forcing his opponents to recede, Sasuke ordered Karin to lead him to Danzo, abandoning Suigetsu and Jugo to their fate. Upon seeing Sasuke, Danzo escaped with his bodyguards with Ao, Torumi's bodyguard, in pursuit. Sasuke was about to give chase when Torumi sealed off the exit with their lava release. Even though Zetsu's sport technique transferred the chakra of everyone in the building to Sasuke, he suffered from Turumi's acidic mist and would have been pulverized by Onoki the Tsuchikage had it not been for the timely arrival of Tobi. After teleporting Sasuke and Karina to safety, Tobi said he sent Sasuke to the summit to train the monk at Sharingan and to weaken the Kage for easy capture, but admitted he was pushing his luck. According to Tobi, the Sage of the Six Paths was worshipped as a god throughout the old ninja world because he managed to subdue the Ten Tails, sealing it within his own body and becoming the very first Jinchuriki. The Sage knew once he died, the Ten Tails would be unleashed and once again lay waste to the world, so in his final moments he split his chakra into nine parts, which would become the Nine Tailed Beasts, and seal its empty body in a massive Chibaku Tensei, which would become the Moon. Tobi's plan was to use the combined power of the Nine Tailed Beasts to reawaken the Ten Tails and seal it within himself, attaining godlike power. With that power, he would project an infinite Tsukiyomi onto the Moon, effectively conquering the planet. Tobi forces the Kage to make a choice between handing over Killer B and Naruto, the hosts of the Eight Tails and the Nine Tailed Demon Fox respectively, or facing war with Akatsuki and their Seven Tailed Beasts. When they refused, Tobi declared the Fourth Shinobi World War and departed. As the threat of Akatsuki had become too great for any one nation to handle, the Kage and the leader of the Land of Iron for the first time in ninja history agreed to form a five country alliance. Because Danzo fled the summit earlier, Gara offered to relay the information to Konoha through Kakashi Harake instead. The Kage decided it would be best to hide the two remaining hosts from the front line as both are unpredictable on the battlefield and Tobi would expect them to turn up. With his composure regained, A was voted the leader of the alliance. Killer B, having faked his capture at the hands of Taka, takes the opportunity to escape his duty as guardian of his village. At an unknown location, while he was practicing singing with the leader of the Enkin ninja Sabu, Kisume Hoshigaki arrived. After quickly dispatching Sabu's companion Ponta, a Tanuki, Kisume went to battle both Killer B and Sabu, feeding his sword Samehara with enough of B's chakra to reveal his true form. Killer B was at a great disadvantage because even though he was low on chakra, he was unwilling to fully release the eight tails out of fear for Sabu and Ponta's safety. 
The longer the battle went on, the more exhausted B became. The more likely Kisame won, as with the help of his chakra stealing sword Samehara, Kisame could heal himself and stay at his peak condition. Having trapped his opponents in a giant dome of water that moved along with him, Kisame absorbed Samehara into his own body, taking an even more shark like form. B stalled Kisame at the cost of his Eight Tails chakra cloak, allowing Sabu and Ponta the chance to escape the water dome before drowning. Deprived of chakra and suffocated, B was rendered unconscious. Kisame released the technique and was about to cut off B's legs when Samehara turned on him and attempted to heal B, having grown attached to B's chakra. Kisame got rid of the rebellious blade, picked one of B's swords, and prepared to deal the finishing blow. Fortunately, B was saved by the timely arrival of the Raikage and his guards. B and A performed the lightning release double lariat, decapitating Kisame in the blink of an eye. After the summit, the Kage left the land of iron to return to their respective villages. As A and his guards went to aid Killer B, Ao of Kirigakure followed Danzo and his guards, only to be trapped by Fu. Fu, sensing Mei and Chojuro coming, and unable to seal the Byakugan due to his protective seal, attempted to trick Mei into dispelling the seal for him. However, because his mannerisms were so different from the real Ao, Mei saw through the trick and forced Fu to dispel the technique himself. Meanwhile, Kakashi advised that Naruto and Yamato not mention what Tobi had said about the Uchiha clan and Sasuke until the new more, as they did not know if what he was saying was true. While Naruto contemplated Tobi's words, he attempted to find Sasuke via sage mode, but was interrupted by the arrival of Sakura Harano's group. Sakura gave a false confession of love to Naruto and asked him to give up his search for Sasuke, telling him he was a criminal and that with her love he would not have to burden himself with his promise. Naruto questioned the confession, got into an argument with Sakura over how he hated people who lied to themselves and how he knows all too well that she's still in love with Sasuke, and stating that how chasing after Sasuke was still something he must do for himself, without being able to explain why or what he had learned earlier. Failing to convince Naruto to give up, an angered Sakura left with Sai, Kiba Inuzuka, and Rock Lee to find Sasuke on their own. As they left, Sai, feeling responsible for inadvertently sending Sakura on a suicide mission, left a clone behind to tell Naruto what Sakura could not. Sai revealed that the rest of the Konoha 11 had decided that they themselves must kill Sasuke to avoid an even greater conflict. They concluded that Sasuke, being allied with Akatsuki and almost causing an international incident in Taka's attempted abduction of Killer B, is not worth saving if it causes the world to go to war. Because of this and what Sai talked to her about, he believed that Sasuke and Naruto's promise to her is causing him nothing but pain. Sakura has decided to kill Sasuke herself because she still loves him so much that she would rather end him than allow him to follow his path to darkness and risk Naruto in the process. Naruto, realizing that his dream of bringing Sasuke back to Konoha was ruined, began to silently grieve as the Kazakage, Kankoro, and Tamari arrived. They updated the Konoha Nin at the results of the summit, about foundation of the allied shinobi forces, the declaration of war, and their decision to promote Kakashi as Hokage after Danzo's deceitful actions at the summit, and his subsequent flight after Sasuke's attack. Seeing no other choice, Kakashi stated that it would be best to return to Konoha and relay the news of the war. Gara, knowing Naruto's reluctance in having to fight Sasuke, reminded him that his dream is to be Hokage, and as Hokage, he must do what needs to be done. Naruto stays silent, shoving Gara's hand off his shoulder, yet despite the circumstances, Gara tells him that he considers Naruto a friend, and asks him to contemplate the meaning of the word in his own way, and to do what he thinks was the best thing for Sasuke for himself, before leaving with Tamari and Kankoro. Reflecting upon all that's happened, and unable to process his thoughts, Naruto started hyperventilating before passing out. Tobi appeared before Danzo and prepared to engage him in battle, but Danzo ordered his men to back him up as he prepared to release a seal on Shisui's arm. Despite their strength, Tobi eventually captures Fu Yamanaka and Torone just before teleporting him into his pocket dimension to retrieve Kuri and Sasuke. When they return, Danzo finishes releasing his arm, which is revealed to have ten Sharingan eyes implanted in it. Sasuke then attacked Danzo using Susano and demanded to know if he forced Itachi into killing his clan. Danzo confirmed this and insulted Itachi's honor, resulting in Sasuke forcing his incomplete Susano into completion. With the upper hand, Sasuke attacked and almost killed Danzo, but the attack was redirected by a tree Danzo sprouted using his wood release. The result of an experiment to allow him to use the Forbidden Uchiha technique, Izanagi. However, using the 60 second time limit to his advantage, Sasuke managed to trick Danzo into believing that he hadn't used all of his Sharingan eyes to severely injure him. Desperate, Danzo attempted to use Karina as a hostage, but Sasuke merely stabbed through her to pierce Danzo's heart. Just before death, Danzo tried to seal Sasuke and Tobi into his own body, and sequentially crushed Shisui's eye, preventing Tobi from using it to his advantage. With Danzo dead, Tobi claimed his body and told Sasuke to kill Karin if he had no use for her before leaving. Sasuke moved to finish her off as Sakura Harano arrived after knocking out the group and declared that she would defect from Konoha to follow him. Back at the inn, Naruto awakened and was told by Yamato that they are to return to Konoha while Kakashi handles Sakura. Naruto, however, tricked the fatigued Yamato into letting him rest while he sneaked through the floor to follow Kakashi using Sage Mode. Kakashi found Kiba and the others after finding out where Sakura went, and he rushed towards her. As Sakura tried to join Sasuke, he asked her if she would really betray Konoha. Sasuke then ordered her to kill Karin to take her place in his group as evidence of her loyalty to him. But a moment of hesitation in her told him she was lying, so he attempted to kill her. Kakashi suddenly arrived to stop Sasuke's attack and prepared to fight his former student after seeing how far he had fallen and feeling responsible for all it had led to. Fourth Shinobi World War, Countdown. As Sasuke and Kakashi fight, the former's vision starts to fade away from overuse of the monkey Kyo Sharingan. Sakura takes the chance to try to kill Sasuke, but is unable to bring herself to do it. Sasuke then tried to kill her once again, but Naruto appeared and saved her. Naruto attempted to reason with Sasuke, who declared his way of reviving his clan by destroying every possible link to it, thus regaining their honor. Seeing Sasuke as a lost cause, Kakashi tried to send Sakura and Naruto away, but Naruto charged Sasuke, both attacking with their signature techniques. In a moment of understanding after the collision, a similar effect seen after their battle at the Valley of the End, Sasuke gave Naruto a choice. Be one of his victims, or a hero for killing him. Naruto told him he would do neither. The blast sends Naruto and Sasuke backwards. Kakashi catches Naruto while Sasuke is caught by Zetsu. Tobi teleports to Sasuke while White Zetsu makes clones of himself to capture Naruto. Tobi tells Zetsu not to battle him and to go find Kisame. Naruto announces that he saw into Sasuke's heart and that they would both die if they fight again and be rid of the Uchiha and the Nine-Tailed Fox. After hearing Naruto's choice, Sasuke merely says that he will not go back on the path he walks and he will kill Naruto first. 
Naruto answers back by saying that Sasuke still hasn't accepted him as an equal, and Sasuke tells Toby that they must talk. Toby and Sasuke teleport back to Akatsuki's hideout, where Sasuke asks Toby for Itachi's eyes to be transplanted into him. Meanwhile, back at the bridge, Naruto, Sakura, and Kakashi get ready to leave after retrieving Kareen. But Naruto passes out from the poison from Sakura's kunai that he got cut with from saving Sakura from Sasuke. Sakura gives Naruto the antidote, and they set off back to Konoha. Meanwhile, it's revealed that the Kisame who was killed during the fight with Killer B was actually a clone of Zetsu, and that the real Kisame was alive and well. Back in Kumogakure, A, Killer B, and Team Samui return. Killer B has taken Samehara with Kisame inside the sword, planning on infiltrating Kumogakure to retrieve the Eight Tails. And in an unspecified location, Kabuto is shown using Orochimaru's snake abilities to subdue a couple of ninjas, saying that he's getting used to his new powers, and that it's time to get things moving. Returning to Kiba, Lee, Akamaru, and Sai, Sakura and Naruto all go back to the village along with Kakashi with a weakened Kareen. Upon return, the others tell Naruto that they want to fight Sasuke too and that he can't fight him alone. Naruto disagrees and says that he's the only one able to fight Sasuke and the only one that will. The others question him on what happened when he confronted Sasuke. Naruto says he will tell them when the time is right and walks off the Ramen Ichiraku. With Danzo dead, the village leaders have to decide on a new 6th Hokage and vote Kakashi for the position, saying that they think that Sunagakure will agree as well. The fire daimyo says, Kakashi Haruke, I will now appoint you as, but is cut off by an unknown shinobi, guy in the anime, running into the room and telling the fire daimyo that he has urgent news. Shizune then breaks out in tears as she sees Tsunade has survived and hugs her, thus removing the need for a 6th Hokage. At the same time, in their hideout, Sasuke is shown regaining consciousness again after the operation in which Itachi's eyes were implanted in him. Sasuke states that he can feel Itachi's power flowing into him. Tsunade, who has regained consciousness, is eating a tremendous amount of food to rebuild her chakra reserves. She's then greeted by Kakashi, who's relieved that she is alright, as it would have meant him becoming Hokage, and he feels he isn't cut out for it. Tsunade orders a meeting to make preparations for the coming war. Elsewhere, at the makeshift headquarters for the interrogation unit, Ibiki Marina prepares to interrogate Karin on the information about Sasuke and Kabuto. While on Mount Byoboku, the great toad sage Geratora, Shima, and Fukusaku are having a meeting about whether or not Jiraiya's request that Geratora store himself within Naruto can be honored. The great sage says he has had a vision of Naruto's future and requests to see him before he decides whether or not he should receive the key to his seal. Naruto is enjoying some ramen when Sakura informs him of Tsunade's recovery. This leads to his next meal being declared on the house. As he's about to eat, he's reverse summoned to Mount Myoboku to receive the premonition. The sage sees an animal island paradise octopus tentacles, and tells Naruto that he would meet a young man with powerful eyes. Naruto listens to what he has to say, and ultimately accepts whatever lies ahead for him. Anko and her team have located a number of bodies, evidently victims of Kabuto. The fact that he just left them there and made no attempt to hide them leads the team to suspect a trap. Meanwhile, Kabuto has located Tobi, briefly shows off his new abilities, reincarnating Itachi, Deidara, Kakuzu, Sasori, and Nagato, and offers an alliance to Tobi. Kabuto asks for Sasuke to test out his ninjutsu. Toby asks if he refuses, and Kabuto summons another casket with an unseen body that shocks Toby. Toby then accepts the offer under the condition that Kabuto cannot be anywhere near Sasuke until the end of the war. Nearby, Anko and her team discover Kabuto is joined with Toby, and she wonders what his motives are, and reports the news to Konoha. Back at Mount Byoboku, Naruto signs the contract to the key, believing he's ready to control the Nine Tails, and Garatora stores himself inside Naruto. Naruto asks the Great Toad Sage about where to find the octopus, but he only sees him in an island paradise. Fukusaku sends Naruto back to Ichiraku, where two Konoha ninja ask for his autograph. Akuma Gakure, the fourth Rei Kage, calls a short meeting with the other Kage. Three days later, the Kage discuss the enemy's power in confining the Jinchuriki. Tsunade is outraged by confining Naruto and B, saying they would help greatly in the war, though Gara and Onoki talk her down, telling her that it was already decided and that her sole opinion won't change anything. A says Naruto and B will be confined on an island in Kumagakure that he and B train at. In the anime, Tsunade privately meets with the Rei Kage, requesting that B train Naruto to control the Nine Tails, as she still believes that there might be a chance that the two left to join the war, and that they should be ready should that happen, which A approved, which is why he also chose that island. As Naruto, Yamato, and other Konoha and Kumo ninja arrive at the island, a giant squid, who Naruto thinks is the octopus the great Toad Sage spoke of, appears and grabs Naruto until he is saved by B in his full eight tail transformation. One Kumo ninja, Motoi, greets them and guides them through the island. While guiding them through the island, they are confronted by King, a large gorilla that B has tamed. Motoi tells Naruto that he can control the beasts on the island, but he can also control the eight tails. Learning B is also a Jinchuriki. Later, Naruto asks B if he can help him control the nine tails, and B refuses. Naruto tries a rap, but messes it up by unintentionally insulting B, and he tries to fix it with the harem technique, though B slams the door on Naruto. Naruto goes to Motoi to ask him how B learned to control the eight tails, who brings him to the Falls of Truth, the first step to how B learned to control his eight tail beast. At the Falls of Truth, Motoi tells Naruto to sit in front of the waterfall and close his eyes when an evil version of Naruto appears from the waterfall. Dark Naruto begins to insult the real Naruto, saying he's an imposter and insults him over the choices he's made, which angers Naruto. They fight, but Naruto realizes they're both evenly matched, the battle ends in a tie. When he wakes up and tells Motoi about his encounter with the Dark Naruto, Motoi tells him he has to defeat Dark Naruto in order to control the Nine Tails. Meanwhile, Killer B is fighting with some bears in competition. The Eight Tails tries to pursue him into helping Naruto, but fails. Also, Motoi reveals something about his past. He once tried to kill B himself, but failed. When Naruto and Yamato ask why, he begins to reveal about the Eight Tails' bloody history. Long ago, Eight Tails had several hosts, but each failed to control it. After each host lost control, the Eight Tails rampaged through Kumogakure several times. Each time it rampaged, the Third Raikage and other elite shinobi came to stop it and seal it inside a sealing jar. Each time the beast was resealed, many shinobi would lose their lives. One of those was Motoi's father. Almost immediately after Killer B was chosen to be the new host, Motoi thought it was pointless and the beast would go on a rampage again. Because of his father's death, the hate of the Eight Tails grew to control and Motoi attempted to kill Killer B. 
He was quickly dispatched and Killer Bee stuck at his hand for his customary fist bump, after which Motoi ran away not speaking to Killer Bee again. After Motoi's story, Naruto goes off to think of all the villagers and his friends trust him. Suddenly, Naruto hears Motoi being attacked by the giant squid, which he mistakes for Bee again. Naruto and Yamato begin to assault the squid until Bee arrives, this time punching a hole through the squid. After being saved by Bee, Motoi tells Bee that he tried to kill him years ago and Bee easily forgives him, which brings tears to Motoi's eyes as they bump fists, which cause Naruto to smile. Later on, Bee thanks Naruto for helping Motoi and they become friends. Bee then becomes willing to teach Naruto how to control the Nine Tails. They return to the Falls of Truth where Dark Naruto surfaces again, noticing a change in Naruto. Naruto states he has faith in himself and hugs Dark Naruto, which causes him to disappear into Naruto. With the darkness eliminated inside of him, Bee takes Naruto to a sacred place behind the waterfall, where he will fight the Nine Tails. They approach an entry box where Naruto activates a switch and opens a door to a large empty room. Naruto approaches the Nine Tails within his subconscious and removes the seal, thus releasing the beast. Naruto tries to use his chakra with the help of Bee to pull the Nine Tails chakra, but it slices the Eight Tails tentacles and pulled away. It then realizes Naruto is trying to take control of it. Naruto and the Nine Tails begin their battle where the Nine Tails fires a tailed beast ball at Naruto. B uses the last of the Eight Tails power to block the attack, and Naruto in Sage mode uses Sage Art Ultra Big Ball Rasengan on the Nine Tails, though it blows it away with a roar. Naruto flips the Nine Tails over and slams Wind Release Rasen Shuriken into it, giving him a chance to drain his chakra. While taking his chakra, some of Nine Tails' hatred is pulled in, causing Dark Naruto to reemerge. B notices the Nine Tails' hatred is larger than he expected, and Yamato tries to tame Naruto from the outside. The Nine Tails tells Naruto to disappear, and suddenly Kushina appears and tells him that he belongs here, with her hand on her chest. Kushina has Naruto guess who she is, and Naruto claiming her to be the Nine Tails' true form, which causes Kushina to clobber him on the head. She apologizes to Naruto, and he realizes she's his mother and hugs her, causing Dark Naruto to disappear again. Outside Naruto, the transformation stops, which surprises B and Yamato. Before Naruto begins asking his mother about her, Kushina chains up the Nine Tails, where it notices it's Kushina's chakra. Naruto asks how she and Minato fell in love, which embarrasses her, though she tells him anyway. When she first met Minato, she thought he looked like a wimp and wanted to be the first female Hokage. Other kids laughed at her because of this, and also her face and hair features with the kids calling her Tomato. She eventually got back at the kids, giving the nickname the Red Hot Blooded Habanero. Kushina had a special chakra and was once kidnapped by Kumagakure because of this. Kushina left a trail of her hair that only Minato noticed. Naruto compliments Kushina's hair, which she states is the second time someone has complimented her hair, the first time being Minato. Being the son of Konoha's Yellow Flash and the Red Hot Blooded Habanero, Naruto gives himself the nickname Konoha's Orange Hokage. Hearing his mother saying she loves him, Naruto releases himself from the Nine Tails' hatred and resumes his battle, which Kushina holding the Nine Tails with their adamantine ceiling chains. Naruto attacks the Nine Tails with his ultra many spiraling serial spheres, and Sage Art many ultra big ball spiraling serial spheres, and slams it once again with a Rasen Shuriken, where it successfully pulls out the Nine Tails chakra. Once the chakra was pulled away by Naruto, the Nine Tails gathered the chakra from one last attack, but it stopped by Naruto, whose seal, the Nine Tail noted, reminded it of the Sage of Six Paths. As Naruto resealed the Nine Tails into a new seal, the Nine Tails warned Naruto that it would not forget this. After the Nine Tails defeat, Kushina says to Naruto that she can see Minato again. Before going, she decides to tell Naruto the truth about the Nine Tail Demon Fox's attack 16 years ago, how on the day of Naruto's birth, she and Minato gave their lives to make Naruto the Nine Tails Jinchuriki in order to stop the masked man. After the story, Kushina apologizes to Naruto for forcing him to be the host of the Nine Tails and not being there to love him. Naruto expresses no bitterness, accepting the apology and saying that he never blamed either of them, now finally understanding the love of a parent towards their child, and is glad that he's their son. Kushina starts fading away, but before that hugs Naruto and thanks him for allowing her to be his mother and for allowing Minato to be his father. With that, Naruto promises to eat, sleep, and bathe well, and that he will be cooler and stronger than his parents. As Naruto returns to the outside, B and Yamato learn of his success, and Naruto demonstrates his new power to them. Naruto's new form gives him the ability to sense an evil presence around him, which blows Kisame's cover. B is shocked to see Kisame alive, and he explains how he survived. With Kisame outnumbered, he attempts to flee, but is suddenly hit by a high-speed punch from Naruto, who gets himself sucked into the wall with the process. While Yamato helps Naruto, B chases up to Kisame. At B's house, Guy, having heard of Naruto's training, decided to cheer him on along with Motoi and Alba Yamashiro. They arrive at the Falls of Truth, and Guy confronts his darkness, due to a bet by Alba saying Guy is scared of his true self, which mocks him. Suddenly, Kisame bursts from the waterfall, and Guy mistakes him for being an insect and his true self. Guy then elbows Kisame into the side of the waterfall. Guy and Alba mistake Kisame for a blowfish, but B tells him that he's from Akatsuki. Some Hada separates from Kisame, who's in weak condition, and runs to B. It bites onto B, which restores Kisame's strength. Kisame continues to escape, and Guy uses the eight gates and opens the sixth gate to pursue Kisame. B does a partial transformation with his arm to launch Guy towards Kisame's direction, though becomes tired afterwards. Guy summons Ningame in midair while losing momentum after being thrown by B and uses his shell as a platform to jump towards Kisame. After, Kisame summons a shark and he puts a scroll containing the information he gathered in its mouth. Kisame hides the summoned shark by creating a wave of sharks that confuses Guy. Guy uses Morning Peacock on the wave of sharks but gets wiped out. Guy then opens the seventh gate and uses his daytime tiger against Kisame's water release, great shark bullet technique. Instead of the tiger being absorbed by the shark, it bursts through and creates a huge explosion. Guy approaches the beaten Kisame with the scroll and explains to him why his technique wasn't absorbed. Daytime Tiger is a Taijutsu technique made of air pressure concentrated on a single point instead of chakra. Guy tells Kisame not to move. However, Kisame moves a single finger, prompting Guy to knock him unconscious with a punch to the stomach. Guy returns to the others with Kisame, where Alba decides to extract intel from him. In a flashback of Kisame's, he is sent on a mission where he must protect the intelligence squad, but must importantly protect Kitagakure's secret code from Konoha Ninja. Kisame and his group are attacked by a group of Konoha Ninja led by Ibiki. Kisame kills his comrades, knowing they would reveal the code to the enemy. Kisame returns to his village and kills his master, who is communicating with the enemy and claims Same. Hata. Yagata Karatachi, the fourth Mizukage, as well as the Jinchuriki of the Three Tails, approaches Kisame, noticing his loyalty to the village. 
for killing fellow Kiri Nin, Kisame thinks his life is nothing but lies. From the shadows appears Toby, who is shown controlling Yagura. Toby introduces himself and explains his eye of the moon plan to Kisame, where he wants to make a world of truth. Not wanting Alba to get any information from him, Kisame wakes himself up by biting his tongue and breaks free of his restraints. Kisame puts himself inside the water prison technique and summons three sharks. Remembering the first time he partnered with Itachi and what he said to him, Kisame makes the sharks eat him and he knows that he is at the time of his death. The others are shocked to see Kisame's surprising suicide. Despite being the enemy, Guy says he lived and died as a ninja and promises to never forget him. Guy opens Kisame's scroll, which activates a booby trap, trapping everyone in a dumb water with sharks, while a shark with the scroll swims to the ocean. Elsewhere in Amagakure, Toby confronts Conan, looking for Nagato's body to obtain his Rinnegan. Conan states she's been waiting for a chance to kill him, and Toby says that he won't go easy on a former Akatsuki member. Toby asks why she decided to betray Akatsuki despite still wearing the uniform. Conan states that Akatsuki was created by Yahiko, and that his justice is not his, nor is Nagato's Rinnegan. Toby simply mocks Conan, stating that she is wrong, as he inspired Yahiko to create Akatsuki, and that he gave Nagato the Rinnegan. Conan turns in a paper and rushes at Toby. Toby then attempts to absorb her, but he realizes that in her paper, many explosive tags are mixed in, creating a large explosion. Toby survives but loses his right arm and part of his mask. Conan, realizing her suicide plan did not work, quickly calls on the massive amount of paper around the battlefield for another attack. Conan uses her ultimate technique, the paper person of god technique, to create an abyss, and attempts to kill Toby by placing 600 billion explosive tags in it, which will continue to detonate for 10 minutes. Since Toby can only remain immaterial for 5 minutes, she believes that this would be enough to affect him. Using Izanagi, however, Toby is able to survive the blast and impales Conan from behind with a pipe. He explains how he survived and Conan frees herself from the pipe. Amagakure's endless rain stops and produces a rainbow, which shocks Toby to see the endless rains of the village stop and spurs Conan on who believes it to be a sign of Nagato and Yagyo's will. Though Conan tries again to attack with her paper, Toby, having become fed up with the delay in retrieving the Rinnegan, grabs her by the throat. He then places her under a Genjutsu in an attempt to learn the whereabouts of the Rinnegan, stating that when the illusion ended, so would her life. Afterwards, Toby arrives at the gravesite of Yahiko and Nagato, the latter of whom is teleported into Toby's separate dimension. Meanwhile, Conan's body lays in the water. The following flashback demonstrates a system dry used to verify the presence of the intruders in the house where he lived with Nagato, Yahiko, and Conan. By flipping a card on the wall, a person could indicate whether or not they were at home. The red side indicates that the person is there, and the white side with the frog head states the person's away. Even after Jiraiya left, the three kept up with the hop-in card system. Eventually, their group becomes too large and they prepare to leave the house for good. Conan flips her card to the wayside, but before Yahiko and Nagato get the opportunity to do so, they're ambushed by a group of enemy ninja and forced to flee through a secret escape row. Presently, the house is overgrown with vines and flowers on the inside. With the exception of Conan, all the other frog cards, including Jiraiya's, which growing vines had flipped, are still flipped to the red side, saying that they are at home. As a bloodied sheet of paper flies off Conan's corpse, it lands on her hop-in card and covers it red. Toby appears before Kabuto, his arm restored, wearing a new mask resembling the Eye of the Ten Tails, his old Uchiha robes, replacing his Gatsuki uniform, and wielding a war fan. Kabuto mentions that Toby went through a lot of trouble to obtain his new eye, to which Toby replies that they were his to begin with. Zetsu informs him that Kisame succeeded in delivering the information that he obtained. After hearing this, Toby slams his war fan on the ground and states that it's time to go after the Nine Tails. Kabuto decides to get Naruto and B instead in order to gain Toby's trust and that Yamato is in the interest of his experiments. Kabuto says he also knows Zetsu's secrets and says that he can make it stronger. Toby says that he'll give him one Zetsu if he captures the Nine Tails. He then takes Kabuto to the chamber that holds the demonic statue of the other path and shows him a mindless copy of Hashirama that Toby created from his cells. He then shows him his army that is made of roughly 100,000 white Zetsu, though at the cost of using the collected Tails Beast Chakra. Back on the island, B was unable to chase after Kisame's shark and returns to the others. Motoi summons an owl to notify the Red Kage that Akatsuki knows of the location. All the Kage received the information and decide to send back up to the island, which is actually a giant tortoise, which Onoki volunteers to be the backup. Kabuto leaves along with the undead Data on his clay owl to get the remaining Jinchuriki. Onoki, Akatsuki, and Kurotsuchi fly off to be the island's reinforcements, while Kabuto sets up to the island as well. Kabuto inserts a tag in Data's head, which gives him most of his free will back. Kabuto is suddenly punched by Onoki, which turns out to be a clay clone made by Data. The real Kabuto and Data are hiding in the clouds, and Data sets off an explosion. On the island, Naruto lines up all the animals in a cave for his ecology survey mission to still unaware of the war. The Onoki that Datera blew up was actually a rock clone made by Akatsuchi. They're surprised that Datera is still alive, with Onoki being ashamed that Datera is causing trouble even in death and that he lost to Sasuke. Datera responds to this saying he killed Sasuke, unaware that he survived the suicide explosion. In the ocean, a giant snake of Kabuto's, his clone of Manda, which he calls Manda 2, bites the island turtle's tail, which reveals its location with its screams of pain. Kabuto and Datera head to the island with Onoki on their tail. Manda 2 flips over the island turtle, which Naruto thinks is an earthquake, and Kabuto and Datera land on the turtle. Kabuto leaves Datera to handle Onoki while he finds Naruto and B. Onoki arrives, enraged and preparing a dust release detachment of the primitive world technique. He is however stopped by Akatsuchi who states the power of the technique can blow up the other turtle. Datera suddenly sends a clay bird towards them and sets it off, but Akatsuchi protects him and Anoki with his rock golem. Kabuto learns from Manda 2 of Naruto's location and asks where inside the turtle. Naruto decides to check what's causing the earthquakes, but Yamato tells him that only he can complete his mission, which Naruto believes. Kurotsuchi notices Kabuto controlling Manda 2 and tries to stop him with lava release, quick lime congealing technique, which Kabuto dodges. Yamato, Moto, and Alba arrive to see the situation outside, and both Yamato and Alba are shocked to see Kabuto and how much he's changed. They all work with Kurosuchi to capture Kabuto and gather intel from him, but Kabuto sheds into a snake-like form, similar to Orochimaru's true form, and swallows Yamato and makes a getaway into Manda 2's nostril. Manda 2 is de-summoned along with Datera, saying that it has started to get fun as he vanishes. Kabuto returns to Toby's lair with Yamato, planning to use Yamato's wood release to strengthen Zetsu army. Toby tells him to hurry as his new left Rinnegan eye craves for battle. Meanwhile, as Anoki, Akatsuchi, and Kurotsuchi relocate the island turtle to Kumagakure, Killer B keeps Naruto from leaving and having him undergo training to control the Ninetales Chakra. Anko's scouting team sends information about Toby's lair, known as Mountain
Shinobi and Kabuto who uses Yamato to strengthen his Zetsu. Kabuto increases the army's size by reincarnating former Akatsuki members, previous Jinchuriki, Kage, and famous Shinobi, Hisashi Hyuga, Don Kato, Asuma Saratobi, Hanzo, Chiyo, Kibimaro, Zabuza Momochi, Haku, Gari, Pakura, Chukichi, Shin, and Toroi as they march off to begin the war. Fourth Shinobi World War, Confrontation The first battle that happened in the war began when Kankuro and the surprise attack division found Muta Aburame, a member of Anko's search team. However, what the division did not know is that Muta was captured by Kabuto's surprise attack and diversion platoon and had been placed under Sasori's control with his insect jar filled with data as explosive clay. Though Zaji almost got himself killed to save who he thought was an injured comrade, despite Muta pleading him not to come any closer, Kankuro quickly saved Zaji. Itan then gets him to safety by lowering the ground before data had detonated the explosive clay and killed Muta. In response, Sasori sends Muta's fellow enslaved teammates Ranka and Tokuma Hyuga to attack as Shin and Data emerge from hiding, with Kankuro correctly deducing that Sasori was with them and behind the initial attacks. Vowing to make the Akatsuki pay for pitting them against their friends, Omoi launches himself to Data, but the attack is revealed to be a feint as his intended target was the chakra strength controlling Ranka and Tokuma. Kankuro then quickly attaches his own chakra strength to Sasori's to pull him down while telling Itan to raise the ground. Now exposed, Sasori uses Shin as a puppet as the allied ninja realizes the deceased root ninja is stuffed with explosives and Kankuro and Omoi managing to contain the explosion. Furious that his brother was used as a bomb, Sai knocked down Sasori and Deira, who were captured by Kankuro. After seeing the picture finished in Sai's picture book, Shin's ties to the world were severed and he could pass on, breaking the summoning bind. Chukichi was returning to reinforce Deira and Sasori. Sasori is then released from the summoning thanks to Kankuro telling him he was immortalized by the puppets he created. With newfound information about the releasing of reincarnated ninja by freeing their soul, Kankuro prepares his team to launch their ambush. Elsewhere, Tobi meets up with Kabuto, who managed to defeat and capture Uncle Midarashi. Though sensing Sasori and Shin's release from his technique, Kabuto still has a good feeling about how things are going according to his plan as he tells Tobi to go ahead to the front lines while he stays hidden and focuses on his technique. Gazing at Anko, Tobi realizes that Kabuto led her near his location in the hopes that he and the allied Shinobi forces would take each other out. However, though Kabuto believes he's using them, Tobi quietly states that it's vice versa. Killer B attempts to teach Naruto how to use the tailed beast ball, but Naruto cannot turn into the Ninetales because his bond with it is weak. The Eight Tails then explain to Naruto that whenever he uses the Ninetales chakra, he stocks his own and the Ninetales can steal it. In the end, Naruto could lose it all and die if he uses his chakra constantly, and using Shadow Clone speeds up the process, making them useless. The Eight Tails explain that he and B were able to compromise on how much chakra each would take from the other, eliminating the risk. Naruto decides to focus on his own skills with the Ninetales chakra, trying to perform the Rasengan using the Fox's chakra shadow to make extra hands in lieu of Shadow Clones. Killer B notices the technique is similar to the Tail Beast Ball, and upon learning it was created by the 4th Hokage, tells Naruto to keep working on it. While the surprise attack division were waiting for the incoming enemy force, they encountered Zabuza Momochi, Haku, and two other ninja, Gari of Iwagakure's Explosion Corps and Pakuro from Tsunagakure. Haku was able to defend against the first attack and then attacks once he and the other reincarnated shinobi quickly realized their invincibility. When he and his third division arrived to stop them from killing, Kakashi engages Zabuza and Haku in brief chat over the two ninjas' impact on Naruto, until Kabuto renders Zabuza's group into mindless killing machines to begin the attack. Though Kakashi said he got an idea of how to counter, Kabuto does not give him any time to enact it as he has Gari and Pakuro summon Zabuza's reincarnated teammates from his days as a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Though only most of them have their traditional blades, Zabuza's hiding in mist technique enables him to slaughter about a dozen more allied shinobi. Kakashi developed a plan involving Ensui Nara, Sante Yamanaka, and Maki to trap Zabuza and end his hiding in mist technique. However, Haku once again acts as a human shield for Zabuza, holding Kakashi in place so Zabuza can slash through them both. Kakashi survived being slashed and immediately countered, allowing Maki to immobilize the recovering Haku and Zabuza. Though the hiding and mist technique ended as he planned, Kakashi expresses his rage about how impure world reincarnation is used in such an unforgivable manner. In the Land of Lightning, Gar picks up the presence of the second Suchikage, Mu, with the concealed sand picture cat. Kabuto decides to have Mu summon the reincarnated second Mizukage, the third Raikage, and the fourth Kazakage, the four curious of how they're even alive. The fourth Kazakage explains to his fellow Kage that they were brought back by the impure world reincarnation, detailing the technique's history while speculating the reincarnation to be Orochimaru's doing before noticing that they're all being watched by his son. Ao informs the Kage of the reincarnation both of their predecessors and the famed powerful shinobi such as the Gold and Silver Brothers Kumo. Enraged upon hearing of his father and his village's two infamous traitors being among the reincarnated, A decides to enter the battlefield, but Tsunade keeps him from doing so. Shikaku Nara formulates battle plans with portions of the 2nd, 4th, and 5th divisions to assist the 1st division, which the Raikage approves. Elsewhere, arriving to what appears to be the hideaway of the country's daimyo, Black Zetsu makes his move to take them, but ends up alerting the guarding shinobi with the daimyo revealed to be hidden elsewhere. Black Zetsu escapes from the guards and continues his objective. Meitorumi and Chojo accompany the Frost daimyo while he is escorted to the safe house, while putting him at ease that the repeated moving of the daimyo from one safe house to another is going to hinder the enemy's search for them. At the land of Lightning's coast, Chozo Akamichi confronts Dan and Asuma Saratobi while Hiyashi Hyuga confronts his reincarnated brother, Hizashi Hyuga. Darui reluctantly decides to take on Kinkaku and Kinkaku, the treacherous Gold and Silver Brothers who betrayed Kumagakure in life, with Samui and her brother Atsui aiding him. However, the brothers unveil the treasured tools of the Sage of Six Paths. A informs Tsunade that Kinkaku and Kinkaku are able to use these Sage of Six Paths tools as they ingested some Ninetales chakra during a failed attempt to capture the unsealed tailed beast long ago. When Kinkaku tackles Atsui and Samui with the Kokinjo, Kinkaku severs their pulled word souls with a Shichi Saiken and places them inside the Benhisago. The siblings try to keep themselves quiet so as to not use their most spoken word to get sucked into the Benhisago, but Atsui gets sealed once tricked into saying hot by Kinkaku creating a wave of fire with the Basho Sen. 
Kinkaku holds Samui hostage to leave Daru to drop his weapon, only to slice Kinkaku's arm and aims his storm release laser circus on Kinkaku to free Samui. But as Kinkaku kicks his sliced arms wrapped with Kokinjo at him to pull out his soul word, Daru is horrified to find Samui sealed despite her silence, and that he will suffer her fate if silent for too long. Though he knew not to say it, his attempt to defend against his brother's notion that he is the pawn of the Rikage forced Daru to say the word that has a similar pronunciation to Dull. Luckily, he manages to escape the ceiling when his apology habit changed his most spoken word from Dull to Sari. Knocking Kinkaku into the Kokinjo, while commandeering both the Shichi Saiken and the Benihisago, Daru uses Kinkaku Kinkaku's most used word, Kinkaku, to seal him away. This causes Kinkaku to assume a six-tailed pseudo Jinchuriki form to demolish the first division, with A seeing the only way to stop the rampaging monsters to seal him in the only item of the Sage of Six Paths Kumo managed to keep from brothers, the Kohaku no Johei. Mabui uses her heavenly transfer technique to send Daru the ceiling pot while receiving aid from Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi, and Ino Yamanaka as they use their formation Ino Shikacho to restrain Kinkaku long enough for Daru to seal him in the Kohaku no Johei. At the land of hot water, Chukichi receives backup from a team consisting of Hanzo, Chiyo, and Kimimaro to fight the surprise attack division. Hearing their arrival, with Deidara demanding his allies save him, Kankuro's team attempts to fall back when Hanzo summons his salamander Ibuse to paralyze surprise attack division. Hanzo is stopped from killing Kankuro by the arrival of his old enemy, Mifune, and his division. Mifune fights Hanzo, impeding him from using ninjutsu by attacking when he stops to weave hand seals. He remembers having fought Hanzo in his youth, and the two discuss their ideals during the fight. Hanzo decides to have faith in Mifune, injures himself, and creates an opening which allows Mifune's division to seal him. Back on the Land of Lightning's coast, Darui, Izumo Kamizuki, and Kotetsu Hagane go against Kakuzu and his heart monsters, while Team Asuma fights their reincarnated teacher. However, while well noting his student's growth, Asuma uses his wind release dust cloud technique on a hesitant Choji before Ino saves him. Despite Asuma's words for him to fight back, Choji could not attack his mentor as Ino takes control of his body to fight in a teammate's place. After being saved by his father and riding the oath forged among the Ino Shikacho groups, encouraged to fight without holding back, Choji creates butterfly wings without the assistance of his clan's pills to the other's amazement. Ino controls white Zetsu clones to hold Asuma long enough for Choji and Shikamaru to hit and immobilize him. Before being sealed, Asuma thanks them and compliments them on their great teamwork. Choji asks his teammates to help him finish the war once and for all, to which they happily agree. Back at the island turtle while training, Naruto suddenly sends the Nine Tails chakra within the rampaging six tailed Kinkaku who is far away from the temple. Wanting to investigate, Naruto is able to trick Killer B into letting him out, but is confronted by Shibi Aburame and a team of Konoha ninja who try to persuade him to explain him what's happening back inside the temple. Despite Iriko Umino's attempted lie, Naruto is Assumes sage mode to force his way out of the false of truth, getting caught in Nara Clan Ninja's shadow imitation technique before sensing the chakra of his friends and other ninja fighting. Having no choice, Irika tells Naruto the truth that Tobi's declared war and reveals that they've been instructed to protect Naruto and Killer B from Tobi. After remembering his talk with Nagato, Naruto tells Irika that his role is to stop the war and that he will endure the pain on his own. Despite Irika's insistence, Naruto reminds his mentor that he was the first to recognize him for more than a Jinchuriki and gave him his first forehead protector. Irika stares down at the forehead protector and hands it to Naruto before using a barrier technique that is countered with his former student's Nine Tails chakra. As Naruto puts his forehead protector back on, he finds a hidden note slips out from Irika telling him to come back alive. Emerging from the Falls of Truth, B follows Naruto to keep him safe. Black Zetsu manages to find the location of the Daimyo but finds himself fighting Mei Torumi and the Daimyo Protection Squad. However, sensing Naruto and Killer B breaking out of the self-repairing barrier covering the island turtle, Black Zetsu informs White Zetsu of the Jinchuriki's escape. With this new information, Toby deems the need to have the Daimyo as bargaining chips for the Jinchuriki no longer needed and decides to enter the front lines while giving Black Zetsu new orders to use guerrilla tactics on Mei's group. Arriving on the Land of Lightning's coast, as Daru and Kitsuchi's divisions have defeated the White Zetsu and sealed most of the reincarnated ninja, Kakuzu included, Tobi summons the demonic statue of the Outer Path. As the statue fights Choza, Chochi, and the other allied shinobi, Tobi uses the opportunity to obtain the Benihisago and the Kohaku no Johei, containing the sealed gold and silver brothers. Shikamaru realizes that Tobi actually set the event of the brothers' sealing, Tobi taking his prize as Shikamaru and Daru are saved from the statue by Choji and Kitsuchi before it vanished. Learning of Tobi and the demonic statue's appearances on the battlefield, along with Naruto and B leaving the island turtle, A leaves Shikaku in charge while he and Tsunade leave to stop the Jinchuriki. As night approaches, Tobi states that his Eye of the Moon plan is to be commenced the next day. As night falls while he's heading to the battlefield, Naruto is dragged into his subconscious with the Nine Tails, as it chides Naruto for thinking he can handle both the war and Sasuke's hatred. However, Naruto is confident that he can shoulder both of them and shocks the Nine Tails with the intent to someday help the Tailed Beast with his own hatred. At Kiba Inuzuka's insistence, due to his overuse of the Byakugan, Neji Hyuga is sent from the 5th Division camp to logistical support and medical division compound where Sakura Haruno attends to his injuries. At this time, word is spread that ninja are being killed off in the compound despite the sensors not detecting an enemy presence, and everyone reaches the conclusion that there's a spy among them. Sakura exposes the real spy as a white Zetsu posing as Neji. Interrogating the white Zetsu about how he is able to copy Neji right down to his chakra, Sakura realizes the clones can siphon a person's chakra and assume their form, with no one able to tell a real ninja from a white Zetsu. As other ninja arrive to assist Sakura while she reports the information to headquarters, the real Neji is revealed to have never left the 5th Division camp. At HQ, Shikaku receives the information and out informs him of chakras disappearing all over the divisions. Shikaku then begins to formulate a countermeasure against this imminent threat to find the imposters. By that time, A and Tsunade appear before the Jinchuriki with the former having no intention to let Naruto go any further and resolving to kill him if they need to delay Tobi's plans. However, B halts his brother's attack as he reminds him how they formed the AB combo and everything they've been through including their time with their cousin and their confrontation with Naruto's father, Mita Tanamakaze. Though Tsunade decides that Naruto can enter the war, A refuses to allow it before being taken down by B's lightning release Lariat defeats his brother. B tells A that his and Naruto's powers don't come from him being Jinchuriki, and that his brother's words, saying that he's important to him, has made B surpass him. B also tells him that as long as he has people he cares about, he can overcome the tailed beast within him. B calls A as his son, the person he cares about 
and Naruto calls his parents his sons. Naruto tells A how he met both Minato and Kushina, and that they believed that he could control the Nine Tails. Sonata states that she will fight A if he continues his attempt to kill Naruto, but A charges towards Naruto, who manages to successfully dodge A's top speed punch, saying he will not fail. A reveals he was just testing Naruto to see if he could avoid his punch, and tells Naruto to get going. Back at HQ, Shikaku learns that the only way to discover who are the White Zetsu clones is to have Naruto scatter his shadow clones at the locations, as Nine Tails Chakra can sense malice. But knowing A will disapprove, Mabui doubts that it'll happen. A Katsuyu clone informs them of A letting Naruto enter the war. The sun rises, marking the second day of the Four Shinobi World War. Toby makes his move, having his own six paths of pain composed of the reincarnated Jinchuriku of eyes that mirror Toby's. Knowing Naruto can't sense malice in the Nine Tails forum, Toby knows that Naruto will be taking out the White Zetsu, saying that it's going along perfectly. Back at the Logistical Support Medical Division compound, Shizune and Sakura learn the secrets about the White Zetsu, using the clone that Sakura captured. Shizune reveals that the White Zetsu have the same DNA as Yamato, meaning they are altered plant clones of the first Okage. A and Sonata return to HQ and learn about the White Zetsu clones being created from the first Okage cells. Believing that Madara developed a technique with her grandfather's cells to extend his life, Sonata states there is no clue on how to defeat somebody who is truly immortal. As Naruto and B head towards the battlefield, Shikaku contacts him telepathically through Inoichi's technique, telling him to search for the White Zetsu and explaining about Tobi, Kabuto, and the reincarnated Shinobi. Naruto and B come across a group of ninja heading back to defend HQ, but were revealed by Naruto to actually be a small force of White Zetsu. Naruto takes out a majority of them and then summons Gamahiro to squish a merged White Zetsu and look out for more White Zetsu with B, while he sends his shadow clone to the other battlefields. When Nagato and Itachi Uchiha encounter Naruto and Killer B, Kabuto planned to capture and use them to further black male Tobi. The battle reveals some truth on Itachi's mission, and much to his chagrin, Itachi learns that Sasuke has turned to Tobi instead of returning to Konoha. The battle begins with Nagato forcefully summoning his bird and his multi-headed dog monsters to battle Naruto. Joining in the fight, Itachi eventually activates his Mangekyo Sharingan. This causes the crow Itachi to place inside Naruto to come out using Kodo Amatsukami on Itachi, freeing him from Kabuto's control as he uses a Matarasu on Nagato and his summons. However, Kabuto responds by removing Nagato's personality to make him a more ideal weapon. When B enters his version 2 form to attack with lightning release Lariat, Nagato uses the Predipath's ability to absorb B's chakra. Regaining his vibrant appearance, Nagato grabs Naruto and begins to remove his soul. Naruto tries to escape by attacking Nagato with a Rasengan, but he absorbs it. B tries to cut Nagato to save Naruto, but he stops him using the Asura Path ability and almost succeeds in removing Naruto's soul and destroying B until Itachi intercepts with his Susano and attacks the summoning's eyes, making them disappear. Nagato proceeds to use Chibaku Tensei to trap the three, but is stopped by the combined effort of Itachi's Yasuka Magatama, B's Tailed Beast Ball, and Naruto's Wind Release Rasen Shuriken to destroy the sphere at the center of the attack. As the smoke clears, Nagato finds himself impaled by Susano's Sword of Tatsuka, and his personality returns. Itachi then seals him, but not before Nagato gives his last words to Naruto, telling him that he was part of a trilogy that included Dry and himself and to correct the wrongs he had done during his lifetime. Once done sealing Nagato, Itachi then takes his leave to find Kabuto in order to undo the impure world reincarnation. Seeing the youth weakened from his use of the Nine Tails Chakra mode, Itachi advises him not to overburden himself like he did himself and to remember those that are helping him as B tells the youth of the promise he made to Iruka. Itachi then incinerates the crow as Shisui's eye cannot be used for another decade and to ensure that it would not fall into enemy hands. And then Itachi departs. Frustrated by losing Nagato and Itachi, Kabuto considers bringing out his trump card to compensate for the turn of events. Using the dustless, bewildering cover, Mu was able to infiltrate the Land of Lightning undetected until Gara was able to locate him on the first day. Mu then summoned the second Mizukage, the third Raikage, and the fourth Kazukage, with the fourth division drawing the reincarnated Kage further into the Land of Lightning, while part of the division under Shikamaru broke off to aid Darui in his fight against Kinkaku in the Land of Lightning's coast. Once the battle on the Land of Lightning's coast was won, with the first division boxing their opponents from the rear, Gara and Onoki engaged the Kage with their attacks, countered by their respective predecessors. As Gara comes into sight, his father is shocked to see that Gara is no longer a Jinchuriki as the two engage with their attacks, cancelling each other out. However, by attempting to protect two of the other Kage from an aerial barrage, Gara restrains his father and his counters continue to fail in the face of Gara's shield of sand. After Gara learns the truth about his mother, seals his father, turning his attention to third Raikage and second Mizukage with a new determination as the new Kage engage him and divulge their abilities. Meanwhile, Onoki follows Mu, who has become invisible, and states that Onoki is going to die if he doesn't call Gara over. Onoki tells Mu not to underestimate him as he makes several clones. As the Mizukage overwhelms their forces with his clams mirage, Gara spots Mu as he's attacking Onoki from behind before noticing a Rasengan behind the reincarnated Tsuchikage. Naruto's planetary Rasengan misses at first, but then manages to hit Mu with a second attack thanks to Gara. Just as he's sealed by Gara, Mu utters a warning yet his silence once the seal is complete. After learning of Naruto's resolve to fight with them, Gara and Anoki part ways with the youth as he goes to where Tamara uses wind release cast net technique to seemingly incapacitate the Raikage, offering his assistance as wind chakra uses are effective against their opponent. After two missed Rasen and Shuriken, Naruto finally manages to hit the Raikage with the technique, but the Raikage recovers fast as the allied shinobi prepare multiple earth walls, supported by Dodai's lava release rubber wall, to defend against the Raikage's strongest ninjutsu, Hellstab. But seeing him break through all the defenses, Dodai explains that the third was very resilient and was only injured when he fought the Eight Tails. Despite attempting the Tail Beast Rasengan, Naruto fails to fully form it and is forced out of the Nine Tails Chakra Mode. Naruto tells Dodai that he needs to contact B in the Eight Tails. Kabuto focuses all the third Raikage's attacks on Naruto, but Dodai forms a rubber ball as a decoy to buy Naruto some time. Naruto then asks the Eight Tails how he defeated the third Raikage, when he learned that both fought each other to a standstill and the third Raikage had only been injured after he fell. Suspecting what had happened, he entered Sage Mode and created a Rasengan. He plans on using Frog Kata to sense the Raikage's attack faster. The Raikage attacks with one finger Nukite, but Naruto dodges and hit the Raikage's arm with a Rasengan, knocking the attack into his own chest. The ceiling team immediately seals the Raikage. Elsewhere, Gara faces the second Mizukage alone and notices how his
Earth Release Rock Fist technique combined with Earth Release Super Added Weight Rock technique to destroy it, revealing the Mizukage's real body. Onoki throws out his back, rendering him immobile, as the Mizukage uses Water Gun technique to shoot out what he learns was a sand clone as he envelops him. The second starts to wash away the sand with oil, but Gaara layers the sand into his desert-layered Imperial Funeral before it explodes. As hail begins to fall, Onoki explains to Gaara that this is the second steaming danger tyranny as his clone reconstitutes. The explosive clone wreaks havoc, with Gaara protecting his division before fighting the clone and managing to incapacitate it with a sand clone with his father's gold dust mist into it. With the sand clone along with the clone's heat to fuse the gold to his body, the clone then finds the real Gaara and attacks him only to be stopped by Gaara's sand and stop him exploding. Greatly impressed by this feat, the second Mizukage beams at Gaara before being sealed. Earlier at the mountain's graveyard, Sasuke recovers from his surgery but is told by White Zetsu to keep the bandages on for the time being. However, as Naruto and Gaara fought the third Rakage and the second Mizukage, Sasuke attacks White Zetsu with his Susanoo and sets him ablaze with Matarasu. Saying that his eyes can see just fine in the dark and he should try them outside, Sasuke removes his bandages to see with his newly evolved Eternal Monkey Kyo Sharingan. In the rubble of a smashed pillar, a damaged move stands up. He reveals that he split his body in two and that only half of him was sealed. He tries to remove the tags from his other half, but the seal is too strong in his weakened state. Mu then, eventually due to his weakened state, performs a summoning of the reincarnated ninja who is Kabuto's ultimate weapon. The figure, whose power is so intense that the coffin's lid burst open, is revealed to be Madara Ochiha. Fourth Shinobi World War, Climax. After emerging from his coffin, Madara believed he'd been brought back by Nagata using Outer Path Samsara of Heavenly Life technique until Mu reveals the technique to be impure world reincarnation. When Madara questions Mu about the user of the technique's identity, Kabuto takes full control of the Suchikage to explain to the reincarnated Uchiha that he brought him back and has made enhancements that will give him greater power than he ever had in the prime of his life. News of this turn of events reaches the fourth division's location with Gaara leading the attack as Madara counters with a widespread fire technique, which is countered by the combined usage of water formation wall by several shinobi. Moving on to general melee attacks, given free reign by Kabuto, Madara wreaks havoc on the 4th division, prompting Onoki to raise the ground below him to force him into Naruto's ultra big ball Rasengan. Madara responds by activating his eternal Monkey Kyo Sharingan and blocking the attack with the Susanoo, and goes on to continue decimating the division's forces. As Naruto enters sage mode and creates his attack, Onoki lightens Gaara's sand, allowing him to manipulate it easier, which he uses to pull Madara out of Susanoo into the path of Naruto's sage mode enhanced Rasen Shuriken. Claiming the attack to be too much, Madara surprisingly activates his Rinnegan and uses the Predapath's Chakra Absorption Technique to dispel the technique, to which Kabuto rejoices that the hypothesis he came up with based on the data gathered by Hinorochimaru was validated, as he improved Madara's body beyond what it was in his prime. Madara reveals that his power is not of Kabuto's creation but his own, using his twin-bodied Susanoo to weave two seals at once in conjunction with his own, pulling a giant asteroid earthbound towards the fourth division, stunning everyone, leading Gaara to question whether this was the power of a god. As the giant meteorite descends, Onoki tells the allied shinobi not to give up before even trying. He flies towards the meteorite intending to lighten it. Gaara orders everyone to retreat as he stays behind to help Onoki. Kabuto, speaking through Mu, surmises that Madara intends to destroy everything with the meteor, and Madara states that he's correct as he will simply regenerate. Onoki successfully lightens the meteorite as Gaara catches it with his sand. Madara asks what they will do about the second one as it collides with the first. At the allied HQ, discussing their masked foe's reason for calling himself Madara Uchiha with A and Shikaku, Sonata believes that it was to play on their fear the name itself presents and how their opponent used Madara's name to get the world's attention and drag it into war. The shock from the second meteorite its impact reaches HQ. They receive intel about what happened, and they determine that it must be Madara's attack. Sonata states that she will be heading to the front. Back at the battlefield, there are barely any survivors left. Dodai protected Naruto's clone due to him being a valuable asset. Onoki was severely injured by the attack. Madara and Mu regenerate, and they speak about Madara's plans. They notice survivors, and Madara attempts to summon the Ninetales, but fails due to it being sealed. Kabuto points out that the Jinchuriki is Naruto Uzumaki. Madara uses Hashirama's wood-release secret technique, Nativity of the World of Trees, to attack the remaining allied forces. The Ninetales gives Naruto some of its chakra without any of its will, preferring to help Naruto over being trolled by Madara. Naruto rushes towards the approaching forest and creates many shadow clones. The clones create multiple big ball Rasengan and destroy the advancing forest. Naruto says that he used up all the Ninetales chakra and that he feels like he could disappear at any moment. Onoki tells Naruto to rest while he finishes the battle. He proclaims that it's finally time to pick himself up off the ground and that there's no opponent more worthy than Madara Uchiha. Onoki decides to take on both Madara and Mu with the assistance of the remaining 4th Division. Tsunade and Ei decide to head to Madara's location through Mabui's Heavenly Transfer Technique, a technique that only transports objects as transporting a living being would surely rip them apart. However, Tsunade decides to take the gamble using her Yin Seal release. Shikaku telepathically communicates to Genma to have him, Raido, and other Konoha Shinobi perform the Flying Thunder God technique to transport Mei to Madara's location as well after Chojuro incapacitates Black Zetsu with a single slash. The three Kage arrive on the battlefield and prepare to fight Madara. Mei and A battle Madara while Tsunade heals Gara and Onoki. Gara and Onoki protect the group when Madara goes on the offensive. The five Kage tell Naruto's clone that he isn't needed on the battlefield anymore and urge him to beat the other Madara. The clone disperses. Naruto and B encounter Tobi and Naruto headbutts him head on, sending them both reeling. Tobi's mask doesn't even get a scratch on it. B catches Naruto and advises him to calm down. Naruto comments on Tobi's new mask's appearance and strength, which Tobi replies is due to the mask being made of materials suitable for war. Then Naruto and B start fighting Tobi's six paths of pain. Roshi begins the attack by launching lava boulders at his opponents which B and Naruto respond by attacking head-on. Yagura somehow manages to counter the attacks, causing B and Naruto to fall into Utakata's trap. B and Naruto manage to escape it, but find themselves being blinded by Fu, which was followed by fast attacks from Yugito and Han, and though the assault was successfully blocked, Naruto and B were still driven back. Tobi finds out that Madara was reincarnated, and the youth demanding to know who he truly is, he tells Naruto that he is a nobody, and that the only thing that truly matters is him completing the Eye of the Moon plan. When Naruto and B state their own goal of tearing the mask off to find out who he truly is, Tobi ends the conversation by proclaiming that he will capture both of them and complete his plans. Naruto states that they won't hand over the Eight Tails and the Nine Tails. B 
questions if the Jinjuri have their tailed beast removed, and the Eight Tails concludes that they must have been resealed, as it can sense them in their hosts, though different. B begins attacking despite Naruto's call to wait. B attacks Fu with Samehara, but she dodges it by flying. B launches his swords coated in lightning chakra from her blind spot, but she dodges it as the other Jinjuri go watch the two. B wonders how she could dodge from a blind spot, so Naruto tells him about the Rinnegan's shared field of vision. Roshi cuts himself in lava and attacks Naruto, who narrowly evades it, the heat burning his cheek. Yugito launches her guided attack and clashes with B, cutting his scarf. B and Naruto take cover, and B is surprised by her speed, and the Eight Tails points out that the Sharingan allows him to react faster, while the Rinnegan coordinates attacks. Naruto tells B and the Eight Tails about the Paths of Pain and the Black Receivers. B points out one of Yugito's chests from a hit he landed earlier. Naruto goes in the open and tries to strangle the receiver and Roshi will be attacked, but is stopped by Han. The Eight Tails says the forest will hinder their field of vision, so B transforms into the Eight Tails to level the forest. B devastates the forest, also knocking down the other Jichuriki. At the Allied Shinobi HQ, Ao detects that B is transformed into the Eight Tails. Inoichi receives updates on the Kage, holding Madara back. Shikaku requests the other division's statuses and learns that the first and second divisions are almost done with their enemies. The third is only one more reincarnated shinobi to seal, and the fifth has the advantage in their fight. Shikaku orders that as soon as they're done, they go to back up B and Naruto, and asks their coordinates. Naruto notes that the Jinchuriki are down, and the Eight Tails urges B to seal them. B spits out ink clones, which proceed to lock them down in place. Before the clones finish sealing them, Tobi appears from underground. The Jinchuriki advance their transformations and resume attacking. Fu and Yugito tag team on Naruto, followed by Yagura, who impairs Naruto's movements. Meanwhile, Utakata frees himself from B's hold, and Roshi attacks. The Eight Tails is concerned and thinks they should retreat, but B is rammed by Han, who is fully transformed into the Five Tails. Tobi moves in to warp Naruto away, stating that 6 against 2 puts the odds in his favor. However, he was thwarted as Kakashi and Gai attack Tobi with his violent, leaf adamantine strength whirlwind technique, which causes Tobi to become intangible and slip through Naruto while Kakashi retrieves Naruto. Naruto is happy to see them, while Tobi states that two more shinobi doesn't make much of a difference against the power of his eyes and the tailed beasts. Kakashi then states that they too have a Sharingan, followed by Gai, who states not to underestimate him as he was Konoha's sublime green beast of prey. At the mountain's graveyard, Sasuke breaks out of the hideout, while elsewhere, having escaped the samurai, Jugo and Sugetsu discuss Sasuke and Karin, as well as Sugetsu's gold to collect swords as they head back to one of Orochimaru's hideouts. On the battlefield, Naruto warns Gai and Kakashi about Tobi's abilities. As the Five Tails attacks, Guy frees Naruto from the coral before seeing the beast turn on Tobi, who chains and suppresses the Five Tails, who is dismayed at being controlled in that manner. The Eight Tails tries crushing Tobi, but he simply slips through it. Tobi returns Han back to his version 2 form. Guy and Kakashi speculate that Tobi doesn't have full control of the tailed beasts. The Eight and Nine Tailed Beasts speak to each other telepathically about the treatment of the tailed beasts, and the Nine Tails says that as the second strongest beast going by tails, the Eight Tails should just finish the battle already and feign sleep. The Eight Tails snaps back, saying that his belief about their powers being defined by the number of tails is exactly why Shukaku hated the Nine Tails so much. Guy and Kakashi charge at the Jinchuriki, intended to figure out which of the six paths of pain techniques each one used, only to conclude that Tobi isn't making them use the six paths techniques because they already have strategies against those. Tobi praises them for figuring that out and then proceeds to make Roshi and Utakata transform completely. Naruto falls out of the Ninetales chakra boat and considers creating more shadow clones with the Ninetales chakra as diversions. B thinks that creating more clones would surely kill him, but the Eighttails points out that Naruto should have already been on the break of death and thinks that the Ninetales has stopped taking Naruto's chakra for a while. The Six Tails attacks Kakashi and Guy who dodge. The Four Tails tosses the Eight Tails and Naruto almost falls into its mouth, but resists being eaten by the Four Tails, now back in the Nine Tails chakra mode as the Nine Tails opens one eye watching on. The Four Tails tosses the Eight Tails on the ground and keeps forcing his mouth shut with Naruto in it with the Nine Tails watching on. Guy wants to save Naruto, but Kakashi points out their own unfortunate situation between two attack fronts, the Six Tails corrosive gas and the other Jinchuriki's chakra arms. Kakashi creates a shadow clone and slices through the arms while Guy punches and burns the gas away. The Eight Tails wraps its tentacles around the Four Tails, telling it to let go of Naruto. The Eight Tails tells the Nine Tails that heard it helped Naruto against Madara, the Nine Tails saying it won't wag its tails to help Jinchuriki as easily as the Eight Tails. The Eight Tails questions if it doesn't care at all about what happens to Naruto. The Nine Tails recalls how many shinobi in the past have restrained it and denied it an identity. The Four Tails closes its mouth and Naruto meets the Four Tails, bound by chains. It asks if Naruto is there to take his power and demands to be called by his proper name, making a boisterous introduction. Naruto apologizes for not listening to Son Goku, which impresses it. Naruto and Son Goku discuss issues of recognition, identity, and existence. The Four Tails laughs when Naruto says he's jealous of how B and the Eight Tails are with each other before seeing Naruto is serious about it. Considering Naruto to be a better sight than Tobi, Son Goku offers to help Naruto if he can undo the chains that bind it. Son Goku tells Naruto that it won't become his ally even if he saves it unless he can trust Naruto who's okay with that. Kurama ponders that it knows Naruto and that nothing he can say will reach Tailed Beast. Tobi pulls Son towards himself with chains intent on absorbing them both. B is still trying to make Son open his mouth and release Naruto. Naruto fails to make Son open his mouth and decides using the multiple shadow clone technique to make Son puke him out, which it does. B celebrates this. Son tells Naruto that the black receiver in him slid from his chest to his neck because of the full tailed beast transformation. Naruto spots it, enters his nine tails chakra mode, and sets out to remove it, apologizing to Son in advance if he needs to get rough. Naruto pulls himself towards the receiver. Tobi tries binding Naruto with the chains. Kurama recalls Naruto's past achievements and thinks that if Naruto truly wants to help tailed beast, that he should do it like he always has an act. Naruto tries pulling out the black receiver while a clone he left inside enters sage mode and tries pushing it out from the inside. After Naruto successfully removes the Black Receiver, Tobi instantly summons the Demonic Statue of the Outer Path and reseals Son Goku, but not before it leaves Naruto with a parting gift. The declaration he intends to go all out from this point on because they had something that belonged to him, Tobi forces the five remaining Jinchuriki into their respective full-tailed beast forms. As Kakashi and Gai watch on in shock, Kurama tells Naruto that he's willing to lend him more of his power. 
Somewhat taken aback by this, Naruto proceeds to thank the Beast for helping during his brief battle with Madara Uchiha, which Kurama rebuffs. Naruto then chastises the Beast for the manner in which he took gratitude before the Beast, offering his fist, tells Naruto to meld his chalk with his own. Bumping fists with the Beast, Naruto stands and tells B and the Eight Tails that he's ready to go again. They, however, tell him that they would take the front lines while Naruto acted as support since he was unable to transform into the full Nine Tails. Naruto, however, declines this maneuver, leading the Eight Tails to wonder if Kurama has finally come around. As Naruto places a hand on the seals in his stomach and opens the gates that held Kurama back, he states that it was no longer the Nine Tailed Demon Fox, but Kurama, a comrade from Konohagakure. As the seal opens up, the five opposing tailed beasts each create a tailed beast ball to fire at Kakashi and Gai. Kakashi planned on countering using Kamui while Gai considers opening up his eighth gate, but Naruto, after undergoing a transformation from releasing his seal, was able to deflect all the attacks. Frustrated, Tobi made all the tailed beasts attack, but they were pushed away by the Nine Tails roar. Kakashi and Gai found themselves within Kurama's chakra, while Naruto created a clone which entered Sage Mode to locate the rods and the tailed beasts. Kurama warned Naruto that since the union wasn't perfect, they could remain in this form for only five minutes, which Naruto states was plenty of time. Using the chakra, Naruto grabbed the Seven Tails, planning on pile driving it into the Three Tails, but the giant turtle managed to curl up and roll away. Intending on finishing off the Seven Tails, Kurama raised its fist, but was swallowed by the Six Tails, trapping them while the Three Tails rolled straight at them. Just before it could reach the giant fox, the Eight Tails managed to grab the turtle with its tentacles. The Five Tails then tried to ram into the bull again, but B managed to knock it away. The Two Tails then attempted to pounce on Kurama, but Naruto swung the Six Tails in its path, sending them both flying. Naruto's Sage Mode clone managed to figure out the location of the Black Receivers, while Kakashi and Guy watch on in disbelief. Tobi, realizing he wouldn't be able to defeat the two Jinchuriki unless he aimed to kill them, made his tailed beast regroup to perform one massive tailed beast ball, which Naruto responded by firing his own. As Naruto's tailed beast ball collides with those of the opposing tailed beasts, both attacks fly upwards and explode. Using the opportunity to grab the beast by the throat, Naruto sends clones of himself all in the initial nine tails chakra mode to grab hold of the black receivers. As they do so, the original enters the consciousness of the tailed beast who had all been waiting there with their respective Nuchuriki and is greeted by Yukito, who is pleased that he had made it to this level. Welcoming him, Naruto and Yagata, whom the former starts pitying, believe in the former Mizukage to be a child who looked even weaker than Naruto did, have a brief conversation. After learning of Sangoku and Roshi's fate from Fu, he is summoned before the tailed beast and told to stretch at his hand. After Urakata and Han thank Naruto, one by one, tailed beast and Jinchuriki alike introduce himself to Naruto and then bump fists with him. Here, Kurama remembers the parting words of the Sage of Six Paths, and then as these stakes are removed, asks his fellow tailed beasts if they too believed as Son did that Naruto was the one that the Sage had spoken of so long ago. They all affirm them as a shock, Toby reseals them into the demonic statue of the other path. Though stating that nothing had changed because of his worn out condition after the tail beast ball had ended, Naruto refused Toby's claim, stating that he had just learned a bunch of difficult names all at once. Toby's confused by Naruto's claim of learning difficult names, which Naruto teases him for. Guy remarks how Naruto's progress is making him feel old, to which Kakashi tries to make him feel better, only to fail. Toby feels a moisture on his wrist, at first thinking he was sweat, but eventually convinces himself that it's rain starting to fall. Toby has a strange feeling about Naruto and perceives an aura about him. However, he snaps out of his shaken state and asserts that the war will make everything irrelevant, including Naruto. At the Allied Shinobi HQ, Naruto's use of Kurama's chakra was felt, though they also feel something else. Al relays the events to Shikaku, who wants to use it to raise the army's morale all at once. Despite the strain it would cause him, Naruto's friends from Konoha all rush towards his direction with the intent on supporting him. Elsewhere, Sasuke also walks towards the battlefield as a thunderstorm ensues. In the Konohakukura Intelligence Division, Kareen feigns mental instability to lessen her guard's attention to her and begins plotting her escape with a lockpit set hidden in her glasses under a portrait of Sasuke she made. Jugo and Suigetsu learn about the war near one of Orochimaru's hideouts. Jugo questions Suigetsu's reasons to be part of Taka, and while the two argue, Jugo's killing intent kicks in, and he attacks Suigetsu. Suigetsu simply reforms and begins drowning Jugo to subdue him. He notices that the attack revealed a secret room caused by Jugo's attack, where Suigetsu discovers a scroll detailing secrets to winning the war. Sasuke runs into a small platoon of White Zetsu army, who question his presence outside and realize he's killed the original White Zetsu before attacking. Sasuke uses Susano and incinerates several of them. He interrogates one of the White Zetsu using Genjutsu and learns about the war and its purpose. Sasuke finishes the White Zetsu and decides to go kill Naruto Uzumaki. Sasuke is pleased with Itachi's eyes and reminisces about him. Elsewhere, Itachi's on the move. Onoki attacks Madara Uchiha with a giant rock golem, which Madara destroys, creating several flowers. Tsunade recognizes the technique as her grandfather's. Gara suspends the Kage above the attack. Onoki levitating A. The flowers begin releasing a toxic pollen. Kabuto Yakushi muses on how people who heard of Hashirama Senji's strength considered it a myth, just like the Sage of Six Paths, and how it'll show everyone that it's real. Dodai, Genma, and Raido give chase to Mu. Having steered the Kage's attention towards the flowers, Madara uses Susano to knock them down from behind throwing them at the flowers, and proceeds to set the forest ablaze. Mei tries putting out the fire, but collapses due to the pollen, as do the other Kage. Onoki thinks back to his youth, talking to the first Suchi Kage about the strong will of Iwa Shinobi. Onoki musters enough strength to destroy the flowers in Jamadara, the other Kage regain consciousness just in time to see the face formed from the DNA of the first Hokage in Madara's chest. Kabuto gushes on how Orochimaru's creation allowed him to create the ultimate trump card. Elsewhere, Sasuke Uchiha detects someone in the woods nearby. Taking out his sword, he goes to investigate, only to be shocked at seeing Itachi Uchiha. After Sasuke spots Itachi, he chases his brother down. Itachi refuses to be swayed from his mission, so Sasuke attempts to use Susano to stop him, but Itachi counters with his own. As Sasuke chases his brother, the two have a conversation. Elsewhere, a regenerating Madara decides to target Tsunade after realizing she was a Senju, deeming her a weak woman who had seemingly inherited nothing from Hashirama, who claimed he was even more skilled in medical ninjutsu than she was. He goes on to say that even more than a weak person, he detested a weak Senju. Tsunade, however, rebuffs him, telling him that even though she had not inherited the wood-release Kakai Genkai her grandfather possessed, and that he may have been even more skilled than her with medical ninjutsu, since he did not require the use of hand seals to use it, Madara made two mistakes. 
mistakes. One was assuming that she was a weak woman, and the other was that she inherited nothing from her ancestor. She states that she inherited something more than simple power, the will of fire, something Madara should not take so lightly. Madara doubts Tsunade can defeat him with will of fire, stating power has nothing to do with will. Tsunade disagrees, saying that the will she inherited made her strong, crediting it for her revolution of medical ninjutsu, building an entire system, and making its three rules, which she lists to him as she releases her seal. She then reveals her other rule, that only those who have mastered the ninja art creation rebirth, strength of 100 technique, are allowed to break the other three rules. The other Kage are stunned to learn about this, while Madara is unfazed, having never heard of the technique. Tsunade explains that it's a kinjutsu that only she knows how to use. Madara says that getting rid of the pollen and adding a medical nin won't help with their odds. Tsunade says that all of them will go at it at once if it comes down to it, and that she's not just a medical nin. Madara covers himself with Susano's ribcage, which Tsunade cracks with her attack. Madara notes it'd be slower than the Raikage, but stronger than him. Madara tries immolating Tsunade, but is stopped by Mei, who also attacks. A and Onoki deal a heavy blow just as Tsunade lands a powerful kick, sending Madara crashing down. Madara can see that Tsunade isn't as weak as he thought. Madara reminds her that she'll get herself killed if she simply rushes into battle, the Kage's source of treatment and recovery. Madara wonders what Hashirama left them, saying they're nothing compared to Hashirama, and that if he only knew how weak they be, he would have taught Hashirama how to rise from the dead. He says the only power Hashirama left is clinging to him, and that his own brother left him only his eyes and their power. Tsunade asks if he heard nothing of what she said. Madara says the only thing that could have been passed to them is hatred. At the same time, Dan Kato and Choza Akimichi have a conversation where Choza informs them Madara had been reincarnated and that Tsunade as Hokage and the other Kage were battling him, which shocks Dan. Despite Choza's confidence in Tsunade, Dan tells him that he should be using his time finding the caster of the technique instead of guarding the barrier that held him as Madara was not to be taken lightly, expressing his belief that only Hashirama could possibly defeat Madara. Back at the battle with Madara, Tsunade manages to land a devastating blow on him as he regenerates, Gara binds and seals him. This is, however, revealed to be nothing more than a wood clone as Tsunade is impaled by a Susano sword and Madara emerges from a root, telling him that when he fought Hashirama in the past, only his dojutsu could see through the clone. To keep Sasuke from following him, Itachi summons a flock of crows, which stall Sasuke. Itachi finds Kabuto Yakushi, saying that he felt where his chakra came from while he's being controlled earlier, setting it as a weakness of the technique. Kabuto is a concern, as he's the only one who can stop the technique. After seeing Sasuke close behind Itachi, Kabuto gets excited, exclaiming his luck has turned for the better, which prompted an exasperated Itachi to remark that things turned out worse than he expected. Having revved Kabuto's hideout, Sasuke identifies Kabuto. Kabuto attempts to manipulate him into attacking Itachi, but Sasuke explains that his goal is to talk to his brother and that Kabuto, who has now taken Orochimaru's mantle, is his enemy. Meanwhile, Sonata reveals her new tactics power, which allows nearly instant regeneration without the usage of hand seals, and throws the sword that impales her back at Madara. While he absorbs it into his Susano, Onoki tries to blast Madara with a dust release from behind, but Madara simply absorbs it, claiming he could have done it earlier, but instead took it as a chance to demoralize him with Hashirama's visage. Tsunade questions his confidence, stating that the Kage forced him into using a wood clone. Instead of rebuffing her, Madara admits 5 versus 1 is a good matchup number and creates 25 wood clones, 5 for each Kage. Sasuke attempts to kill Kabuto, but Itachi stops him, explaining the need to discover the counter to the Impure World Reincarnation beforehand. Sasuke agrees to cooperate on the terms that Itachi will answer his questions once they're done, and Itachi accepts, as both brothers and Kabuto ready themselves for battle. Closing his hood and stating that he was an introverted person, and as such, it was unsettling to be stared at by so many people, Kabuto sends his snakes charging towards Sasuke and Itachi. The brothers are able to fend this attack off by activating their Susano, however, Kabuto uses the opportunity to hide in one of his snakes. Here, Kabuto reveals the abilities that he had gained from experimenting with Sasuke's former teammates, Kareen's healing abilities, a similar ability to Suigetsu's hydrification technique, as well as Jugo's ability to absorb natural energy. After revealing that he had found and trained in the Ryuchi cave, much to Itachi's shock, he narrowly dodges Sasuke's arrow. Emerging from the snake's mouth, he reveals that he had finally surpassed Orochimaru and was able to become a sage, and declares that he was now a dragon after Sasuke mistakes him for an imperfect snake like Orochimaru was. Kabuto launches a dragon at the brothers. As Itachi rushes over, a blinding light and violent air vibrations erupt. Sasuke and Itachi are paralyzed by the air vibrations, but Kabuto is still able to move because of his liquefied body. Kabuto goes after Sasuke first. Itachi protects him with Susano. Itachi explains that he already knows where Kabuto is going to attack, so he can guard properly. Sasuke attempts to impale Kabuto with his Chidori Sharp Spear, but Kabuto jumps into the ceiling. Itachi tells Sasuke to remember the plan they used when they went into a mission together. Sasuke, remembering hunting a large boar as he puts the plan into action with his brother. While Itachi launched Yasuke Maikatama as a distraction, Sasuke fired another arrow at Kabuto, but managed to pin to the ceiling. Sasuke thinks he has Kabuto, but then is shocked to see Kabuto off to the side, stabbing Itachi. Itachi's body is revealed to be a crow clone, and the real Itachi counterattacks, cutting off a piece of Kabuto's horn. Itachi and Sasuke remember their time together and prepare to catch a snake. Amused at the fact that though Sasuke should hate Itachi, the two seem to be getting along well, Kabuto states that he understands that something might have happened during the brothers' battle, could not understand what Sasuke could want from a dead person. After hearing Sasuke declare that he wanted to know the truth, Kabuto surmises that Sasuke was suspicious of his brother, having already heard the truth and as such never returned to Konohakakure because of his intent to destroy it for making his brother suffer. Calling Itachi a liar and stating he went as far as to eradicate his entire clan to protect his village, he asked Sasuke whether or not what he was doing was more akin to his own goals of wanting to continue what Orochimaru started and destroy Konoha. Attempting to inveigle him to his side once more, Sasuke has a flashback of a conversation he overheard with a group of Konoha and badmouthing Itachi, after which he declares he was nothing like Kabuto and that crushing Konoha was his own ambition. Recalling his life in Konoha, Kabuto begins to renounce the village and tells Sasuke that he would be his new brother. Telling his brother not to listen to Kabuto, Itachi commences a plan of action, telling his brother he would use one of their clan's ultimate dojutsu. Believing it to be Izanagi, Sasuke questions his brother on this. 
Itachi, however, corrects his brother as he clashes with Kabuto while wielding Sasuke's sword, telling him that it's another technique, able to decide destiny, Izanami. Kabuto attacks the Uchiha brothers with his sage art, inorganic reincarnation, causing the cave formations to attack them. Having used his Susanoo to protect Sasuke, Itachi is incapacitated between the rocks. As Kabuto retrieves a talisman from his snake, intent on rewriting Itachi's mind, Sasuke creates a ring of Amaterasu flames to prevent Kabuto from taking any further action. Commending Sasuke's strategy, Kabuto tells him nonetheless that they were not able to defeat him. Continuing to brag about his accomplishments, he states that of anyone currently alive, he had come the closest to the Sage of Six Paths and that compared to him, the Uchiha were nothing. This prompts Sasuke to lash out at him, but is stopped by a fully regenerated Itachi. Itachi tells Kabuto that he reminded him of his former self and that the two of them were very different. He then tells him that because he did not understand his own limitations, the value of comrades and who he really was, he was doomed to fail as he did when he was alive. With this, Kabuto retorts that they were the ones that knew nothing about him and that for his whole life he had tried to find out who he really was. With this, Kabuto has a flashback to his earliest memory of being found by Nono and Urushi. He then states that for his whole life he had nothing. Kabuto then remembers his first meeting with Orochimaru while aiding the wounds of several Konohaka Kure shinobi, declining the offer of being a shinobi. Nono is later approached by Don Anzo Shimura, Orochimaru, and an Abarama shinobi who blackmail her into undertaking an intelligence gathering mission based on intel that it received that Iwagakuro is planning a big attack. Taking Kabuto along with them to replace a dead root member, the young man was sent on several spy missions in different hidden villages, inclusive of the five great shinobi countries. On a mission in Iwagakure, his cover was blown as he attempted to escape, he was confronted by an Iwanin. Kabuto attacked the ninja with a chakra scalpel, severely wounding his would be assassin, revealed to be Nono to his horror. When Nono did not remember him as he attempted to heal her, a shocked Kabuto ran off and left her as Kitsuchi and another Iwanin approached them. Devastated that she did not remember him and wondering who he was, Kabuto was once again approached by Orochimaru who states that Kabuto had become quite the shinobi. Kabuto was startled by Orochimaru's approach. Orochimaru says he's been watching Kabuto and Nono for a long time and invites him to come with him, promising to reveal the reason Nono attacked him and didn't recognize him. Orochimaru takes Kabuto to his medically equipped hideout, telling Kabuto he's the first person he's brought here. Kabuto questions Orochimaru on why he brought him here, and Orochimaru is pleased with his inquiring nature. Orochimaru reveals that Root set up Kabuto and Nono to kill each other as their skilled abilities as spies with vast knowledge would have made them too dangerous to be kept alive. Orochimaru then explains that Danzo told Nono the reason Kabuto joined Root, accepting her pleas to relieve him of duty if she kills one man, Kabuto, who she would believe to be someone else, having been given photos of a different child over the years. Kabuto figures Orochimaru was sent to kill whoever survived. Orochimaru confirming the fact to a mortified Kabuto while telling him that they're no different. He explains to Kabuto that he has found value in Kabuto's skill and wants his services within the newly created Otogakure with the promise of a new identity. Accepting the offer, Kabuto becomes Orochimaru's spy, pretending to be a spy for Sasori in order to learn about Akatsuki, and aids his new employer in his experiments throughout the years. After Orochimaru's defeat at Sasuke's hands, Kabuto injects himself with blood from the remains of Orochimaru's true form to achieve an identity of his own making. Having finished reminiscing about his childhood, Kabuto tells the brothers that he has assimilated more than just Orochimaru's DNA, and that his pawns were a show of his own power and refuses to have Itachi oppose him any longer. Even though Itachi rejects what Kabuto says, Kabuto presses on with his attack. A construct of Sakon emerges from the base of his navel snake, and Kabuto uses his attack of the Twin Demons technique as he has the construct transform into Jirobo who then uses Earth Release, Earth Shore Return technique to part the circle of flames that the Uchiha brother created around himself. Giving them no time to react, he brings forth Kitamaru next, and has him use the spider web unrolling technique to trap the brothers, who use a Matarasu to incinerate the uncuttable web. Moving behind the brothers and producing Kimimaru next, he has him use the Dance of the Seedling Fern technique to block the area behind them while also creating another web in front of them, effectively caging the brothers in. After they manage to escape, Kabuto uses Tayuya and her demonic flute, Phantom Sound Chains technique to attack the siblings with an auditory genjutsu, effectively incapacitating them. Bringing forth Orochimaru himself, finally Kabuto has him transform into his white snake form and attack the brothers. Others. The Uchiha managed to escape the Genjutsu and fend the snake off by casting Genjutsu on each other. Kabuto, however, appears from the mouth of the snake with a surprise attack and bites sexy Tachi, stating that a genius that has everything would not understand him wanting to find his true self and then declared that no one would stand in his way with this. Regenerating, Itachi called out to Sasuke as Kabuto moved to implant his talisman to rewrite Itachi's mind. Responding, Sasuke threw his sword at Kabuto. Kabuto caught the sword with his navel snake and dodged the grasp of Sasuke's Susano. Sasuke launched a fireball at Kabuto, who countered it with a large torrent of water, which swept Sasuke off his feet. Through the mist created from the two clashing techniques, Kabuto noticed that Itachi, who Kabuto stabbed with the sword for him, disappeared into a flurry of crows and attacked Kabuto with the sword he took from him, chastising him for using the same attack pattern he used before to cut his horn off. To which Itachi rebuffs that he cannot be harmed, also refuting Kabuto's claims that Genjutsu cannot affect him, stating that it already had. This sequence of events repeats itself once again until Kabuto begins to notice the deja vu, regardless of what he did differently. It was ultimately revealed that the entire new sequence of the battle was taking place within Kabuto's head, as he was trapped within Izanami. During this time, Sasuke questions his brother about Izanami. Itachi explains the mechanisms behind the technique, the history of their clan, the use of the Izanagi, and why Izanami was created. He then tells his brother that Kabuto would be freed from Izanami once he accepted his fate. Somewhat angered that Itachi would use a technique that the victim could escape, Sasuke questions his brother, who tells him that he wanted to give Kabuto the opportunity to accept his fate, something he himself could not do during his lifetime. This explanation only served to make Sasuke more irate, who believed his brother to be perfect, but Itachi refutes his claim. All throughout this, Kabuto continues the battle in his own mind, refusing to give up. Elsewhere on the battlefield, a grown-up Urushi tells one of his comrades about his home and hopes that by the time he got back, his brother Kabuto would be there. Meanwhile at the cave, Itachi prepares to end the summoning Impure World Reincarnation. As Kabuto remains incapacitated by Izanami, Sasuke questions whether undoing the Impure World Reincarnation would not mean that Itachi would disappear as well. Declaring that he no longer had any attachment to the world of the living, Itachi notes that he was proud to be able to protect Konohaku Kure once more. 
Enraged to hear Itachi's motive, Sasuke states that while he could forgive his brother, he would never forgive the village for what they have done. This leads Itachi to tell his little brother that he won't be the one to change him, and that he was doing this to aid Naruto Uzumaki, whom he had entrusted the task to. Itachi then proceeds to raise the brill over Kabuto's eyes, and uses Genjutsu to order Kabuto to teach him the hand seals needed to stop the impure world reincarnation. Meanwhile, the five Kage struggle to hold their own against Madara's 25 susano clad wood clones. Amidst all the struggles, Onoki rallies them to fight on, having been entrusted with a great task which they could not fail. Madara notes that he needed to break Onoki's will as it was the most troublesome of all. Rallying to each other's side, Tsunade transfers chakra to Onoki, uses a large-scale dust-release detachment of the primitive world technique, which succeeds in obliterating the 25 wood clones and a part of the real Madara, in one fell swoop. Splitting the clone down the middle, Meitorumi unleashes a water-release water dragon bullet technique which A charges with lightning. This makes contact Madara, effectively slowing down his response time. As Madara prepares to counter it, it's revealed that sand was also concealed in the dragon, which Gara uses to bind Madara's movements further in order to create an opening for Onoki to use another dust release, thus giving him time to seal him through the regeneration process. As they declare that this is the power of the five Kage, Madara compliments them, stating he would respond with his full power as well. He then unleashes the complete version of a Susanoo, stating that it would help them realize just how futile their efforts have been, regardless of being Kage. The five Kage look on in shock as Madara unleashes his Susanoo. After stabilizing the construct, Tsunade questions whether her grandfather really fought against someone who was so much stronger than the five Kage put together. Madara responds by saying that Hashirama was the only one who could defeat him, and then states that it was a good thing that he wasn't here, as the extent of the damage to the surrounding landscape would be on a much smaller scale, as he sends the Kage flying with one swing from his sword, destroying the mountain rage behind him in the process. Realizing his full power, Onoki questions whether or not Madara had gone easy on him and Mu in the past, to which Madara states that why should he fight seriously against children? As the Kage stand to face Madara nonetheless, Onoki then states that they would not back down now, causing Madara to resolve himself to crush their beliefs. Elsewhere, Itachi then commands Kabuto to use the hand sails he had just stated to end the impure world reincarnation. Sasuke uses this time to state his resolve to Itachi that he will destroy the village because of what it did to him before bidding farewell to Itachi. As the technique is released, the reincarnated shinobi from all over the battlefield begin to deconstruct. Upon seeing this, a battered Naruto and B thank Itachi and then uses this as motivation to wrap things up with Tobi as well. Before being completely decommissioned, Itachi heads towards his little brother's hand outstretched, stating that he could still make it. With the impure world reincarnation released, all the reincarnated shinobi began to fade into pillars of light. As the battle between Tobi and Naruto ensues, Naruto charges at him, stating that his opponents were in front of him as Tobi contemplates the fact that Kabuto had seemingly been defeated. Meanwhile, the five Kage struggle to combat Madara. As he's about to deal another blow with a sword, his Susanoo completely dissipates as he's enveloped in a beam of light, causing him to wonder what happened to the summoner. Back at the cave, Itachi uses the last of his consciousness to show Sasuke his memories of the Uchiha clan downfall, showing him when he came into possession of Shisui Uchiha's Sharingan, Konoha leadership's decision to move against the Uchiha clan's Kure Ta, his meeting with Tobi, and ending with Fugaku and Mikoto's last word to Itachi. With the full truth about the massacre revealed, Itachi told Sasuke even if Sasuke never forgave him, and no matter what he decided to do from that point on, he would always love him. After imparting his final words to Sasuke, Itachi's soul is released from the Impure World Reincarnation, after which Kabuto seems to have been released from Izanami. On five different battlefields, all the other reincarnated shinobi souls are being released as the five Kage realize what was happening. They wonder who had released the technique, with Anoki noting that whoever it was, he was a hero to the shinobi world. Regaining dominion over his movements, Dan asks Chosa to have him remove the barrier which had sealed him. When the barrier is released, Chosa notes the hand seals Dan used, realizes his intentions, and tells him to hurry to go to Tsunade. Using his spirit transformation technique to take control of the then ascending soul, Dan flies to Tsunade's location in time to take over her body and save her from Madara, who, though being released from the Impure World Reincarnation, was still making a desperate attempt to kill the Kage. Speaking with Tsunade in her subconscious, just before disappearing, Dan tells Tsunade that he would wait for her in the afterlife but not to follow him just yet, and he leaves her with the remainder of his chakra, thus restoring her strength of 100 seal. After returning to the real world, Tsunade and the other Kage watch in some confusion, wondering why Madara hadn't stopped moving as well. He then explains that if the reincarnated know the seal to end the summoning contract of the Impure World Reincarnation, they could sever ties from the summoner. With this, Madara performs the seal to sever the contract, and tells them to tell the summoner that he shouldn't use Kinjutsu so arbitrarily. Reminiscing about Itachi's last words, Sasuke is tormented by questions about important aspects of a shinobi's life, his clan, his friends, and about his existence. Just as the roof of Kabuto's place caves in, Sasuke manages to dodge the falling stones and rocks. So we get to Injugo up here, claiming that at last to have found Sasuke. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, as the five Kage are amazed to find Madara among themselves even after the Impure World Reincarnation had been released, Madara exclaims that after fighting him, they might have realized that he was not the type of shinobi to be under someone else's control, and that it would be a disgrace to again summon his complete Susano when it is said that anyone who has seen it has died. Onoki exclaims that they must fight and defeat Madara themselves when Mei gives up. Meanwhile, when Naruto and Killer B are still fighting Tobi in his demonic statue of the other path, Naruto provokes Tobi to show his real face. Angered by Naruto's provocations, Tobi decides to revive the demonic statue to its full form as he starts weaving hand signs. At Kabuto's place, Jugo declares Anko Midorashi to still be alive and exclaims that Madara is still in the living world, surprising Sasuke. As Sasuke questions why they're still after him, Suigetsu tells him that they found a cool thing and hands Sasuke the scroll which they found at one of Orochimaru's hideouts. Rendered speechless for a moment by the contents, Sasuke decides to meet with Orochimaru, explaining to a shocked Suigetsu that Orochimaru is too tough to die easily, deciding that he's going to meet the one who knows everything. Despite Suigetsu giving several vehement and somewhat manic reasons why not to revive Orochimaru, Sasuke is resigned to his decision. Moving to execute Sasuke's orders, Jugo retrieves some of Kabuto's DNA using his sage transformation abilities, much to Suigetsu's disgust. After Jugo places DNA in Anko's Curse Seal of Heaven, Sasuke uses the evil releasing method to revive Orochimaru as his conscious remnants exit Anko and regenerate his body from the sample. Retreating behind Kabuto as Orochimaru emerges, Suigetsu sheepishly greets his former captor, who notes that he was a 
rest of the situation have been able to observe everything from within Anko, further shocking them when he tells them he has no interest in the war that was currently going on. And instead, he still had his sights set on Sasuke's body, but was able to seal it in his current state. Showing him the scroll he was given, Sasuke tells Orochimaru that he wanted to hear everything from the source, leading Orochimaru to question him if he was waiting for his path of revenge, to which Sasuke denies. Moving over to the immobile Kabuto, which prompts Sugetsu to run to the other side of the cave, Orochimaru drains Kabuto of his chakra, causing Kabuto to revert to his original self. Noting to himself that Sasuke has changed since they last saw him, Orochimaru beckons him to follow to a place that he himself knows well. While analyzing the situation before him, Naruto, Killer B, Mike Guy, and Kakashi are told by Toby to bear witness to the beginning of the end once the Ten Tails is fully revived. Confused that Toby would be able to do this, Kakashi notes that the war was all for the sake of preventing Kakashi from attaining the Eight and Nine Tails, and since they already had the beast, wonders whether Toby was lying. Remembering what Toby said, and then the fact that they had used a clone made from its chakra to evade Tanka, Kyuki reminds me of this and then notifies his comrades. Speaking to Naruto directly, Kurama notes that the chakra is also present in Ben Hisago and the Kaka no Johei, which the demonic statue the other path had consumed, and asks Naruto to let him speak through the boy to personally reveal what it knows about the others. As the fox explains the story behind the two treasure tools of the Sage of Six Pass, the Gold and Silver Brothers, and how they had come to obtain his chakra, after which Kakashi corroborates his story with the intel received from headquarters. With this, Kakashi declares that he would like them to do something before the beast is revived, leading Toby to retort that because Kakashi always spoke so easily, it led him to live a life full of regret, shocking both Kakashi and leading Guy to question Toby once again on who he was. Rebuffing this, Toby told Guy that it made no sense to tell him because he didn't remember faces. Interjecting, Kurama Kurama tells him that as Kakashi said, now is the only time to do something about the situation as the Sage of Six Paths had told him that the revival of the Ten Tails signaled the end of the world. Answering Naruto's questioning of the Ten Tails' power, Kurama tells him of the beast's might and the fact that amongst all the names it was known as, it was also seen as the progenitor of all that existed in the world. The beast then goes on to say that even though alone it would stand no chance against the beast, it could be possible since Toby did not possess all the eight tails in its own chakra. Toby, however, rebuffs this by stating he only needed the beast to cast the infant Tsukiyoma in the world. Switching back with Kurama, Naruto declares his dreams to Toby with Guy, Kakashi, and even B, who disclaims female attributes he values, much to the eight tails' shock, rally behind him. As Toby launches into another speech, Naruto enters his nine tails' chakra mode and attempts to land a high speed Rasengan attack on the statue, and Toby blocks it with his gun by, prompting Naruto to state that it seems as though he would really have to bash Toby's mask. Toby responds, noting that there is one thing he could not part with, and then declares that he would not let him touch the statue. Formulating this strategy as Naruto produces a Shadow Clone, the Shinobi agreed that use of feint attacks would be crucial to this battle because of Toby's abilities. Moving directly towards Toby, Naruto uses his super mini-tailed beast ball while Kakashi asks B to hoist him into the air as he activates his Mangekyo Sharingan. Deciding that it was best to avoid direct contact, Guy takes out his pair of Soshuga. Toby, wielding his gun by, is able to stave off Naruto's attacks, but ultimately has a harder time at things when Sky joins the fray. Using his Nunchaku to counter Toby's gun by, Guy is able to send a masked man throttling towards Naruto in his super mini-tailed beast ball. Using that opportunity, Kakashi activates Kamui with the intention of ripping the demonic statue the Air Palace neck off. However, the statue, which at this time was bleeding from the eyes and metamorphosizing, is seemingly able to nullify the attack, which confused Kakashi greatly. As Naruto's attack is about to make contact, Toby teleports, prompting Naruto to sense his intent and anticipate Toby emerging from the ground in a surprise attack. Dodging the initial attack, Naruto, now separated from the others, has a harder time blocking Toby's gun by. Kakashi imbues a kunai with the lightning release and once again calls out to B. Launching him across the battlefield, Kakashi easily cuts through a rock that separated him from Naruto and then launches the kunai at Toby. Forced to become intangible but not one to give up so easily, Toby changed the trajectory of the kunai and sends it hurtling towards Naruto. Telling him to ignore the kunai, Kakashi uses Kamui once again to warp the kunai away. Regrouping as the last attack seemingly fails to land, the shinobi wonder how they are going to defeat Toby. Just then, a tiny crack appears on Toby's mask. Noticing a slight crack on Toby's mask, Guy and Naruto think that Naruto's last attack had actually hit the mask. However, Kakashi disagrees, knowing the type of crack was a sharper object that he remembers the kunai he warped with Kamui. As Kakashi came up with a hypothesis on Toby's ability, Toby erects a barrier to thwart Beast's chance to strike the demonic statue of the other path in the midst of his transformation into the Ten Tails. Once figuring out a possible way to attack Toby, Kakashi details his plans with the others. With B launching them directly at Toby, Guy starts off unleashing his Oshuga only for Toby to avoid it using his dematerialization ability, predicting Guy's moves with a Sharingan. As a result, Guy loses the Soshuga and steps away from Toby's front. Naruto then follows up quickly by launching a Rasengan, which is avoided easily by Toby, who keeps insisting on the futility of the strategy. However, the Rasengan seemingly disperses before reaching Toby, followed by a sudden explosion that hits his right shoulder. After being hurled away, the masked man uses his gun by to stand back up. Toby then realized the attack was transported to his right arm using Kamui, just as he was about to materialize. Realizing Toby's ability now, Kakashi knows that Toby was not using two separate techniques to dematerialize and warp things away, but a single technique. Urging Kakashi to explain it in the simplest way possible so that they could readjust their strategy, Guy and the others listen on as Kakashi explains Toby's ability to become intangible and absorb things that were one and the same. He then explains that when he makes himself intangible, what Toby actually does is to warp away the part of his body that was being attacked to the other dimension, so while it existed there, all attacks would simply be phased through his body. However, since Kamui shares the same dimension, the lightning enhanced kunai that Kakashi warped away passed through the intangible part of Toby's body and ended up in the other dimension and scratched the part of his body that was now sent there in order to make himself appear intangible. When questioned by B how the two techniques were linked to the same dimension, a hesitant guy begins to question Kakashi, but the latter cuts across him to ask Toby directly where he got the Sharingan from. Responding, Toby reveals he obtained his right Sharingan eye during the previous war at Kanabi Bridge, the moment that Kakashi became recognized as the hero of the Sharingan. With Kakashi left speechless by the revelation, Toby belittles him while perpetrating the Eye of the Moon plan as the right move for humanity. However, Naruto still refuses to accept Toby's goal with the intent of not giving up on his dreams. Having its Shinchuriki let it speak through him to chastise their opponent as well, Kurama tells Toby that it was entrusted to Naruto who had befriended him for the express reason to stop Toby. Spurred onwards, Naruto enters his tailed beast mode and charges at Toby. Charging forward, Naruto attacks Toby using giant chakra arms which Toby simply phases through, chiding the boy of thinking he could defeat him on his own. As Guy tries to snap Kakashi out of the sh
by Guy to act, Kakashi notes that he had to time the next use of his Kamui perfectly, despite Toby chastising his borrowed power and stated intentions of showing him Kamui's true potential. Acting immediately, Toby jumps into the air and sends out a number of black receivers which pierce B and Gyuki. Warning Naruto not to let them touch him as it sealed off the Tail Beast's power, Naruto creates a Shadow Clone to be protected by Gyuki. While a clone charged forward with the Rasengan, the original prepared the Tail Beast Ball. As the clone prepares to attack, Kakashi seemingly warps away the Rasengan again, while Toby, seeing the same attack pattern, decides to attack the clone with one of its stakes rather than having to go through him. When the clone is seemingly dispelled, Toby phases through the Tail Beast Ball and fully enters the other dimension. There, Toby is shocked to see Naruto and realizes that Kakashi has warped the clone there to wait for him. Declaring he has nowhere to run, Naruto slams the Rasengan into Toby's face, shattering the mask, with Naruto asking the enemy who he is. With memories of their old friends from the days of the Academy to tune in exams and later to the former's promotion to Jonin, Kakashi and Guy recognize the face of the unmasked ninja to be that of their old comrade, Obito Uchiha. Shocked by this revelation, Kakashi and Guy started asking the masked man whether he truly was Obito, but upon seeing his monkey kill Sharingan, Kakashi noted that there was no doubt about it. However, Obito reiterated his point that it was insignificant what they called him, as all that mattered to him was his Eye of the Moon plan. Kakashi had a flashback to the time when Obito died, and then asked whether he survived the cave-in. This led Naruto to ask them who the person in front of them was. Guy answered that he was a former classmate of theirs who supposedly died during the Third Shinobi World War. Kakashi, still in shock, asked Obito that if he survived, then why he had not made the fact known until now. Obito retorts that whether he survived or not was unimportant. However, if Kakashi really had to have an answer to why Obito had not returned, it was simply because Kakashi had let Rin die. An answer that had an amused Obito chortle over Kakashi's reaction. Even more devastated by this response, Kakashi asked him if he was going to blame him for it. Obito answered that he did not see any point in blaming this useless reality which would disappear soon enough. Naruto tried to rally his sensei, telling him that right now Obito's plans need to be stopped and that he would listen to the story later. Obito used the fire release blast wave wild dance technique, sending a giant vortex of flames towards his opponents. Kakashi, unable to register what was happening, simply stood there despite Guy calling out to him. Naruto, however, intercepted the attacks with Kurama's tails. Before any side could act further, they were interrupted by Madara's appearance in the battlefield. Standing beside the younger Uchiha, the legendary shinobi remarked that Obito seemed to be having fun, much to the onlooker's surprise as they wondered what happened to the Kage. Madara casually replies that the Kage are not doing so well, each having been critically wounded in their attempts to stop him. Obito returns the gun by to Madara, which he uses to block a volley of black receivers Naruto sends flying at them and repels Naruto's super mini tail beast ball. All the while, he lectures Obito, both for initiating the Ten Tails revival before capturing the Eight and Nine Tails, and for reincarnating him through the Impure World reincarnation instead of using Nagato's outer path Samsara of Heavenly Life technique as planned. He decides to make the best of the situation and moves to capture the Eight and Nine Tails in hopes to seal them in the demonic statue of the outer path with the time they have left, leaving Guy and Kakashi to Obito. Kakashi takes his opportunity to question Obito about what happened to him. Obito is a flashback of being found and rescued by an aging Madara after the events of the Kanabi Bridge. Madara attended to his injuries, and though he had to amputate Obito's arm, he restored it with the damage half his body with parts from his Zetsu. Obito was grateful for Madara's help, but was adamant about returning to his teammates, Kakashi and Rin. Time passed as he recovered and began to rehabilitate under the watch two Zetsus, White Zetsu and a Spiral Fate Zetsu. One day, White Zetsu returned to the hideout and alerted Obito that his comrades were in danger, surrounded by Kirigakure Shinobi. With the aid of the Spiral Fate Zetsu forming a suit to reduce his physical limitations, Obito rushed to help them. Upon arrival, he found Kakashi's hand running through Rin's chest. As Rin died, it caused Obito's Sharingan and the one he gave to Kakashi to become Bangekyo Sharingan. While Kakashi passed out and enraged, Obito slaughtered the Kirigakure ninja. He looked upon Rin's dead body and, devastated by her death, concluded that he must be in hell. The events changed Obito and gave him resolve to change fate by destroying the world and creating a new one where Rin still lives. Remembering the Zetsu's discussion over Madara's plans to create just such a world, Obito decides to become Madara's apprentice to achieve that goal. Over time, Madara imparted Obito with all that he knew the legend of the Sage of Six Paths, the Eye of the Moon plan, and all the necessary steps to bring the plan to fruition. He then infused White Zetsu with a part of his mind, completing his creation with the Black Zetsu. Madara then took himself off of life support, dying so that he may be brought back at the planned juncture. Left with Madara's name to take as his own, with Setsu by his side, Obito spent the following decade setting the pieces in place with his meeting with Nagato, who was vital to Madara's resurrection. Inspired to cause the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox's attack after overhearing Kakashi, Obito fully embraces his new ideals, and then he confronted his former mentor, Minato Namakaze. In present time, when Madara attempts to have him see things his way, Naruto declares that he is Minato's son and he would not be persuaded by him. Noting that he was being lenient because Naruto was a true Jinchotoki, declares he would no longer hold back. Creating an enormous wooden dragon, he notes that it has been used by Hashirama Senju in the past to bind the Nine-Tails, which prompts Naruto to manifest Kurama's body in tailed beast mode to fight it. Asking Obito why he chose to follow someone like Madara, the Uchiha notes that all it was left for him and Kakashi was to have their final battle and he had nothing left to say. Obito and Kakashi continue their battle, with the former unleashing a barrage of shuriken only to be stopped by Kakashi's wall of earth. As Obito slips through the wall, Kakashi continues to ask him why and ask him if it's related to Rin, which Obito tells him to shut up. Obito then warps Kakashi to the other dimension, but his victory is short-lived as Kakashi returns using Kamui. In the meantime, Madara's wood dragon begins absorbing Kurama's chakra, causing Naruto's child beast mode to falter. Obito begins to overwhelm Kakashi, bringing him to his knees. Madara uses wood release to bind Killer B and Mike Guy, and then begins to activate his Susanoo to finish things with the battlefield. Resolved, Naruto notes that the Uchiha's ideals annoyed him to no end, and creating a Shadow Clone, he's able to stop both Obito's Shuriken and Madara's Susanoo sword from making killing blows on Kakashi and Guy. Hearing Naruto's words that he could protect his friends, Kakashi and Guy both spring into action with the former using Lightning Cutter to destroy Obito's other Shuriken, and Guy using Daytime Tiger to attack Madara. Turning to his former friend, Kakashi tells Obito that he still remembered what he had taught him in the past, and what he could do now is protect Naruto. As Obito questions Kakashi's resolve, the copy ninja's sentiments are echoed by Guy, who is severely weakened. Seeing this, Gyuki notes that all Konoha Nin like to act tough, before taking advantage of the loosened grip of his wooden restraints and warning Naruto that the wood release binding could suppress a tailed beast's power. 
Obito uses his own wood technique to attempt to restrain Naruto while he attack Kakashi, but he's sent reeling by Naruto's intercepting headbutt. Yuki then decides to attack the demonic statue of their path before his transformation into the Ten Tails is complete, leaving Obito to Naruto. Naruto declares that he can see Obito's suffering phase, though Obito counters by saying it's Kakashi who's truly suffering. As Naruto knows that he has to do something for Kakashi who is worn out, Kurama switches place with Naruto and throws the copy ninja at Obito. He warps Kakashi to the other dimension. Obito learns too late that Kurama revitalized Kakashi with his chakra, so he can attack Obito in the other dimension whenever he uses Kamui to dodge Naruto's attacks. With Obito wounded as Kakashi returns to the real world, Naruto joins Killer Bean combining the tailed beast balls to create a massive sphere to fire on the barrier containing the demonic statue. After the explosion, they note that the statue's chakra vanishes, causing Kakashi to question whether this is the end. However, the revived Tentails appears from the clearing smoke, prompting Obito to declare that it is indeed the end of the world. Elsewhere, though disappointed that the eight Nine Tails were not captured in time, a recovered Madara notes that they should begin their plan. Shocked to see the Tentails before them, Naruto surmises that they must have been tricked as he was unable to sense the demonic statue that had passed malevolent chakra. However, Kurama tells Naruto that it was impossible to sense the beast in the tailed beast mode as the beast has neither feelings nor ideals and was akin to natural energy, and that using sage mode to sense how powerful it was would be a different matter. Meanwhile, Obito and Madara relocate atop the beast as it attaches its tendrils into them. Obito notes that he would like to commence the plan immediately, but Madara is more in favor of testing out the beast's power. As Naruto's attempt to gauge the Ten Tails' power in Sage Mode ends in Naruto realizing that it was indeed truly immeasurable, Kurama asks Yuki to hand a Might Guy and Kakashi so he could restore their chakra. Taking command, Kurama devises a battle strategy to face the beast, launching a continuous stream of tailed beast balls, which culminates with Yuki seemingly being decimated by the Ten Tails' tailed beast ball. But it was later revealed that Kakashi had warped it away while it was being launched by Naruto along with the latter's clone overhead, the Ten Tails, where Kakashi released Yuki to aim a tailed beast ball. But the attack was flicked back at him, leaving Naruto's shadow clone and Kakashi open for an attack. After the clone successfully pushes Kakashi out of the way, Obito reflects on how much Naruto was like himself before the Ten Tails' attack disperses the shadow clone and sends Yuki flying. At their limits, Kurama and Gyuki tell Naruto and B to buy them some time while they generate more chakra for use. As the opposition notices this, he and his teammates already somewhat incapacitated, Naruto prepares to create more shadow clones which Madara chides him for, calling him incompetent. Kakashi also echoes these sentiments and Obito goes on to explain Naruto that numbers will not change anything as he laments that all shinobi like the youth are powerless and would eventually become like him one day. This causes Naruto to lash out at Obito, once again stating his dream to become Hokage, which leads Obito to tell him that he would make him a Hokage inside the infinite Tsukiyomi, as he has the Ten Tails prepared to fire a tailed beast ball to obliterate Naruto and his allies in one blow. However, when the Ten Tails fires his tailed beast ball at them, the shinobi are shocked to realize that the beast is missed. Just then, from above, Ino, Hinata, Hiyashi, and a few others arrive and it's revealed that Ino was able to shift the blast after taking control of Obito for a split second. Immediately, the Aburame use the insect jamming technique and the Kirigakure Nin shroud the battlefield in mist to stop them from being sensed. Shortly after this, the entire allied shinobi forces arrive at the battlefield, causing the sensing water sphere to distort, and Naruto announces that they were no longer a disorderly crowd before announcing a new technique, the Ninja Alliance technique, which is the strongest technique that ever existed in the shinobi world and it could win against the infinite Tsukiyomi. Despite the swell in the number of opponents, Madara and Obito note that their efforts were still futile and that even after this war, history would only repeat itself and they would end up in the very same predicament. Naruto chastises them both, noting that when there was a difference between in a group, the majority of beats all. Accepting this premise, Obito simply notes that they would make the decision after exterminating the majority, the alliance itself. Using this time, Shikaku, through Inoichi's telepathic abilities, is able to relay the strategy he'd formulated with the entire alliance. With this, the alliance launched their strategy. The first attempt to slow down their targets by blinding them, which was executed by the Kumonin, was C and a few others using the lightning illusion flash of lightning pillar technique, followed by Darui and the other storm release bearers using the storm release laser circus technique. Secondly, the Sunanin used the wind release air current wild dance to manipulate the dust from the previous attack to obscure the opponent's vision once again adding to it what remains of the insect jamming technique and heading a mist technique from earlier to completely impair the opponent's sensory skills. Following this, Kitsuchi and a group of Iwanin sink the beast in a hole, allowing his daughter and the other lava release bearers to cover the beast in quick lime, which is mixed with water with the Kirinin. Finishing off, members of the Konoha Saratobi clan harden the mixture using fire release. This leads Madara to state how surprised he is that Shinobi from different countries were able to pull off such a perfect combination. Shikaku informs them that they have to defeat Madara and Obito while the Ten Tails was still restrained, recommending the logistical support and medical vision to coordinate with Naruto to exploit Obito's weakness and telling all Shinobi who were skilled in Taijutsu to deal with Madara. As various Shinobi as well as techniques bear down on the two Uchiha, Madara realizes that they're being targeted this time. He notes, however, that in order to do that, the Alliance would have to have someone to stop the Ten Tails first. With this, a powerful blast sends the incoming Shinobi flying away as the fully matured Ten Tails emerges from the pit. While the medical teams move out to tend to the injured, Shikaku, Inuichi, Ao, and the others discuss what was happening on the battlefield. Now finding it even harder to control the beast, Obito and Madara use Hashirama's cells in order to fortify their control over the beast, as the former agrees with the legendary Uchiha that it was time they showed the allied shinobi forces true despair. As the beast fires off a tailed beast ball, Kitsuchi is able to deflect its course using Earth Release Underfoot the Beast. A second tailed beast ball is launched, which detonates in a nearby lake, and a third, which Yashi notes, destroys an entire town in an instant. Initially believing that the towns where civilians were were now unsafe, the fourth tailed beast ball which is launched is noted to be heading straight for HQ as Shikaku surmised. As Inuichi asks for directives, Shikaku tells him that the only thing they could do is what they were assigned until the very end. And for what appears to be the final time, Inuichi patches Shikaku through to the entire alliance as the genius Nara passes on his final strategy to defeat the enemy. Meanwhile on the battlefield, Madara exclaims that they're finally able to get them with a the tailed beast ball, justifying the deaths of the alliance its head was a simple war attack. Though Choji tries to console him after his father's death, Shikamaru reminds him and Ino that they are in the middle of a war and must focus on carrying out Shikaku's final strategy. Only Naruto was unaware of Inuichi and Shikaku's 
his deaths, with the others attempt to explain interrupted by the Ten Tails of his main attack. Leaping into action, Neji and Hiyashi are able to deflect the beast's attack, with everyone beginning to praise the Hyuga clan. Hiyashi tells Naruto that he must focus in this fight while explaining to him that death is a possibility in this war, adding that Shikaku and Inuichi were willing to die for their children. Neji echoes his uncle's sentiments, referring to his own father's sacrifice, before he, Hiyashi, and Hinata state their intent to protect Naruto to their last breath. Meanwhile, atop the Ten Tails, which is slowly resisting their control, Madara and Obito discuss how to proceed with their plan. However, as he's only a reanimated corpse and cannot become the Ten Tails of Maturiki, Madara needs Obito to sacrifice himself to become a living being once more. Taking advantage of his ancestor's dilemma and wanting to put the allied shinobi forces in further despair, Obito is the Ten Tails attack again. As the attacks are being deflected by the Hyuga, Kishi builds his chakra in preparation to use his signature technique. With the beast's hand itself bearing down on the group, Hiyashi uses the eight trigrams vacuum wall palm to deflect it. The beast then uses a pinpoint attack, which Hiyashi realizes they could not deflect in time. As Sinata throws out her arms to protect Naruto, Neji actually intercepts the attack. Naruto calls for medics. Neji notes that it was already too late and that he will die within minutes. As Hiyashi looks on in horror and Hinata cries openly, Naruto questions why a genius from the Hyuga clan would throw away his life for him. And Neji, who notes that he finally understood his father's feelings, states that it was for the exact reason that he did it, because Naruto called him a genius and that he chose to die for those he cares for. With this, the Byakugan sealing Junjutsu on Neji's forehead disappears, confirming his death. Taking delight in Naruto being shocked, Obito attempts to shatter Naruto's self-confidence and drag him into his way of thinking. However, Hinata snaps Naruto out of it while telling him that his life is connected with everyone who shared his beliefs and are willingly sacrificing themselves for him. He should not give it a despair and have Neji die in vain. By that time, as Killer B manages to cripple the Ten Tails by lodging his tailed beast ball into his mouth and is about to fire, Naruto thanks Hinata for staying by his side and takes her hand while entering tailed beast mode. Infusing some of Kurama's chakra into Hinata's body, Naruto creates shadow clones to do the same with the rest of their allies. Empowered by Kurama's chakra with their attack strengthened, the allied shinobi fight back with the Akamichi clan members restraining some of the Ten Tails' tails. Remembering their father's final words, Ino takes over Obito's body to veer his attempted wood release technique off course before Shikamaru leads his Nara clan kinsmen in restraining the Ten Tails. By that time, Team Guy made their way to the deceased Neji with Rock Lee mourning his friend's death. Despite Obito mocking Guy's words of comfort, keeping those in your heart as a curse, Kakashi and Naruto rebuff this notion, the latter telling Obito that ninja are meant to endure such pain and will keep Neji in his heart even if it becomes an actual curse. As Naruto infuses Lee with some of his chakra, Kurama ponders his Jinchuriki's ability to match his own chakra with that of different shinobi and considers the youth to have surpassed his parents. Though Madara decides to help Obito in breaking the Nara clan's restraints, they are respectively severed from the Ten Tails tendrils by Lee and Naruto before the Uchiha are forced to the ground. Elsewhere in Konoha, though sensing Naruto's chakra as it was being given, Sasuke instructs Suigetsu and Juga to press onwards with Orochimaru before they arrive to the Uzumaki clan's mask storage temple. Though it was actually a detour, Orochimaru took one of the masks with Suigetsu unnerved by Orochimaru's choosing. After Sasuke breaks away from the group to serve the village from a high point, he and his group arrive to the destination, the remains of the ruined Naka Shrine. There, Orochimaru dons the mask, which invokes the Shinigami as it binds itself to him. While explaining his actions, Orochimaru slashes the Shinigami's stomach open to release the souls of those it had consumed. Though the act mortally wounded him, Orochimaru regained his hand so he can now use impure world reincarnation as he has Jugo to use his natural energy to activate the six Setsu spores Obito had planted on Sasuke to monitor him. With the two held down by Jugo and Suigetsu, before transferring his being into the latter's restrained white Setsu, Orochimaru uses the remaining four as sacrifices to reincarnate the ones Sasuke needs his answer from, Hashirama Sen Senju, Tobirama Senju, Hiruzen Sarutobi, and Minotona Makazi. Tsunade serving as the current Hokage, they and Hiruzen believe they are all brought back by Orochimaru in another scheme to destroy Konoha before he clarifies his reason for bringing them back to life. Shocked of Orochimaru's reason and that Sasuke knows the full story of the Uchiha clan downfall, Hiruzen reveals that everything the youth has learned up to this moment is true. Not surprised, Tobirama berates the Uchiha clan until Orochimaru points out that his actions in life set them down that path by placing them in charge of the Konoha military police force and separating them from the rest of Konoha. When Hashirama demanded why his brother did it, Tobirama explained that the Uchiha treasured love above all else and that through the despair of losing someone dear, they gained the Sharingan eventually evolve them. However, using Madara and the love he had for his brother as an example, Tobirama reveals that the despair can also madden the user. He concludes that all he had done was an attempt to use the Uchiha's cursed heritage in a positive way and cannot be blamed for this self-destructive nature. Hearing enough, Sasuke turns his attention to Hashirama to ask him the meaning behind the village and ninja so he can determine whether or not it's worth sparing. Against Tobirama's protest, having sensed his rival also being reincarnated, Hashirama tells Sasuke of his history of Madara Uchiha in an effort to save the youth from his old friend's fate by telling him his ideals. Beginning his story at the Warring States period, the time before the Shinobi villages were established, Hashirama reveals that he and Madara had met as children. Though enemies by birth due to their family feud, Hashirama befriended Madara and they dreamed of an ideal system where everyone could live in peace. However, when their families learned of their secret meetings, Madara severed his ties to Hashirama and became his enemy despite his former friend's pleas. Time passes and both Hashirama and Madara became leaders of their respective clans. Though Hashirama continued to revisit their plans of peace to him as he lost his entire family in the conflict, Madara remained reluctant to end the bloodshed before accepting it when Hashirama demonstrated how strong his resolve for peace was. Soon after Konoha was formed, and despite his intent to make Madara their leader, Hashirama became Hokage by popular vote. Madara feared that a day would come where Konoha would be led by people like Tobirama, who distrusted the Uchiha. Therefore, leaving Konoha, Madara created what he considered a true method of achieving peace. However, this required Madara to capture Kurama and use his power to wipe out Konoha. This resulted in the epic battle between Hashirama and Madara that created the Valley of the End and was thought to be where Madara died. Although he regretted killing Madara, his friend for so many years, Hashirama concludes by stating his notion of a ninja as one who strives for their dreams, that he may become an entirely different person in the process. With his story done, Hashirama asks Sasuke if he accept his ideals or continue embracing Madara's views of the world. Sasuke responds that his brother Itachi shared Hashirama's dreams for a unified Konoha and died protecting it. Because Madara's plan means the complete abandonment of this, Sasuke decides to fight to save what meant so much to Itachi. 
Orochimaru decides to join him out of curiosity, as does Karin, who tracks Sasuke down and immediately forgives his previous attempt to kill her. The Hokage, though earlier restrained by Orochimaru so they would not run off to join the war, are now given freedom to do so. Each standing upon their own face the Hokage rock, the Hokage voice their eagerness to get things started. Minato in particular delighted that he would finally get to meet his son, and promises to make up for not being there with a huge surprise. Having been disconnected from the Ten Tails, Madara and Obito begin attacking. Naruto manipulates the chakra cloaks he gave the alliance, protects him as he engages Obito in a fight while debating whose values truly matter. As Madara shivers with delight upon sensing reincarnated Hashirama's chakra, the Ten Tails breaks free from Kitsuchi's earth restraints and begins to act on his destructive impulses. Kakashi tries to warp it away, but is pulled into a fight with Obito as both are sucked into the other dimension, while the Ten Tails' power creates multiple natural disasters all over the battlefield. As the Nine Tails' chakra shrouds disappear after protecting the Shinobi Alliance from the worst of the Ten Tails' attack, the monster reacts to the sight of Naruto with the tailed beasts and the Sage of Six Paths silhouette around him. The Shinobi form a defensive line to give Sakura time to heal Naruto. Madara notes his growing disinterest in the battlefield and that another awaits him. Within the other dimension, Kakashi and Obito continue the battle, with Kakashi stopping just short of driving his lightning cutter through Obito's heart. Obito is surprised to find Kakashi hesitating and asks if he is racked with guilt for not keeping his promise. Still wanting to save Obito, realizing his friend's malice towards Naruto is based on not wanting to be rejected by the boy he once was, Kakashi explains to him that he can still be that person again, but Obito laughed and phased through Kakashi's technique. Effectively recreating the scene how Kakashi had impaled Rin, Obito reveals that he knows why Rin died and notes that he did not wage a war just because of her death and Kakashi's inability to keep his promise to protect her, but because of the hell that the villagers and their shinobi put him through that made him empty and devoid of almost all feeling. When offered a place in the Eye of the Moon Plane, Kakashi questions Obito if the delusion would truly fill the hole in his heart, stating from experience of his intent of not letting Obito's discarded ideals go to waste. Back in the real world, having seen the tailed beast inside Naruto, the Ten Tails is violent they reacted to their present by transforming once again while charging its attack. As it charges a devastating tailed beast ball, Shikamaru comes up with a plan of using all the remaining members of the alliance to create a lot of weaker earthen walls to redirect the attack with Yuki's assistance. After consulting with Kitsuchi and having Ino pass the info around, Shikamaru has Killer B take point. As Sakura rallies their forces while healing Naruto, the Shinobi Alliance carries out their plan to hinder the Ten Tails attack. However, despite B's support, the Ten Tails tailed beast ball was about to breach until it was sent to the sea by the recently reincarnated Minato just as he arrived. Once explaining himself, Minato muses over Sakura's similarity to Kushina and the other Hokage arrive. Madara gets giddy at the sight of Hashirama as the first Hokage states he will deal with the Ten Tails first as he and the successors use four red yang formation technique to trap the beast, with Hashirama adding an additional seal pinning down the beast's tails. By then, Sasuke arrives with Jugo and the remaining members of the Konoha Eleven surround Naruto. However, not caring what they think of him, Sasuke explains that he no longer wishes to destroy Konoha but to make changes to it. Stating that becoming Hokage is the only way to achieve that new goal, Sasuke gets into a minor dispute with Naruto over it before Hashirama reminds them to their current situation. Though told the rest as they're about to join the Hokage, Sakura explains to Naruto and Sasuke that she is no longer the weak girl from a few years ago, and she trained under a Sanian just like they were. This prompts Naruto to note that Team 7 is back and they and the reformed Rookie 9 charge into battle once the Hokage's barrier is complete with the Tentails unable to escape. After adding one more seal, Hashirama creates five wood clones, four to make an opening for the allied ninjas, and one to confront Madara who decides to stand out until the original's ready. Once inside, the group finds himself facing an army of Tentails clones, with Sakura using what she learned from Tsunade to wipe out some of the creatures, much to her teammates' shock before they save her when she momentarily left her guard down. The rest of the Rookie 9 follow suit by displaying their own newly mastered abilities, Kiba's Human Beast Mixer Transformation, Three-Headed Wolf, Shino's Parasitic Giant Insect Bug Bite, and Team Asuma's Inoshika Cho Formation E Human Bullet Yo-Yo. Even Sai joins the fray, although ends up being saved by Naruto. With the number of Tentails clones having an advantage of the allied Shinobi forces, Sai points out that the only way to beat the Tentails is to defeat its largest extension to get close enough to it. Though the attempt is risky and could be fatal, Naruto has a solution and he summons Gama Bunta but finds a large Gama Kichi aiding him instead. Sasuke and Sakura have a similar conclusion and follow suit by summoning Aura in place of the deceased Manda and Katsu, respectively. As Sakura has Katsu provide aid to the Shinobi Alliance's wounded, Naruto and Sasuke use their summons to fight through the Ten Tails. Once there, glad to have Sasuke as an ally again, Naruto combines its Ultra Big Ball Rest and Shuriken with Sasuke's Blaze Release Susano Kagutsuchi to land a blow on the Ten Tails. When Naruto and Kuroma were intent to extract the tailed beast from the inside the Ten Tails, Sasuke is intent to incinerate the monster in its entirety before it severed the burning piece of its body with no intention of going peacefully. Elsewhere, Orochimaru arrives with Suigetsu and Karin to where Tsunade and the other Kage are being tended to by Katsu. Though the slug is wary at first, it eventually agrees to them assisting because of Tsunade's dire condition. While Suigetsu aids in putting Tsunade's bifurcated halves back together, Karin has Tsunade bite her so that she can recover, which in turn allows Katsu to heal her injuries. After a brief conversation about Orochimaru's change of heart, Orochimaru and his companions leave for the battlefield. While Tsunade and the other healed Kage are briefed on battle by Katsu, they make preparations to head back to the battlefield. Back on the battlefield, Sai continues to question Sasuke's true motives, and while Sakura notes that she has faith in Sasuke, Sai noted that her eyes did not reflect this. Back in the other dimension, the conflict between Kakashi and Obito rages on as both think back to their childhood days as Minato's students. With Kakashi intent to protect both Naruto and the old Obito from the latter's current incarnation, Kakashi manages to impale Obito with the lightning cutter infused kunai. However, the heavily wounded Obito stabs Kakashi within his black rods while telling him that his defeat will not turn the tide of the war as he returns to their reality. Appearing atop the Ten Tails, Madara notices his arrival. Obito finds himself betrayed by his mentor, who decided it is time for Obito to return the favor for saving him in his past. Using the black receivers and the artificial parts of Obito's body, Madara forces him to perform the Outer Path Samsara of Heavenly Life technique to become truly alive and become the Ten Tails from Shuriki. Realizing Madara's intent, Hashirama sends Naruto and Sasuke to stop Obito while he and Tobirama create an army of clones as a contingency plan. Minato also creates a clone to attack Obito, learning the truth that his former student has been alive the whole time while realizing his student's role in the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox's attack.
field and Killer B confirming with Yuki that the Tentails have not reached its final form yet, Obito proceeds to destroy the four Red Yang formation. As the other Hokage deal with Obito to find a weak point, learning there is a substance on his skin that makes him invincible to attacks. Hashirama ends up being confronted by Madara, who decides to settle things with his rival once and for all. Birth of the Tentails Jinchuriki. Despite Minato's attempt to stop him, Obito goes after Naruto and proceeds to attack him and Sasuke. Luckily, Naruto uses his chakra arms on his father and Sasuke so the former can teleport them away. By that time, his body beginning to mutate as he attempted to attack, Obito is losing control as the Tentails is asserting itself and destroying the human's mind. Though he instructs Naruto and Sasuke to follow his counter with a collaborative attack, his former student thinking of Rin and their team, Minato finds Obito had managed to regain control of his body and assume a form similar to the Sage of Six Paths himself. Teleporting away after his arm got ripped off, Minato finds that Obito attached an orb made a mysterious substance to him as it begins to expand. Luckily, a clone of Tobirama grabs the orb and destroys himself in an attempt to kill Obito. Elsewhere on the battlefield, deciding that the time for waiting is over, Madara battles Hashirama in an epic clash with the allied Shinobi forces in awe before Shikamaru uses Ino to contact their allies not to lose focus for a second. By that time, having used the substance to avoid being consumed in the explosion, an unscathed Obito deflects an impulse of Sasuke's Amaterasu before Naruto aids his friends so the two can make an opening for Minato and Tobirama. With the second and fourth Okages preparing for an instantaneous swapping flying thunder god technique, before Tobirama appears behind Obito, Sasuke and Naruto rush forth with a Kagetsuchi-infused Rasen Shuriken. Expecting to be attacked by the second Okage, Obito learns he fell for a trap as Minato suddenly has the Rasen Shuriken and takes Tobirama's place to attack Obito from behind. The Konoha Ninja's elation at landing a direct hit are quickly diminished when Obito makes use of his new abilities to push aside the flames and heal himself. At this point, they realize that Minato's arm had not regenerated and figured out that the Uchiha was using Yin Yang Release, and thus being able to nullify the regeneration of Impure World Reincarnation and making the reincarnated vulnerable to fatal attacks. In response to this, Naruto tries to enter Tailed Beast mode in order to deliver an even more powerful attack but fails completely, earning himself blank looks from both enemies and allies. After Kurama tells Naruto to hold off from using his chakra, Gamakichi fires a natural energy infused starch syrup gun in a last ditch effort to help before disappearing. Obito easily blocks it, however, both Tobirama and Naruto notice something amiss. As Minato questions why Obito discarded his dream of becoming Hokage, Naruto uses his chance to enter Sage mode. When the Uchiha explained his reasoning and assaults the Hokage, Tobirama assists Naruto in delivering Rasengan, proving that while resistant to ninjutsu, Obito is vulnerable to Senjutsu. As Naruto passionately defends the title of Hokage and his father's legacy, Kurama's yin half within Minato spurs Minato to action. After Naruto and Tobirama fall back, a recovered Obito decides to execute the Eye of the Moon plan by first creating an enormous tree to wipe out the remainder of the allied shinobi forces while boxing them in with a barrier to prevent them from escaping. To counter the turn of events, Naruto thinks of a risky plan before asking his father to bump fists with him, the act between father and son allowing Yang and Yin Kurama to connect to each other as well. After telling Obito that he will not let the world end as long as he lives, Naruto dons his Ninetales Chakra Mode mantle with Minato falling suit. Their combined efforts bolster the version 1 like mantles around the shinobi, thus allowing Minato to teleport the alliance outside the barrier before the Tailed Beast Balls exploded. With this, the team presses onwards in their assault on Obito, and the father-son duo going into Tailed Beast Mode, and Naruto also using Sage Mode to bolster their attacks that would affect Obito. The Uchiha, however, was prepared for the assault this time and was able to deflect it. Before the alliance can launch another attack, Obito decides to press on with the Eye of the Moon plan as he manifests the Tentails and has it transform into a tree that instinctively proceeds to suck the chakra out of any shinobi that it grabs. Madara reveals the tree to be the Tentails in its tree form while telling Hashirama the monster's true origin along with the chakra within all ninja. Barely escaping the branches with Hiruzen's help as he's teleported to safety, Naruto looks around his friends and allies in anguish as Obito proclaims that their suffering will end once the tree forms flower, the crown piece and creating the infinite Tsukiyomi, blooms. En route to the battlefield, the five Kage see the ten tails tree form and wonder what it was, which leads Sunaida to ask Katsu to explain what's happening. When Shikamaru is found to be one of the victims of the tree's attack, Sakura tries to have Katsu heal him remotely, but Katsu informs her that its clones also died due to having a chakra absorbed by the tree, leading her inside to rush to their comrade's side instead. The allied shinobi forces members spiral into deep despair, and taking advantage of their morale, Obito declares that he will not kill those who stop resisting, but Hashirama's wood clone reminds them not to give up. Hiruzen's sentiment causes Orochi Maru, who had just arrived with Suigetsu and Karin, to note that pessimism was very out of character for his sensei. As Madara and Hashirama continue the fight, the Uchiha reveals that even without the full chakra of the Eight and Nine Tails, the tree would bloom in approximately 15 minutes, during which Madara planned to take Obito's place using Hashirama's Senjutsu abilities. As the information is relayed to him, Hashirama's wood clone called out for Yamanaka, and while startled, Ido responds to the first and patches him through to the Alliance. Connected, the clone passes on the recent revelation and also tries to boost the shinobi's confidence, telling them to not give up. As the Tentails tree form moves again to attack, a large chunk of its root is cut off by a Susano created by Sasuke, who asks Naruto if he's out of reach the limit of his capacity. Responding to his friend's question, Naruto once again enters both Tailed Beast and Sage mode, and through Ino's technique, his feelings and memories are passed to everyone. Remembering his time as a child and the people he lost along the way, Naruto notes that he did not want to have any more regrets and that sacrifices would not be made in vain. With new determination and a chakra boost from Yinkurama, Naruto charges forward into the battle alongside Sasuke, who has Jugo use the Sage Transformation on his Susano to imbue it with natural energy, creating the Cursed Seal of Heaven markings on Sasuke's Susano. Ready for action, the two shinobi plunge back into battle against Obito, who took note of how time and time again Naruto would pick himself up from the red of despair. With this, Orochimaru reflects on how Sasuke seemingly has the potential to surpass even Madara Uchiha himself, while Tobirama notes that Naruto was in a lot of ways like his brother Hashirama, faults and all. With the shinobi still somewhat doubting themselves contemplating waiting for directors from the current Kage, Hashirama shares with them all his memories from the first summit of the five Kage. How the meeting unfolded is revealed to all, what rings home for them all is Hashirama's wish for all shinobi to be united. With this, Hashirama rallies the troops to amass their worries, their resolve, their sorrows, and strength in order to fight, all
ultimately Hashirama's wish for the future is answered by the appearance of the five current Kage to the battlefield, all standing as a united front. The five Kage disperse across the battlefield in order to strengthen the wills of the shinobi from their respective villages. Sakura is still attempting to heal Shikamaru, who is slowly slipping away due to a astounding loss of chakra. However, Naruto's version 1 chakra re-emerges and begins to give Shikamaru some strength, which Ino later notes that Naruto did subconsciously. So Sunata arrives to the location and easily heals Shikamaru back to full health, and while commending Sakura for her recent achievements. While a reformed allied shinobi alliance, led by the respective Kage, begin attacking the tree, Naruto and Sasuke are still engaging Obito. Meanwhile, Kakashi is healing himself in the other dimension, while also pondering Obito's true feelings and his buried will of fire deep within him. Just as Naruto and Sasuke believe they have found an opening, Obito deflects their attacks and manages to force Naruto out of his Senju to enhance Tailed Beast mode and Sasuke out of his Susano. As Obito asks Naruto why he would want to save a world that would ultimately only hurt him in the long run, Naruto replies that he would never go back on his world because it's his Nindo. Naruto and Sasuke agree to put an end to the battle once and for all as Sasuke Susano encases Naruto's Tailed Beast mode. With Korama now in Susano armor, Naruto and Sasuke prepare to attack Obito once more. Realizing their strength, Obito manifests a giant Yin Yang shield and the Sage of Six Paths legendary sword of Nunoboko to counter them. As the two young shinobi rush in, Naruto creates nine Rasengan within the tails of his Susano enhanced tail beast mode. Naruto then uses Ino's mind body transmission technique to contact the Konoha 11, excluding Neji, who died, Sakura, and Sai to enter the fray. As they join the battle, the tail beast mode mantles envelop them, and Naruto instructs them to use the Rasengan to break Obito's shield. After the Konoha 11 and Sai destroy the shield, Sasuke's Susano sword breaks the sword of Nunoboku and manages to slice through Obito. From there, Naruto proceeds to siphon out the other tailed beast, while Gar attempts to reclaim Shukaku and Killer B receives the fragment of Gyuki. Knowing that the tree would become a lifeless husk again if he allows the Jinshuriki to succeed, Obito wrestles with him for the chakra. However, the rest of the allied shinobi forces and Sasuke's allies join in, helping Naruto in grabbing hold of the chakra through Minato's Nine Tails chakra mode. Within his subconscious, having begun to imagine what his life would have been like if he returned to the village instead of Madara after Rin's death, Obito sees himself alone against the entire alliance as he begins to contemplate and grapples to come to terms with what he starts to view as to be regret. However, using a link to reach them, an empathetic Naruto tells Obito that despite his declaration of being no one, he was in fact someone with dreams. Telling Obito he was and still is Obito Uchiha, Naruto vows to destroy the metaphysical mask he created for himself. Even despite attempting to strangle the youth, insisting he regrets nothing in the choices he made, Obito struggles with his inner turmoil. When Naruto pointed out that Rin could never accept the man he is now. As Naruto grabs Obito's hand, the allied shinobi forces succeed in freeing the tailed beasts. Utterly defeated, gazing at the moon while lamenting that he could never feel the void in his heart, Obito did not notice Sasuke running at him with the intent to cut him down. However, as the alliance were about to join in before Tsunade tells him to stand down, Kakashi manages to return from the other dimension. Stopping Sasuke, Kakashi informs his former student that killing Obito is his burden to bear. It is stopped by Minato. From there, the three members of Team Minato speak of their ideals and what they each became since Rin's death. Kakashi then tells a doubtful Obito that Naruto would not have ended up like him because he had many friends to help him along the way. By that time, after the tailed beast thanked him for freeing them from the Ten Tails body, Naruto focuses his attention away from Obito to find Madara with the intention of stopping the Uchiha for good. A defeated Obito watches as Naruto attacks and immobilizes Madara from atop the tree that Hashirama managed to subdue besides being himself pinned down. The allied shinobi forces notices the direction of Naruto's attack and begins rushing to location. Shukaku agrees to assist Gara with stopping Madara while the other tailed beast following suit. Sai flies to the top of the tree to collect Naruto while Madara recovers from Naruto's attack. Meanwhile, Obito, who is incapacitated due to the extraction of the tailed beast, resolves to use the outer path some sort of heavenly life technique to revive those who have been killed during the war, stating that he finally understands Nagato's actions. Before he could do so, however, Black Setsu emerges and takes over his body, forcing him to use the same technique to revive Madara instead. Much to the shock of Naruto and the others, and his own satisfaction, Madara is revived in the flesh. As Madara's eyes crumble, having bestowed them to Nagato prior to his death, he is suddenly struck ablaze by Matarasu, courtesy of Sasuke. The legend is unfazed, though, simply absorbing the technique. As his armor falls away, Madara reminds Hashirama about the conversation they had under the Naka Shrine, stating that he believes the unity stated refers to the combination of both Uchiha and Senju, revealing the face of Hashirama on his chest. Stating that the face was due to Kabuto, Madara quickly bypasses Naruto and Sai so as to grab onto his old enemy and drain him of all the Senju to Chakra, turning the face on his chest into Sage Mode. Sasuke then goes on the attack, intent on killing Madara now that he's just been fully revived. However, the older Uchiha manages to grab the younger's blade, planning on taking Sasuke's eyes until he gets his originals back. Meanwhile, Obito, Kakashi, and Minato learn about Madara's revival. Just as Black Setsu attempts to take the Rinnegan, the former Hokage and his pupils simultaneously attempt to attack the creature, who quickly attaches himself to Obito before they can reach it. Explaining that he is Madara's will, he recalls how it escaped. Though Chojuro managed to pin the upper half down after bisecting Black Setsu, the lower half was also sentient and escaped to help his master later. Back with Madara, the Uchiha attempts to persuade Sasuke to joining his side, but the younger adamantly refuses. Both Sai and Naruto attempt to attack Madara in a pincer attack, but he manages to push them both back while escaping Sasuke's blade. As he instantly starts healing, Madara then turns his attention to the incoming tailed beasts. Seeing that they're between the beast and Madara, the allied shinobi forces quickly get out of their way with Killer B and Yuki's help. Gara, together with Shukaku, launches a mass of sand projectiles at Madara. Gara then manipulates the sand in the Uchiha's blood to temporarily immobilize him, as he's ricocheted between Maratabi, Isobu, Sangoku, Koku, and Chome before landing in a sticky field courtesy of Saiken. Gara and Shukaku then act quickly, attempting to seal the Uchiha before he could recover. Though they manage to do so, Madara still manages to break out using Susano, but is quickly knocked down by Naruto and Kurama. They are then joined by B and Gyuki, and together the beasts use their tails to rain down a barrage of hits, stripping away the Susano to get to the man within. Though the attack cost Madara his right arm, he manages to escape. A white Zetsu then emerges from the ground, which carried Madara's Rinnegan. 
Taking the eye and the clone's right arm as he attaches both, claiming that now the real fun begins. Though temporarily overjoyed at being alive and able to feel the fight, Maduro quickly returns his attention to battle. As the Uchiha prepares to summon Kurama shudders as he recalls how Maduro had used to summon it, which receives a chastening from Shukaku, who in return gets a warning about the mere human. As the demonic statue of the outer path is summoned, the object in question suddenly emerges from Obito. Kakashi attempts to warp it away, but only manages to take an arm. As the tailed beasts wonder how Maduro is capable of summoning the statue, Naruto quickly manages to figure it out himself. Back with Obito, Black Zetsu again attempts to take the Rinnegan from its weakened host, but through pure willpower, Obito manages to prevent it. When Zetsu states that the Rinnegan is to be returned to Madara, Obito claims that he has hidden the right eye and Kakashi will crush the left. However, Black Zetsu mocks his host's ignorance, stating that White Zetsu was already found and returned the right eye, and Obito would be dead if it wasn't attached to him. It goes on to say that the only reason that it's still attached to the dying man is because he knows that Kakashi and Minato would have already killed him otherwise. Madara soon recovers from the damage he received earlier, claiming to White Zetsu that he has gotten careless considering that he now possesses Hashirama's recovery power. He then resolves to be more careful and will instead use the Rinnegan's ability to its fullest. Madara then uses Limbo, Border Jail, and while at first it doesn't seem to do anything, one by one each of the beasts are blown back. He then launches chains from the statue which attach to the tailed beasts and start pulling them towards it. Madara declares he will extract the eight and nine tails from the Jinjuriki. Naruto tries to exit tailed beast mode but finds it futile, as Madara has Kurama's chakra trapped within the chains. The clone of White Zetsu informs Madara that it would be best to recapture the beast in numerical order, starting with Chukaku. Madara, with a readjusted strategy, attempts to capture Chukaku with the chains first. However, Gara manages to stop this transaction with two enormous sand hands. Chukaku, shocked at Gara's actions, remember the words of his previous Jinchuriki, realizing that the time has come where humans and tailed beasts can be comrades. Madara quickly equips his Susano and hurls one of his swords at Gara. The Shukaku intercepts it. Madara sends another sword across the battlefield, and manages to connect the chains once again, as well as knocking Gara down. As the beasts are dragged into the statue once more, Beast severs one of his tentacles, while Kurama asks Gara for a favor. As Naruto is ejected from tailed beast mode and sent hurtling towards the ground, Gara calls out to a shocked Naruto. As Naruto begins to fall to the ground, unconscious due to Kurama's extraction, Gara uses his sand to cushion his comrades' fall. Meanwhile, Madara reseals all the tailed beasts, including Yuki and Kurama, back into the demonic statue of the other path. Tobirama suddenly attacks Madara, and the two engage in a brief battle, with Madara gaining the upper hand. Madara pins down Tobirama with his chakra rods, and the two exchange harsh words. As Sasuke travels to the battlefield from atop Garuda, he recalls how Hashirama wanted to give him a technique to stop Madara. Though initially hesitant, Sasuke accepted the offer when Hashirama noted Sasuke reminded him of Madara's brother, Izuna. Madara drives the stakes into Tobirama's head, taking deep pleasure in this as he states that this is penance for Tobirama's killing of Izuna. Sasuke appears over the two shinobi and jumps down towards them, ready to enter the fray. Tobirama tries to attack Madara to get an opening for Sasuke, however, Madara foils the plan, suspending Sasuke in the air before he has a chance to attack. Taking Sasuke's dropped sword, Madara stabs Sasuke through his chest, expressing his disappointment in the young Uchiha's actions. Gara rushes Naruto to help, but Tobirama curses Madara for stabbing Sasuke, which has left the young Uchiha severely injured. Meanwhile, Tobi appears in the battlefield and uses the Kanzi on Lotus King to attack the Alliance. However, it is barely fended off by Hiruzen, who Shikamaru takes note that if Hiruzen falls, the Alliance is doomed. While Orochimaru and Taka plan a surprise attack against the Tobi and Zetsu clone, Karin senses Sasuke's current predicament and becomes frantic. Gara arrives to Sanade, Shizune, and Sakura and asks them to heal Naruto. Hinata, realizing that Naruto's heartbeat is getting weaker and weaker with the Byakugan, rushes to Naruto's aid but stumbles due to being low on chakra, praying for Neji to help Naruto. However, Sakura is the only one with enough chakra left to heal Naruto, though stated before that neither she, Tsunade, or Shizune could perform medical ninjutsu any longer. Meanwhile, a struggling Sasuke refuses to die, promising to honor Itachi's sacrifice by becoming Hokage and changing the ninja world for the better. Madara simply rebuffs his statement and walks away from the dying Uchiha. Due to healing the members of the alliance beforehand, Sakura rapidly begins to run out of chakra, and Karin notices how serious Sasuke's wound is. The two young women note that soon Naruto and Sasuke will die if they do not receive immediate attention. As Kurama's chakra vanishes from around her, Sakura notices that Naruto lost his pulse and heartbeat. Confused as to why her medical energy isn't working, Gara explains that the Nine Tails has been extracted from Naruto. He then explains Kurama's plan to bring Naruto to his father in order to replace the yin half of Kurama from within him, which would allow him to be saved. Realizing Naruto may not make it, Sakura cuts open Naruto's side and begins personally pumping his heart while performing mouth to mouth resuscitation on him. Elsewhere, Tobirama notices he can no longer sense Sasuke's chakra. Additionally, he has lost complete movement, being even unable to use the flying fender god technique. Meanwhile, Karin commences an assault on Tobi using chains to fight the immense wooden structure. Her attack allows Orochimaru the opening to bite the Zetsu clone's neck, producing a curse seal that binds his movements. As their assault ends, Karin heals by biting a Herself. She notes that she can no longer set Sasuke. At this point, Madara summons the once again revived Tentails and proceeds to seal it inside of it, becoming its new Jinchuriki. He then launches himself in the direction of Obito in order to retrieve the missing Rinnegan. As Sasuke's situation seems hopeless, he's approached by an unknown barefooted individual. As Orochimaru's group presses forward towards Sasuke, both Karin and Tobirama note that they do not recognize either person or their chakra signature. Believing that this person may intend to harm Sasuke, Karin races towards Sasuke's location. Meanwhile, Guy, Rock Lee, and Ten Ten begin making their way across the battlefield. However, they see Gara, Sakura, and Naruto fly overhead towards Kakashi's location and decide to turn around and head there as well. As Madara flies to the same destination, he spits out the Kohaku no Johei and the Benihisago noting that they're waiting him down. Two weapons land on top of Guy and Lee's heads, while Ten-Ten is shocked at the weapon's reappearance. On the other battlefield, Kakashi and Minato continue to battle Black Zetsu until the Kazakage's group arrives at the scene. Gara explains what happened to Minato and urges him to give Naruto the other half of Kurama's chakra. As Minato begins the transference, Black Zetsu suddenly intercepts and absorbs Yin Kurama, becoming his Jinchuriki. With no hope left, Madara arrives in the battlefield, chastising Black Zetsu for taking too long. Black Zetsu tells Madara that he has successfully taken half of the Nine Tails' chakra, and Madara tells him to give it to him immediately. Black Zetsu tries, but Obito regains control of himself. Minato, Kakashi, and Gara try to interfere, but are countered by Madara. Minato has his remaining arm cut off. Madara and
chest, manifesting the same chakra Joe he wielded when he was the Ten Tails from Jerki. Madara immediately attempts to obtain his left eye from Obito, however, the latter simply phases through his former mentor. Locked in their subconscious, Obito attempts to extract the tailed beast from Madara. However, he only manages to extract fragments of Shukaku's and Gyuki's chakra. Returning to reality, Obito orders Kakashi to send Naruto to the other dimension, which Kakashi does so without arguing. As Obito attempts to transport himself, Madara stops him by sending a mysterious orb in his direction. Reclaiming his footing next to Kakashi, Obito tells Madara to beware the power that the two manga Kyosharingan have to offer. As Madara launches two more orbs towards the two, Obito, with Kakashi's help, transports himself to the other dimension. After convincing Sakura of his changed nature, Obito begins to transfer the tailed beast chakra into Naruto. In the real world, Guy arrives just in the nick of time to save Kakashi from Madara's attack. Orochimaru and Taka arrive at Sasuke's side, who are surprised to learn that the mysterious man was in fact Kabuto Yakashi, who managed to break out of Izanami after finding his true self. Mentioning that he inherited Itachi's will to protect Sasuke, Kabuto reveals that he has arrived on the battlefield to heal Sasuke's wounds and atone for his sins. Meanwhile, Kakashi thanks Guy for saving him from Madara's attack and mentions that only Senjutsu and Taijutsu will be effective against the Tentails of Jurki. As Minato mentions that his Senjutsu is subpar, Guy opens the seventh gate and attacks Madara with a series of punches. Keeping Madara at bay, Guy finishes his assault with a daytime tiger, which Madara managed to survive although he plans on eliminating an exhausted guy by launching a mysterious orb in his direction. Though Kakashi attempts to save Guy with Minato's special kunai in order to warp away the black orb, Rock Lee arrives just in the nick of time to save his sensei. As the group ponders on how to defeat Madara, Guy reveals that the only way to beat Madara is for him to open the 8th gate, which would result in his death, and evolve into the Crimson Beast. While Kakashi, Minato, and Lee attempt to dissuade Guy from using the fatal technique, they abandon this fruitless endeavor once they realize Guy's commitment. As Lee begins shedding tears for his master, Guy tells him that it's no time for tears, as the noble shinobi rushes towards Madara once more, sticking his thumb into his chest and opens the 8th gate of death. As he begins transforming into a Crimson Beast, Guy reflects on his father, might die, a shinobi only talented in taijutsu like himself and his pupil, who was once disgraced because of his own faults. Remembering how Might Die gave up his life after using the 8th gate in order to save him and his teammates from the previous 7 ninja swordsmen than this, Guy realizes that his time has come to sacrifice himself for the safety of his comrades. As Madara berates Guy's abilities, he immediately attacks Madara with the Evening Elephant. Guy wastes no time in attacking Madara with his new technique. He manages to land a blow on the legendary shinobi and sends him plummeting into the ground, creating an extremely deep crater. While Guy laments from the pain that is caused from using his first attack, Madara notes that Guy has become extremely powerful and decides that it would be best to avoid being hit from the technique at all costs. As Guy and Madara prepare to clash again after Guy grows accustomed to the pain, Minato, Lee, Kakashi, and Gaara decide to aid Guy by disabling Madara's black orbs. As Lee opens the sixth gate, their plan succeeds and they're able to warp away the black orbs and create an opening for Guy to use the five steps of the Evening Elephant. Though beaten severely, Madara notes that he has not had this much fun since his battle with Hashirama, greatly surprising Guy. Meanwhile, in the other direction, Naruto finally opens his eyes. Waking up surrounded by a watery surface, Naruto questions if he's died. An unknown figure asks him what his definition of death is. Naruto asks who this person is, and the figure reveals himself to be none other than Hagoromo Otsutsuki, the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto recognizes this name as he previously heard it from Jiraiya and Nagato, and states that he is the one who created ninjutsu. Hagoromo corrects him by saying he did not create ninjutsu, but ninshu, stating that his creation was to inspire peace, while ninjutsu was made to create war. Following this revelation, Hagoromo begins telling him about his history, including his mother, brother, and how his two sons fought. And Hagoromo reveals to Naruto that he is a reincarnation of his younger brother, Asura Otsutsuki. Naruto, however, is not surprised by this fact, and tells the sage how he felt something different in Sasuke during their meeting at the Samurai Bridge, and realizes that Sasuke is the reincarnation of the sage's older son, Indra Otsutsuki. Hagoromo goes on to tell Naruto more about his mother's past, and about the previous reincarnation of the sons, Hashirama and Madara. He then summons all the tailed beast chakra sealed inside Naruto and asks him how much he wants to fight Madara against the end. To which Naruto replies he is stupid and does not know much, but he knows what friends are and he wants to protect them. It is then revealed that Hagodomo was talking to Sasuke at the same time as Naruto, stating that they are the ones who will decide the future, and proceeds to pass on his power to both of them. Returning to the battlefield as Guy prepares his technique, Night Guy, Madara notices Guy's rapidly decreasing chakra levels and notes that this will be the legendary beast's final attack. Meanwhile, Naruto, with a light circle mark on his right hand and Sasuke with a dark crescent moon mark on his left hand, finally awaken and prepare to head to the battlefield with their respective surrounding groups of people. As Kakashi, Lee, and Gara watch the gruesome battle continue, Kakashi realizes the first time he met Guy and realizes that Guy is no longer the talentless loser he once was. As Guy finishes preparing his attack, he rushes towards Madara, as the latter notices that Guy is managing to distort space, resulting in his inability to counterattack. Guy lands a devastatingly powerful kick on Madara, which manages to decimate the complete left side of the Uchiha's upper body on almost killing him. As Guy's body begins to deteriorate, Madara sends one final black orb to annihilate his enemy. Naruto arrives in the battlefield and kicks back to him. Naruto manages to restore Guy's life force slowly as he reveals his new mysterious eyes, commenting that he can change the world with his new power. Madara is confused as to why Guy did not perish after using the 8th Gate of Death and questions what Naruto did to stop the shinobi's death. Without any time to react, Naruto leaps towards Madara while the latter forms his Shakujo from his remaining true seeking ball to defend against Naruto's punch. As Madara ponders Naruto's new powers once again, Naruto mentally requests Son Goku's power. Naruto forms a Senjutsu-enhanced lava-natured Rasen Shuriken with his new powers. As Naruto is about to throw it, Madara leaps away and casts Limbo Border Jail, but the young ninja somehow unintentionally dodges it. Naruto throws his new technique at Madara, making direct contact, and upon exploding, chops down the tree form of the Ten Tails. Naruto then quickly gets Guy out of danger and back to Rock Lee. As the tree collapses towards Madara, a voice tells him to absorb the tree. Following the advice, Madara recovers completely from his wounds and even altering his form slightly. Meanwhile, Sasuke has pulled out the stakes which pinned down Tobirama, who wonders how the young Uchiha is capable of doing so without being affected, until he gets a good look at Sasuke's face and understands. Sasuke then asks Tobirama to teleport him to the main battlefield, which the Hokage agrees, but warns that in his current condition he'll only be able to transport one person. The Uchiha responds saying that's fine, claiming that he'll be fine by him
himself. Back in the other dimension, Sakura reluctantly thanks Obito for saving Naruto, while the half-dead man asks for a favor in return. After Gara wishes Naruto good luck, the young Konoha Shinobi ponders on how different he feels when he confronts Madara. The other Uchiha then boasts how he was immortal and can't be defeated, to which Naruto responds that together they will defeat Madara, just as Sasuke appears. After Naruto transforms into a new tailed beast mode, Madara realizes that Sasuke possesses the Rinnegan, while the Uzumaki has the Senjutsu of the Six Paths. Well, he himself has both of them. Responding to the two younger ninjas' challenge, Madara announces this to be their final battle as he prepares to use a technique. Madara begins his counterattack, which Naruto blocks by throwing one of his stabs at it. While Sasuke seemingly teleports out of harm's way, shocking Madara. Naruto attacks Madara with his staff, but is blocked by a seemingly invisible wall. Meanwhile, Sasuke notices an invisible clone of Madara in between Naruto and the real Madara with his Rinnegan, so he throws his sword towards the clone, but the attack fails. Madara dispatches Naruto and retreats. As Sasuke begins explaining Madara's technique, Madara soon realizes that the two shinobi have found out how his limbo border jail technique works. Madara attempts to seal Sasuke's Rinnegan eye, but much to the surprise of the elder Uchiha, Sasuke switches places with his discarded sword from earlier and Madara is stabbed in the chest. Sasuke tells Naruto to use a technique with his Senjutsu in order to bind Madara, while Shukaku offers its new host its own chakra, creating the sage art magnet release for Sengon. Sasuke manifests a black version of his Chidori, and though the two strike Madara simultaneously from both sides, the elder Uchiha uses his shadow version of himself as a substitute. Madara goes for Kakashi and manages to seal his Sharingan, transplanting it into his own empty eye socket. Despite Sasuke slicing him in half, Madara uses Kamui to teleport to its dimension, in order to stop Sakura and Obito from destroying his other Rinnegan. Obito quickly transports Sakura back to the other dimension, where she informs everyone that Madara has entered the Kamui dimension, and intends on retrieving his left Rinnegan. While tending to Kakashi's eye, Sakura informs everyone that Madara will become unstoppable if he receives the other eye. In the Kamui dimension, Madara holds his hands in Obito's chest, and is shocked to discover that the forbidden individual curse tag on his heart has been removed. Obito reveals that Kakashi destroyed it earlier in their battle, and that enabled him to become the Ten Tails Minchuriki. Madara then reveals to Obito that he was the mastermind behind Rin's death, and has been manipulating Obito the entire time, much to the younger Uchiha's shock. Meanwhile, Naruto returns to Kakashi's side and restores his left eye using power from Hagoromo, much to Sakura's shock. Kakashi reflects on how each of the three members has changed and matured since their first meeting. Kakashi asks Sasuke what his true motives are, and Sakura wonders this as well, but Kakashi interrupts him before he can answer, stating that they need to remember their first lesson about teamwork as Madara returns to the battlefield. Madara, who has recovered his left Rinnegan from Obito, mocks Team Kakashi's pledge to defeat him with teamwork. Black Setsu informs the group that Obito is no more and that he has completely taken possession over his body. Sakura sees an opening and activates her ninja art creation rebirth, strength of 100 technique to attack Madara, but to no avail, and Naruto and Sasuke quickly rescue her from Madara's wrath. Sasuke notes that Madara has created four more shadows and warns Naruto to beware. Madara goes on the offense and activates multiple Chibaku Tensei, intending to drop the mass of earth and debris on his opponents. Naruto creates several shadows clones to deal with Madara's shadows, while the real Naruto and Sasuke use Tailed Beast Ball Rasen Shuriken and an improved Susanoo to counter Madara's technique. Madara uses this opportunity to fly closer to the moon, and he removes part of his forehead protector, revealing the third eye on his forehead that resembles the eye of Kaguya Otsutsuki. Turning towards it, Madara casts the infinite Tsukiyomi onto the moon. On the other battlefield, the members of the allied shinobi look at the moon in horror, realizing that Madara's plan had finally been accomplished. Toby, considering his job was complete, releases in case Yamato from his body. While Naruto destroys the remaining meteors from earlier, Sasuke rushes back to Earth and covers his teammates with the new Susanoo. Madara finally activates the Genjutsu on the world as light begins emanating from the moon and turns the night as bright as the day. Around the world, all living souls fall victim to the infinite Tsukiyomi, with the Rinnegan reflecting in their eyes. The only ones not affected by the technique are the reincarnated Hokage, who watch on in horror as Madara activates a technique that connects all life forms to the root of the Tentails tree form, and Team 7 with the help of Sasuke Susano. Kagi Otsutsuki strikes. Immediately after the infinite Tsukiyomi technique is cast, Sakura asks Sasuke what's happening, and he simply berates her and Kakashi, informing them that they're somewhat useless in their current predicament. Much to Naruto's dismay, Sasuke is elected the leader of Team 7 for the time being, as it seems that only his Rinnegan will be able to counter the infinite Tsukiyomi. Meanwhile, everyone in the allied shinobi forces witness their truest desires coming true within the infinite dream as the light shining down from the moon slowly fades away. The reincarnated Hokage are immune to the Genjutsu but are helpless to stop it. With the threat of them being caught in the infinite Tsukiyomi gone, Team 7 emerges from Sasuke Susano as Madara returns to Earth. Madara states that he's the savior of the world and he will eliminate Team 7 before they can destroy everyone's personal peace, but before Madara can do anything he is suddenly stabbed through the chest by Black Zetsu, who is using Obito's body with Black Zetsu also declaring that Madara isn't the savior and that it isn't over. As Madara tries to come to terms with this betrayal while claiming that Black Zetsu is his will, Black Zetsu reveals to Madara that he has harbored the will of Kaguya Otsutsuki ever since his creation. He berates Madara for thinking he was something more than a pawn like Obito was, as the legendary Uchiha begins to morph. As Madara screams out in pain, Naruto and Sasuke notice that his four shadows are disappearing. After possessing Madara, Black Zetsu reveals that an infinite Tsukiyomi will eventually turn every human on the planet into a white Zetsu for Kaguya's army. Naruto and Sasuke are prevented from interfering as Black Zetsu, using Madara as a medium, turns the Uchiha into Kaguya, resulting in Princess Kaguya Otsutsuki being reborn into the modern ninja world. The resurrected Kaguya deduces that Naruto and Sasuke have been given powers by Hagoromo and declares that she has no intention to fight. Instead, she tries to kill Team Kakashi at once, teleporting them inside a volcano over a river of lava. As Team 7 begins to fall, Sasuke immediately summons his hawk and saves Naruto, completely ignoring Sakura and Kakashi. Due to his quick thinking, Kakashi manages to save himself and Sakura, as well as Obito from their fiery deaths. Naruto questions Sasuke's disregard for his comrade's safety as he warns Naruto that only he and Naruto have a chance of defeating Kaguya, so neither of them must die, even if they survive at the sacrifice of their comrades. Kaguya launches a pinpointed attack at the two, and while Sasuke manages to save himself and Naruto with Susano, his hawk is injured and they begin to fall into the river of lava once again. Meanwhile, Kakashi's scroll begins to burn 
burn up, so he and Sakura also begin to fall once more. Fortunately, they're all saved by Naruto, who has just discovered his newfound ability of flight. Emerging outside the volcano and next to a castle, Naruto and Kaguya clash fist to fist. As Naruto is buffeted away, Sasuke, with his complete body Susano activated, attacks Kaguya from above, resulting in a large explosion. Sasuke's attack fails as he's forced out of complete body Susano and starts falling into the ocean of lava once again, while Naruto spirals out of control due to the aftermath of his previous attack. As his blade melts away, Sasuke teleports to Naruto's side and receives a platform to stand on for Naruto. During the ensuing chaos, Naruto's clones, Sakura, and Kakashi retrieve Obito. Kaguya enters a portal and appears behind Naruto and Sasuke. Kaguya begins to cry as she clutches their faces, while Black Zetsu emerges from Kaguya and attaches itself to Naruto and Sasuke. While absorbing their chakra, Black Zetsu explained to Naruto and Sasuke the history of the Kaguya's complicated relationship with their sons, her defeat, Black Zetsu's creation, and his mission to revive his creator, Kaguya, with Black Zetsu calling her its mother, and Black Zetsu referring to itself as her child. Enraged by Kaguya's actions, Naruto manages to free himself and Sasuke from Black Zetsu, and the duo prepare to go on the offensive once more. Naruto explains to Sasuke's plan to attack Kaguya, planning to use a new technique that he's practiced more than Rasengan. Elsewhere, Kakashi wonders about the mechanics of Kaguya's technique as Naruto's shadow clone revives Obito. With a plan formulated, Sasuke distracts Kaguya while Naruto uses a new technique to surprise her, and much to everyone's surprise, Naruto manages to land a punch on Kaguya. Sasuke teleports the two to Kaguya's location as they're about to seal her. Kaguya traps the three of them in a giant block of ice while also transforming the lava wasteland into a frozen mountainside. Kaguya escapes the block of ice while Sasuke manages to free himself and Naruto from the icy prison with Blaze release Kagetsuchi. Black Setsu recommends that Kaguya battle Naruto and Sasuke separately, so Kaguya grabs Sasuke and throws him into an isolated desert dimension. Naruto tries to pry open the portal with his brute strength, but it's futile, and he's separated from Sasuke. Meanwhile, the four Hokage convene at the location where Kaguya was revived and find nothing but Madara's lower half. Minato explains that he tried to free those trapped within the infinite Tsukiyomi, but despite all his efforts, they would not wake up. Agreeing that Madara is likely dead, Tobirama suggests that Madara should be revived in order to figure out what's happened. However, before anyone could act, Hagodoma manifests himself before the four Hokage. In Kaguya's icy dimension, Naruto continues to battle her alone, and due to Naruto's elusive nature, begins using the world to attack Naruto. Naruto pretends to trap himself and waits for Kaguya to approach him and begins planning a surprise attack. Elsewhere, Obito awakens and learns of everything that has occurred since his last meeting with Madara. Realizing that Kaguya's ability is extremely similar to his own, Obito plans on sinking his Kamui with her own technique in order to find Sasuke and returning him to the battlefield. Planning on utilizing Naruto's Shadow Clone and Sakura's Chakra in order to accomplish a task, the three prepare for the next opportunity to begin their journey to rescue Sasuke. As Naruto's clone and Sakura touch Obito in preparation to teleport at the next chance they get, Kaguya plays little attention to them and goes after Naruto's real body. Naruto receives some power from Kokuo and manages to break free from Kaguya's trap, launching her back a great distance. Deciding that using diversionary tactics followed by Taijutsu is the best way to encounter Kaguya, Naruto creates a barrage of clones that surround Kaguya, surprising the rabbit goddess as she did not expect Naruto to be such a challenge. Naruto continuously assaults Kaguya and forces her to travel to another dimension to escape the attacks. Noticing her attempt at fleeing, Naruto and Obito use this opportunity to follow Kaguya. Entering her core dimension, Kaguya is surprised to find out that Naruto infiltrated her sacred area. Fearing Naruto's reunion with Sasuke may result in Kaguya's defeat, Black Zetsu advises Kaguya to kill Naruto instead of absorbing his chakra. Though hesitant at first, Kaguya complies and uses her all-killing Ash Bones technique to impale Naruto and disintegrate his body. Kaguya returns to her ice dimension and is surprised when she notices all of Naruto's shadow clones still intact, signifying Naruto's survival from Kaguya's attack. Meanwhile, in Kaguya's main dimension, once realizing Kaguya had left, Obito and Sakura encounter Kaguya's core dimension, intent on fighting Sasuke and returning him to Naruto's location. With Sakura and Obito in Kaguya's core dimension, Naruto's disintegrated Shadow Clone disperses, and the real Naruto learns everything his Shadow Clone did. Naruto becomes determined to distract Kaguya, while Sakura and Obito search for Sasuke, so he begins to attack the Rabbit Goddess. Sakura transfers her strength of a hundred seal chakra into Obito, who begins using the Kamui to search for the desert dimension that Sasuke is stranded within. While searching for Sasuke, they open a portal to a sea of acid, and Sakura manages to shield herself and Obito from the heavy damage, and discards the right sleeve of her flak jacket in the process. Meanwhile, in the desert dimension, Sasuke goes to the area where he was able to sense Naruto's chakra moments before. Finally, Obito and Sakura find the desert dimension to call it to Sasuke, who immediately begins dashing towards the duo. They begin to lose control of the portal, and it ultimately closes. Believing they had failed, Sakura and Obito are surprised when they find out that Sasuke uses Amena Tajikara to switch places with Sakura's discarded black jacket. Thanking the two for saving him, Sasuke and his group prepare to return to the ice dimension to help Naruto engage Kaguya. Meanwhile, Hagodomo explains to the Hokage that he managed to appear before them by combining the Ten Tails, Indra's, and Asura's chakras together. After recapping the Hokage on the events that have transpired, Minato asks about the technique that he told them about, but Hagoroma notes that he can no longer use this as he's given his power to Naruto and Sasuke. He tells the Hokage that they're running out of time and they must listen to him carefully and do exactly as he says. In the ice dimension, Naruto continues to battle Kaguya, who has realized that the real Naruto has the truth-seeking balls behind him, and as such continues to eliminate the clones one by one. Kakashi laments that he cannot do anything to assist Naruto at the moment, but he's quickly snapped out of it by Naruto's determination. Sasuke, Sakura, and Obito return to the core dimension, much to Kaguya's annoyance. She manages to impale Naruto, who has the truth-seeking balls behind him, but much to her surprise, this also turns out to be a clone, and she figures that Naruto can attack his black orbs to his clones. 
Irked at this fact, Kaguya teleports Team Kakashi and Obito to a high gravity dimension. While they are pinned down, Kaguya fires her bone attack at Naruto and Sasuke who manage to barely dodge the attack. Adjusting to the atmosphere, Kaguya aims towards Naruto and Sasuke's directions once more and fires the projectile in their direction. Kakashi and Obito quickly intercept the attack and stand in the place of Naruto and Sasuke, preparing themselves to die. However, Obito uses Kamui at the last second and saves Kakashi's life as well, as Obito is impaled by Kaguya's attack, much to the shock of Team Kakashi. Kakashi questions Obito, asking why he would throw his life away when he can still be of use while Kakashi himself is worthless. Obito silences Kakashi, telling him that he must remain alive to support the next generation of Shinobi. Running low on chakra, Black Zetsu informs Kaguya that they should return to the core dimension to replenish their chakra supply. Naruto attempts to save Obito once more, but his efforts are futile. Black Zetsu notices this and goes on a tirade about Obito's useless life, angering Naruto while Obito agrees with Black Zetsu's claims. With his Rinnegan's power restored, Sasuke immediately teleports to Kaguya once more and attempts to impale her with Chidori, but fails, as Kaguya shifts to the core dimension and flees Sasuke's attack. Sasuke manifests his complete body Susano, and after telling Naruto that healing Obito is useless, flies towards Kaguya and engages her in battle. Obito begins his final goodbyes to Naruto and Kakashi. He thanks Naruto for helping him find the right path once more. After commanding Naruto to become the Hokage, Obito crumbles into a pile of ash and perishes. Noticing his death, Black Setsu continues berating Obito once more, angering Naruto even more. Noting that he was an awesome man for believing in the same dream as himself, Naruto flies up to Kaguya with instant speed and severs Kaguya's left arm with Black Setsu still attached to it. Meanwhile, a younger Obito meets his former teammate, Rin Nohara, once again after so long. She informs him that she has been watching over Obito this entire time, and while taking Obito's hand, the two prepare to depart for the afterlife. Before they manage to leave, Obito asks Rin to wait a little while longer, as he wants to help Kakashi continue with the ongoing battle. Promising to return soon, Obito uses Kamui to teleport to the core dimension. As he manifests as Chakra, Obito inhabits Kakashi and the two enter Kakashi's consciousness. Appearing as the younger versions of themselves, Obito explains that he believes Kakashi will still become the Six Okage and plans on giving him another present to celebrate Kakashi's impressive future feat. Returning to the real world, Kakashi opens his eyes and reveals his two Mangekyo Sharingan eyes, Kakashi living up to his nickname, Kakashi of the Sharingan, once more. Meanwhile, Naruto and Sasuke continue to battle Kaguya. As Sasuke's attack is countered by Kaguya's chakra arms, Naruto uses the powers of the Nine-Tailed Beast to attack the Rabbit Goddess, which results in massive, misshaped chakra monster forming as a result of Kaguya's inability to control the separate tailed beasts. As the massive chakra monster sprouts arms to absorb everything around it, including Naruto Shadow Clone, one of the arms prepares to eliminate Sakura. Just before Sasuke can use his Rinnegan powers to save her, Kakashi, donning a complete body Susano, flies in and jumps up to protect her from the attacking massive chakra, stating that he and Obito will protect everyone. Leaping into action against Kaguya, Kakashi is able to deflect her incoming attack with his Kamui Shuriken. Kaguya soon regains control of her power and manifests a humongous truth-seeking ball intent on erasing everything within her core dimension. Realizing he cannot teleport the tremendous orb away, Kakashi formulates a plan, telling his teammates that this will be their final mission. As Naruto distracts Kaguya with shadow clones, Kakashi renders Kaguya's right arm useless with Kamui Lightning Cutter. Sasuke switches place with one of Naruto's clones and appears next to Kaguya as well. Though she tries to escape, Kaguya is knocked down by Sakura, with the punch also knocking off one of Kaguya's horns in the process, allowing Naruto and Sasuke to touch her with their sun and moon markings, preparing to seal away the rabbit goddess once again. Immediately, Naruto and Sasuke begin the ultimate Funjutsu they obtained from Hagad the Six Paths Chibaku Tensei. As Kaguya questions how she, the ancestor of all chakra, could be defeated by mere fragments that were once part of herself, her third eye is obscured by the moon and then followed by the sun. As the sun and moon tattoos disappear from the palms of Naruto and Sasuke's hands, they reappear in Hagoromo's hands, symbolizing that the technique was a success. As Kaguya reverts back to the demonic statue of the other path, the tailed beasts get out of her, while the remainder of Kaguya's chakra ejects Madara Uchiha before being encased within a giant satellite produced by the Chibaku Tensei. Though he intends to revive her again, albeit at some time in the future, Black Zetsu is found by Naruto who chastises him for his false beliefs that he was the one who created the shinobi world, calling him a spoiled brat who is too afraid to leave the nest, and proceeds to throw him into the satellite, sealing away both enemies. Joining up with his comrades, Naruto and Team 7 suddenly realize they're trapped within Kaguya's dimension with no other way to return. Suddenly, Team 7, the Tailed Beast, and Madara are all summoned back to Earth by Hagoromo, the four Hokage, and all the previous Kage whom Hagoromo managed to recall from the pure world. He faces Team 7 and thanks them for saving the world. Hagodomo commends Kakashi for commanding Team 7 during the battle with Kaguya. However, Kakashi admits he didn't do much, as it was only thanks to Obito that he could contribute at all. Within Kakashi's mind, he meets Obito one last time. The two exchange their final words to each other as Obito returns to the afterlife with Rin and Kakashi loses his Sharingan forever. Sasuke notices that Madara is still alive and dashes towards his fallen enemy only to be stopped by Hagoromo who tells Sasuke to listen to Madara and Hashirama's final words to each other. The two discuss their dreams of the past and Madara admits that while his dream has failed, Hashirama lives on. Hashirama offers Madara the chance to be comrades once more but Madara exhales his last breath before he gives his response. The Kages begin returning to the Pure Land as Naruto rushes towards Minato as the sun rises over the horizon. Minato wishes his son a happy birthday, and the two exchange their final words to each other as Minato and the other reincarnated Hokage return to the Pure Land once more. Free to roam once more, the Tailed Beasts decide to return to their homes, though Gyuki decides to stay with Killer B, and Kurama is elected to stay with Naruto by Hagodomo in order to preside over any meetings the Tailed Beasts have with their small portion of chakra within Naruto. Hagodomo tells them that the next order of business is to dispel the infant Tsukiyomi using Naruto's Tailed Beast chakra and Sasuke's Rinnegan. Sasuke, however, revealed his plan to execute the five sitting Kage and start a revolution 
evolution, beginning by taking control of all the tailed beasts, and then by trapping them inside satellites, revealing that he had been evolving his Rinnegan's ability during the battle against Madara and Kaguya. His time running out, Hagodomo places his trust in Naruto, who resolves to finally end the brothers' feud. Sasuke explains that he intends to kill Naruto since he's the Jinchuriki host of all nine tailed beasts, and also plans to keep the ones he has trapped alive in order to end the infinite Tsukiyomi. Sasuke tells Naruto to follow him as he wants to move to another location to have their final battle. As he begins to leave, Sakura calls out to him, professing her love once more and begging Sasuke to stop. Sasuke rebuffs Sakura's pleas, calling her annoying once more. Sasuke puts her under his genjutsu in order to prevent her from interfering with his battle with Naruto. Naruto criticizes Sasuke's attitude, though to no avail. As Sasuke dashes away with Naruto in pursuit, Hagodomo explains the cycle of hatred that has occurred ever since his generation to Kakashi, lamenting on all his past failures and entrusting Naruto as the one who will end it all. Meanwhile, Naruto and Sasuke arrive at the Valley of the End once again, standing atop the heads of the statues of Hashirama and Madara. Naruto tries to use Itachi's words to sway Sasuke, but to no avail, as Sasuke proceeds to tell Naruto what he means when he says Hokage. Sasuke explains Itachi's sacrifice to Naruto, stating that Itachi was the true definition of Hokage, and deserved to be honored as one. Resolved that he's leaving Itachi, his clan, and everything else in the past, Sasuke explains to Naruto that he will take on the Shinobi world's hatred by himself and become dark itself, so that the shinobi world can shine bright once more. Naruto tries to convince Sasuke of the error in his ways, but fails as Sasuke notes that Naruto's death will be the beginning of a clean slate for the shinobi world. Meanwhile, as Hagodomo disappears, he recalls his conversation with Sasuke, in which the young Uchiha noted that he will kill Naruto and become Okage because Naruto is the closest thing to a friend he's ever had. With no more words to say to each other, Naruto and Sasuke begin their final fight, as the clash of their fists begin cracking Hashirama's statue. Repelling off each other, Sasuke immediately shoots a grand fireball at Naruto, but Naruto manages to defend himself. However, Sasuke shifts behind Naruto and uses Chidori to knock Naruto into the water, finishing his combination attack by shooting three arrows from his Susanoo at Naruto, though he manages to block Sasuke's attacks once more. As Naruto activates his tailed beast mode and Sasuke activates his complete body Susanoo, the two bump fists through their avatars and start viewing each other's memories, with Sasuke commenting on how slow Naruto has always been. Naruto rebuffs by saying that he won't let himself get killed so that Sasuke won't be alone, creating a tailed beast ball that clashes with Sasuke's complete body Susanoo and hence Chidori, causing a great explosion. Meeting with their inner subconscious once more, Sasuke comments that they're no longer children and they should be able to understand one another at this point. Within the white plane, Naruto once again tries to convince Sasuke to stop his plans of revolution, stating that it will solve nothing as the five great shinobi villages have already united together. However, Sasuke believes that this is only a temporary peace due to them all having a common enemy. With the threat neutralized, Sasuke is convinced they will all return to how they were before the war. Resolved to find a way to gain some sort of immortality with his unlimited power, Sasuke promises to become the common enemy so that the shinobi world could thrive. Returning to the real world, Naruto and Sasuke are knocked back from the massive blast. Satisfied that Naruto is finally getting serious, Sasuke summons the satellites containing the tailed beasts and begins channeling the chakra into his complete body Susanoo as it begins to change into a new humanoid form. As Naruto summons three shadow clones, the two battle above the earth, and Sasuke knocks one of Naruto's clones to the ground while neutralizing the attacks of the other clones, resulting in a massive explosion. While Sasuke prepares a lightning based arrow attack, Naruto combines the remaining clones into a three headed, six armed battle avatar similar to the one Asura used in the past. All the while, the clone Naruto had dispatched earlier begins gathering natural energy, which it then supplies to the real Naruto. When Naruto tells Sasuke that this is not how he wanted to be his former comrade, he throws two Rasa and Shuriken while Sasuke fires Indra's arrow. Naruto and Sasuke's attacks collide, causing a massive explosion that devastates the landscape and decapitates the statues of Hashirama and Madara. Drained from the last attack, Naruto and Sasuke fall back to the earth, landing on the valley once more. Shocked that Naruto survived the last encounter, Sasuke tries to burn Naruto with the Matarasu, though Naruto manages to defend against the attack by utilizing Kurama's chakra. With no power left, Naruto and Sasuke engage in a fierce taijutsu battle that lasts almost an entire day. Elsewhere, Sakura awakes from being trapped in Sasuke's genjutsu shocked that night has already fallen once more. She asks Kakashi where her comrades have gone, and he explains that they're settling their issues with one last fight. Returning to the Valley of the End, Naruto and Sasuke are badly injured and nearly out of stamina as they continue to fight with only pure willpower. Kurama recharges his chakra and prepares to give it to Naruto only for Sasuke to use his Rinnegan's Predipath ability to absorb Naruto's chakra. Using the chakra he has stolen, Sasuke activates his Chidori and prepares to kill a completely depleted Naruto, stating that he'll finally be alone once his only best friend is gone. However, Naruto manages to stand up and land an uppercut on Sasuke before one final clash between Rasengan and Kagatsuchi enhanced Chidori that destroys the other's dominant arm, the blast costing Naruto his right arm and Sasuke is left. After passing out, Sasuke awakens lying on the ground beside Naruto, who once again explains his reasoning for persistently chasing after the Uchiha. Both fall asleep while Sasuke further reflects upon his bond with Naruto and comes to the realization that he feels the same way in many regards. After waking up the following morning, Sasuke finally acknowledges Naruto, both as a comrade and as the winner of their long-lasting battle. As they both lie defeated on the statue's hands, forming a seal of reconciliation, Sakura and Kakashi arrive to witness Naruto and Sasuke both hurt. Sakura begins to heal both of them, and Sasuke apologizes to a teary-eyed Sakura for what he's done to her. The two are both rejuvenated, and they release everyone from the infant Tsukiyomi, and Tobi also dies after being released from it. The tailed beasts are then freed from Sasuke's Chibaku Tensei. At Konohagakure, funerals are held, including a memorial service for Neji, and Sasuke is sent to prison for his crimes. Kakashi succeeds Tsunade as the sixth Hokage, and his face is carved on Hokage Rock. Naruto becomes an international celebrity, and Tsunade begins crafting artificial arms of Hashirama's cells for him and Sasuke. With his contributions in the war and Naruto's appeal, Sasuke is granted a pardon. Sasuke leaves the village to seek redemption, telling Sakura he will return for her and pokes her on the forehead. He meets Naruto who hands him his forehead protector, which he discarded during their battle many years ago, and Sasuke credits Naruto for teaching him what being a ninja really means. Sasuke Shinden, Book of Sunrise Two years after the fourth great shinobi war, a former Konoha Anbu named Tadaichi is traveling when he's confronted by two mysterious people and placed under Genjutsu by one of them with red eyes. In Konoha, Kakashi tells Naruto and Sakura about recent disappearances of Konoha
suspect the attackers are under Genjutsu and Ina recognizes one of them as Tadaichi, whom she says would never betray Konoha. Tadaichi is injured and explodes, and Naruto realizes they're exploding humans. Hinata doubts Genjutsu is responsible because there's no one around. To avoid more destruction, Naruto and Shikamaru restrain the humans and Hinata uses gentle fist to knock them out. Kakashi suspects someone of an unheard of Kekai Genkai is responsible and decides to bring Sasuke Uchiha back to the village. In a forest, Sasuke feeds some stray cats before he sees Sai's ink bird with a message for him to return. An explosion in a bamboo village catches his attention and an elderly villager, Ayo, is fighting exploding humans. Sasuke asks what is happening but is attacked by Chino and Nawaki before they decline to fight him further because of how strong he is. Sasuke uses his Sharingan to save the humans, making Chino realize he is an Uchiha. Ayo goes to check on his daughter, but she is an exploding human and kills herself and Ayo vows to never forgive Fushin. Sasuke sees through the memories of one of the humans and realizes that the culprit has a Kekai Genkai. Sasuke sends a message of the events to Kakashi and after the funerals for the victims, heads to Orochimaru's hideout to get more information on Fushin. Chino and Nawaki offer to come with him to help. At the hideout's entrance, Sasuke meets with Yamato who lets him proceed after Sasuke confirms he's gathering information for Konoha. Sasuke demands information on Fushin and the Lightning Group, but Orochimaru muses over Sasuke gathering information for others. Orochimaru says Sasuke needs to speak with En Oyashiro, who is a trades dealer and is more skilled at hiding than Orochimaru is. When Sasuke persists, Orochimaru is satisfied and goes to make arrangements. Karin and Suigetsu and Jugo greet Sasuke, but Karin gets into a fight with Chino for clinging to Sasuke. Orochimaru takes Sasuke, Chino, and Nawaki to travel through the ocean, with Yamato behind them. Suigetsu wonders why Sasuke is working for Konoha if he hasn't returned to the village. Karin says Sasuke is avoiding the village because his Sharingan and Rinnegan earn him enemies who likely won't attack Konoha if he isn't there. Sasuke states his amazement that Orochimaru is allowed to be free despite his horrific crimes. Orochimaru retorts Sasuke and Kabuto are no different but are less likely to turn evil again, and he's technically not free because Yamato is constantly watching him. Thereafter, they call a scene in which Orochimaru explains where wealthy business people use their shinobi to compete in battles and the winners get to keep the lost competitors. And it is the only place that N will appear. Chino is disturbed at how the shinobi are treated and tells Sasuke that if he doesn't help the poor and doesn't stop the rich, he's just as guilty before she walks away. To Sasuke's dismay, Orochimaru signs Sasuke up as a contestant because N is a Kekai Genkai collector who will want to obtain Sasuke. Having no choice, Sasuke enters the arena, but dozens of exploding humans appear before the battle can begin. Sasuke tries to save as many people as he can, which surprises Orochimaru, and Sasuke is nearly struck by a chakra blade by a fleeing person. Yamato tells him that he can't save everyone but lessen the damage. As the exploding humans are killed, Sasuke saves Chino from being killed and the chaos ends. N asks to speak with Sasuke, who's uninterested in greeting him, but he's delighted to meet with Orochimaru again after a long time. N tells him that Fushin was a shinobi he won, but left him after taking all the other Kekai Genkai owners with him. Sasuke asks if Fushin has red eyes, and N recalls someone in his guard unit did. N says red eyes originated with the Chinoike clan, which is exiled from the Land of Lightning by the Uchiha clan. Sasuke realizes that exploding humans have been appearing around him, and Konoha was attacked because he's being targeted. N recommends Sasuke go to Hell Valley in the Land of Hot Water to find Fushin. N and Orochimaru then discuss how he enjoys collecting Kekai Genkai for his business, which disgusts Sasuke, who decides to deal with the situation as the sole survivor of the Uchiha clan. At Yuga Gakurei, five exploding humans appear, but Sasuke saves them and is attacked. He chases after the person, but easily knocks him out. Sasuke sees this person is not Fushin, and the man tries to insist he is, but Sasuke knows he's lying. Sasuke threatens to kill him if he doesn't tell him who he is, but Karyu fights back with his lava release. Sasuke easily dodges and attacks using Amaterasu to make him surrender. Sasuke sees through Karyu's memories and learns that he was hired to impersonate Fushin, who is really Nawaki. Nawaki approaches Sasuke, who orders Nawaki to show his true appearance, which Nawaki does. The two fight with Fushin's Typhoon release overpowering Sasuke Susano, but Sasuke wins by jumping into the hole of the funnel and hitting him. However, Sasuke falls into another Genjutsu trap while trying to get information, and Fushin leaves. Sasuke travels to the Valley of Hell where he finds Chino waiting for him. She reveals herself as the sole survivor of the Chinoike clan and lashes out at Sasuke for how her clan struggled to survive in there after being forced to live there by the Uchiha clan. She explains her past to Sasuke, how she was kidnapped as a child by Orashiro, and she was too young to remember her parents. Her discovery of her Ketsuryugan, her meeting and eventual partnership with Fushin, being betrayed by Kirigakure and the villages they had helped, and vowing revenge for the persecution and demise of her clan. Sasuke and Chino battle with Sasuke easily cutting down her blood dragons. Chino cuts Sasuke and explains via Genjutsu to him that a Ketsuryugan controls blood and will turn him into an exploding human. However, Sasuke uses Sharingan to prevent this, leaving Chino devastated she isn't able to get revenge. She lashes out that Sasuke has always had people who loved and protected him despite his notorious reputation, while she was lonely and unable to bond with others. She cries out to Sasuke about why he goes so far to protect Konoha despite its role in the downfall of his clan, and Sasuke responds that he has a friend who saved him and with whom he shares pain. Fushin arrives and offers to be killed to protect Chino, who says she'd be lonely if he died. Chino and Fushin surrender and thank Sasuke for his words. At Konoha, Sakura and Hinata heal the last exploding human victim and discuss how Chino and her allies were arrested by Konoha Shinobi, although Sakura wishes Sasuke was there. In prison, Kakashi brings in the Mizukage, who approaches Chino, Fushin, and Karyu and offers them to work for her in order to atone for Kirigakure's betrayal. All three accept and learn from Kakashi that Sasuke had returned to the Colosseum to free all the Shinobi. To the shock of the audience, Sasuke wins every battle and reveals Kumogakure will be taking everyone into custody for the illegal activities. The Rekage and a Shinobi arrive to arrest the Shinobi owners, and A speaks to Sasuke regarding his actions to help others and how glad he is that he didn't kill Sasuke after Naruto pleaded for him to spare him. After having reconciled since their battle at the Kage Summit, the two bid farewell in amiable terms. Orochimaru and En, who escaped from being caught, have a conversation, during which En reveals that Chino is his daughter and that he 
slaughtered the Chino Ike clan to protect her, and then sought out Sasuke to save Chino from her desire for revenge. Naruto and Sakura discuss how far Sasuke has come to redeem himself and protect the village, and Sakura says she's happy but wishes she was by his side. Resuming his traveling, Sasuke receives a letter from Naruto in which it says Sasuke's way of protecting the village is like the Gonaha military police force. Remembering when he told Itachi it was his child to dream of joining the police force, Sasuke decides to return to the village. Shikamaru Hiden, a cloud drifting in silent darkness. Shikamaru has been busy helping the six Hokage with paperwork since the war, but is bored with his desk job and insists he's doing the work until Naruto becomes Hokage. After work, Shikamaru plays Shogi with Onoki, whom he easily defeats and goes to the forest to train. At a Shinobi Union meeting in the Land of Iron, the village ambassadors each discuss the decline of Shinobi assistance, and Shikamaru simply replies the matter is being investigated. But Tamari suspects he's hiding something, and his refusal to answer the questions causes her to slap him in anger. After returning to Konoha, Shikamaru and Kakashi discuss the suspicions of how the leader of the Land of Silence, Gengo, recruiting missing Nin and how Konoha had been slowly investigating. However, Sai's team had been killed, and they're concerned for Sai's well-being. Kakashi asks Shikamaru to go to the Land of Silence to capture or assassinate Gengo with the company of two Anbu, Hinoko and Ro, as teammates. Shikamaru visits the graves of his father and Asuma, where he's greeted by Kuronai and Mirai, who have come to visit Asuma's grave. He later meets with Ino and Choji for dinner, and the three discuss how much their lives have changed since the Genin days. The next morning, he leaves to meet his comrades at the village gates. Shikamaru runs into Naruto, who is on his way to eat ramen for breakfast, and advises him to stay the way he is because he will become Okage one day. Once they arrive at the Land of Silence, Shikamaru decides that disguising themselves will help them get past the checkpoint to the village, Tobari. However, Hinoko believes that killing Shinobi is easier and uses her chakra needle to kill two that were tailing them. They track Sai's last known location, which is an inn near the checkpoint. Shikamaru plays Shogu with the villager to gain information on Gengo, and the man's remarks about Shinobi being disposable tools for citizens angers Hinoko, who fears Shinobi will be eradicated during peaceful times. Hinoko desires to prove her worth, and the inn is suddenly raided by Shinobi, her earlier killing of the partners exposing them. Shikamaru, Hinoko, and Ro are saved by a busboy named Komori who claims to hate Tobari. Hinoko contemplates defecting Konoha to prove herself, which strains her from Shikamaru and Ro, who warn her about the consequences of betraying her village. Later that night, she goes to the checkpoint and asks to join the Land of Silence. The guards doubt her trustworthiness, but Komori reveals himself to be a follower of Tobari, and he had spied on her to see if her abilities for herself and wants to help her prove her loyalty. Hinoko easily defeats the two guards before Shikamaru and Ro arrive to stop her. Shikamaru abruptly accuses Ro of betraying him as well, but are both seemingly killed by Hinoko. Satisfied, Komori takes her to the village, but she knocks him out and returns to let Shikamaru and Ro, who had been placed under a temporary death state as part of her plan to gain entry. Shikamaru wakes up from nightmares of the death of Asuma and the times his comrades were injured. Ro asks him about the nightmares. Shikamaru notices the lack of wind in Tobari. Hinoko feigns being killed by her own jutsu during initiation and is taken to a room full of corpses. Shikamaru shows Ro the little intel they have on Gengo, a single blurry photo. Hinoko reunites with Ro and Shikamaru, informing them how no one seems to know anything about Gengo or the Fushu Castle. The three go around Tobari gathering information, seeing people from all over, learning Gengo arrived 10 years prior and that Tobari is better now than it was then. They spot a former Konoha Anbu, Minoichi, who went missing during the last war after killing his unit. The three corner Minoichi and interrogate him, learning more of Gengo's ideology. Minoichi recognizes Ro and puts him in a chokehold, hinting at his past, but Hinoko incapacitates him with the chakra needle. Ro wakes up after having nightmares about his past as a genin, when he survived the slaughter of his unit by burying himself in the corpses of his comrades and suppressing his chakra to appear dead. That night, Gengo appears for a public speech. Shikamaru wants to move closer to the stage so his jutsu can reach him, and Hinoko goes to a tower where she has a clear view of the entire crowd. During his speech, Gengo reveals a restrained Sai, and the crowd asks for his death. Gengo's words begin to affect the three of them. Shikamaru and Ro create a diversion with explosive tags, and Shikamaru tries saving Sai, but he retaliates, having been in a trance by Gengo. Gengo's words affected Ro and Hinoko, who are restrained. Gengo tries converting Shikamaru after Sai binds him, but Shikamaru begins strangling himself with a shadow. Shikamaru struggles against Sai's ink beasts. Shikamaru wakes up shackled in a cell and thinks Shogi movements to pass the time. Sai arrives with food and compliments him for resisting for so long. Shikamaru asks for his lighter, and Sai says it'll be returned while Shikamaru follows Gengo. The two discuss Sai's current condition, why Shikamaru came instead of someone from Team 7. A while later, Ro is tossed in a cell near Shikamaru who asks if he's okay, and if Hinoko is with him. Gengo uses his jutsu on Hinoko. Shikamaru is taken to talk with Gengo, who has looked him up. Gengo tells Shikamaru how he perceives the current shinobi world and how peace as it exists is forced by the other great nations. Gengo shows him a flower that grows in the land of silence that dies if taken out of its environment and compares it to shinobi, who stopped developing their skills in times of peace. Shikamaru notices the flower's scent stirs up unpleasant memories, which Gengo uses to turn shinobi to its side. Shikamaru asks for Ro and Hinoko, who were revealed to be the guards that brought in the flowers, having been converted by Gengo. Shikamaru escapes the room. Shikamaru returns to Gengo's room and fights Ro and Hinoko. He has Hinoko attack him with the chakra needles, and positions himself so they hit his ears, impairing his hearing so Gengo's voice can't affect him. Shikamaru almost reaches Gengo, but is stopped by Sai's ink lion. Gengo escapes, and Shikamaru is hit with a chakra needle in his head. Ino and Choji arrive to save him, though Shikamaru believes he's dreaming. Shikamaru is convinced that he isn't dreaming when Tamari slaps him for lying to her in the Shinobi Union meeting. Ino and Choji prepare to fight Ro and Hinoko. Tamari tosses him Asuma's chakra blades, which Shikamaru uses to open up the way to Gengo. Shikamaru pursues Gengo through the Fushu Castle. Ino, Choji, and Tamari fight Sai, Ro, and Inoko. Gengo's hold over them weakening as the fight drags on. Gengo lures Shikamaru in a dark room, both so he can't use shadows and for his hearing to become more sensitive and more vulnerable to Gengo's jutsu. Gengo tells Shikamaru about his past with Zabuza and how it shaped his ideology. Ino then enters Sai's mind to break Gengo's hold on him. He asks about Shikamaru and tells him that they have to warn Shikamaru not to turn around when Gengo is trying to convert him. Gengo tells Shikamaru he had his followers infiltrate the hidden villages and with a signal he can make them cause incidents all over. Gengo's jutsu manifests the darkness to Shikamaru, but thinking of Naruto, Shikamaru isn't affected by it. To Gengo's surprise. 
Shikamaru surmises Gengo's comrades are all dead, having been used by him. Tamari and the others reach the location, and Shikamaru calls on Ro and Hinoko to finish their mission. Hinoko uses her chakra needles to open holes in the wall so that sound lighted. Gengo summons a great sword and tries cutting Shikamaru down with it. Shikamaru manages to pin him down, allowing Hinoko to hit his tongue with the chakra needle, rendering his jutsu useless. Konoha Anbu arrives to take Gengo into custody. Shikamaru asks Tamari to a date, as does Sai to Ino. The last, Narts of the movie. The film starts off with an explanation of Kaki Otsutsuki consuming the chakra fruit, the birth of the ten tails, and the sage of six paths stopping the beast and creating the tailed beasts. It then moves over to the fight battles between Asura Otsutsuki and Indra Otsutsuki, to Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju, and the ending conflict between Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha. Before enrolling in the academy, a young Hinata Hyuga is seen being bullied by boys over a Byakugan, calling her a monster which causes her to cry. Naruto shows up and tells him to back off, proclaiming that he'll be the future Okage. However, the boys outnumber him and easily beat him up and tear his red scarf. Hinata thanks Naruto for his efforts, and Naruto lets her keep the scarf since it's ruined, unaware that this is when the young girl's affections began for Naruto. Sometime later, the academy, Iruka Umino tells his stories to write down the name of the person they would want to be with if the world was to end today. Though Naruto tries to act tough towards Sakura Haruno, she ignores him for Sasuke. While Hinata is unsure whose name to write, she sees Naruto making a paper plane with his paper, which leads him to be scolded by Iruka. Naruto goes on to state that he has no friends or family, and that the world isn't going to end. Seeing this, Hinata happily writes Naruto's name on her paper. In the present time, two years after the Four Shinobi World War, Hiyashi Hyuga, accompanied by two subordinates, met with Tenori Otsutsuki at Sadakona Kakure. Asking for an answer to his earlier proposition, stating the fate of the Hyuga clan depends on Hiyashi's answer, he declines Tenori's offer. Engaging in combat, Hiyashi is overwhelmed by his puppet army and trapped in a cave. In Konoha, Naruto is invited to teach Academy students Taijutsu, much to the joy of the young boys. The lesson, however, is interrupted by a crowd of young girls that greatly admire Naruto, much to his confusion. Yino, Choji, and Chikamaru spot this, noting how popular he's gotten since the war. He has since then received various gifts from Konoha villagers and abroad from young women spin with him as the hero of the world. Later, Konoha Mara meets up with Naruto and wishes to take him to his late grandfather's old storage shed, claiming that there's something for him. Elsewhere in Konoha, Hinata knits a red scarf in remembrance of the one Naruto used to wear back in the Academy, so she can give it to Naruto at the Rinne Festival as a personal gift of love when she confesses her love for him. She is later found by Sakura, who encourages her to give it to him and win his heart. Meanwhile, the five Kage, the sixth Okage, Kakashi Harake, the fifth Kazakage, Gara, fifth Mizukage, Meitarumi, fourth Raikage, A, and third Tsuchikage, Onoki, have an emergency meeting in regards to the threat of the moon, which is revealed to be falling out of orbit and onto the earth. They deduce that if nothing is done soon, then the moon will break apart and crash into the earth and kill all life on the planet. At night, Hinata finishes her gift for Naruto and attempts to give it to him, but her shyness stops her from doing so. Hanabi Hyuga playfully encourages her to give it to him, while warning her sister that there are various girls after him now as well. She meets Naruto, Sakura, Ino, and Choji at Ramen Ichiraku. Just as she sits down to eat, three Konoichi show up and start being affectionate towards Naruto. After seeing this, Hinata decides to leave, to which Sakura tells Naruto to walk her home. However, he doesn't understand why he has to, given her powerful abilities. Sakura catches up to Hinata, telling her Naruto is very dense about love due to not having anyone in his life to express it for him, and assures Hinata she'll be able to win him over if she's confident enough. Meanwhile, various puppets secretly invade Konoha and raid the Hyuga estate, kidnapping Hanabi in the process. On the outskirts of the village, Sai paints a portrait, and spots one of Hanabi's captors flying overhead and falls behind. However, after a quick chase, Sai was taken down by a blast. Back in Konoha in front of Naruto's home, Hinata practices her confession, but is interrupted by Naruto's arrival. After noticing a scarf around Naruto's neck, Hinata's stomach growls. This notions Naruto to invite her to eat ramen in his apartment, but runs off embarrassed, much to his confusion. As Hinata sits on a park swing, she begins to cry, saying she's happy for him and thinking that she lost her chance to be with him. Just there, Toneri appears before Hinata, claiming that he came for her. She's rendered unconscious by Toneri, who affirms the strength of her chakra of Hamada as Naruto shows up and gives chase. Naruto was able to save her from her kidnapper, but the scarf she knitted is ripped as a result of her chakra being distorted. Toneri leaves a message that the end of mankind is approaching and he will return for Hinata. As he leaves, Naruto and Hinata witness a meteor crash outside the village. With Hanabi captured by Toneri, Naruto, Hinata, Sakura, Sai, and Shikamaru are deployed by Kakashi to go and rescue her. To accommodate for the mission, Shikamaru is given a special clock only held by the five Kage, which apparently counts down the time till Doomsday. As the group follow Toneri's tail, courtesy of Sai, Hinata finds Hanabi's kunai and puts it in her bag where Naruto sees the rift scarf. They eventually find a cave with a secret path towards Toneri's location. Hinata is unable to use her Byakugan due to a lake distorting her vision for an unknown reason. Naruto proceeds to make sure his scarf is not wet, proclaiming it to be special to him, leading Sakura to state that it can't be that important, and Hinata feels upset. Sai realizes that the water is incapable of making them wet. They then dive into the lake only to discover it is a genjutsu set by Taneri. They're all trapped in their own memories from the past as Naruto recalls his fight with Kibi Inazuka in the Chunin exams. Hinata's scarf begins to wrap around Naruto and her memories flood into his, causing him to remember her fight with pain, her confession of love to him, her writing his name on their paper in the academy, and Hinata and Sakura's talk about giving him her scarf. Naruto is left utterly bewildered by how she's loved him for so long. Before it can sink in, Sakura dispels the genjutsu placed on everyone. As they descend further, Hinata is found by Toneri who calls her the Byakugan princess and announces his desire for them to be married. Hinata refuses, demanding the safe return of his sister. Toneri then reveals he has taken her sister's Byakugan and if Hinata agrees to his proposal, he will spare both Hinata and Hanabi's lives, and eventually return Hanabi's Byakugan. While Sakura, Sai, and Shikamaru fight against the gatekeeper of the spring, Naruto comes back to protect Hinata and fights Teneri, only for the two to realize Teneri is a puppet. The Teneri puppet explains he will return in person to hear Hinata's answer. Now knowing Teneri is targeting Hinata, Naruto proclaims he will not let Hinata out of his sight, having realized his own romantic feelings for her as well. 
With this, Hinata notices Naruto isn't wearing the scarf anymore. The team arrives outside the village, seeing an artificial sun inside the moon. They make their way to an abandoned shinobi village of the Otsutsuki clan. At some point, Tanari takes Hanabi's Byakugan, which he remarks is incredibly pure after he implants it in his own empty eye sockets, awakening the Tensaigon sealed by Hamura's descendants over the last millennium. He tells his guards he will go after Hinata, but not until his eyes are adjusted. As Naruto and Hinata spend more time with each other, she remains humorously oblivious to his love for her. As Hinata runs into a spider web, she screams, having Naruto rush to her as he picks the web out of her hair, making her blush. Hinata asks Naruto why he took off his scarf, to which Naruto states he feels fine without it. Naruto then falls down some stairs and hurts his back. With Naruto unable to reach his bruised spot, Hinata proceeds to rub ointment on his back, which leaves Naruto rather pleased. As they search the ruins, Shikamaru realizes Tanari's plan and that he is the orchestrator of the falling moon. With Hinata's arrival, a monument of the clan awakens for her, revealing a puppet, which calls her the Byakugan Princess and shows her a vision of Hamura. Hamura awakes her latent Hamura chakra, transfers his own, and orders her to stop Toneri as only she can destroy the Tensaigon as she is the Byakugan princess, and that Toneri, a member of the Otsutsuki's branch house, has misinterpreted his celestial degree. When Hinata awakens, she tells the others what she saw was nothing. Later that night, Naruto follows Hinata to a pond, seeing her knit away at a scarf. Naruto consoles her when Hinata thinks she's a horrible big sister since she just knits a scarf rather than spending more energy to find her sister. Naruto disagrees, recounting the amount of time and energy she's been putting into finding Hanabi. When Hinata thanks him for his reassuring kindness, a flustered Naruto accidentally reveals his newfound feelings for her, leaving her greatly shocked. However, the tender moment is interrupted by Taneri's arrival. This time, Hinata freely goes with Taneri after giving the refurbished scarf to Naruto. Before having his chakra jammed by Taneri, Naruto chased after them, only to be shocked by Hinata's not denying Taneri's statement that they would be married. The resulting explosion of Naruto's vast chakra displays a massive part of the moon and shreds Hinata's scarf yet again, leaving her heartbroken at Taneri's assault on Naruto, forcing him to put her into a slumber. Back on Earth, the various hidden villages defend themselves against crashing meteorites as they protect civilians all over from Taneri's genocidal assault. As Rock Lee and others fail to completely destroy a huge meteor, Sasuke arrives and saves Konoha from certain doom, revealing he rescued Hiyashi. Sasuke then declares he'll defend Konoha since Naruto is away and gives Konoha Ninja a much-needed break. Elsewhere, as Naruto is being healed by Sakura, she notes the injuries are quite serious. Naruto mutters Hinata's name, and Sakura notes that he finally realizes his feelings for her. Back on the moon at Taneri's palace, Taneri marvels at Hinata's beauty as she sleeps. Wanting to know more about her, he reads her mind only to see that she's thinking about Naruto, much to his confusion and jealousy. When she awakens, she finds her sister safe, but even while in a comatose state, Hanabi grabs Hinata silently begging for help. Taneri arrives and gives Hinata a vast army of puppet maids to do her bidding and gives her a tour of his palace. Here, Taneri tells her about his clan and how they should use the Ten Saigon against their enemies, this case being mankind who used Chakra as a weapon, and thus intends to wipe them out as per Hamura's celestial decree. After showing Hinata the mausoleum of Hamura and having dinner, Taneri requests Hinata to make him a scarf like she did Naruto, and orders her to never question his plans to destroy Earth again. Later, upon seeing a floating island in front of the castle, Taneri explains that it's a temple of Hamura, and it comes nearby his castle once a year during the Rinai festival. He then takes her to the floating temple after Hinata says that she personally wants to pay homage, saying that Hamura must be happy for her offer. Hinata realizes she couldn't find the Ten Saigon somewhere in the moon, so she finds a hidden location with Byakugan. While Taneri rests from his inability to control the Ten Saigon, Hinata attempts to destroy the Ten Saigon altar as per Hamura's request, only to be stopped by Taneri. Angered by her lies and betrayals, Taneri destroys her scarf in a jealous rage, proclaiming he knew full well she made it for Naruto. He then brainwashes her by placing his green chakra sphere within her body, so that she will still go through with getting married. Meanwhile, following a three-day recovery process, Naruto awakens and becomes depressed about Hinata's choice, leading Shikamaru inside to scold and make fun of him in hopes of reigniting his drive, only to fail. Shikamaru then takes Naruto to Sakura, revealing that she was severely weakened due to saving his life in the hopes that she would restore his fighting spirit, something he met Sai and himself are nowhere near capable of. Sakura then talks with Naruto and helps him realize that Hinata truly loves him, stating she noted the feelings he had for herself were just another way to compete with Sakura. But Naruto's feelings for Hinata are far more genuine and deeper than they were for herself, and Hinata's love for Naruto is much more genuine. With newfound strength, Naruto leads the charge into Taneri's moon base. Naruto's team invades the palace and splits up. Sai and Sakura are going to rescue Hanabi, while Shikamaru and Naruto go after Hinata. As Shikamaru holds off Taneri's puppets, Naruto arrives just in time to stop Taneri from kissing Hinata, angering Taneri, who leads her to the room of rebirth. To humiliate Naruto, Taneri forces the brainwashed Hinata to attack him, but he manages to remove the orb in her body. After Taneri pulls Hinata towards him, he tries to put another green orb in her body, but his latest Ten Saigon pulsation allows Hinata to escape from Taneri, and after apologizing to him, she leads Naruto to the energy vessel. With their combined efforts, they are able to destroy the vessel, revealing numerous Byakugan sealed inside, which stops the moon from plummeting to the earth. After regrouping with everyone, Sakura presents Hinata with the remnants of her scarf, to which Naruto reveals that he knows it was for him after seeing her memories. Despite being ruined, Naruto happily takes it, which leaves Hinata on the brink of tears of joy. Just then, Shikamaru notices the Doomsday Clock has began again for some reason. Back on Earth, A and Killer B use a massive chakra cannon to destroy the meteor heading from Earth, and upon learning of the moon still approaching, intends to use the cannon to destroy the moon. Kakashi is then told by Hiyashi that it is certain that Taneri took his daughters to the moon. After observing Kurama battling on the moon, Hiyashi's theory is confirmed. Despite now being informed that Naruto and his team are on the moon, A wishes to destroy the moon regardless. The other Kage are against this, angry that A once again has a weapon of mass destruction secretly hidden away, and order him to wait for an hour as they feel that Naruto can't stop the moon given his actions during the previous war. Meanwhile, at the destroyed energy vessel, a furious Taneri manages to unlock the Ten Saigon, allowing him to continue his view of the Celestial Decree. Taneri then summons a giant golem that battles Kurama as he unlocks the Ten Saigon Chakra Mode. He captures Hinata, throwing her into a cage so she can watch him kill Naruto, who he has grown to despise. 
A huge duel ensues, Donari refilling his newfound power to slice the moon in half. Near the end of the fight, Naruto grasps the last remaining shred of the scarf he not had made for him, and seemingly redirects and channels his chakra shroud into the scrap in his right fist and delivers a devastating punch, which is enough to depower Tanari and pin him against a wall. With his defeat, Konami uses this chance to destroy the golem with a tailed beast ball and allows Hinata to retrieve Hanabi's Byakugan. Despite his defeat, Tanari refuses to give up and summons all the Byakugan eyes around him to grant him the power to kill Naruto by draining his chakra. But Hinata stops him from absorbing his chakra anymore. With Tanari unable to maintain his form and is about to burn in the sun, Naruto saves him. With the hour up, A prepares to fire the cannon, but B refuses to kill Naruto and the others, much to A's frustration. Luckily, Kurama writes on the moon, mission complete symbol, much to the fox's annoyance as he admits his penmanship is terrible, signifying everyone is safe and the disaster is averted. As a global declaration is made that Naruto, Hinata, Shikamaru, Sakura, and Sai have saved the planet from extinction, it is revealed that before returning to Earth and saving Teneri, that Hinata took Teneri to the site of Hamura's soul and the truth is revealed to him. Seeing this, Teneri apologizes for his actions and chooses to stay on the moon to atone for his sins and promises that the moon will never approach Earth ever again, despite Hinata and Naruto offering him a place on Earth. Later, Hinata asks Naruto about a scarf he was using earlier, to which he reveals it was knitted by his late mother before he was born, which is why he's so protective of it, leaving Hinata relieved and embarrassed by her actions. As they all head home on Hanabi's request, Naruto proclaims Hinata he wants to spend the rest of his life with her, which moves her to tears. As they leave through the portal, a glimpse of their future lives together is shown, and is followed by them seeing past versions of themselves and Naruto's past selves wearing the red scarf she knitted all were running out of the cave hand in hand as the portals fall apart. Hinata falls but is called by Naruto who tells Hinata to let go, to which she happily states she never wants to, and then they fly out of the cave, leaving the others behind at the exit. While floating in the sky with the moon behind them, they lean in and share their first kiss. The movie ends with a series of flash forwards of Naruto and Hinata's wedding. It further flash forwards to them having a peaceful morning with their two children, Boruto Uzumaki and Himawari Uzumaki, who playfully order their father to play with them, instigating the happy family into a snowball fight. Konoha Hiden, the perfect day for a wedding. Konoha Maru records a congratulatory message from Sakura for Naruto and Hinata's upcoming wedding. Sai isn't sure he can express himself in such a manner, but Sakura forces him to record a message as well. Sai struggles, coming off too stiff or too forced. Lee delivers a high-spirited message getting too close to the camera, Ten Ten finding it doesn't quite come across as congratulatory. Guy thinks there should be something symbolic on screen and suggests recording the message during the sunrise. Ino begins recording her messages but gets angry with Choji and Shikamaru's comments. Akamaru suddenly topples her and Kiba takes over the recording, sparking an argument with Ino. Konohamaru is bothered he can't seem to find someone to record a proper message. He tries Iruka, who is very nervous and asks to postpone it so he can think of something to say. Next day while trying to come up with something, Iruka finds Sadoru, a new academy instructor distressed by vandalism for students. He easily spots the perpetrators when they try claiming they were just playing hide and seek, and he tricks one of them into to admitting to the vandalism, impressing Sadoru. Iruka comments that compared to Naruto, that was nothing. Sadoru is impressed, but the vandals think he's making it up, so Iruka adds to their punishment. Iruka reflects on how the village sees Naruto. Iruka is invited to take an exam for being the vice principal at the academy. Kashi looks over the schedule for missions, seeing that if all of Naruto's friends go to the reception, there will be unfulfilled missions on the day. Konohamaru tries recording a message from Rochumaru, but Yamato covertly and emphatically tells him not to do it. Shizune tells Kakashi that Tsunade made a rule to determine which shinobi get to attend shinobi weddings based on their gifts, much to his dislike. Konohamaru and Ebisu find Iruka at Ichiraku, and Ebisu gets self conscious upon learning of Iruka's offer. Kakashi asks what's up, having been there for a while without being noticed. When they tell him about Iruka's possible promotion, he says it would be difficult. As he leaves, the others discuss what he meant. Iruka decides to take on the exam for vice principal, and his efforts are visible to all in Konoha. Sukune, one of the vandals, steals the scroll of seals after learning Naruto did that. Kakashi almost explains what he meant in Ichiraku about Iruka, but Shizune tells him about the scroll's theft. Iruka finds Sancho and Mibuna, some of the vandals, who confirm his suspicion. He finds the vandal and the scroll at the Hokage Rock and apologizes for always comparing his students to previous students, realizing he just wanted attention. The vandal promises to try harder. Kakashi shows Iruka the scroll just as an Ichi Ichi volume, as if he'd leave the scroll where someone could steal it so easily. He then explains what he meant about the exam being difficult is that it's on the same day as Naruto's wedding and considers moving the exam to another day, but Iruka decides not to take it, noting his failure to notice his current students. Kakashi decides to make getting a wedding gift for Naruto and Hinata a mission, so he can determine who should go to the wedding and who should be on mission duty that day. The Konoha 11 wonder what to give Naruto and Hinata. Lee tries Naruto's favorite ramen to get into his shoes and figure something he'd like. He asks Iruka about Naruto, but Iruka barely sees Naruto nowadays. Lee leaves to find a gift. Konohamaru once again asks Iruka to record a message from Naruto, and Iruka postpones it again. Lee considers giving them dumbbells, but decides against it. Ten Ten thinks about giving them a cute kunai, but realizes that giving them a weapon might reflect poorly on her. Lee arrives asking for help, and the two spend the day trying to figure out a gift. Lee always coming up with a weapon, and a ludicrous rationale for being a useful one. Lee dreams of Neji's ghost visiting him to offer advice, but only gets more confused. Iruka records a message from Naruto at last. Lee tells Iruka about his struggle to come up with a gift. Iruka says something that suddenly inspires Lee. Lee, Ten Ten, and Guy try coming up with ideas together, but Lee and Guy keep going off topic. Lee and Guy decide to roleplay being Naruto and Hinata, with Ten Ten being their baby to figure out what they should gift him. When they talk about Neji, Lee remembers his dream and has an epiphany and decides to give them dumbbells anyway. Him giving the left one and Guy the right one. Ten Ten settles for a custom made kunai. Lee thanks Iruka for his input. Iruka asks Konohamaru to record a new message later as he wants to learn more about who Naruto is now and starts by asking Naruto's favorite ramen at Ichiraku. Shigamaru and Choji visit Ino at Yamanaka Flowers, wanting to discuss what to get for Naruto and Hinata. Ino says she already picked a present and says they can't go shop with her when Shikamaru wants to go to the same store. At Yakiniku Q, Shikamaru discusses with Choji about ideas and is shocked to find he's already picked a gift, vouchers for a dinner at a fancy tea house. Shikamaru considers giving them cash, so they pick whatever 
they want, but considers it to be too impersonal and lazy for a gift. Something Choji says about eating ice cream in a snowy place inspires Shikamaru to give them a honeymoon. The two come across to Mari, and she and Shikamaru exchange awkward words. Choji suggests getting Tamari to give him a woman's point of view for a honeymoon location. Shikamaru asks her about it, but the two misunderstand each other, Tamari thinking Shikamaru wants her to go on a honeymoon with him. The two spend the day together. Ino goes to the store and is about to get a portrait frame for Naruto and Hinata, but Sakura shows up also intending to get the same gift. Ino and Sakura try psyching each other out of buying the frame, but end up being kicked out of the store for upsetting other customers. The two begin arguing who is more feminine and ask a passing Choji for his opinion. Choji says he thinks women who can cook are very feminine, and the two decide to make food pills. Both use ninjutsu skills to make the pills. Choji tries them both and is overwhelmed by how good they are, and since they eat them both together, doesn't know which is which. Choji passes out while trying to figure out what happened, Ino and Sakura try each other's food pills, really enjoying them. Choji wakes up, figuring all the ice cream he ate earlier made his blood sugar go too high. Sakura and Ino decide to go find gifts together. Shikamaru and Tamari almost go to a hot spring inn together when they finally understand what the other meant, only Tamari beats him up. Choji, Ino, and Shikamaru discuss their progress at Ichiraku Ramen. Gara, Tamari, and Konkuro arrive in Konoha, where they're greeted by Kakashi and Chizune. Kakashi confirms the arrival of the Kage, while the Mizukage is still to arrive due to bad weather. Onoki asks Kakashi about Naruto's wedding, intending to give him a gift on Iwa's behalf. A also intends to send a gift on Kumo's behalf. Gara learns of Naruto's wedding. Later, Konkuro asks Tamari why they didn't know that, considering she just visited Konoha. Tamari angrily says she forgot, scaring Konkuro. Konkuro suggests something extravagant. Lee and Tenten arrive on duty to show them around the village. Gara asks to see places Naruto likes. Tamari wants to stay in and avoid running into Shikamaru. At Ramen Ichiraku, Ayame notices Iruka has been coming there a lot lately. Teuchi notices that shinobi around the village are all trying to figure out what to give Naruto, and despite not being a shinobi, he has also come up with a gift, a free ramen pass. However, they don't know for how long the pass should be worth, worried about Naruto going through all their ramen. Gara asks Lee if he's gotten Naruto a gift already, which Lee confirms. Gara ponders that this is the first time he's had to give a wedding gift. Tenten is apprehensive when Lee begins getting overactive over telling Gara about his gift and how he decided on it. Lee and Tenten take Gara and Konkuro to Ramen Ichiraku, where they meet Iruka. They further discuss what to give Naruto and then have ramen. Killer B runs into the fort and is also giving Naruto a gift. Killer B mentions a dance number and Konkuro feels Gara should also perform. When A learns of B saying he'll dance, he almost makes a scene, but when the Mizukage misunderstands B about the wedding, she intimidates him. The five Kage meet and Kakashi asks them to exercise moderation in their gifts. Tamari runs into Shikamaru and the two apologize for the misunderstanding last time and they go out to eat together. Ino and Joji spy on their date. Gara goes to dine at Ramen Ichiraku and Iruka apologizes for putting pressure on him to give an extravagant gift. When Iruka says he's happy Naruto made so many friends, Gara is inspired to give him a gift not as a Kazakage but as a friend. As Ayame locks up, Teochi decides to make Naruto's free pass lifelong. Kakashi, Lee, and Tenten say goodbye to Gara, Konkuro, and Tamari. Gara intends to come back for Naruto's wedding. Konkuro is sad he won't see Gara dance, and they notice Tamari is in a much better mood. They realize they still can see Gara dance as Naruto's friend. Shino has his Kikaichi report to him about the others buying Naruto when he had his wedding gifts. He shows the insects to Academy students, one of them wanting to become Hokage, much like Naruto. Iruka watches them from afar. Shino encourages them to follow their dreams. Shino meets up with Kiba, who complains he's late. Shino tells him all their friends have already gotten a gift. Kiba is taking buying the wedding gift as a very serious mission, as it's the last mission they'll have his teammate. The two ask Kuranai for advice. Kuranai tells him about a rare honey wine that the Senju clan would gift in certain occasions. The two leave for Soraku, where a beekeeper who supposedly makes the wine lives. They come across an Ineko, Momo, who refuses to share information with them, antagonizing them over Akamaru and their dog and insect scents. They try baiting him with catnip and pursue it, but Tamaki protects him and apologizes for his behavior. Kiba flirts with Tamaki. Tamaki gives them directions to find the beekeeper. When looking around for him, Shino ends up being lost in thought and loses track of Kiba. Shino is attacked by the beekeeper, but manages to deceive him. The beekeeper assumes Shino wants to kill him, but just gives him the honey wine when he asks for it. Shino asks for directions to leave, but is told there's something like a barrier keeping those who come in wandering around. The fog has a component that stirs doubt in those in it. Kiba manages to leave the area with no problem, while Shino recalls his earlier conversation with the academy students, Kiba and Kuranai, which lead him to question how to live as a shinobi after teammate. The beekeeper tries to keep Shino enslaved to his out, but his resolve to find a new path allows him to leave. Shino meets up with Kiba and the two leave with the honey wine. Shino speaks with the academy students again, further motivating them. Iruka suggests Shino should be a teacher. Kakashi and Shizune review the wedding gifts for Naruto and Hinata. Kakashi leans towards having Lee, Guy, and Konohamaru on duty. Kakashi goes out on a stroll and meets up with Hinata, who is going to meet the other girls. Konohamaru finds Iruka at Ramen Ichiraku and demands he finally record a message for Naruto and Hinata. Iruka is still unsure of what to say, recalling that Gara decided to celebrate Naruto as his friend instead of Kazakage and wondering what his role should be, though understanding most would consider him Naruto's teacher. While meeting with Hinata, Sakura almost slips about the mission for getting the wedding gifts. Later, with Team 8, Kiba almost slips about the mission. Tsunade comes by the Hokage's office, and Shizune tells her about the mission and Kakashi's predicament to judge by gifts, while Konohamaru overhears them, deciding to hand in his video without a message from Iruka. Konohamaru informs the others of their judging of their gifts, which Hinata overhears, distressing her. Hinata goes to see Kakashi about the mission. The others go to Kakashi and offer to rotate between missions and wedding reception, allowing everyone to participate, and Kakashi being Hokage can change the rule. Tsunade points out that this situation is different, as the rule was made at a time where there was a boom in shinobi weddings during a war, and that Kakashi should rule as he sees fit. Kakashi asks the other Kage to lend shinobi during the wedding, to which they agree as they wedding gift. Iruka comes across a distressed Hinata who wrongly assumes Naruto is to blame and starts to apologize for him. Hinata finds it hilarious. Iruka talks with Kakashi and gives him an idea while also telling Konohamaru that Hinata found out about the mission so his video is no longer a surprise. 
Kakashi asks if the other Kage can spare Shinobi for the missions of the day of the wedding, and Konohamaru tries recording a message with them. Irika dreams back to when Naruto stole the scroll of seals. Konohamaru wants to record another message from Irika, finding the previous one to be uninspired. Irika doesn't know what to say. He scolds Sukune, Mibuna, and Sancho for vandalizing the third Hokage statue again. Satoru asks Irika of making a speech during the ceremony, but Irika says Kakashi will do it. Ayame runs into Irika, saying he hasn't been to Ramen Ichiraku in a while. Irika explains he's still trying to figure out what to say. Naruto visits Irika, asking about for ramen. Irika is trying to cook his own dinner without much success. Naruto wants to have fun in his last day as a single man, and Irika scolds him for it. Naruto wants to go out with him to tell him something. Irika wonders why he struggled so much with his message. Naruto asks Irika to attend the ceremony as his father, moving him. Irika accepts. Irika and Hinata talk about Naruto's request. Irika records another message with Konohamaru finally getting it right. The guests arrive at the reception and mingle. Naruto and Hinata go get married. In the future, Nolda Boruto fights Kawaki and destroy Konakagure, and argue about the end of the age of Shinobi. Both activate seal-like powers. Boruto activates the dojutsu in his right eye, and both resume their fight. In the present, Boruto looks after a bed-ridden Himawari while Hinata goes out to pick up her medicine. Boruto recalls a previous occasion Himawari had a rough time and recalls when Naruto became Okage. Naruto had arrived drunk late from celebrating with his friends the night before his inauguration. The next morning, Boruto jumps on him to wake him up when Himori is unable to do it. Hinata leaves to pick up Naruto's formal wear, as the seamstress, who made the formal attire of every previous Hokage, still isn't done with it. At the inauguration menu, Kakashi expresses relief at passing on the mantle of Hokage. Hinata arrives, but Naruto hasn't, so she goes back to check on him. At home, Boruto and Himori fight over a teddy bear and end up tearing it apart. Himori, angered beyond reason, awakens her Byakugan and moves in to attack Boruto. Seeing a terrified Boruto, Naruto puts himself between them, getting himself knocked out. At the inauguration, Kakashi and Shikamaru have Konohamaru transform into Naruto to get the event underway. Down in the crowd, only Irika sees the ruse. Hinata finds Naruto unconscious at home with his Senketsu clothes and wonder who might have done it. Upstairs, Himawari finds Boruto hidden in a closet. In the present, Boruto thinks about his resentment of Naruto for spending little time at home ever since becoming Okage. Sarada Uchiha arc. As Shino Abarame explains to his class that within one week they'll be going through graduation examinations for getting positions, the majority of the class boards their views in the opportunity. However, Sarada questions the meaning of Shinobi in her future, despite being told that she must be proud of being born to the Uchiha clan. Sarada walks home, jealous that her classmates are being trained by their fathers for the exams, with Chocho Akimichi eating with her father, Inujin Yamanaka getting drawing lessons from his father, and even Boruto playing an expansive game of hide and seek with his ever busy father, the seventh Okage, coupled with being given a lecture by Shigeru Nara and his father. Seeing all this, Sarada quietly admits that at her best recollection, she has never seen her own father for as long as she can remember. Upon returning home and seeing a picture of her parents together, Sarada questions her mother about him. When Sakura can't give her satisfactory answers, Sarada openly questions the validity of her parents' marriage, causing Sakura to violently lash out. Collecting herself, Sakura apologizes to her daughter but realizes her outburst was destroyed their house, much to her horror, as apparently this is not the first time Sakura has destroyed it, and she cries about a loan she took before fainting. Dropping her mother off to Shizune, Sarada returns to the house's ruins to collect some valuables. However, as she picks up the picture from before, Sarada makes a shocking discovery. The family picture is fake. Pulling out the larger picture of her father, she sees him with the rest of his team and Taka, and to her horror, Karin, a girl with glasses similar to her, causing Sarada to further question her own parentage. All the while, Sasuke appears to be returning to Konohagakure. After encountering a mysterious boy possessing the Sharingan and wearing the crest of the Uchiha clan, Sasuke sends a hawk back to Konohagakure to contact Naruto with the matter. Meanwhile, Sarada's identity crisis continues as she reveals to Shizune that she knows that there's no record of her birth in the village, with Shizune's evasive demeanor on the topic not helping matters. In a restaurant, Chocho complains about her father's excessive eating habits, which her mother simply ignores. Annoyed that she's being ignored while trying to lose weight, she simply sighs as Sarada appears. Humorously, Chocho explains to her that she doubts her parents are her real parents. This is challenged by an eavesdropping Mitsuki, who simply states that it was normal for girls their age to start questioning their identity, angering Chocho. Sarada eventually decides to simply find her father herself or ask the 7th Okage about her dilemma. In his office, Naruto sees Sasuke's hawk and realizes the situation that Sasuke is in and consults Kakashi. Together, they come to an agreement that the boy is not an Uchiha survivor, but more likely another one of Orochimaru's experiments. Naruto leaves a shadow clone to run the village with Shikamaru as he heads out to meet Sasuke and Yamato. Sarada, however, secretly hears this and ties the trailer until she realizes Jojo has invited herself along too, thinking Sarada is helping her find her real parents. Elsewhere, the mysterious boy meets a person cloaked in an Akatsuki mantle, informing him of his brief fight with Sasuke. They both declare they cannot forgive Sasuke for killing his older brother Itachi and promise to make him pay. Naruto asks Shikamaru to apologize to Boruto for him and heads off to meet with Sasuke. Just as Naruto leaves, Boruto arrives together with Mitsuki with the intent to bring Naruto his lunch. Sarada offers to bring the food to Naruto, and though he's hesitant at first, Boruto later hands it over to Sarada, and she heads off towards Naruto with Chocho. Unbeknownst to them, however, the two are being watched by a tiny creature with a single Sharingan. At a remote clearing, the mysterious boy Shin is ordered by his father to capture Sarada. Sarada and Chocho continue to pursue Naruto to deliver his lunch, which Naruto notices using sage mode and hurries back to them. Stopping momentarily as they catch their breath, Sarada and Chocho are intruded by Shin. Sarada remarks upon his Sharingan as her mother had told her that aside from Sasuke, they were the last one of the Uchiha. When Sarada refuses to go with them, Shin quickly engages and overwhelms the girl in their brief scuffle, which Naruto intervenes in the end to save them. Angered by Naruto's appearance, Shin activates his own Mangekyo Sharingan and uses the Dojutsu's abilities to attack the three with the Kusarigama. Following the brief skirmish, the strange Sharingan creature appears and urges Shin to retreat, noting that they cannot defeat the seventh Okage. Shin agrees, and the creature with the same Mangekyo pattern as Shin teleports them away. Deciding to be safer for the two young girls stay with him, Naruto allows them to accompany him on his journey. As they stop for a break, Naruto tells Sarada that she's a combination of her parents and Sarada feels at ease in Naruto. After traveling for an uncertain amount of time, they finally come within range of the rendezvous point and decide to take a break. Too excited to meet with her father, Sarada sinks away from the group and continues onward. While imagining her first encounter with her father, Sarada's intense emotions allowed her to awaken the Sharingan. Arriving at the temple, Sarada finally encounters Sasuke and is overwhelmed by her emotions. However, Sasuke taking notice of her Sharingan
While Sarada sucks the fact that Sasuke didn't recognize her, Naruto and Chocho converge in the scene. Sasuke demands an explanation from Naruto as to why he brought along children, which prompts Sarada to reveal that she wanted to ask him about the identity of her biological mother, along with a slew of other questions regarding Karina in the photograph and the reason behind his absence. Sasuke refuses to answer any of her questions, and Sarada storms out of the temple in anger. As Naruto attempts to comfort her, he recalls when Sasuke held a meeting with the five Kage and Sakura where they discussed an issue revolving Kaguya, the way that Zuarmi and the possible emergence of a new threat. As Sasuke has taken it upon himself to investigate this matter, Naruto informs Sarada that her father is one of the greatest shinobi alive. Meanwhile, Shin's father meets with his son and several copies of him, proclaiming the revival of the Katsuki. Teleporting to the temple via the Sharingan creature, Shin and his father launch an attack on Sarada, which Naruto counters. Sensing danger, Sasuke emerges from the temple and prepares to confront the enemy. Elsewhere, Sakura awakens and begins her journey towards the temple where her family resides. The mysterious man immediately guides weapons towards Sasuke, who easily counters with his sword and proceeds to attack. The enemy manages to block Sasuke's advance while his son attacks, prompting Sasuke to evade. When Sasuke releases a large fireball at the duo, the older man uses his son as a shield against the attack. Defeated, the older man commends Sasuke's skill and reveals himself as Shin Uchiha, possessing the same name as his son. While Naruto plans his escape with the children, he is stabbed in the abdomen with Sasuke's sword, which Shin manipulated during their earlier encounter. With Naruto weakened, Shin's blades hurl towards Sarada, leaving Sasuke with no choice but to jump in front and take the blades. As Shin starts to make his next move, Sakura arrives and pummels him to the ground. Reuniting with her family and her former teammates, she begins apologizing to Sarada for keeping secrets, to which Sasuke replies that the fault lays with him. While Sasuke does so, the Sharingan creature teleports Shin and his son back to their base, with Sakura caught in the middle and dragged with them. Recovering from the battle, Shin begins to surgically replace his liver with the sons, much to Sakura's disgust. During the surgery, Shin explains to Sakura that his son is just one of many clones of himself that he created with his own teeth and nerves. After revealing that he was once a test subject of Orochimaru's, he begins to explain his philosophy of how conflict is essential for human evolution and his views on the role of genetics, which Sakura vehemently refutes. Meanwhile, without any leads to go on after Sakura's capture, Naruto's group decides to meet with Orochimaru and ask him what he knows about the situation. After a briefing with Yamato, they enter the hideout and reunite with Orochimaru, Suigetsu, and Jugo. Without wasting time, Orochimaru explains Shin's history. He was a former experiment whose unique body could accept anything transplanted into it without rejection, which made him the perfect test subject. This resulted in multiple Sharingan being implanted with his body and his right arm being harvested for Danzo Shimura. Eventually, Shin learned about and became fascinated with Itachi Uchiha, leading him to abandon Orochimaru and taking all but one clone with him. Orochimaru informs the group that the clones are unlike any standard shadow clone technique and that they can only be stopped by being killed. Orochimaru's speech discusses Sarada and Sasuke demands to know Shin's whereabouts, to which Orochimaru agrees to tell him so Sasuke can kill Shin for him. While changing rooms for more information on where to go to find Shin, Sarada gets Suigetsu's attention so they sneak away from the rest of the group. In a private location, Sarada requests that Suigetsu do a DNA test with the use of an umbilical cord that Suigetsu thinks belongs to Karin, to confirm if Sakura or Karin are her birth mother. After comparing DNA from both Sarada and the umbilical cord, the test seemingly reveals that Karin is Sarada's real mother. Meanwhile, noticing Sarada and Suigetsu be gone, Naruto finds the location and eavesdrops on their conversation, becoming angry at the idea that Sasuke was unfaithful to Sakura and at Suigetsu's involvement. While Suigetsu awkwardly exits the situation, Naruto attempts to remind Sarada that they must save Sakura from Shin. However, a devastated Sarada with her Sharingan activated lashes out at Naruto for lying to her and denounces any relation to Sakura. After calming down from her tirade, Sarada explains to Naruto that since everything she knows has been a lie, she intends on leaving the village and continuing her journey alone. Naruto stops her and asks her to remember her memories of Sakura. In deep thought, Sarada remembers when her parents taught her how to walk and how Sakura loved her and comforted her as she missed her father. After reminiscing about their past, Sarada realizes that she does care about Sakura and decides to help in the mission to save her. Returning to the others, Sasuke reveals that he has learned the location of Shin's hideout. Activating his Tomoe Rinnegan and Mangekyo Sharingan, which was previously weakened due to him traveling through Kagi's dimensions, Sasuke manifests to Susano to transport everyone to Shin's location. Meanwhile, Shin has completed a surgery and notes that it is his job to eliminate peace lovers who are a menace to human evolution. Refuting his statement, Sakura prepares to take him on in combat, revealing she kept Shin alive this long so she can get information for Sasuke. When Naruto detects Sakura, Shin and his clones attack her, injuring her right arm. Sasuke and Naruto arrive in time to save her in battle. As Sasuke cares for Sakura's injuries, Sarada watches, realizing there is love between her parents. Later, Sasuke uses Susanoo to fight a giant Shin clone to protect everyone while Naruto takes on a herd of Shin clones. Sakura is about to join in the fight when Sarada decimates the area and several Shin clones, shocking everyone. With everything now under control, Sakura checks on Sarada and declares that she really is her biological mother. Sarada believes her and says that she's learned what's most important is the connection that they share. She asks her father if he believes this, to which he confirms, with him reasoning that he and Sakura have her as their daughter, moving Sarada to tears. Sasuke asks Naruto what they should do with the Shin clones, and Naruto decides to place them in a new orphanage in Konoha. After returning to the village, Chocho is relieved to know that she's not an adopted child after all. Sarada and her parents have their first family dinner before Sasuke returns to his traveling the next day. Before departing, he notices that Sarada is sad and comforts her by hugging her and poking her on the forehead, assuring her that he will come home soon. When Sakura attempts to receive affection from him, Sasuke teases her by walking away and bidding them farewell, much to her disappointment. The Shin clones are dropped off at the orphanage that is operated by Kabuto Yakushi and Urushi, and Kabuto tells the clones that he will be giving them their own names and he will be their new father. Versus Momoshiki Arc. Upon being tasked with capturing train robbers and finding out that all but one of them were killed in the abandoned mine, Team 7 ventures inside. Konohamaru is surprised to witness a white Zetsu being under the impression that they were all killed in the Fortune of World War. As it uses attacks with elemental natures, Konohamaru struggles as well as the Genin. Borto used the scientific ninja tool he received earlier from Kataska and the Zetsu, giving Konohamaru the opportunity to strike it, forcing him to retreat. While Mitsuki tends to Konohamaru's injuries, Konohamaru informs him of what they're actually up against. Mitsuki discovers a room with a dead blossom and determines to be previously used to cultivate white Zetsu. As the flower is without a chakra supply, it can't incubate any more Zetsu before revealing that his parent taught him about the topic. While Konohamaru agrees with Boruto that they should destroy the location, he decides to handle the situation alone, while the three Genin report back to Konohag
As Mitsuki, Boruto, and Konohamaru cancel out its elemental attacks with their own, the Zetsu switches to Taijutsu, leading the Boruto clones engaging it as a distraction. Seeing an opportunity, Boruto stops following the strategy and attempts to attack it, which results in Zetsu pinning Boruto down until Mitsuki pulls him off. Then Konohamaru destroys it with his Rasengan. Investigating further, they find a cavern full of decomposed Zetsu cocoons. When they find another portion of the Otsutsuki clan ruins, they discover a deceased white Zetsu being incinerated by black flames, followed by dozens more in the same situation. Konohamaru explains that Sasuke was responsible and informs the Genin of his mission involving Kaguya. Learning that Sasuke's strength rivals Naruto's, Boruto becomes intrigued. Afterwards, the team contacts Konoha, leading to Naruto's shadow clone coming out with a shinobi. Meanwhile, as Sasuke arrives in Kaguya's ice dimension, he is watched from above by Momoshiki and Kinshiki. Discovering Tonari's location, Urashiki crashed into the moon. Urashiki told him that the Otsutsuki clan's main family observed everything over the millennium, including the humiliating incident. Noting Tanari betrayed the clan for his servants to the earth, he revealed he knew Tanari did something to the son of the Byakugan princess. Aggravated, Tanari charged towards Urashiki, but was immobilized by his chakra rod, leading to the later petrifying him, though he didn't have the authority to kill a fellow clan member before setting his eyes on earth and departing. On Konoha TV, Naruto was interviewed and notes the importance of teaching the current generation shinobi how the era of peace was achieved due to the Four Shinobi World War. Elsewhere, Moegi hands Chunin an exam's application to her team. After Naruto denies the use of the Kote in the upcoming exams, Kotasuke is approached by a hooded figure at the Ninjutsu Research Center. At Lightning Burger, Boruto, Inojin, and Shikadai play their electronic games together, during which they disapprove of Boruto cheating. Approached by Mitsuki and Sarada, they attempt to prompt Boruto into participating in the exams as a team, though Boruto was uninterested until Sarada convinces him that passing will show everyone how strong he is. Arriving home for Himori's birthday, Boruto finds Naruto there to his surprise. As the celebration begins, Naruto disappears, revealing to his family that he was just a shadow clone, which infuriates Boruto. With the party being over, Boruto goes upstairs where he finds Naruto's old battered jacket, leading him to throwing it out the window. As someone rings the doorbell, Boruto runs over and prepares to punch Naruto, but discovers it's Sasuke who blocks his attack. Sasuke asks Hinata if Naruto's around, to which she informs that her husband's still at the office. Having met Sasuke thrills Boruto. Attempting to leave to confront his father, Boruto was stopped by Sasuke. On Sasuke's way to meeting Naruto, he discovered the jacket Boruto threw away. At the Hokage office, Shikamaru discovers Naruto exhausted, followed by Sasuke arriving with the scroll he obtained earlier, and recounts his encounter with Kinshiki and Momoshiki Ozutsuki. Leaving, Sasuke notices Boruto arriving and decides to block his path. Impressed, Boruto asks to become Sasuke's student. Asking if he can perform the Rasengan yet, Boruto says he'll learn it in order for Sasuke to accept him. Later, Boruto approaches Konohamaru at the Sarutobi clan compound, and asks him to be taught the Rasengan, which he agrees to. While struggling to grasp the first step to perform the Rasengan, Boruto gets hints from cooking with Himawari, leading him to go into the next step, the Jutsu. After managing to perform the Rasengan and demonstrating to Sasuke, the Uchiha notes that it's small, leading to Boruto throwing his Rasengan away in frustration before leaving. Sarada approaches her father, who says he's being too strict, leading to Sasuke correcting the pair's assumptions, which he revealed he was going to accept Boruto as a student. Vending to Katasuke, the scientist offers a kote to Boruto. Elsewhere, Mitsuki speaks with Orochimaru, who advises the Genin not to reveal his true strength during the exams. The next day, Boruto approaches Sasuke to show him his progression, leading to performing a normal sized Rasengan secretly via his kote, which Sasuke notices. Training in Shuriken Jutsu, Sasuke informs Konohamaru that he's training Boruto and thanks him for teaching Sarada. During their training, Boruto asks about Naruto's weaknesses. Later, Tamari trains a Team 10 and informs them that Gaara's adopted son will soon be taking part in the exams. Struggling to train in Shuriken Jutsu, he uses kote to perform a technique which obeys him and continue practicing. Later, the various Konoha Genin sign up for the tuning exams. In Kaguya's Lava Dimension, Momoshiki and Kinshiki search through Kaguya's scrolls, during which Urashiki approaches them and informs them on Earth, prompting Momoshiki departing there. Followed by Kinshiki and Urashiki, the latter tells the pair of the tailed beasts and the two Jinchuriki, Killer B and Naruto. Approaching Killer B, the Otsutsuki attack him, leading to B transforming into Yuki. During the fight, Momoshiki absorbs B's tailed beast ball and fires an enhanced version of it back, which seemingly defeats him. Absorbing Yuki into chakra pills, Urashiki notes Kaguya's history while on the planet of his superiors. As Konkuro escorts Chinki's team to the Junin exams from Tsunagakure, Gara sees them off. Afterwards, Shukaku contacts the Kazakage and informs him that it lost contact with Yuki. Later, after Hinata and Himawari wish Boruto good luck at the Chunin exams, his team depart to the village gate where all the competing Genin are. After all the Genin gather, Shikamaru addresses them at the entrance ceremony. Spending the remaining time before the exam starts at Lightning Burger, Boruto and Sarada get into an altercation with Yurai, leading to Shinki intervening to break them up. At the exam venue, Chojuro beats Boruto and thanks him for his assistance on his field trip in Kirigakure. He then informs Boruto that Kagura is looking forward to him becoming a Chunin. Sai begins the first exam, prompting the Genin to race towards the exam venue in time limit given. As the three Kage and their bodyguards watch the teams make their way there, traps and obstacles overwhelm some Genin, while others manage to overcome the hurdle, resulting in ten times how many puppets to challenge them. Shiki instructs Yoro and Araya not to reveal their jutsu to other teams, leading to them defeating the puppets with physical attacks while Yoroi deals with them using his bubblegum ninjutsu. The teams that make it to the exam venue are given a true or false question by Sai about the fifth volume of the Shinobi Handbook. He notes that those competing that turn black will fail. Standing on one of the two platforms to indicate their answer, all the Genin fall into a pit after the floor gives way, leading to them all falling into pits containing ink at the bottom. Various Genin use different methods to avoid their teams falling into the ink, including Yura using floating bubblegum spheres, Sumire using Nue, the three Senka brothers standing on the ink, and Iwobi be creating platforms to stand on. The Genin that avoided falling into the ink passed the first round of the exams, during which Kosuke informs someone that Boruto hasn't used his kote yet. Shigumaru later informs Naruto that Boruto passed the exam, followed by him emailing his son to congratulate him. Struggling to train in Shuriken Jutsu, Boruto excuses his performance due to it being a Chiha specialty, leading to Sasuke creating shadow clones to dismiss Boruto's logic, as being Naruto's son would make the shadow clone technique a specialty. Swearing to play an active role in the second rounds of the Chunin exams, Boruto barely manages to create four clones. On the night Gaara arrives in Konoha, he organizes a meeting with Sasuke and Chojuro, during which he discusses being attacked by Urashiki earlier, who managed to steal Gaara's tailed beast chakra. Concluding it's probably an Otsutsuki cl
Afterwards, Team 10 wins against Kitty Team, Team 15 loses to Akuma Gakure Team, and Jinki single-handedly defeats Denki, Iwubi, and Metal of Team 5. In the final match, the three Senka brothers compete against Team 7, leading to the triplets facing Boruto, who is guarding his team's flag. Hearing Boruto in distress, Mitsuki departs back to his location while Sarda continues onward. As the brothers and the Shadow Clones defeat Boruto's clones, they all ran toward Boruto's flag. Refusing to lose, Boruto utilizes his Kote to protect his flag using water release, followed by electrocuting them with his own jutsu. As the brothers collapse, Mitsuki arrives to find them defeated. Sarda finds the enemy flag protected by Genjutsu, which he bypasses to obtain the flag, resulting in Team 7 passing. In the control room monitoring the event, Ten Ten determines the reason why they couldn't see Boruto use hand seals while he used water release bullet orca is due to him weaving them faster than the eye can see. Afterwards, Kosuke informs Katasuke that Boruto used the tool at last and that he captured footage of him using it. While worrying about Boruto, Shikamaru informs Naruto that he passed the round, which thrills Naruto. In the aftermath of the round, the Konoha and Genin discuss the outcomes of their fights with each other. Arriving home, Boruto is congratulated by Himawari before heading up to his room to rest. While Sasuke waits for Kagi's scroll to be translated, Naruto discusses Sasuke becoming Boruto's teacher and informs that his daughter passed the round. Boruto is later applauded by Naruto for passing before he returns to his office to work. As the third round of the exam starts, the Proctor Rock Lee explains how the round is structured, with it being a 1 vs 1 tournament. For the first match, Boruto is pitted against Yoroi. While the two fight, Boruto relies on the Kote to defeat his opponent. For the second match, Yoroi faces Shikadai. Managing to catch her with a shadow, she forfeits. Before Sarada participates in her match against Tarui, she determines she'll win it with 3 seconds. As the match between the two Konoichi begins, Sarada dodges Tarui's lariat, leading to her punching the Kumo girl in the arena as well within 3 seconds of the match beginning, which results in Sarada winning the match. In the fourth match, Inojin uses a super piece imitated in drawing to attack Araya. Unfazed by the attacks, Araya manages to defeat Inojin. For the fifth match, Mitsuki and Toroi are pitted against each other. Using lightning release to increase his reaction time, Toroi manages to slightly injure Mitsuki, leading to begin to activate Sage Mode. Remembering Orochimaru didn't want him to reveal his true power publicly, Mitsuki stops activating it and resorts to attacking Toro with his snakes while pinning him down, leading to his opponent surrendering. For the final match of the first rounds, Chocho and Shinki face each other. Before the match begins, Shinki apologizes in advance for not holding back. While Chocho's team watches the match from the waiting room alongside Boruto and Sarada, they overhear Choji cheering on from the crowd beside Karui. As the match begins, Shinki talks down to his opponent while Moegi discusses Chocho's potential with Konohamaru and Udon. Provoking Chocho, she attacks him while using her partial multi size technique. Blocking her enlarged fist with an iron sand hand, he overpowers Chocho with his own two hands. Listening to her father's suggestion, she puts distance between herself and Shinki, during which she changes tactics and attacks him from a distance by allowing debris at him. Blocking the attack using his iron sand, Kurotsuchi comments on him being skilled and asks Kara where he found the boy, prompting him to recall his first meeting with Shinki. Overpowered by his iron sand fists, Chocho results to using the multi size technique which he hates using, leading there performing the human bullet tank. Blocking her assault with his jutsu hands, Shinki is briefly pushed back until he lunges his arms with more iron sand. The attack drains Chocho, resulting in her falling down in defeat, and Shinki progresses into the finals. With the end of the elimination matches, Rock Lee announces a 30 minute break before the next match, during which Shikadai and Boruto agree to fight fair and square during their match. While waiting, Boruto decides to take off his kote and not use it during his upcoming match, until he overhears Shikadai's parents putting their faith in his son to win. As the match commences, Boruto and his clones dodge Shikadai's shadow but are ultimately freed by it. Forcing Boruto to give up, Boruto relies on his kote to break free of his restraints and force Shikadai to surrender, which he does. On her way to entering the arena, Sarada's peers voice words of encouragement to her. As Sarada's match begins against Araya, he repels her attacks during which Sarada can't keep up with his movement despite having her shrine guard activated. Attempting to catch up in Genjutsu, Araya is unfazed before further injuring her. Contemplating why the Genjutsu wasn't effective, she notices the chakra threads leading to her attacking the arena's roofing. As the smoke clears from the attack, the real Araya emerges, who is revealed to be a puppeteer that's manipulating a look-like puppet in the arena. After explaining how she discovered his strategy, Araya nervously attempts to flee the fight, but is stopped by Shinki, who convinces him to remain there and fight. Continuing the match, Araya has his puppet charged towards Sarada, during which she incinerates it, resulting in Lee calling the match with Sarada as the winner. As the match between Mitsuki and Shinki begins, the latter withstands and defeats Mitsuki's techniques using his iron sand, prompting Mitsuki to attack Shinki from underneath him, resulting in Shinki being dragged underground. Reappearing after his clone is defeated, Shinki tricks Mitsuki into repelling away his iron sand cloak using lightning release, during which Mitsuki attempts to attack the opponent with taijutsu but is punched away. Having been marked with this technique to pressure Mitsuki into sage mode, he forfeits the match, as Mitsuki's desire to stay in Konoha outweighs his desire to win the match. With the finalists being decided, the three are informed the last match will be held during the next day. Afterwards, Moegi treats her team to dinner, while Sakura treats Sarada's injuries. Elsewhere, Sasuke demonstrates his Chidori to Boruto to motivate his student into polishing his skill with lightning release in the hopes that he would be able to use similar strong techniques in the future. The next day, the final match between Boruto, Sarada, and Shinki begins. Boruto and Sarada decide to team up in order to defeat Shinki. The two try multiple coordinated attacks on Shinki, but to no avail. Eventually, Shinki managed to overpower them and defeat Sarada. Boruto decided to use Boruto's stream against Shinki's Iron Sand. With his power near its limit, Boruto uses purple electricity through his kote, overpowering Shinki's Iron Sand to win. While everyone, including Boruto's friends, celebrate with him, Naruto arrives and exposes Boruto's use of the kote, disqualifying him for cheating and removing his forehead protector, much to the distraught of everyone, including Shikadai, who is disappointed to realize that his best friend had been cheating during their match. Naruto told Boruto that he'd lecture him later for that, which immediately angered Boruto, asking his father if he really does have time for him, saying that if he paid attention to him, he wouldn't be in this situation. Katasuke arrives and tries to make an announcement about his scientific ninja attack, calling Boruto his tester, which led the latter to realize that he had been used. Suddenly, they're interrupted by the arrival of Momoshiki and Kinshiki, the latter which assaults the arena. While everyone is evacuating the citizens, Momoshiki approaches Naruto and kicks him away. Boruto attacks him with his kote, but his techniques are all absorbed. Mitsuki decides to help Boruto using his sage mode, but he's ambushed by Urashiki, who steals his power. Before he approaches Mitsuki, he's ambushed by Gara and Chojuro. Back in the stadium, Sarada and Boruto get attacked by Momoshiki and Kinshiki, only to be saved by their fathers. The duo intro
Elsewhere, Urashiki pressures both the Kazakage and the Mizukage, with the power he stole from the others. Momoshiki uses Taka Mimu Subino Kami to unleash his assault on Naruto and the others, but Naruto and Sasuke respond back by using the respectively the Tailed Beast and Susanoo to protect Boruto and Sarada. When Momoshiki fires a Tailed Beast ball, Naruto asks Sasuke to take care of the two before using his full power to block the attack. At the same time, Gara and Chojuro manage to defeat Urashiki with their coordinated attacks, prompting the latter to use his Rinnegan to escape. Naruto tries to blow Momoshiki's attack away with his own attack, but hesitates. When Boruto asks Sasuke why his father isn't trying to blow it, Sasuke responds that citizens will get caught up as well if he counterattacks. While everyone is watching Naruto withstanding Momoshiki's attack, Boruto begins to reminisce the time he spent with his father and finally understand the job as Hokage, while at the same time watching his father give him a warm smile before being captured, leading Boruto to cry out at him. Boruto wakes up in the hospital. Seeing Sarada, he asks about his father. He hears Himawari calling for Hinata as Sakura attends to her. Sakura explains Hinata was injured trying to keep Momoshiki and Kinjiki from taking Naruto. Sarada informs him that Mitsuki is in critical condition after having his tracker stolen. Boruto sees how many others got injured despite Naruto's efforts and runs out of the hospital. Boruto notices he's still wearing a shinobi gauntlet after tripping on a medical kit and angrily throws it away. Upon waking up, Hinata asks about Naruto and Sasuke assures he's fine, and to leave the rest to him. Boruto goes to Naruto's office, thinking about all the times he complained Naruto. He finds and wears Naruto's old clothes. Sasuke tells Boruto he's in a similar situation Naruto used to be in, scorned by others. He reveals he can still sense Naruto's chakra and that he intends to rescue him with Boruto's help. The other Kage arrive saying they'll help, so everyone pools all of their knowledge on each of the Otsutsuki's abilities. The Kage questions Sasuke's decision to bring Boruto along, but he assures me he has a reason. Sasuke hands Boruto his own forehead protector with Naruto's scratch on it and explains the history behind it. As Sasuke, Boruto, and the Kage prepare to leave, Sarada asks Sasuke to go with them. He instructs her to help Kakashi and Shigamaru protect the village, as she's the only other person with a shotgun. gun. Boruto tries to apologize to Nishigadai, but he says they have more pressing matters and that he'll listen to what he has to say later. Sasuke opens a portal with his Rinnegan. Hinata arrives and is shocked to see Boruto and Naruto's all clothes. The sight reminds her of her husband when he was younger, and that moves Hinata to entrust Naruto's safety to her son. They then leave to rescue Naruto. In a wasteland where a god tree resides, Momoshiki drains Kurama's chakra from Naruto. Kinshiki explains that this god tree was created from a man who also harbored a tailed beast, which Naruto understands to be Killer B. Momoshiki complains about how long the process is taking, having absorbed only half the chakra in Naruto. Naruto says he won't make it easy for them, that as a shinobi, they've had to persevere to develop their abilities. Momoshiki explains how they're able to effortlessly acquire power, which Naruto links to the shinobi gauntlet, realizing his own lack of effort in trying to understand Boruto, which is what drove him to cheat with the shinobi gauntlet. Momoshiki resumes extracting his chakra. The four other Kage arrive, interrupting Momoshiki and cutting Naruto free from his restraints. The Kage fight Momoshiki and Kinjiki while Sasuke and Boruto check on Naruto. Naruto notices Boruto is wearing his old clothes. When he tried to apologize to Boruto for not being there for him, Naruto replied that it was alright and he just wants to hear more about Naruto's past. Boruto asks Naruto to tell him the story after they get back home. In Konoha, Shigamaru instructs other shinobi to make sure that no one is missing, and to be on the lookout for Urashiki. Shigadai asks them if they shouldn't send reinforcements. Shigamaru sees his concern for Boruto as like his for Naruto. He explains the current situation using shogi analogies. Sasuke, Chojuro, and Kurotsuchi fight Kinjiki, which leads Chojuro and Kurotsuchi pinning Kinjiki down. The others focus on Momoshiki, Gara using his sand to offer others footing while pursuing him. Boruto warns Naruto of Momoshiki's ability to absorb and amplify any ninjutsu used against him. Momoshiki notices Kinshiki has been incapacitated, and upon checking Boruto with his Byakugan, notices that Naruto is unable to pass on his power to him, and offers to show him how his clan does it. He converts Kinshiki into a chakra edible and consumes it. Sasuke attempts to strike him but fails. Momoshiki's appearance changes, including manifesting a third Rinnegan on his forehead, and tells Naruto he's next. The shinobi are horrified by Momoshiki's consuming of Kinshiki for power, who replies it was the former's wish and the law within their clan. Momoshiki releases a pulse of energy that cuts clean through the god tree and pushes everyone back. Momoshiki proceeds to knock out Chojuro, Darui, Gara, and Kurotsuchi. Momoshiki targets Naruto, and the two engage with Taijutsu, and the latter gains the upper hand when he strikes Naruto's Tengetsu. Sasuke attacks Momoshiki, who evades his attack, counterattacks, and rams both Naruto and Sasuke under the ground, throwing them against the remains of the god tree. Naruto and Sasuke go on the offensive, activating their chakra mode and Dojutsu respectively, and Momoshiki manifests a weapon to counter them, leading to the trio to brawl. Eventually, Naruto manifests Kurama. Momoshiki coalesces the rocks around into a monkey in retaliation. Sasuke armors Naruto with Susanoo, and they cut through Momoshiki's monkey. Boruto watches the fight in awe. Naruto and Sasuke power down, and the other Kage ask if they're done. Kotasuke arrives at Kosuke, and against the other's warnings, fires several ninjutsu at Momoshiki with the Shinobi Gauntlet. Momoshiki absorbs them, regains strength, and uses the absorbed jutsu against them. Gara protects the group with the sand, but before they can strike back, Momoshiki paralyzes them with an absorbed Narashata ninjutsu, and for extra measure, pins Naruto down with the black receivers. Boruto remembers Sasuke's words from before, and on Sasuke's command, throws the Rasengan. Naruto wonders when Boruto learned it, while well, Momoshiki thinks he should have stayed out of sight. He prepares to absorb it, but it vanishes before reaching him, so he turns his attention back to the Shinobi. Boruto's attack connects, breaking Momoshiki's hold on the others. Sasuke explains to Naruto how he trained Boruto on the condition that he learned the Rasengan. Momoshiki consumes more chakra pills to power up for a decisive attack. Naruto tells Boruto to make another Rasengan and adds his chakra to enlarge it. Sasuke distracts Momoshiki, throwing a sword and switching places with it to get close. Sasuke's sword is a transformed Boruto who throws a kunai. Momoshiki catches it, and Sasuke switches it with his Chidori, so Momoshiki strikes his own arm, while Sasuke uses the kunai to stab the Rinnegan on his hand, preventing him from using it to absorb Jutsu. Boruto uses clones to distract Momoshiki, allowing his real self to attack with the Naruto powered Rasengan. Momoshiki counters with a similar attack, but Boruto prevails. As his body is destroyed, Momoshiki's spirit talks to Boruto, recognizing that he strongly inherited Osotsuki powers. He gives Boruto cryptic information about his future and warns him that his victory means he can't save an ordinary human, grabbing his arm before disappearing. Kotasuke is confused about recent events, unsure of what happened. Momoshiki's tracker receivers vanish. Sasuke and Naruto talk about their previous conversation about the nature of Shinobi.
Boruto apologizes for his actions to Team Shinki. Naruto, Sasuke, and Shikamaru discuss how they still targets the Otsutsuki as Udashiki escaped and they still don't know the true extent of his powers. Sasuke says he'll leave to track Udashiki. Naruto and Shikamaru discuss how they got to see the skills of the participants requiring meeting with the other villagers to discuss the outcome. Shikamaru also points out Naruto has to deal with Katasuke and informs him that Killer B returns to Komogakure. Naruto wants to take time off, but Shikamaru advises to finish handling his paperwork first. Boruto and Shikadai ride the train, the situation between them awkward. They both apologize to each other, Boruto for having cheated, Shikadai for making Boruto wait so long to talk to him when he said he would after the attack on the exam. They talk about the type of shinobi they want to be. On the train back to Tsunagakure, Shinki thinks how Boruto, who he perceives as weak, went against a much stronger opponent and won. Gara claims responsibility for telling him not to fight, but Shinki says that even if he had fought, he'd have lost. Gara tells him to focus on his own path instead of the paths of others beside him. Sasuke talks to Boruto, who informs him he hasn't seen Momoshiki again, nor felt the same paralysis he had before. Sasuke tells Boruto to keep him updated. A snake clone Orochimaru meets Mizuki in order to talk to him about using Senjutsu in public. Boruto is interviewed for his participation in the fight against the Otsutsuki. Sakura asks if Boruto intends to become Hokage, but he denies it, saying that that is her dream, while he wants to become like Sasuke. After she and Mitsuki leave, he undoes his bandages, thinking back to Momoshiki's words, looking at the diamond-shaped mark upon his right hand. Boruto arrives home to find Naruto, who brought home a cake to make up for missing Himawari and Boruto's birthdays. Boruto punches him in the stomach to make sure he's not a shadow clone. When Himawari jumps in the two, Hinata threatens to put the cake away. Naruto and Boruto both wake up late the next day and fist bump before they head to handle their respective duties. Parent and Child Day arc Naruto and Shikamaru watch the announcement of the Parent and Child Day holiday. The two discuss how Shinobi life has changed to their days. Shikamaru tends to free Naruto's schedule so he can spend it with the children, but several shopkeepers arrive at his office needing signature and several forms. Naruto confirms Shikamaru's commitment to freeing his schedule. The day before the holiday, Boruto and Himori wonder if Naruto will be able to make it, Hinata assuring them he will before leaving to visit her own father. Naruto only arrives in the morning. Boruto leaves the train and tells him Himori's been waiting. He finds her sleeping on the floor. After Naruto wakes her up, she says she'd like to go buy a Kurama plush toy with him. He wants to take a nap first, but sees the toy's limited edition sale for the holiday. Naruto chooses to go with her instead of sleeping. Himori explains how the toy works, and Naruto compares it to a baby. Kurama gives Naruto his own commentary. They find several people already waiting for the store to open, and they also find Kiba. Naruto explains he was Hinata's teammate, but Himori was too young to remember him for the first time they met. Kiba shows her Akamaru and Akamaru. She pets them both. Kiba is there to get the Kurama plush toy for his girlfriend. It sells out fast and Kiba isn't able to get it, and Naruto gets a Shukaku toy by mistake. Kiba decides to help him search for it in other parts of the village. He checks at Yamanaka Flowers, where Ino questions his logic looking for a toy there, but gives Himori two sunflowers as thanks for having helped Unijin. Walking through the village, Boruto finds Shino with a Kurama toy, who tries to pass it as research and a better understanding of students. They check Ten Ten's shop next, where she guilt trips Naruto into buying a parent and child kunai set, and also a pink shuriken necklace for Himori. Kiba arrives saying he managed to get the last Kurama toy from a kiosk, but when Akamaru gives him the package, it's a hamburger. They spot the person who took Kiba's package, and Naruto pursues them. Naruto catches up to him, recognizes him as something he sent to investigate the state of affairs near the border. His son asks him if he's okay, and asks Naruto for forgiveness. Himori arrives and hands the toy to his son. Naruto removes him from his mission, and assigns him to the village gate, so he'll stay closer to his son. At the end of the day, Himori is glad for the time she spent with Naruto, says she'll cherish the gifts he did get for her. Several cooks discuss an upcoming eating contest and wonder how to account for Choji Akamichi's participation. Choji watches the announcement on the Parent and Child Day holiday on TV, keeps flicking on through the channels and eating. Seeing her father, Chocho asks Kadoi why she married him. Kadoi doesn't quite remember and gets angry with him for having eaten the snacks that she bought for them to have together. Kadoi throws him out and then asks him to buy more chips and she goes to replenish snacks. Choji and Chocho run into Boruto and explain the situation. Chocho spots an advert for a patent child day eating contest and wants to enter it with her father so she can prove to Kadoi he's a role model for their daughter. At the contest, they also buy Sai and Inojin, Rock and Metal Lee, Shikamaru and Shigadai participating as well. Choji and Chocho advance to the second round and are surprised when another team ties with them. The Inara and Yamanaka also advance to the second round. The team would tie with the Akamichi, the Dotonbori, and introduce themselves and both that will win. The Akamichi, the Dotonbori, and the Nara advance to the semifinals. One of the cooks watches them and later conspires with the Dotonbori, afraid that Choji will make her go bankrupt if she wins. The Dotonbori and the Akamichi advance to the finals. Kadoi watches the contest and Boruto spots Shino in the audience of the Kurama doll. While the Akamichi recover, Kadoi expresses her doubts over the value of the eating contest and the recklessness. Boruto wants to try the spicy burgers for the semi-final and manages to find leftovers of the Dotobori, but finds them not to be spicy at all. During the final, the conspiring cook puts shallow bowls to the Dotobori to give them an advantage. Boruto brings them their meal in their regular bowls. Chojo struggles to finish the dishes by herself and reminds Choji that the delicious meals are meant to be eaten together, something Kadoi also shouts from the audience. With newfound determination, the Akamichi catch up with the Dotobori. The cook interferes using ninjutsu to cause the dumplings to grow. Rock and Metal try to deal with it, but are ineffective. Kadori uses lightning release to release her daughter, but it takes Choji growing in size to end the issue by eating them all and then burning the calories through converting them into chakra. The Akamichi win the contest. Sakura and Sarada hear Naruto's announcement of the Parent and Child Day holiday on TV, and Sakura apologizes for having to work that day. Sarada tells her not to worry as Sasuke isn't there either, and she promised to help Boruto with shuriken training. She wonders where Sasuke is, unaware that he's in Korakakure. Boruto recognizes Sasuke on the street, who asks him about all the family activities. Boruto explains the new holiday. Sasuke asks about Naruto, and Boruto adds he's with Himori today, before telling Sasuke where Sarada will be, and suggesting he spend time with her. Waiting by a stream, Sasuke thinks back to times he spent with his father, when he mastered fire release, great fireball technique. Sarada is surprised to see him. Sasuke explains that he just got to the village and that Boruto told him where she'd be, and invites him to go to the festivals. Sarada is happy that Sasuke came to the village, but he explains he dropped by because he had business to attend to near the village, cutting down on her excitement. Watching other parents with their children, Sasuke struggles to bond with Sarada. The two spot Naruto carrying Himori as they search for a Kurama doll. Sarada envious of their bond. He thinks back to how he enjoyed being carried by
Sasuke comes across Shino doting on his Kurama doll, and after an awkward silence, he asks about Sarada. Shino comments on her talent and the difficult path she has chosen. Sasuke asks about any parasites on her, which Shino misunderstands as a negative comment on insects. When he talks to Sarada again, he tries using Kakashi's advice from the books, but ends up further antagonizing her. Boruto finds Sarada training by herself and asks her about Sasuke. She confesses she doesn't think her father knows about her at all, but Boruto surprises her asking if he knows about Sasuke at all, and that she should tell him if there's anything she wants to do. Sasuke complains to Kakashi about his advice, and the two come across Sakura. At home, the two talk about how Sarada perceives Sasuke, and Sakura explains Sarada wants to be Hokage. He finds her training with Shuriken and explains that he too once wanted to be Hokage, but his version of it was warped until Naruto set him on the right path. Sasuke helps her with the Shuriken training. On the way home, they come across Boruto, and Sarada gives him the same advice he gave her. At home, Naruto apologizes to Boruto for having spent the whole day with Himawari and gives him the parent and child kunai set he bought at Tenten's shop. Boruto asks Naruto to train with him since it's technically still parent and child day. At his home, Shino continues doting on his Kurama doll. Jigen informs the other inners of the vessel's loss. They argue about the delay that causes their plans and who's to blame for the incident. Most of them blame Victor, who tries to deflect it to Amato, whose absence in the meeting in questions. Jigen says that Amato is busy with matters that no longer concern Victor. Koji Kashin offers to retrieve the vessel as the airship carrying it did so in an area under his jurisdiction. The rest of the other inners present agree to let him handle it, and Koji says he will contact the outer agent to assist. After the meeting is over, Victor considers retrieving the vessel himself and is glad the theft of the vessel's data hasn't been discovered. He disparages Koji, who enters back, revealing he was in the same room as Victor since the beginning of the meeting. Victor moves to attack him, but Koji strikes first. Victor maintains someone tampered with his airship, but Koji incinerates him. His troops are strong enough to overcome Victor's regeneration. Koji also destroys the drone with the stolen data. Amato has informed Jigen of what Deepa knew. Having regenerated his head and brain enough for him to report back. Having no further use for Deepa, Jigen has Amato dispose of his head. Koji reports having dealt with Victor to Jigen, who in turn informs everyone of the precise coordinates of the airship crash and orders him to kill anyone who has seen the airship. Konohamaru and Mugino approach the crash site. Several Genin gather to watch the sparring between Boruto and Naruto. Mitsuki helps Boruto prepare. Boruto is happy his father managed to keep a promise and is glad to have an opportunity to make up for past mistakes and show him that his growth in his training. Shigamaru confirms to Naruto that he hasn't told Boruto he'll be testing a new prosthetic hand. The sparring begins and Boruto using Shadow Clones as decoys to protect Naruto from behind. He throws a Rasengan which Naruto extinguishes. Boruto uses Electrified Shuriken to blind him, so he only spots the Rasengan when it's near him, but Naruto extinguishes it again. Boruto wants to clash the Rasengan and uses Shadow Clones to propel himself with Naruto. The Boruto who has the Rasengan is a Shadow Clone and the Rewind attacks from afar with a Water Release and Lightning Release combo. Naruto blocks it with an Earth Release wall. He punches through the wall and absorbs Boruto's Jutsu. Boruto heads to the wall and Naruto kicks him from behind, knocking him down and ending the match. Naruto acknowledges Boruto's growth. Later, Naruto confirms to Boruto his prosthetic hand was a scientific ninja weapon, explaining that Katasuke developed it based on Momoshiki's ability, though it isn't capable of releasing the jutsu it absorbs. Boruto admonishes Naruto for using it when he chastises Boruto for using it before. Sasuke arrives and points at the differences at how they're used. Sarada asks when he came back, and he says he just returned from investigating Kara. Konohamaru and Mugino enter the crashed airship and find an empty container. Something approaches them from inside the airship. Konohamaru is suspicious of the empty container and copies data from it. Mugino recognizes one of his assailants as a subordinate of Victor's and is attacked by an automaton. Mugino urges Konohamaru to run as more automatons appear. In Konoha, Sasuke reveals he hasn't discovered any worthwhile information about Kara, much to everyone's surprise. They speculate their headquarters must be underground and recall that Kara also has ties to the seal in Boruto's hand. Katasuke arrives, further stoking Boruto's disdain for scientific ninja tools. Naruto affirms there and Katasuke's worth as supports for the Hokage and assigns Team 7 to escort Katasuke and the prosthetic to another lab. Boruto walks away and Naruto requests Sarada and Miski to keep an eye on Boruto's seal. Despite Shikamaru's concern, Sasuke is certain that Boruto will come around about the mission. Sarada understands Boruto's feelings about scientific ninja tools, but wants to live up to the expectations of receiving a mission straight from the Hokage. Mitsuki explains that while he's always tied his choices to Boruto, he'll be part of the mission even if Boruto isn't, and that this isn't any tool, it's Naruto's hand, which plays a part in protecting the village and everyone in it. He adds that with Kara making moves, he can't afford to let Sarada face danger alone. Boruto is convinced, as Mitsuki thought he would be. Amato does maintenance on Jigen, who is still concerned about uncovering the traitor responsible for the crash. Amato is confused, so Jigen explains that while Victor did try to steal the vessel, somebody else had the ship crash. His agreement to an unnecessary move was bait to drive him into action. Amato asks how he knows it wasn't Victor. Jigen felt the vessel being moved through the Kaba before the ship crash, something that Victor couldn't have done. Ever since discovering the vessel, Jigen had been worried this thing would happen. Amato takes Jigen's words as an order to investigate the other inners, which he confesses will be troublesome. Team 7 and Katasuka take the Thunder Train for their mission, where they find Ao. Katasuka introduces Ao as one of his patients, though neither can remember the last time they met. Sarada notices Boruto's diligence in carrying the prosthetic, but Boruto reaffirms his disdain for scientific ninja tools. Sarada points out the games computers he enjoys are also fruit of scientific development. Katasuka adds that while scientific ninja tools are the launchpad, most of the technology developed ends up with civilian applications. Katasuke offers to adjust the wrist of Ao's prosthetic arm. Ao says that old habits from the active service die hard. Boruto is surprised to learn that Ao is a shinobi, and Mitsuki asks what village he's from. Ao answers he's from Kiri, and is likewise surprised to hear that Boruto has visited as part of a school trip, noting how much has changed. Ao credits him being alive to scientific ninja tools, and when Boruto is still lukewarm about them, he takes a screwdriver Katasuke is using on him and comes close to stabbing Boruto. He points out that they're not inherently good or bad, it all depends on how they're used. Team 7 and Katasuke depart, having arrived at the station. From the bench behind him, Koji Kashin addresses Ao. As an outer, he expected Victor to be the one to reach out to him, only to learn he's dead. Koji asks why he went to see Katasuke. Ao says he'd kill Katasuke if he remembered anything, Koji praising the skill with which Ao placed him under Genjutsu and extracted information about the scientific ninja tools from him. Koji tasks him with retrieving the vessel and killing anyone he interacted with. Ao warns it's likely to get dramatic. Konohamaru helps Mugino, who tells him to abandon him. Konohamaru refuses and says the help should be on the way.
Delta is called by Code, who is leisurely waiting alone. They trade barbs about the vessel's retrieval before Amato arrives. He reveals Victor's treachery and death to them. Kataska and Team 7 arrive at the research facility, which is headed by one of his juniors. They find Nui running around, but he is paralyzed by Akita Inazuka using the shadow imitation technique through Shinobi Gauntlet. Team 7 are surprised to see Nui and Sumire there. Sumire explains some of her efforts to learn to coexist with Nui as part of the research team. Akita is excited to have Kataska's latest prototype to test. Despite their enthusiasm and Kataska's insistence that how they're used matters, Boruto remains unconvinced of scientific ninja tools' value. As part of the mission, Team 7 helps test other tools, some of which Boruto even has fun testing. Tending to an injury Boruto sustained testing one of the tools, Sumina explains that she wants to develop a tool to keep Nui from getting out of control so she can support the village, and lets him know that she'll be relocating back to Konoha to act as Kataska's assistant. Boruto notices a plaque with Kataska's creative science being used to support others. Akita's Ninken Chamaru befriends Boruto, who notices he's a prosthetic leg. Akita explains she became Kataske's assistant after he helped the Ninken. Kataske shows Boruto a prototype chakra blade, but it tires him quickly due to high chakra expenditure. Boruto concedes the tools have a role in supporting the village. Boruto has a call from his father. At Kara's headquarters, Amato does maintenance on Delta and Code, who continue to trade insults. They consider Boro might have stolen the vessel before he checks in. Naruto informs Boruto they've lost contact with Konohamaru and Mugino, and has his team check in on them as they're the closest. Naruto is concerned that despite being two capable Jonin, they have been able to get in contact, and wonders if Kara might be responsible. Sai and Shikamaru share his concern. Amato shows Jigen the scans he had made of the other inners to identify the traitor among them. Code spies on them. A boy looks at the sunset. Akita provides Team 7 with manuals and the scientific individuals as they leave. She attributes her concern with Chamaru and Kataske joining them. Kataske wishes to test a prototype mechanical suit made for caregiving that was modified for combat. Sarada finishes packing and they say goodbye to Sumire. Arriving at the airship crash site, they notice several scattered puppets. Boruto wonders if Konohamaru defeated them, and Sarada looks for signs of a puppet user. Kataske gets carried away examining the airship and notices the open empty container. One of the puppets moves on its own and attacks Boruto, who defeats it with lightning release. The other puppets begin to activate and surround the Geni. Sarada attacks with Taijutsu and fire release, Minsky with wind release. The puppets get up again and begin using fire release against them. From their firing and lack of hand seals, Sarada and Kataske surmise that they're autonomous scientific ninja tools. Kataske believes they were there to guard the container they found. He steps forward using his own scientific ninja tools to absorb their attacks until they overheat from continuous firing. Kataske instructs them to destroy the puppet's power supplies to prevent it from reactivating once they cool down, and takes one for later examination. Sarada is surprised as she believes such tools were still a field exclusive to Konoha. Kataske recalls being told by Ibiki that he may have leaked intel without a genjutsu and feels guilty. Chamaru brings them one of Konohamaru's kunai and leads them, having caught a scent. At Kara's headquarters, Jigen deflects an attack from Code, who wishes to handle the traitor. Jigen points out he has another important task. Code leaves, crosses past Delta, and they insult each other. In a cave, Konohamaru tends to Mugino's injuries. Team 7 finds them and they catch each other up on what happened. Konohamaru means for Kataske to analyze the data he acquired, but they're interrupted by Ao. He points a weapon at them and asks the contents of the container. Konohamaru refuses to share intel from a mission, so Ao opens fire against them. Sarada recognizes it as the same attack the puppets use. Kataske absorbs Ao's attacks, allowing Konohamaru to break his weapon with Rasengan. He asks about the container and about Kara. Ao shoots Konohamaru in the face with a hidden prosthetic in his chat. Through them knowing about Kara is a greater mess than he anticipated, so he removes one of Kataske's jutsu absorption arms and uses it to absorb Boruto's Rasengan before kicking him aside. Sarada considers using a smoke flash bomb, but Konohamaru and Mugino don't know the signal for her plan. Mugino grabs Ao and asks him about what he said when they met during the memorial. Ao pierces him with a hidden tool in his arm. Mugino holds Ao in place and collapses the cave around them, telling the others to run. Ao begins emerging from the rebels, so Konohamaru hastens their escape. Free from the rebel, Ao intends to kill all of them. Hiding in an abandoned structure, Sarada applies the healing foam to Konohamaru's injuries. He thanks Kataske for developing the technology. Mitsuki believes Ao isn't pursuing them at the moment, Sarada wants to retreat as soon as Konohamaru is healed. Boruto is frustrated by Mugino's death, so Konohamaru assures him of Mugino's intentions. They discuss how someone like Ao would align with Kara and how dangerous he is. Knowing that Ao wants to eliminate them for investigating the empty container, Konohamaru prioritizes getting the information to Konoha, and offers himself as a decoy to stall Ao. The Ganyan argue against it, pointing out he's exhausted. Kataske offers himself as bait instead, revealing that while under Genjutsu, he leaked information on the side of the tools. He feels responsible for what the enemy has done to the technology, including Ao's murder of Mugino. Boruto confesses he used to agree that scientific ninja tools shouldn't exist, but seeing their positive influence on the lab changes mind. He wants to stop Ao from misusing the tools so others won't hate them without knowing them like he did. Konohamaru is convinced to deal with Ao instead of the decoy strategy. At Kara's headquarters, while trading insults, Code tells Delta that Jigen believes it's a traitor among the inners. Each accuses the other of being the traitor. Amato interrupts them and explains the steps he's taken so far to uncover who the traitor is. Code and Delta point out Boros skip maintenance, as did Koji, and wonder where Koji is. Koji meets with Ao and questions his commitment. Ao assures him of his loyalty to Kara. The Konoha Shinobi strategized, wanting to make use of the Jutsu absorption tool Ao stole. They intend to make him absorb their attacks to create an opening for a surprise attack from a blind spot. Now that Ao no longer has a Byakugan, Boruto activates the chakra blade he has to use but passes out from chakra use. When he wakes up, Kataske has finished adjusting the remaining Jutsu absorption arm for Boruto's use. They prepare to defeat Ao with the proper use of scientific ninja tools. The Konoha Shinobi wait for Ao's attack, Mitsuki's snake acting as a scout. They discuss Ao's prowess and plan to defeat him as Shinobi. Mitsuki warns him of Ao's approach. Ao sees where they're hiding and attacks Mitsuki, whose lightning release to counter attack Ao absorbs. Mitsuki retreats and Konohamaru attacks a fire release. Ao notices they disregard for conserving chakra and deduces they have a strategy. Mitsuki attacks while Ao is absorbing Konohamaru's attack, forcing him to dodge, allowing Sarada to land Taijutsu hits. Ao's shinobi wear is resilient, so he counterattacks Sarada. The three continue attacking with the ninjutsu for him to absorb a dodge. Ao creates a greater absorption sphere to absorb all their attacks at once. Ao notices Boruto's absence and determines him to be vital to their strategy. 
Boruto strikes him above with a chakra blade, which Al blocks with his own. Before Boruto can retrieve his blade, Al collects it and stabs him with it. Al boasts of seeing through this strategy, but Boruto mocks him. He grips Al's hands on the blade handle. Mitsuki wraps an arm around it so he can't let go, and the Boruto Al stab disperses a shadow clone. The chakra blade drains Al's chakra, who uses his own tools to force Mitsuki to release him. The real Boruto attacks the Rasengan and uses the Jutsu Absorption arm so his absorption sphere cancels out Al's, allowing him to land the Rasengan. Boruto throws Al's words about how to use tools back at him. Al removes the absorption arm, destroyed by Boruto's attack. Konohamaru detects Al's attack from above and pushes Boruto out of the way, being hit himself and knocked unconscious. They notice the drones in the sky under Al's control. Kotasuke surmises they respond to Al's chakra. Boruto comments on how unshinobi Al has become, and Al is steadfast that Kara saved him and allowed him to transcend to a new existence. He denounces that not all shinobi can be powerful, which necessitated the tools for new powers like he has. Boruto asks Sarda and Mitsuki to protect Kataske and Konomaru and prepares to face Al's drone strikes. He uses the arm to absorb some of their attacks. The drone strikes block the attacks he throws it out. Boruto throws himself at the drones, hopping between them, planting explosive attacks to take them out. Summon destroys the electrified shuriken. Still in the air, Boruto strikes water release, but Al's drones evaporate the water. Boruto asks Al why he didn't return to Kirigakure, and Al answers he was waiting for death as a shinobi. He couldn't stand no longer being a shinobi. Al commends Boruto for pushing him so far, and the two resume fighting. Boruto attacks the shadow clones, but Al was able to discern the original, since the jutsu can't replicate complex machinery out of its scientific ninja tools. Sarda tries intervening, but Mitsuki has to pull it out of the way of the drone attacks. Al prepares to stab Boruto, who disperses the shadow clone arm with the absorption arm. Boruto emerges from the rebel, dodging Al's attack and landing a Rasengan on his weaponized arm, destroying it and setting him against the abandoned building. Al's drones crash down. Al admits defeat, and when Boruto pulls out the screwdriver, Al tries goading into killing him. Al thinks him naive for showing mercy. Boruto once again voices Al's how it's used rationale, so even the tools Al uses should be used for good. He tells Al to live with the tools Kataske gave him. Konoha regains consciousness and wants to take Al back to Konoha when they get reinforcements. Kataske looks forward for the future of the Genin. Al notices and calls out to Koji, who summons a toad. The abandoned building collapses under the toad's weight. Al uses water release to push Boruto out of the debris way, and is crushed by the toad. Koji wonders what motivated Al to use Ninjutsu at the very end and introduces himself after releasing his summon. He congratulates them for the battle, having quite enjoyed it, and aggravates Boruto by belittling Al's emotions. Konohamaru probes him for more information on Kara, but Koji reveals nothing. Koji seals their movements and readies himself to incinerate them. Konohamaru breaks free of the seal with one of his own. The two begin to fight, Koji countering and avoiding Konohamaru's taijutsu and fire release. Koji counters Konohamaru's Rasengan with one of his own, to everyone's surprise. He detonates a toad he planted on Konohamaru who catches on fire. The seal on Boruto's hand activates and spreads, absorbing the seal and the flames in Konohamaru who collapses. Koji recognizes it as Kama, surprised that Boruto was the one chosen by Momoshiki. Boruto sees the seal spread all over his arm before passing out. Koji retreats as thanks for showing him something interesting. Sarada wants to force answers out of him, but Miski holds her back, now wanting to risk her teammates' lives. Koji approves of the judgment, aware his parent is Orochimaru. Later, after having recovered, the group makes a grave for Ao and wonders about Kara. Amato reviews the files on Code and recalls that Koji and Boro have not yet been cleared as traitors. He leaves his station for a moment and Delta sneaks in to check the files on Code. Considering him and Boro clean, she considers Koji to be the traitor. Elsewhere in the hideout, Code is frustrated with another member. Konohamaru wants to return to the village because they have a lot to report on. Boruto asks about Chamaru, but Kataske assures him that if anything happens, he'll return to the lab on his own. They find the remains of a battle with more autonomous puppets and investigate. They're far more damaged than the ones that Team 7 defeated. Chamaru draws their attention to a passed out boy who they believe to be the one who defeated the puppets. Despite Konohamaru's warning, Boruto approaches him and notices that he is the same mark as him. Kawaki Arc, Kara Clash. In the past, a weakened boy walks around a facility. A man the boy fears asks him about his survival. He says that despite surviving, he lost his arms, but Kara gave him new ones. He's surprised that nothing seems to have gone wrong with the boy. The boy wants to leave, causing the man to get hostile. Koji and Amato watch the two from afar, and Amato comments on Garo's recklessness. Garo asks why the boy would want to leave when he learns that he has no family outside. Garo prepares to hurt the boy, and Koji prevents Amato from intervening, telling him to watch. The boy's comma activates, and he severely injures Garo. Amato celebrates Kara's success, while Koji remains quiet. In the present, Delta watches while Jigen has a meal. She's concerned about Koji's retrieval of the vessel, but Jigen assures her of Koji's skill and determination. He does concede that something interesting might have triggered his curiosity. Delta kicks the table aside, asking what could be so important to put off the vessel's retrieval. Jigen tells her to relax, recreates the table in the meal, and is certain that the vessel will return to them. He does allow her to go check on it if she wishes, but stresses it's still Koji's mission, so she's to take his lead and report back to Jigen if there are further issues. Delta wants to know what Koji is thinking. Code watches her from afar, thinking her to be simple-minded. Amato asks Jigen if it's wise to let Delta go, but Jigen is unconcerned. He asks Amato not to let anyone near him for a while. Delta recruits Garo to retrieve the vessel in the land of fire. The Konoha Shinobi are concerned by the boy having the same kama as Boruto. Boruto feels pain in his kama hand, and the boy grunts in pain as well. Kawaki dreams back to being sold by his father to Jigen. Kawaki begins waking up, screaming to not touch him. Everyone falls back as energy surges from him. When the dust settles, Kawaki asks if they're Kara trackers. Konohamaru introduces the group as Konoha Shinobi. Koji watches from afar and is joined by Delta. Saying she has Jigen's permission, she asks why he's letting the situation unfold, specifically after he reveals that Ao is dead. She tells him that she brought Garo with her to Koji's annoyance. Kawaki doesn't trust the Konoha Shinobi when they ask about the airship crash, and becomes hostile when seeing Boruto's kama. From afar, Delta is likewise shocked, while Koji remains observant. The Konoha Shinobi and Kawaki are interrupted by Garo, who attacks and declares that he'll take back the vessel. From Garo's words, the Konoha Shinobi deduce Kawaki is the vessel. Garo and Kawaki trade insults as they begin the fight while the others watch. As Kawaki and Garo begin fighting, Boruto's Kama glows. Koji and Delta decide to not interfere for a moment. Garo and Kawaki exchange physical blows before Garo begins shooting at him with his mechanical arms. Kawaki blocks the first shot with 
with a manifested blade and dodges the others. He attacks with the manifested bits of weaponry from his body. They continue dealing blows, none of them doing lasting damage. The Konoha Shinobi watch in awe. When one of Garo's attacks knocks Kawaki down, Boruto tries to intervene, but Konohamaru stops him and protects him from Garo's counterattack. Kawaki's Kama activates, and Boruto reacts to it, activating as well. Kawaki wakes up and destroys one of Garo's arms with a blast from his Kama. Garo is stunned by Kawaki's increase in power and shoots at him. Kawaki absorbs it, which Mitsuki notes is exactly what Boruto did earlier. Garo continues shooting, either missing or his shots being absorbed until his shinobi war overheats. Kawaki powers up his next attack with the Kama and punches through Garo, his manifested weaponry piercing through him. Despite Garo's pleas, Kawaki blasts him at point blank. The explosion destroys Garo's upper body. Delta is pleased that Kawaki also blasted the Konoha Shinobi, but Koji tells her to take a closer look. Boruto protected the others by using his own Kama to absorb part of the explosion. Kawaki takes Boruto's command of his Kama as proof that they are part of Kara. Koji speculates that the resonance between the two Kama might be why Jigen is so invested in Kawaki and decides to gather more intel. Delta watches him. Kawaki's body steams, his Kama recedes, and he passes out. Katasuke believes he overheated and approaches to examine him. Koji intends to let them take Kawaki for now, but Delta believes that they should eliminate them because of what Garo told them. Koji says there's no point to concern themselves with intel leak after the discovery of the airship. The inners leave. Katasuke determines Kawaki's entire body has been modified with scientific ninja tools, to a much greater degree than our Garo, and considers it to be a work of art. Mitsuki wonders if Kawaki was built like him, but Katasuke contrasts Mitsuki's organic genetic engineering against Kawaki's inorganic remodeling. Chamaru leaves Mitsuki's cloak and licks Kawaki. They decide to take him back to Konoha. Kawaki wakes up in the presence of Naruto, Shikamaru, and Konohamaru. Naruto tells him he's in a safe place. Kawaki wakes up in a hospital room with Naruto, Shikamaru, and Konohamaru watching in. Despite Naruto's claim of safety, he attempts to run out through the window, but is stopped by Shikamaru with his shadow imitation technique, who points out that if they wanted to harm him, they would have done so already. Naruto properly introduces himself to Kawaki, who remains silent. Shikamaru argues against harboring Kawaki based on Konohamaru's report. Naruto counters that as a Jinchuriki, he might have been placed under the same strict security Shikamaru wants to place on Kawaki if it wasn't for the third Hokage's interference, but agrees that decision isn't his alone. During the Five Kage Summit, Katasuke and Naruto report what Konoha has learned about Kawaki. Through use of Shadow Clone, Naruto proposes to physically monitor Kawaki at all times, which the other Kage agree to support. Team 7 discusses Kawaki, and Boruto leaves to feed Mugino's turtle, who bites him. Konohamaru shows up to sort Mugino's belongings and is surprised to learn Boruto has been to Mugino's before. The two discuss and recall Mugino. Mugino's turtle doesn't bite Konohamaru, who decides to adopt it. Kawaki tries fleeing Naruto when he takes Kawaki home, but Naruto gets ahead of him every time. When Boruto arrives, he's surprised by Kawaki's presence, and Naruto explains that he'll be living with them for a while. Boruto shares his concerns with Naruto, who in turn shares his experience as a Jinchuriki as a reason not to mistreat Kawaki. Boruto tries talking to Kawaki, who flips a table and breaks Himawari's vase. Boruto admonishes him, he apologizes, and reveals his name. Hinata disposes of the broken vase, stressing to Himawari that what's important is the thoughtfulness she put into it. Boruto and Kawaki discuss over who gets to use the bathroom first, but it's already occupied by Naruto. He yells at them to go outside if they really need to go. They pee outside and begin fighting after trading insults. They activate their Kama, but Naruto creates a shadow clone from the bathroom to stop their fight. During a meal, Boruto comments on how unusual it is for Naruto to be at home all day, and reiterates he hasn't forgiven Kawaki for breaking Humawari's vase. When Hinata asks Kawaki what food he likes so she can make it for dinner, he says he doesn't know because no one has ever asked him. During training with Team 7, Boruto complains about Kawaki. Naruto, Sai, and Shikamaru discuss the investigation on Kara. Kawaki walks around the village, followed by Naruto. At the end of the day, Kawaki returns and has dinner with the Uzumaki family. The following day, Kawaki asks Boruto how he got his Kama. Boruto tells him about Momoshiki and in turn asks Kawaki how he got his. Kawaki recounts his experience being experimented on by Yamato and Jigen and how many children died from the same experiments. Naruto overhears them. Kawaki says that having gotten away from Kara, he wants to learn more about Kama so he can get rid of it, and wants to collaborate with Boruto so he can get rid of his as well. Boruto agrees to this, but stresses he still hasn't forgiven him for Himawari's vase. Boruto leaves, and Kawaki considers replacing the vase, so Boruto stops harping on him about it. Naruto offers to show him around the village. While Naruto is taking him for a walk in the village, Kawaki thinks to himself that he's using the Hokage for protection. Back home, Boruto learns that his father took Kawaki out to find a new vase. Kawaki notices the Hokage rock, which Naruto explains to him. They come across Sarada and Chocho buying snacks. Chocho is interested in Kawaki, and Sarada tries to be friendly by suggesting which snack Kawaki should have, which he ignores her suggestion. Naruto treats them in addition to buying snacks for himself and Kawaki. Kawaki is taken aback by how much he enjoys his snack. Naruto tells Kawaki to let her have a bite of his snack, which he has never had, but he refuses. A boy bumps into Kawaki, who transforms his arm to attack. Naruto stops this and prevents him from harming the boy. Kawaki advises the boy to be careful, telling him that there's danger everywhere. Sarada and Kawaki argue over his outburst. Naruto takes him to Yamanaka Flowers, where Ino greets them. Naruto discreetly informs her to keep the sensing unit on alert. He tells her that they're there for a flower vase. Kawaki picks one at random, causing Sarada to admonish him over his lack of effort and sincerity. Naruto explains the meaning behind making a proper choice. Kawaki picks the same vase, but backs up his choice with motive. Ino offers to add some flowers to the vase, but the stems trigger him, reminding him of the tubes in Amato's lab in Jigen, causing him to drop the vase, breaking it. Kawaki's 
Kawaki's comma begins to activate and Naruto calms him down, causing it to recede. Leaving the shop, Sarada tells Kawaki of her goal to be Hokage, so he can also count on her if he needs anything. Naruto takes Kawaki for lunch and they have ramen. Back home, Boruto acknowledges Kawaki's sincerity when he shows the new vase and offers him a glue tube to fix the old one. Koji and Delta arrive at the outskirts of Konoha. Koji informs her of the history and capabilities of the sensing unit, including their ability to detect previously unknown chakra. He crosses into the village without triggering a response, surprising Delta and angering her when he tells her to stay put. He begins looking for Kawaki. Delta is frustrated by Koji's ability to infiltrate Konoha without triggering a response as that puts him out of her oversight. At the Uzumaki household, Kawaki stares at the glue tube Boruto gave him. Sarada and Mitsuki visit Boruto, also wishing to get a look at Kawaki. Sarada asks Boruto how Kawaki is, recalling his outbursts when she spent time with him in Naruto. Naruto arrives and offers to postpone his sparring with Boruto over the visitors. Boruto says it's no problem and Naruto invites Kawaki to watch. Boruto and Naruto begin to spar, Kawaki recognizing when Boruto uses Shadow Clones. He tells Boruto to just use the Kama already, activating his so Boruto's activates in response but Boruto still can't activate it at will. Sparring resumes, Naruto and the spectators both noticing the increase in Boruto's performance. Boruto's lightning release is even strong enough to dispel one of Naruto's Shadow Clones. Boruto manages to trick Naruto with a Shadow Clone but ends up defeated. He's unsatisfied with his performance but Naruto credits him for fighting smarter. The two perform the Seal of Reconciliation which Sarada and Himori explain to Kawaki. Talking to Mitsuki later, Sarada feels inadequate thinking thinking about Boruto's progress and decides to train with her father to learn a jutsu that only she can perform. Mitsuki is concerned about the risks associated with these powers. Kawaki recalls Boruto and Naruto's sparring and compares it to his own abuse of training with Jigen. Kawaki asks Naruto about his training with Boruto and Naruto invites him to join next time. Kawaki says he can't wield chakra and is no shinobi, so Naruto explains the nature of chakra to him. Kawaki asks about shadow clones, believing using them to beat himself up to be an appropriate form of dealing with frustrations. Naruto advises against it, having done so himself in the past, and suggests having a rival. Boruto overhears them and decides against complaining about the vase again. At the Uchiha household, Sarada and Sasuke compliment Sakura's cooking, and Sarada asks her father to train her to use the Chidori. The next day, Kawaki collects the broken vase and prepares to glue it back together. He's spotted by Koji, who spies on him through the eyes of one of his toads. Kawaki decides to fix the vase he broke. Himawari places flowers in the vase Kawaki brought. She finds Kawaki trying to glue her vase back together. He thinks that doing so is impractical, and Himawari thanks him for buying a new vase, finding it enough. Boruto listens to them. Koji watches Kawaki through his toad and thinks about his next steps. Code asks Amato about Jigen's whereabouts. Amato explains Jigen is recovering and asks not to be disturbed. He tells Code he's going through Kawaki's file looking for clues that a traitor might have accessed them, and shares his concerns about Jigen's relaxed disposition and apparent detachment to the vessel. Code assures him that Jigen is still very much invested in Kawaki, having mentioned it impossible for him to escape Jigen, even though he doesn't understand exactly what it means. He suggests Jigen already knows who the traitor is, which angers Amato for doing so much work for nothing. Amato asks Code to check on Boro, assuring him that Jigen would be pleased. When Code asks about Koji, Amato says Delta is already on it and wonders himself what Koji's doing. Enraged by Koji's attitude, Delta deploys her spy drone, its lack of chakra meaning won't be sensed. Despite the animosity between them, Boruto agrees to help Kawaki learn more about the Kama, finding his argument to be sound. Naruto listens to them. He and Himawari watch Boruto and Kawaki activate their Kama and begin fighting. Naruto explains Kawaki's abilities to Himawari. Satisfied with Boruto's performance, Kawaki fires a blast at him, wanting him to absorb it with his Kama. Boruto fails to do so, but isn't hurt much. With the sparring over, Naruto has them perform the Seal of Reconciliation. They both experience pain in their hands, but Boruto has a vision of Momoshiki. Through his toad, Koji notices Boruto's hand healing and speculates on it. Delta finds Kawaki through her drone and decides to get him herself. Using jets on her legs, she flies to the village. The Konoha Barrier team detects her and Ino alerts Naruto. He gives her instructions. Koji sees Delta in flight. Naruto warns the kids about the incoming danger and wants them to leave. Delta arrives before they can go. Naruto asks Kawaki about Delta's identity and Kawaki confirms that she's a Kara Inner. Delta is aware of who Naruto is and asks him to step aside, which he refuses. Kawaki warns them of the inner's strength and Boruto notes his apprehension. Delta decides to kill Naruto who instructs Boruto and Kawaki on what to do next. Naruto and Delta begin fighting, exchanging physical blows and until Naruto gets an opening. He attempts to lend her a Sengon, but Delta absorbs it with her modified eyes. She attacks him by transforming her legs, similar to Kawaki, and confirms her body has been extensively enhanced with scientific ninja tools. Naruto dons his chakra cloak and resumes fighting. He blocks her kick, but Delta transforms her leg, injuring Naruto. She breaks the leg with chakra arms and she accuses him of being as much of a monster as she is while regenerating her leg. Concerned, Boruto tries intervening, but Naruto warns him against it. He threatens Delta, goading her into keeping engaged with him. He asks Delta what Kawaki is to her, and she realizes he's trying to trick her into revealing information. She removes the spike on him, and he stands up, healing the wound. Boruto is relieved, and Kawaki stresses that they need to leave. Naruto and Delta resume fighting, and when they're locked in place, Delta releases the Rasengan she absorbed from her eye. She makes use of her modified body to attack. Naruto destroys her legs with a lava release Rasen Shuriken, but she merely regrows them, so he strategizes 
strategizes how he should hit her. Boruto wants to create an opening for Naruto to attack, but Kawaki reminds him of Naruto's orders, and explains that by staying away, it allows Naruto to go all out, and adds that Naruto is the one leading the fight, as to keep attacks from coming in their direction. Delta comments on Naruto's abilities, but when he suggests that she surrender, she unleashes beams from her eyes. Naruto dodges them, and Kawaki is concerned, explaining that they were designed to counter regenerative abilities. Naruto deduces that such an attack must be chakra taxing, but Delta counters that it only has to hit once. She tries getting close to him to land her beams, but he keeps dodging. She spots the children through her drone and sends a beam their way. Naruto punches her, knocking the beam off course. She attacks Boruto, throwing him Naruto's way and grabs Himawari. Boruto activates his Kama and throws a vanishing Rasengan her direction. Despite it disappearing, Delta is able to spot it with her drone and absorbs it. She throws Himawari in the air to force Naruto to get in the way of her beams. When the smoke clears, they're shocked to see that Kawaki blocked the beams with his transformed arm. Kawaki tells Boruto that they're even on the vase. Delta is baffled by Kawaki's attitude, growing more furious about the situation. Naruto instructs Boruto to take care of Kawaki and Himawari. Delta lashes out at Kawaki for endangering a body that, as a vessel, isn't his. She doesn't answer Naruto's question, so he dares her to kill him. The two trade several blows as Boruto, Kawaki, and Himawari watch. Naruto reminds her of his threat, saying that it's too late now that she hurt Kawaki, so he'll go after everyone in Kara. He gets close to her, so she fires her eye beams, which he blocks with a big ball Rasengan. Delta begins absorbing it, so Naruto ups the ante by growing it into an ultra big ball Rasengan. Boruto realizes his strategy. Delta mocks Naruto for thinking she can't absorb bigger jutsu. Kawaki finds the strategy futile, but Boruto corrects him that it's not what Naruto is doing. Delta realizes Naruto's plan, and Boruto explains to Kawaki that he's trying to overtax her absorption. Her shinobi wear overheats, her eyes ceasing to function. Naruto explains that he realized when she fired back his Rasengan, it meant it was stored somewhere, and such storage would have a limit. Naruto boasts about his chakra reserves, and Delta tries physically attacking him. Naruto dodges it and grows his jutsu into a super ultra big ball Rasengan, landing it on her. It caves a crater in the ground where Delta lays defeated. The children celebrate. Naruto expresses his desire to have her question so Kawaki urges to have her killed immediately. Delta's body sounds off and self-destructs. Naruto takes the kids out of the blast radius. Delta's drone retreats, witnessed by Koji through his toad, who comments that Naruto's power still isn't enough. He's convinced the key will be uncovering the secrets of the Kama through Boruto. Elsewhere, a couple argues over doctors being unable to treat their sick son. The village is visited by Boro and his followers, where he cures those who are sick. Boro talks them into believing that salvation can be achieved through the infinite Tsukiyomi, bringing them into his cult. Later, Code visits Boro and delivers him Amato's message, telling him to come in for maintenance. Boro claims he's busy and grows aggravated when Code asks if it's fun to deceive people. Code is willing to use force to bring Boro for maintenance, so he relents. At Kara's headquarters, Jigen finishes recharging, Amato noting that it's becoming more frequent. He reports that there's no news about the vessel from either Koji or Delta. From his reaction, Jigen concludes that he still hasn't uncovered their mole, which Amato vows to do. Katasuke observes Kawaki's treated wound, which he has fitted for a prosthetic. Naruto questions if he can't restore his arm, but Katasuke denies it, as the technology at his disposal isn't as advanced as Kara's, so making a prosthetic for Kawaki will take time. Naruto suggests using one of the prototypes made for him. Katasuke explains prosthetics are made to react to the wearer's chakra, so Naruto decides to keep constantly molding chakra while he's awake to keep it functioning. He dismisses Kawaki's concern by pointing out the situation is an example of chakra as a connecting force. Boruto comments on how cool it looks and jokes about wanting one. Kawaki offers to blast off his hand, wondering if it would get rid of Boruto's kama. Boruto explains that he was joking, while Naruto and Katasuke laugh. Amato finishes performing maintenance on Boro's body, who complains about it. Delta's drone arrives and connects to the terminal. Amato enters a command, and the terminal downloads her consciousness onto one of the two spared Delta bodies. She kicks open her container, breaking the lid, cursing at Naruto and disparaging Amato. Boro teases her about her defeat. Delta recounts the events for Boro and Code, who are surprised that Kawaki protected Naruto's daughter. Jigen quells the discussion and reminds that he told her to follow Koji's lead and asks where he is. She answers that he's still in Konoha now, laying low, and that he allowed Konoha to take Kawaki to gather more intel on Boruto Uzumaki, who's also got a comma. This revelation surprises everyone. She adds that both Boruto and Kawaki got a power boost when their comma resonated. Jigen considers Momoshiki's final act. Naruto discusses Kawaki with Sasuke, Sai, and Shikamaru. Sasuke agrees that keeping Kawaki away from Kare is a priority, but Shikamaru won't budge and Kawaki having a security detail assigned to him. He tasks Konohamaru with keeping an eye on Kawaki. Koji keeps watching the Uzumaki household through his toad. Kawaki asks Naruto why he's doing so much for him. Naruto says it's hardly anything, considering he saved Himawari, and adds that Kawaki reminds him of himself. Kawaki asks to be taught ninjutsu, which Naruto agrees to. He also begins gluing Himawari's vase back together. While training Kawaki, Naruto, Boro, and Mitsuki consistently have to remind him not to use specific ninja tools or rely on his kama. Sasuke prepares to train Sarada to learn the Chidori and gives her a demonstration. Boruto overhears Code Namato, learning that there is a traitor and offers to kill everyone and assemble new inners. Sarada practices the Chidori and is given pointers by Sasuke before he is summoned by Sai. 
She runs into Boruto, Kawaki, and Mitsuki, who are buying extreme Shinobi Picture Scrolls cards. Boruto is sullen, getting another card of his father, and Kawaki gets a rare fourth Hokage card, which he offers to trade with Boruto. At night, while Naruto is sleeping, Kawaki finishes fixing the vase, but discovers a leak when he pours water in it. He means to go outside to look for a missing piece, but Kurama manifests himself, telling Kawaki not to leave Naruto's side. Kawaki is startled by Kurama's appearance, who introduces itself and explains that watching him while Naruto sleeps was a request by the five Kage. He has some concept of tailed beasts from reading Kara's files and assumes that having Kurama sealed within him is why Naruto leads Konoha. Kurama corrects him, explaining the parallels between Naruto's life in Kawaki's, and summarizing all the antagonism it posed to Naruto throughout the years, from causing him to hurt those close to him, to how the village mistreated him for being Kurama's Jinchuriki. It comments on the irony of Naruto's use of the Shadow Clone technique and his loneliness, Kawaki himself recalling Naruto's words on the Jutsu. Kurama continues, mentioning how it saw Naruto fill his heart up through the years, and now he's at his strongest when protecting his friends. Kawaki tears up learning about Naruto, and Kurama tells him it's pretty late, so he should probably be looking for the missing base piece the next day. The following day, Kawaki recalls how Jigen trained him and learns walking up trees from Naruto. Sarada and Mitsuki watch from afar, and while sympathetic to Kawaki's circumstances, she is jealous of the treatment he gets from Naruto. Mitsuki points out that it's natural for that to happen, as Naruto treats everyone in the village like family, even willing to let him be a part of it. After training, Naruto asks Boruto about the pain from Kama. Boruto says it hasn't hurt in a while, and Kawaki reveals he hasn't hurt in a while either. Determined not to be outdone, Sarada comments that Sasuke has been training her, and Boruto asks her to relay the messages he wants to train with him again. Boruto invites Kawaki to train with them, but he refuses, saying there's something he has to do by himself at home. Boruto tells him that while he doesn't know how Kawaki feels, he's not alone anymore. Kawaki reveals it was Jigen who gave him his Kama, and he knows all about it. Boruto supports Kawaki, saying that they'll defeat Jigen together. Sarada continues practicing the Chidori on the waterfall. Sai and Shikamaru discuss whether Kawaki can be trusted and the intel that Konohamaru recovered from the airship. In them, there was a coordinate that can only be accessed through space-time ninjutsu, which they can't ignore even if it might be a trap. Sai reveals he already sent Sasuke to investigate. Sasuke arrives at the destination and notices carved walls. Boro preaches about salvation and Otsutsuki rule to his cult. Boro investigates the wreckage of Victor's crashed airship and collects some evidence. In Kara's dimension, Sasuke examines the carved walls, triggering a hologram of Kinshiki Otsutsuki. Boro returns to his cult and preaches salvation by the Otsutsuki through the infinite Tsukiyomi. He alleges that the shinobi of the five great shinobi countries murdered Kaguya Otsutsuki and lied that the infinite Tsukiyomi was a calamity. Sasuke discovers holograms for Momoshiki and Kaguya. He notices how the carvings are arranged in pairs, deducing that Kaguya also came with a partner, triggering his hologram. Boro takes children with questions to Inori, who claims to corroborate Boro's preaching. Inori's brother arrives, incapacitating two cultists with water release, intent on rescuing her. Inori doesn't listen to him. Boro claims that he was given an indestructible body by the god he met, and gives Inori's brother a chance to believe his words. Inori's brother slices through Boro with water release, but he simply regenerates. Seeing him regenerate makes the children believe him. Boro has Inori take them away and give them new clothes. Inori's brother refuses to believe Boro, who extends his hand, and he dies. Boro looks at what he collected from the airship and wonders how Koji will explain himself. Boruto practices shuriken jutsu and discusses Kawaki with Mitsuki, who advises him to be careful with the Kama since they know so little about it. Sasuke investigates some roars and discovers a restrained ten tails, much to his shock. He hides as Jigen arrives, noting his Kama. He watches as Jigen absorbs chakra from the ten tails and sprouts a horn like the one he saw in Kaguya's partner's hologram. Jigen recedes the horn and plans to visit the two vessels. Going back home, Mitsuki asks Boruto what he'll do if the Kama is permanent. Boro remains unconcerned, choosing to focus on defeating Jigen as his mission. Watching Jigen, Sasuke wants to inform Naruto as soon as possible. Kawaki watches the amended vase, and Boruto tells him he's going to train and to get along with his father. Naruto wakes up, and Kurama tells him it had to intervene with Kawaki, so it will go to sleep for a bit. Kawaki searches for a missing piece in the vase, but Naruto tells him he not cleans every day, so he's unlikely to find it. Naruto asks him if it's necessary, as it's almost completely restored. Kawaki stresses that there's no point to a leaky vase, and that such comments are why Boruto yells at him. Naruto comments that he got himself another strict son, but Kawaki quietly says he's not his son. Shikadai beats Iwabi at Extreme Shinobi Picture Scroll, so he has to treat Team 10 to a meal. Team 5 and 10 discuss the recent lack of big missions, whether Kawaki can be trusted, and their opinions on him. Koji continues to surveil Kawaki, noting a lack of action since Delta's last attack. He wonders why Jigen hasn't made a move, since through Delta he must know that Boruto also has a comma. Sarada picks up flowers her mother ordered at Yamanaka Flowers and buys some herself. Boruto loses his footing during training, and Mitsuki notices his comma has activated. As he can't willingly activate it yet, and knowing the circumstances in which it activates, he becomes concerned for Kawaki. Hinata and Himawari leave for groceries. As Sarada leaves her shop, Ino detects and is shaken by a sinister chakra. Kawaki's comma releases a massive chakra, turning into a portal through which Jigen appears. Koji watches through his toad. Boruto's comma spreads further, and he and Mitsuki rush back to the Uzumaki house. Team 5 and 10 notice them. Koji is surprised by Jigen showing up in person and questions the need for a retrieval mission if he could portal directly to Kawaki. 
Jigen notices his toad, and Koji determines Jigen was actually investigating him. Jigen nonchalantly states his purpose to collect Kawaki and wishes Boruto was there as well. Naruto attacks, but is kicked aside by Jigen, who manifests rods to pin him down. The guards attempt to aid Naruto, despite his warnings to step back. They're both pinned as well. Jigen threatens Kawaki and attempts to convince him that the hand they gave him is a monitoring device, in a sense no different than the Kama. Kawaki continues to deny him as he disparages Naruto in the village. His Kama spreads further, manifesting a horn, much to Jigen's surprise. Kurama berates Naruto for taking so long to remove the rods, and Naruto enters his chakra mode, kicking Jigen aside and checking on Kawaki. Jigen spreads his Kama and begins fighting Naruto. Naruto dodges the rods, but gets hit by one getting Konohamaru out of the way. Jigen prepares a blast, much to Koji's surprise, and Kawaki offers to return with him if he lets Naruto go unharmed. Jigen agrees to it, but Naruto is unwilling to let Kawaki give himself up, so Jigen portals himself and Naruto to a different dimension. He intends to leave Naruto stranded, but Sasuke arrives, changing his plans to deal with both of them then and there. Jigen considers it unfortunate for Naruto and Sasuke to have met him together, making their battle necessary. Naruto and Sasuke continue it fortunate. If they defeat him early, and their location makes it possible for him to go all out. Koji observes them having snuck a toad through the portal. Boruto's Kama recedes. Sarada arrives at the Uzumaki house and finds the remnants of Jigen's attacks. She checks in on Konohamaru and Kawaki tells her that Naruto was taken away. Ino confers with the Konoha barrier team confirming that Naruto and Jigen's chakra have disappeared, and orders them to continue monitoring the situation. She updates Shikamaru who issues orders. Jigen fights Naruto and Sasuke, manifesting rods to both attack and defend. Sasuke asks Naruto to buy him time, which Naruto does with Shadow Clones. Sasuke observes Jigen and his jutsu, as he disappears and reappears between attacks. He determines that Jigen is shrinking and then returning to normal size, both himself and the rods. Jigen compliments Sasuke's abilities and decides he should kill him first. Sasuke warns that there's another secret to him, but Jigen attacks. Naruto blocks his rods with a big ball Rasengan. Jigen shrinks himself, but Sasuke warns Naruto where he is. Naruto attacks with a big ball Rasengan, which Jigen can still absorb while shrunken down. Naruto counted on it, so Sasuke can attack him while absorbing the attack. Jigen portals out of the way. He thanks them for exposing a weakness of his ability and manifests a horn, which Sasuke recognizes. The medic corps takes the injured shinobi from the Uzumaki house as Boruto and Mitsuki arise. Kawaki tells them and Sarada it was Jigen who also took Naruto away. Kawaki wants to go look for Naruto. Mitsuki points out that Naruto should be okay as Kawaki's prosthetic, which relies on his chakra, is still working. Sasuke updates Naruto on the Otsutsuki and Tentails until he discovered, determining his goal is to drain the planet's chakra. He manifests his complete body Susano, and Naruto manifests Kurama. Jigen blocks and avoids their attacks and kicks Sasuke out of Susano. Jigen pins him with rods, but Sasuke switches places with him. Naruto attacks with Kurama's tails, but Jigen avoids and pins them as well. He punches Naruto out of Kurama. He baits Jigen with a Rasengan, but Sasuke switches places, intending to behead Jigen, who protects himself by manifesting rods from his neck. Sasuke attempts to burn Jigen with a Matarasu, who merely absorbs him with a Kama. Sasuke is concerned that he won't have enough chakra to leave the dimension with his space-time jutsu. Jigen notices a crack on his body, noting it's too much power for this body to contain, stressing his need for Kawaki. He decides to wrap things up and stabs them from below and begins to drop a lid on the battlefield. As it would take too much time and effort to kill Naruto with Kurama, Jigen opts to seal him. Naruto taunts him about the crack on his body, but Kurama tells him not to give Jigen a reason to change his mind. Jigen asks about Boruto and how his Kama is maturing. He moves in to kill Sasuke, but Naruto creates shadow clones to give Sasuke time to escape. He convinces Sasuke to go, who portals back home just to be found by Sakura. Jigen finishes dropping the lid and shrinks the seal. His body cracks further and he cries. Ishiki Otsutsuki dismisses his pain and worth as a vessel and portals away. Watching through his toad, Koji deems the entire affair quite informative. Kawaki's prosthetic hand stops working, causing him to drop a photo of Naruto to his shock. Kawaki, Sarada, Boruto, and Mitsuki are stunned by the implication of Naruto's chakra ceasing to make the prosthetic hand work. Shikamaru paralyzes Kawaki and has Tatsuki put a barrier up around the Uzumaki house, and orders other shinobi to look for traces of Naruto and the enemy. He releases his hold on Kawaki and asks what happened. Wishing to save Naruto, Kawaki explains that Jigen suddenly appeared after his Kama hurt and formed a pattern he had never seen. Shikamaru comments in the Konoha barrier team's report and determines it to be space-time ninjutsu. Sarada is confused why Jigen would take Naruto if he's after Kawaki, but he says that it's because Naruto protects him. They deduce that if Jigen had simply dropped Naruto in another dimension, he'd be back by now, so they're either fighting or Naruto has defeated Jigen and he has no way back himself. Boruto suggests Sasuke, but Shikamaru reveals that he had been returned critically injured and is looked after by the medic corps. They won't be able to retrieve Sasuke's intel until he regains consciousness. Shikamaru asks if Kawaki is holding something back, revealing he's never trusted Kawaki and suspects that he's a Kara spy. In Naruto's absence, it falls to Shikamaru as to what to do with Kawaki, so he decides to keep him under house arrest until they can prove he's not a spy. Boruto finds it extreme, but Kawaki agrees. At Kara's headquarters, Amato tends to Jigen and determines it'll take 10 days for his chakra to fully recharge. Code is incredulous, someone pushed Jigen so much, Delta remains silent. Amato asks about Naruto, who Jigen reveals he has sealed. Jigen admits to getting carried away by the progress of Kawaki's Kama, with both he and Amato agreeing it's due to its resonance with Boruto. 
Naruto's comma. He believes both of them will become powerful Otsutsuki and that a giant god tree will grow, claiming all life on the planet, its chakra fruit making all their wishes a reality. As he retreats to recover, Jigen orders Code to guard the Ten Tails and asks about Boro. Code says he is neither here nor there with his cult. Jigen wants Code to relay orders for Boro to guard Naruto's seal. Delta is mad there's nothing for her to do, Jigen telling her that there's no need for her powers at the moment and that it'll all be over soon. Boruto and Shikamaru continue to argue over whether Kawaki is a spy. A Kara operative informs Koji that Boro wishes to speak with him. Boro contacts him through Genjutsu and asks about his inaction and lack of reports. Koji claims to have reported everything to Jigen, who must have chosen not to relay the intel to them. Koji keeps up his facade, even when Boro shows him one of his toads he recovered in the crashed airship. Koji claims he knew the airship would crash because Jigen was suspicious about it, and he was using his toad to monitor it. He reveals that Jigen personally came to Konoha and asks why he didn't deal with Koji if he was a traitor since he was so close. They discuss the progress of Boruto's comma before Boro is called away. Kawaki wonders why Naruto was so caring about him and Sarada shares her opinion. One of Shikamaru's subordinates brings back the repaired vase, which Boruto tries to use as proof that Kawaki isn't a spy, but Shikamaru refuses. Kawaki's prosthetic hand resumes working, Naruto's chakra being proof he's still alive. Sensing Naruto's chakra, Kawaki asks Boruto for help, and they use their comma to open a portal like Jigen's. The children want to go rescue Naruto, but Shikamaru paralyzes them, having not allowed it. Kawaki absorbs Shikamaru's jutsu with his chakra, and Mitsuki takes the other two through the portal. As he leaves, Kawaki tells Shikamaru that he's getting his proof. Kawaki Arc, Otsutsuki Awakening Boruto, Sarada, Mitsuki, and Kawaki arrive at another destination. On the lookout for Jigen, they're called out by Boro, and he and Kawaki recognize each other. Kawaki clarifies to Boruto that he isn't Jigen, but that in some ways, Boro is worse. Shikamaru is stressed about how little they know about the enemy and the hopes the children come back safely. Boro notes that this place is only accessible through space-time ninjutsu and asks how Kawaki managed it. Kawaki ignores this and asks about Naruto. Boro teases him, revealing Naruto is sealed in the container that he's holding. He throws the container at them for them to examine. He reveals that only Jigen can undo the seal and he can't vouch for the safety of the contents if it's forced to be opened or destroyed. Kawaki confirms Naruto's chakra is inside the container, sensing it with his prosthetic hand. When they turn their attention back to Boro, he's vanished. Sarada detects Boro's attack from below, a surge of acid. Kawaki notices the acid engulfing Naruto's seal and absorbs it with his comma. Boro attacks Kawaki while he's distracted with the seal, so Boruto absorbs the next acid attack. Boro confirms Delta's intel of Boruto having a comma, and Boruto accuses him of being a coward, only attacking from a distance and sneaking around. Boro challenges Boruto to come at him if he's not all talk. Boro weaves hand seals as Boruto rushes at him despite Sarada's warnings. Boruto aims a Rasengan at Boro, and Kawaki pushes him out of the way of the next acid attack. Boruto's Rasengan gets bigger when Kawaki touches him, so he pushes him at Boro, landing it. Boro regenerates the damage, much to everyone's amazement. Kawaki wants to injure him so much that his regeneration can't keep up. Sarada notices him weaving seals again. Kawaki hits him with his modified arm, throwing him around and teeing him up for Boruto's Rasengan. Boruto falls to the ground, and Kawaki suddenly struggles to move as well. Boro chides them for their recklessness. Kawaki notices a dark mist from Boro's ninjutsu, and he can't absorb it with his comma. Boro kicks him aside. Sarada speculates on the seals Boro has been weaving, and why they can't absorb this mist when they were able to absorb his attacks earlier. Boro addresses Boruto as Momoshiki's vessel, and thanks him for eliminating the time constraints on Kara's plan. Mitsuki attacks with a wind release, pushing Boro aside, but his his mist quickly gathers again. Boro boasts that his mist is already eating away at their bodies. Mitsuki attacks with a lightning strike, which Boro blocks with a water wall. Mitsuki's actual snakes go through the wall and wrap around Boro, who pulls them and uses them to throw Mitsuki at the ground. As the snakes let go, one of them has envenomed him, but he simply weaves seals and heals. Mitsuki is concerned with prolonged exposure to the mist, and Boro prepares to kill him as he's only interested in the vessels. Sarada punches a boulder at him, giving herself and Mitsuki time to get to Boruto and Kawaki and retreat. Boro is certain that Kawaki will return as he seals the Hokage. The children discuss Boro's jutsu. Sarada saw him weave seals, so she knows he's using ninjutsu. Boruto shares how the mist makes them feel, and Kawaki explains that Kama can only absorb chakra-based matter, leading them to conclude that Boro's jutsu is physical matter. Boruto and Kawaki pass out. Mitsuki has the snakes bite them and shares his hypothesis hypothesis with Sarada, that the mist is a virus. Boruto and Kawaki wake up, able to move again, and since Boro is using a real virus for his jutsu, Sarada and Mitsuki deduce that he's using scientific ninja tools. Mitsuki nominates Sarada for team captain over her strategic retreat. Sarada addresses Boro, saying that they have figured out his jutsu. Boro preaches how his virus can be used to make people believe in miracles to save them from a hellish world. He attacks with his lava release, and Sarada counters with her fire release, and keeps her distance to avoid the virus. Boruto and Kawaki discuss the power boost that happened to the Rasengan earlier. Sarada attacks with her fire release again, and Boro blocks it with water release. He circles her, surrounding her with the virus mist. She tries to jump up, but Boro expected this and punches her back down at the mist. He picks her up by the neck, but is surprised when she's still able to move as she obscures his vision with a point-blank fire release and lands a punch. She signals for Boruto and Kawaki to attack, their comma activated, surprising him once again. He weaves hand seals. 
Boruto lands a Rasengan, which is augmented by resonance with Kawaki, destroying much of Boro's upper body, including his head. Boruto comments the use of antibodies works, showing the snake bites on his arm. Boro regenerates from the damage, shocking them as well. Team 7 is shocked by Boro's regeneration. Boro boasts of having a body surpassing that of all humans that Shinobi can't hope to defeat. He's puzzled by Boruto's comment of antibody use against his virus, and realizes that Mitsuki harvested them from the blood he took when the snake bit him. Mitsuki explains his line of reasoning. Boruto taunts him about his virus no longer working, and Sarada warns Boruto not to let his guard down. They get into formation for a pincer attack. Boro notices Kawaki's attention to Naruto's seal, so he rushes at it, breaking their formation. He moves past the seal, releasing more viruses, and then aiming shuriken at Kawaki. Kawaki blocks the shuriken with his transformed arm, but these sparks ignite a flammable substance mixed in with the virus. He still checks the kettle containing Naruto, Boro commenting negatively how Kawaki has changed. Boruto chastises Kawaki for his recklessness, but Kawaki is unconcerned as he can quickly heal from those injuries. Boro thinks Kawaki will have to be trained from scratch, and says he'll take Boruto as well for his comma. Boruto and Mitsuki charge. Kawaki holds Sarada back to ask her a favor. Boruto's Rasengan destroys Boro's hand, which regenerates in time for a counterattack. Sarada understands Kawaki's request, but can't abandon her teammates. She reasons that with the flammable substance, fire release and lightning release are no longer options. She attacks with Shuriken, but Boro melts them with his lava release. Mitsuki elongates his arm and holds Boro in place for Kawaki to blast him. Boro's lower half is destroyed, but he still regenerates. They wonder how to deal with it. Kawaki asks Boruto and Mitsuki to attack relentlessly with him, Boruto knowing he has a plan. They charge ahead while Kawaki reminds Sarada that they're counting on her. Sarada recalls Kawaki's earlier explanation about the limits of Boro's scientific tools and the requirements of a core for regeneration of the degree Boro has exhibited. Sarada observes Boro with her Sharingan, looking for clues where his core might be. Mitsuki immobilizes Boro with his snakes, but he releases more flammable substance and ignites it. Sarada wonders how there can be such a sizable core consisting of all the body parts they've already destroyed. Boro sends a burst of flammable substance at Mitsuki when he attacks him with lightning release. He weaves seals just before Kawaki's blast destroys his head, and Sarada notices something moving inside him. She notices it moving again when Boruto lands a Rasengan. Boro recalls Koji's intel and intends to capture Boruto as well as Kawaki. Sarada knows where Boro's core is, but can't inform the others without alerting Boro. She goes through her jutsu and determines only one is fast enough to strike before Boro has a chance to move the core again. Kawaki absorbs a fire release from Boro aimed at Mitsuki and fires back a blast of his own, which Boro dodges. Boro's next attack hits both of them. Sarada is concerned that reading Boro's movements wrong will leave her open and that she's never used it in battle before, but begins using Chidori. Boruto notices Sarada and uses smoke bombs for a ruse with the vanishing Rasengan, destroying Boro's arm. Sarada's Chidori hits where she wants. Mitsuki explains the Chidori to Kawaki. Sarada destroys Boro's core. Boro's scientific ninja tools go haywire and swell up, going on a rampage. As Boro can't fight anymore, they move to rescue Naruto. Kawaki suggests to Boruto that they use their Kama to gate the space inside the seal with where they are now, similar to how they arrived in this dimension. They're able to release Naruto from the seal. They're concerned with Naruto being unconscious, but Kawaki points out how his prosthetic hand still works, so Naruto should be okay. Mitsuki is knocked out by Boro's newly grown giant tentacles. They try to counterattack, but Boro's size makes his attacks too powerful, knocking out Kawaki and incapacitating Sarada. He begins punching down at Boruto. Boruto is suddenly no longer on the ground, but floating in the air, possessed by Momoshiki and speaking with his voice, calling Boro an inferior creature. Recognizing Momoshiki as an Otsutsuki, Boro attacks, but Momoshiki destroys his arm and delivers a kick that sends him flying. Noticing how chakra-depleted Boruto is, Momoshiki lands by Naruto and absorbs some of his chakra. He resumes kicking Boro around. Mitsuki regains consciousness just in time to see Momoshiki kill Boro with a gigantic Rasengan. Kawaki also regains consciousness. Momoshiki comments that Boruto is still ways away from losing everything as Boruto's Kama recedes. Mitsuki catches Boruto as he falls. Boruto wakes up with no recollection of what happened. Mitsuki and Sarada are concerned by his Kama. Two days later, Naruto wakes up in the hospital and is informed what happened. Boruto rushes to inform Kawaki and Naruto asks about Sasuke. Sakura informs Sasuke that Naruto woke up. Katasuke speculates that Kawaki's body might be rejecting the prosthetic and Kawaki refuses painkillers that would dull his senses. Katasuke is unable to think of a treatment as Kawaki's body is beyond his understanding, but, but Kawaki is unconcerned. Boruto arrives with news of Naruto's awakening. He takes Kawaki to see Naruto, who is also being visited by Sasuke, Sai, Shikamaru, Sarada, and Mitsuki. They all coordinate what they know. Shikamaru asks for confirmation that Jigen isn't Otsutsuki. Sasuke reveals that Jigen had a ten tails hidden in another dimension, which he can no longer access. Sai speculates that they might have changed its coordinates. Boruto details how Boro fought, and that Sarada successfully used Chidori against him. Sarada explains what Boro said about making people believe in miracles with this virus. Kawaki explains that all Kara members, including himself, were modified by a scientist named Amato. He also reveals one more Kara inner, Code, though he knows nothing about his abilities. Shikamaru finds Kawaki's lack of knowledge strange and asks if he knows why he's being called a vessel. Boruto recalls Delta saying that Kawaki's body didn't belong to him. Kawaki explains many others were experimented on alongside him and died. Boruto confesses to not remembering the end of the fight with Boro. Sarada and Mitsuki exchange looks. Sakura arrives and insists Naruto must rest. Kawaki calls Boruto aside and tells him how he grew a horn when his comet expanded. 
Boruto recalls Momoshiki's words. Back in her room, Sarada details Boruto's defeat of Boruto to Sasuke. Mitsuki reveals Boruto called Boruto Momoshiki's vessel. They speculate that the Kama is a way for Otsutsuki to resurrect themselves, but Sasuke believes Jigen himself is a vessel for another entity. Shigadai and Inojin arrive at the hospital, bringing Tayaki for Kawaki as a thank you for protecting Naruto. Kawaki is amazed at the custard one which Sarada recommended before. They play extreme shinobi picture scrolls. Sumire arrives and stresses Kawaki has to rest. The others leave and Kawaki asks Sumire why they call her class rep. She explains that they're from the same class in the academy. He asks her for the painkillers. She says that Naruto was worried about him and suggests Kawaki should visit him. He overhears Shikamaru stressing the danger of another attack through Kawaki's comma to Naruto. At home, Boruto ponders on his comma and Momoshiki's words. At the hospital, Kawaki thinks about everyone who has been nice to him in Konoha. In Konoha, Kawaki wakes up from a nightmare where Jigen attacked his village and killed everyone. Himawari asks Boruto where Kawaki is as he's not home. Boruto finds him on the roof by himself. Kawaki asks about Konohamaru. Boruto tells him he'll be in the hospital a while longer and not to blame himself for it. Kawaki remains pensive during breakfast. After learning that Konoha knows about their ten tails, Jigen had its coordinates changed and orders Code to guard it. Delta informs Jigen that Boro is dead, having investigated it after receiving no further communication from him. She also found the remains of the Hokage seal with him absent. Jigen speculates that Sasuke is responsible, but Delta believes it was someone much stronger. Jigen sends Code on his task and orders Delta to return. Koji returns to Kara's headquarters and meets Amato. He informs Koji of Jigen's condition and that the other inners are away. They mean for Koji to kill Jigen. Amato meets with Koji after gathering enough resources to enable him to keep working elsewhere. Koji summons a toad for Amato to leave. Delta arrives and tries to stop them from leaving. Amato issues a shutdown command causing Delta to fall unconscious. Koji gives him directions and reverse summons his toad with Amato inside. Amato arrives at the outskirts of Konoha. Koji proceeds inside the headquarters. Team 10 trains, motivated by their failure to capture the intruder overseen by Moegi. She leaves to get them lunch. Amato praises their training and requests an audience with Shikamaru. Shigadai paralyzes him, but Amato breaks free with a scientific ninja tool. He drugs Shigadai and puts a collar around his neck. Inijin contacts Ino, informing her of Shigadai's situation and requesting communication to Shikamaru. Katasuke reports to Naruto that he'll need Kara's technology to repair Kawaki's body. The best he can do for now is the prosthetic which Kawaki's body is projecting. Ino contacts Shikamaru and informs him that Shigadai has been captured by Amato, who strapped a bomb through his neck. Moegi returns with lunch and is startled by Shigadai's capture. She restrains Amato with Earth Release and backup arrives. Amato detonates a bomb like the one on Shigadai on a tree branch with a voice command, and reveals that the one on Shigadai is set to explode in 48 hours. Under Sai's order, Moegi releases her jutsu. Amato apologizes for his drastic measures, but stresses that time is critical and requires an audience with Shigamaru. Shigamaru talks to him through Ino's jutsu. Amato wants to talk to Shigamaru because he has decision-making authority if the Hokage is unavailable, which he believes to be the case, knowing of Naruto's loss to Jigen. Shigamaru takes this knowledge as proof of Amato's Kara relationship. He asks Ino to connect the others into the conversation and reveals to Amato that Naruto has been recovered. Kawaki confirms Amato's identity. Amato reveals his wish to defect to Konoha in exchange for providing intel on Kara, Jigen, the Tentails, and the Otsutsuki, as well as releasing Shikadai. Shikamaru is furious, and Kawaki is incredulous that Amato would leave Kara. Naruto is willing to talk in order to save Shikadai. Koji meets with Jigen, who asks for a mission report. Amato gets a rise out of Shikamaru before he's interrogated, and Naruto orders him to talk. Kawaki tells Boruto and Sumire of Amato's role in Kara, and that Jigen has never granted him leave. Katasuke expresses interest in having Amato's expertise at his disposal if his defection is approved, as it would be beneficial to Kawaki. Naruto wants Amato to share some of his intel to see if it's worth it, and promises him not to use any dirty tricks like Amato did. Amato agrees, but his glasses begin beeping. He asks Shikamaru to position them, and they begin a transmission of Jigen and Koji's meeting. Amato explains that Koji is his ally. The discussion reveals that Koji and Amato were responsible for the airship crash, which allowed Kawaki to escape. Jigen wants to know why they betrayed him, and Koji attacks. Jigen evades him and pierces Koji with chakra rods, but is only a shadow clone. Koji explains that he was created to kill him. Amato and the Konoha Shinobi watch the projection of Koji and Jigen from Amato's glasses. Koji questions why task him with retrieving Kawaki when Jigen could do so by just teleporting to his location. Jigen doesn't find it odd to send someone to do what he could do at any time. He adds that the timing of Kawaki's move was intentional on his part to uncover a traitor. Koji claims they discovered Victor as the traitor, but Jigen thinks that he was used as a cover-up by the real traitors, that Koji would never make a move that Amato say, and that they crashed the airship. Kawaki is incredulous that those two are responsible for his freedom. Jigen wants to know Koji and Amato's motives, as all inners agreed to acquire the chakra fruit. Jigen evades Koji's attack and pierces him, but it's only a shadow clone. Koji claims that he was created to destroy him. Amato explains that Jigen was severely drained by his fight against Naruto and Sasuke, giving them a rare opportunity to take him down, and that they only pretended to follow Jigen. Jigen considers Koji a mere tool to be used by Amato, but Koji is fine with it and attacks him with fire release. Jigen absorbs his attacks with his comma, allowing Koji to position himself behind him to cover him in oil. Jigen notices several toads on himself, which ignite, burning even more intensely because of the oil. Naruto finds Koji's fighting style familiar. The burning knocks the toad, transmitting the fight down, but Amato assures them it'll resume shortly. He continues to explain that rather than being an Otsutsuki, Jigen became one. He explains the Otsutsuki nature of arriving on a planet and consuming everything on it by planting a god tree, which grows a chakra fruit containing all the chakra and genetic information of a planet, which is how the Otsutsuki evolve. 
They recall that Victor's plan involved creating a chakra fruit as well. Jigen absorbs the flames on him and wonders about Koji's motives. He surmises that Koji wanted to learn more about the comet, and upon discovering that Boruto also had one, found it advantageous to let Konoha have Kawaki. Amato asks if Sasuke has been to the place of the coordinates he planted in the airship so they could know about the Ten Tails in advance. Kawaki has limited knowledge on it, so Boruto explains the role it had during the war. Amato explains that Ten Tails are what the Otsutsuki plant to grow god trees. Sai wonders if Jigen is the Otsutsuki wanting to consume the planet this time, but Sasuke says that it's the person who marked Jigen with a comma. Chocho and Inojin watch over Shikadai, hopeful that Naruto will solve the issue. Based on Amato's words, Sasuke determines that Jigen became an Otsutsuki through the comma. Jigen avoids an attack of Koji's by shrinking in size and pierces his shadow clone. Koji addresses Jigen as Ishiki Otsutsuki. Amato explains that Ishiki arrived with Kaguya but was betrayed by her and only survived by taking over Jigen's body, a novice monk. Sasuke asks if that's why he branded Jigen with a comma to take him over. Sasuke asks if that's when he branded Jigen with a comma to take him over. Amato confirms his asylum deal with Naruto before continuing, which Naruto agrees to, but Shikadai's bomb will remain on until he has it in writing. Using Boruto and Momoshiki as examples, Amato explains that the comma functions as a highly compressed Otsutsuki backup file, slowly turning the host until they cease to exist and the Otsutsuki is reborn. Naruto demanded to know if there was a way to stop the process, and Amato stated that to his knowledge there isn't, but he believes that Momoshiki's resurrection can be stopped by killing Boruto. Sasuke asks what happens to the comma, and Amato answered it disappears upon full decompression. Sasuke points to the inconsistency of Jigen still bearing a comma. Amato chuckles, angering Shikamaru. Amato continues and explains that while Ishiki did take over Jigen, he didn't do it with a comma, having been too weak after Kaguya's betrayal to make one. He shrunk himself with his jutsu and physically took over Jigen like a parasite, and only later branded him with a comma. Fighting Koji, Jigen activates his comma, expanding it and growing Ishiki's horn. Koji creates a swamp to hold Jigen in place. Naruto asks why Ishiki hasn't resurrected in Jigen with the comma, and Amato explains that the selection of the proper vessel is of utmost importance. Jigen can't bear Ishiki's chakra, and if the revival were to happen, he'd expire within days, so he chose to prepare a proper vessel in Kawaki. The battle transmission resumes. Jigen breaks free of the swamp by shrinking and sends rods at Koji who dodges them. Koji retracts the swamp, revealing summoning seals. He uses them to summon flames that Jigen can't absorb. Amato explains that Ishiki will be unstoppable if he revived through Kawaki, and while Otsutsuki can transcend death as long as they have a comma, there are methods of killing them, which he will teach. Koji observes Jigen struggle with the flames. Boruto questions if Jigen won't simply absorb them with the comma. Kitasuke notes that they're not dying down, and Kawaki deduces their natural flames summoned from elsewhere not derived from chakra, explaining why Jigen can't absorb them. Amato explains it to the Konoha Shinobi. The flames begin to diminish, and Sasuke determines that instead of absorbing them, Jigen is shrinking them. Amato details Jigen's shrinking ability. Shikamaru questions how Koji will deal with it, and Amato reveals there's a reason they waited until now to make a move. Jigen begins to run out of chakra, and unable to keep shrinking the flames, starts to be consumed. Amato tells Naruto and Sasuke that Jigen had yet to fully recover from fighting them, limiting how much he can shrink anything. Naruto finds it an abrupt end, but Sasuke chastises him, reminding him that there's a comma in play. He summarizes what Amato has explained so far. However, he questions the fact that if Jigen is killed, Kawaki would be his remaining vessel, the one Amato said would make Ishiki unstoppable. An enraged Kawaki barges into the room, attacking Amato, but is stopped by Sasuke. Katasuke instructs Sumire to alert Akita and other lab workers to prepare for video analysis. Amato greets Kawaki, who insults him. He continues, revealing that when Jigen perishes from the flames in moments and Ishiki along with him, it'll trigger the comma. While both Jigen and Kawaki have comma, Jigen has had time to fully extract Ishiki's data, while Kawaki's hasn't, and therefore can't act as a vessel yet. Boruto thinks Amato means to kill Kawaki before it can happen. Amato admits that it's an option. He turns their attention to the feed, and reveals that even if Jigen dies, his branded corpse can still act as a vessel for Ichigi's resurrection. Amato comments on how fortuitous it is that Kawaki is there, wanting to confirm something about to happen with his own body. Kawaki's comma flares up and recedes, and Amato has Boruto confirm the comma on Kawaki's palm has vanished. On the battlefield, the flames all shrink suddenly. He explains that when a comma resurrection takes place, all other comma in other vessels are erased, presumably a safety feature to avoid creating multiple copies of the same individual, and when that happens, an Otsutsuki can be permanently killed until they brand another vessel. Ishiki emerges from the smoke and begins shrinking everything in the vicinity, including the toad, cutting off the transmission. Naruto asks about Koji, and Amato deems the plan mostly fruitful, saying Koji served his purpose. Naruto asks if Koji knew he wasn't meant to survive, and feels that he fought like he truly wanted to kill Ishiki. He can't explain why he's so concerned for Koji when Amato asks him. Ishiki shrinks Koji's mask and realizes that Koji is a clone of Jiraiya, whose change bringing fate Amato had clung to. Ishiki walks towards him, shrinking Koji's attack. Koji grabs him with his hair and tosses him around, but Ishiki shrinks and escapes. He tries stabbing Ishiki when he gets close, but Ishiki avoids it. Ishiki ponders that Jigen's body will last only a few days, and Kawaki's comma has been removed, praising Amato's planning. He taunts Koji, telling him that Amato doesn't think he has enough power to kill him, presuming him to have fled to Konoha so Naruto and Sasuke can kill him. He deems Koji a sacrificial pawn, having fulfilled his purpose in forcing Ishiki's resurrection in Jigen's body. Koji enters sage mode. Amato goes over his deal and is informed of the rights it affords him and conditions required of him. Shikamaru demands he remove the explosive color from Shikadai, but Amato reveals to be a decoy, having only used a real 
one on the tree to force a negotiation. Turning the subject back to Ishiki, Amato thinks only Naruto and Sasuke are strong enough to defeat him, but stresses that their main concern right now is to protect Kawaki, who Ishiki will still want to rebrand before his time in Jigen's body runs out, ignoring combat with Naruto and Sasuke, and suggests evacuating the village where he'll come looking. He proposes that Kawaki be hidden, and Sasuke and Naruto keep close to him to fight off Ishiki if he discovers Kawaki's location until he expires. Koji attacks Ishiki, trying to use wide flames to block the line of sight for his dojutsu. He tries to pin Ishiki between flames and an ultra big ball Rasengan, but Ishiki pins him with the stone pillars he shrunk before. Ishiki pins Koji with the pillars he shrunk earlier in battle. Koji evaluates his injuries as Ishiki explains and demonstrates his jutsu. He questions Koji's decision to fight him despite the gap in power between them, and offers to relay his last words to Amato as a courtesy. Koji escapes by getting inside a summoned toad and reverse summoning it. Ishiki portals away to find Kawaki. In Konoha, Boruto wants to fight against Ishiki, pointing out that they fought Momoshiki together and that Naruto and Sasuke already lost to Ishiki when he was weaker. Naruto refuses, pointing out that he might get taken over by his Kama again. Sai arrives with Sumire and notifies them that evacuation of civilians has begun. Amato believes Ishiki will quickly find Kawaki with his Byakugan. Sai escorts them to an old root facility that is impervious to Byakugan, which Danzo has built as a precaution against a Hyukaku. Shikamaru, Kakashi, and Tsunade coordinate the Konoha Shinobi in preparation for Ishiki's attack. Shikamaru confesses he doesn't have a plan this time. Choji, Tenten, Kiba, and Rock Lee rally the Shinobi. Konohamaru visits Mugino's grave. Sasuke tells Boruto he and Naruto are prepared to die for the village, and asks about him. He confesses that they did struggle against Jigen before, and informs Boruto that Sarada told him that he's being taken over by the Kama. Boruto is fearful of what he might do to the village if he's taken over. Ino alerts everyone of Ishiki's arrival. Ishiki is unable to find Kawaki with his Byakugan, and considers killing people to force the information out of them. Konohamaru, Choji, Tenten, Kiba, and Rock Lee attack him, but Ishiki makes short work of them. Sarada wants to fight, but is still recovering, so Amitsuki helps her evacuate from the hospital. Naruto saves Konohamaru from one of Ishiki's attacks. Ino informs Naruto that evacuation is almost over, so he can go all out. Naruto enters six path sage mode and begins fighting Ishiki. Sasuke arrives, switching places with him, and asks Naruto to cover him with thrown weapons. He and Sasuke attack Ishiki, who shrinks all the weapons. Sasuke throws his sword at him, but Ishiki can't shrink it. As it's about to hit him, the sword transforms back into Boruto, who has his Kama activated. He thinks back to his conversation with Sasuke, where Sasuke swore to take him down if Momoshiki took over again, and he asks Sasuke for his forehead protector again. Boruto creates a rift with his Kama, taking himself and Ishiki away from Konoha to another dimension. Sasuke tracks his chakra, taking Naruto with him. Boruto tells him that they can go all out now without worrying about damaging the village. They all prepare to fight. Naruto asks Boruto where they are, and Boruto confesses that he doesn't know. Naruto believes Boruto inherited his act without thinking attitude. Sasuke focuses on Ishiki's limited lifespan. Ishiki wants to punish Amato for revealing all he did and attacks. Naruto charges forward, but Ishiki shrinks past him and grabs Boruto. He estimates that Momoshiki's Kama is about 80% decompressed. Sasuke switches positions with Boruto, attempting a Chidori, but Ishiki grabs his wrist and tosses him aside, bothered by his Rinnegan. Ishiki finds it more expedient dealing with him here instead of dragging them back there if he attempts returning to Konoha, hoping that their deaths will break the citizens and convince him to hand him Kawaki. Naruto warns him not to underestimate them. Kawaki wakes up from a dream with Jigen. Amato and Shikamaru update him on what he's missed. He attempts to join the battle, but Amato points out that his Kama is gone, explaining how forcing Ishiki's resurrection through Jigen erased it. Kawaki still doesn't feel free, realizing that Ishiki came to Konoha to implant him with a new Kama. Sumire tells him to have faith in Naruto and the others. Kawaki is concerned by Ishiki's strength, but Amato stresses that all they need to do is avoid Ishiki for the remainder of his limited lifespan. Naruto strikes Ishiki with chakra arms and shadow clones, and holds him in place for Sasuke. Ishiki manifests cubes, crushing the shadow clones while Sasuke switches places to avoid them. He separates Naruto and Sasuke, pierces Naruto with several chakra rods, and further pins him between two cubes. Boruto helps clear rubble off Sasuke. Sasuke notices Ishiki aiming rods at Boruto and switches places, being hit instead. Amato and Katasuke discuss how they might avoid Ishiki for two days, and Amato wonders if Boruto has realized his potential value against Ishiki. Ishiki attempts to crush Sasuke with a cube, but Boruto strikes against it with a compression Rasengan. He fails to stop the cube, but Ishiki shrinks it so as to not crush Boruto. Amato explains that a Ten Tails needs to consume a living Otsutsuki to turn into a god tree. Boruto realizes Ishiki needs him for his plan and explains it to Sasuke. He threatens to kill himself with a kunai to stop Ishiki. Ishiki shrinks himself and Boruto's kunai. Sasuke tells Boruto that threats won't work and orders him to run. Ishiki attacks Sasuke and reaches for Boruto. Amato continues to explain Otsutsuki practice, and Sumire realizes Ishiki wants to use Boruto as a sacrifice. Ishiki admits to Boruto he can't kill him, but he can't hurt him, breaking his wrists and stepping on him, and explains his role in Ishiki's plan. Amato says that sacrificing a young and healthy Otsutsuki will result in a better chakra fruit. Kawaki is frustrated and asks how much of the current situation is according to his plan, criticizing him for remaining so calm. Amato merely states that he makes the best decision he can at the time, and that one must be willing to accept the consequences of these decisions. He asks Kawaki if it's powerlessness that's irritating him or grief over losing his Kama before brushing it aside. Kurama questions if Naruto has a plan, and reveals that they have a last resort option when Naruto comes up empty, which will mean 
certain death and advises Naruto not to make the choice lightly. Naruto decides to do it, so Kodama starts and they break free of the cubes. He makes his way to Ishiki, all of them puzzled by this new power. Both Sasuke and Ishiki are surprised by Naruto's new power. Naruto hands Boruto over to Sasuke with one of his chakra tails. He fights Ishiki using very limited movements. Kodama explains how Baryon mode consumes their chakra and how to fight to make it last longer. Ishiki attempts to crush him with his cubes, but Naruto tosses them back at him and goes back on the offensive. Sasuke is impressed that Naruto is overpowering Ishiki. Ishiki sends his rods at him again, but Naruto catches them, astonishing Sasuke, who can barely keep track of them with his Sharingan. Ishiki is incensed at how strong Naruto has become. Boruto and Sasuke watch from afar. Ishiki sends a barrage of rods at him, and Naruto dodges them and uses one of them to deflect the others. Naruto goes through a fire blast from Ishiki, landing a Rasengan. He begins to feel the toll of Baryon mode. In Konoha, Amato asks about Kawaki's prosthetic hand and is surprised to learn that it functions by Naruto sharing his chakra. Kawaki gets concerned, feeling Naruto's chakra get weaker. Ishiki realizes Naruto's power has life-shortening effects and thinks Naruto has lost his bet, but begins to cough up blood, confused. Kodama explains to Naruto that while Baryon mode expends their life force because all chakra is connected, coming into contact with Ishiki during the fight also drains his, cutting his remaining lifespan down to minutes. While touching Naruto, Ishiki detects the chakra he's sharing with Kawaki and uses it as an intermediary to pull Kawaki to where they are with a riff. Amato thinks they're done if Ishiki gets his hands on Kawaki. Boruto passes out. Kawaki goads Ishiki, saying he's happy that he gets to see him die. Ishiki dismisses it as a long nap. Naruto tells Kawaki to run, and Ishiki stomps him hard enough to get him out of Baryon mode. He manages to grab Kawaki by the throat, but Sasuke exchanges places with him. Sasuke uses a special smoke bomb made with a mineral that can occlude abilities such as the Byakugan, preventing Ishiki from finding Kawaki. Ishiki launches a widespread barrage of chakra rods trying to find Kawaki. Ishiki flies down to Naruto, yelling to Kawaki that if he doesn't give himself up, he'll kill Naruto. Kawaki thinks back to many times he hid and tried to flee from Jigen, and also his time with Naruto. He shows himself to Ishiki. Ishiki flies at Kawaki, harmlessly going through a fire release he throws at him. He grabs Kawaki and admonishes him for trying to be a shinobi. Kawaki reveals that Naruto took him on as a student, thinking he had a knack for it. He goes on to say that Naruto taught him a lot of things, giving him a reason to live. Ishiki mocks these, pointing out the prosthetic arm that allowed him to bring Kawaki there and his attachment to Naruto, which made him give himself up. Kawaki affirms that a world without Naruto isn't worth living in for him. Ishiki brands Kawaki with another comma and laughs in celebration. His body begins to break down. The comma begins to dissipate to Ishiki's confusion. The real Kawaki emerges, revealing that the one that Ishiki branded was a shadow clone, which disappears. He disparages Ishiki one more time before jumping on him, his weight collapsing Ishiki's body into dust. Naruto is surprised by Kawaki's shadow clone. Sasuke asks Naruto about his new power. Boruto suddenly stabs Sasuke's Rinnegan. Momoshiki speaks through Boruto, expressing a surprised approval of them defeating Ishiki. Kawaki tries calling out to Boruto. Momoshiki confirms that Ishiki's soul has perished and asks why Kawaki is not smiling at his freedom. Naruto tells Momoshiki to give up as he no longer has anything to feed to a ten tails to grow a god tree for chakra fruit. Momoshiki dodges Kawaki's fire release and fights him close up, managing to stab him. He determines that Kawaki's Kama extraction had progressed enough. Sasuke kicks Momoshiki aside, who explains that the Kama extraction had made their bodies about 80% Otsu Tsuki, making them viable as sacrifices even if the Kama itself is erased. Sasuke attacks Momoshiki, who blocks his sword and retreats when Sasuke channels a Chidori through it. He finds it odd that Momoshiki didn't absorb his ninjutsu. Momoshiki asks Sasuke if he's prepared to kill his student, which Sasuke confirms, using a Matarasu. Momoshiki dodges it and then uses a Shadow Clone as a shield. Sasuke determines that since Momoshiki emerged because Boruto used too much chakra, restoring his chakra should make Momoshiki recede again. Momoshiki plans on how to defeat Sasuke. He hits Sasuke with a vanishing Rasengan. Kawaki thinks back to his arguments with Boruto and begins to self immolate when Momoshiki prepares to teleport away, forcing Momoshiki to absorb it. Boruto begins to regain consciousness, stopping Momoshiki from leaving, and breaks off his horn, causing the Kama to recede before collapsing. Naruto passes out as well. In his mind, Naruto talks to Kurama, and the two reminisce about the past. Kurama reveals that the price for Baryon mode is its death, not theirs, knowing that Naruto would have hesitated or opposed using it had he known, and fades away, wishing Naruto well. The other tailed beast sends Kurama's death. Naruto wakes up with Boruto crying and holding his hand, Sasuke and Kawaki looking at him. Boruto fails to create a rift to Konoha, their only way home since Sasuke no longer had his Rinnegan. Kawaki asks asks if he's afraid of being taken over by Momoshiki again and vows to help him get rid of his Kama just as they helped him. Boruto is able to create a rift as Kawaki begins arguing with him and they all leave for Konoha. Shikamaru receives word of their return and Amato asks about Kawaki. Shikamaru, Katasuke, Sumire, Sarada, and Mitsuki greet them. Sarada asks about her father's eye who doesn't blame Boruto when he claims responsibility. Sasuke agrees with her. Naruto, Sai, and Shikamaru confirm with Amato to ask about the state of Kara with Ishiki's death. He reveals that the remaining inner, Code, is dangerous as a non-functional vessel who bears a Kama. Since his Kama doesn't function as a means of reincarnation, it is erased, but it still functions as a weapon. Amato explains that while he modified other inners to make them stronger, he instead restrained Code's power as to not undermine Jigen's authority, as Code is deeply devoted to the Otsutsuki. Code is the only cyborg stronger than Jigen that Amato didn't dispose of under Jigen's order, and is likely to seek vengeance for Ishiki's death. Code wakes up with the Tentails pen having dozed off. His white comma activates, manifesting a vision of Ishiki, who deems Code his successor and bequeaths his mission to him. Boruto and Kawaki talk about going back home. Sakura and Katasuke go over what the loss of Kurama and the Rinnegan mean for Naruto and Sasuke. Boruto and Kawaki 
Kawaki also received confirmation of their bodies being 80% Otsutsuki, and Kawaki reaffirms his commitment to helping Boruto get rid of his comma. Katasuke and Boruto are pestered by the media, wanting to know how the fight with Ishigi went down. Boruto's friends watch him being interviewed on TV. Mitsuki informs Sarada that because of Boruto's situation, Team 7 is currently prohibited from going on missions. Boruto apologizes for his problem affecting them. Sumire is concerned about him and realizes her feelings for Boruto, and Boruto rides the train while pondering about his comma. At night, Boruto thinks back to being possessed by Momoshiki after Ishiki's defeat while playing a video game. During a 5 Kage video conference, Shigamaru explains they've discovered destroyed space-time gates in several locations, which they believe would be access points to Kara's headquarters in another dimension. Naruto also raises his concern of no longer being able to investigate the dimension in search of Kara's tentails, but believes it won't pose a threat soon as the enemy no longer has a suitable sacrifice to cultivate a god tree. They discuss Code's goals and motives and agree to put the highest priority on finding him. The other Kage express some apprehension on the fact that most of the intel that they have comes from Mato. Naruto confesses to not fully trusting him, but finds him reliable enough due to his contributions against Ishiki. The Kage asks Naruto what he'll do if Boruto becomes a threat due to his comma, and Gara points out that with Kurama's loss, Naruto might not be strong enough to take down another Otsutsuki, so he might need to take action before Boruto gets taken over again. Himawari is saddened by Kawaki no longer being able to use Naruto's prosthetic. Sumire visits Kawaki and takes him to have his arm restored by Amato. Katasuke is impressed by it. Kawaki advises him to be aware of Amato. Mitsuki notices Boruto's dejected attitude. Katasuke informs Naruto of the acceleration of Boruto's comma progression. Naruto wishes to inform Boruto himself. Amato asks Katasuke on the progress of him becoming a member of the scientific ninja weapons team. Sarada finds Mitsuki by himself, and he tells her that Boruto is staying awake out of fear of Momoshiki taking over. Naruto and Sasuke discuss Boruto's comma, and Sasuke reveals he promised Boruto he'd take him out if he became a threat. Naruto informs Boruto of his predicament and comforts him. Boruto can no longer stay awake and falls asleep. Amato approaches Naruto and offers him a drug he developed to weaken the Byakugan that might help in preventing Boruto's Otsutsuki progression. He explains that he microdosed Kawaki with it for a long time, so Jigen wouldn't notice, which is why Kawaki's progression took so long. Amato also points out that since Boruto has Byakugan potential, he might experience side effects that Kawaki didn't. He admits that he was concerned about Naruto not being able to take action like before, but also reveals that he knows what it's like not wanting to lose a child, having had a daughter who died 12 years prior. Naruto gives Boruto the medication, who begins taking it immediately. Mitsuki and Sarada notice the change in Boruto's attitude and wonder if they'll be able to take missions again. Amato is accepted as part of the scientific ninja weapons team and gives data for Sumire to compile. Kawaki returns the prosthetic to Naruto, who asks if he wants to become a Genin. Kawaki says he'll think about it. Naruto tells Shikamaru he wants to host another Chunin exams to make up for the one that Momoshiki's attack sidelined. Sasuke Retsuden arc. Near the land of Radaku, Sasuke overhears a pair of women discussing a wedding ring, recalling being told of the custom. He sends a messenger hawk, extending his search for intel and code, returning to the land of Radaku for the first time since Naruto was afflicted with an illness years prior. Kurama had shared with Naruto that the Sage of Six Paths suffered from the same illness. Looking through their records, they discover that the Sage recovered while visiting the Astronomy Research Institute in the land of Radaku. Kakashi was sent to investigate as the land of fire doesn't have any diplomatic relations, but the situation is precarious, with the country suffering from famine and their prime minister having taken power after the death of their king. He had become a tutor to Prince Nanara, using the opportunity to search through the records for more information. The prince couldn't read or write, so Kakashi had to teach him before tutoring him could lead to any intel. Sasuke decided to investigate on his own, Naruto too weak to stop him. He infiltrated the institute as a prisoner, the institute now functioning as a prison, to look for records of how the sage recovered from the illness. Sasuke was introduced to his cellmates, learning their names and sentences, and defended himself when other inmates attacked him. A couple of guards tried to discipline him, but director Zansuru points out everything Sasuke did was in self-defense. He advises Sasuke not to do anything too conspicuous. One of the inmates attempts to use the commotion to escape, but is killed by Menno. The prisoner watch as Menno devours the prisoners. The prisoners work while Menno patrols the area. In his cell at night, Sasuke refuses to gamble at first, thinking about Menno, but changes his mind, wanting a favor instead. He uses ninjutsu to win with dice and wants Gigi to distract the guards if they patrol the area while he looks around. Gigi doesn't want to do it, but Sasuke leaves. He needs freedom to look for records of the sage, and Menno is in the way. Sasuke thinks Menno is Zanzuru's summon, but his permanence is unusual. Menno attacks Sasuke, immune to Genjutsu, who is forced to fight back. He is concerned with leaving evidence of a battle, but has to slash Menno's claws and torso. Menno flees. The next day, Sasuke is surprised to see Menno healed from every injury. Zanzuru confronts Sasuke about attacking Menno. Sasuke attempts to use Genjutsu, but Zansuru's artificial eye makes it ineffective on him. Zansuru warns him he'll increase surveillance. The Prime Minister wants Nanara to evacuate his village for military occupation, wishing to attack other countries to acquire land to deal with the famine, as they received no help over their lack of diplomatic relations. Kakashi infiltrates the library during the mission and discovers records about the Sage of Six Paths. Sasuke receives a beating from the guards over his attempt to put Zansuru under Genjutsu, putting on no resistance and giving no reaction. Gigi and Panjira check on him. Gigi suggests Sasuke get himself checked in the infirmary, having learned of a new attractive and single doctor. Panjira accuses him of using Sasuke to see her again after being treated the previous day, with Gigi admitting to it. Gano refuses to join them and reveals that Zansudu's office has a cellar where he's rumored to keep a secret. Zansudu and Menno check on the Menno Sasuke defeated, finding Sasuke to be troublesome, but confident that making more Menno can settle things. Sasuke sneaks out at night again and combats Menno once more. He wonders if this Menno was healed or if it's a different one, and begins to feel the effects of poison from a claw cut on his cheek. A doctor arrives just in time to pacify Menno, causing it to give up attacking Sasuke and leave. Sasuke passes out, and when he wakes up in the infirmary, he learns that Sakura is the new doctor. She's come to update him on the mission, having 
having received intel from Kakashi about the Sage of Six Paths' illness, detailing how he was cured from it with what became known as polar particles. He hid the rest of it, leaving clues on where and how to find them. She draws some of his blood, surprised how the poison affected him. Sasuke wants her to return, respecting her strength but finding himself capable enough, and suspicious of whatever Zansu is up to with the beasts who are supposed to be extinct. She refuses to leave but is happy that he's concerned for her. Sasuke finds Gigi eavesdropping on them who claims he got permission to get himself treated for his blisters. He heard that Sakura and Sasuke are married. Sakura claims she came to work to see Sasuke as visitors aren't allowed. On their way back to their cell, Sasuke asks Gigi not to tell anyone he's married to Sakura, and Gigi reveals he has a fiancé himself in the Ridaku capital. Gigi is appalled to learn that Sasuke and Sakura are apart for years at times and advises him to get Sakura a ring. Sasuke asks if if Gigi knows anything about astronomical documents, and he advises Sasuke to ask Panjira, who is librarian. Sakura asks Panjira about it when he's gambling during lunch break. He checks that the books are in a restricted basement, which would require Zansuru's permission to check out. Sakura wants to gamble with him for the key, promising to smuggle him as many cigarettes as he wants if he wins. He introduces her to Hoshinarabe, and she picks it up quite quickly, beating him. He accuses her of cheating, but lends her the key anyway. At night, she explains to Sasuke that she memorized the unique wear and damage of each card, something she began doing to always draw when playing with Tsunade, boring her to stop playing. She asks him about Gigi, who often visits her and talks about his fiance. Recalling Gigi's words, he asks her about how she feels about spending so much time apart. She's flustered, but answers she isn't worried even if she misses him sometimes. He makes her a wedding ring and asks her to wear it. They find the book, which contains ink paintings relating to the Hoshinarabe cards. The paintings depict constellations. Sasuke recognizes some of the constellations as tailed beasts, and they deduce the two remaining paintings depict John Maru Tataru and the Sage of Six Paths of Himself. They wonder where they could look for more information, and Sasuke mentions the rumor about Zansuda's basement. Someone eavesdropping on them leaves. Sakura mentions that a messenger from the capital will meet with Zansuda the next day, which could give them an opportunity to investigate. She wants to impersonate the messenger, allowing Sasuke to look around. Panjiro loses a bet to Gigi over the timing of Mano passing by their cell. Using an almond tree branch from Gano, Gigi lures Mano near to pet it. Gigi explains that despite not eating almonds, he always sees Mano under the almond tree, deducing it likes the scent. Gano pets Mano, and encouraged by his success, Panjiro tries as well. However, his foot goes slightly outside the cell, agitating Mano over a rule being broken. The commotion causes causes hot oil from the lantern to spill and burn Menno, who runs away. Gigi smooths things over when a guard checks on them. The next day, Sakura greets the messenger Fundaro. She learns that Fundaro himself doesn't know the specifics of what the Prime Minister wants with Zansudu, only that he must inquire about a certain progress. After getting details of whether Fundaro and Zansudu met before, and when Zansudu last visited the palace, she gets him to Sasuke, who knocks Fundaro out with a Sharingan. They go over their plan, and Sakura explains a vulnerability she learned about in Zansudu's artificial eye, that it has a narrow field of vision at high angles. Sakura transforms into Fundaro and goes to meet Zansudu. She distracts him by making him go to the window and tosses Fundaro's cane across the room, actually a transformed Sasuke. Zansudu asks about the missing cane and Sakura produces another one, hidden beneath Fundaro's cloak. Sakura stalls for Sasuke to have enough time to map the keyhole with Chakra and make a key with Earth release. Zansudu asks what the Prime Minister wants and Sakura asks about the progress. Zansudu answers that he already intends to send the assets to the capital, but refuses to elaborate on the numbers. Sasuke manages to go down to the cellar. He goes through another door and is surprised to find a number of chickens and fossils. Sakura leaves the meeting with Zansudu and Sasuke discovers the room has an exit to behind the main building. From an altar present in the room, Sasuke believes Zansudu is resurrecting the fossils with impure world reincarnation. Meno attacks Sasuke, who notices the burn from the previous night hadn't healed. While dodging its attacks, Sasuke notes it doesn't have a tag embedded into it, despite clearly acting on Zansudu's orders, and adjusts his premise, still believing to be in reincarnation jutsu. He stops Meno from attacking with a sheathed sword, and through a shadow clone, applies super cooled water to his burn. Sasuke lets Meno bite him, and convinces it to let him help Meno go back where it was before being brought back. Reaching inside and grabbing Meno's tongue, Sasuke flows his chakra to overwrite the Genjutsu control over it. Now affectionate, it obeys Sasuke. At the altar, someone resurrects more fossils for Zansuru, who wants to have an army of dragon beasts. A messenger hawk delivers an update from Kakashi to Sakura by sunset, informing her that the Prime Minister has taken military action in Princess Minari's name. She recalls Zansuru's words of sending assets to the capital, and wonders where he could be keeping them and goes to search for Sasuke. She doesn't find him in the lunch hall, and reviews what they don't know yet. Gano sits next to her to eat, and notices her wedding ring. He asks about her husband, and surprises her when he mentions Sasuke by name, explaining that he overheard Sasuke and Gigi talking about it. He adds that before Sakura arrived, Sasuke would spend time watching the flowers outside and leaves. She checks outside and sees a blooming almond tree whose flowers resemble cherry blossoms. Thinking about paintings, constellations, and zodiacs, she realizes those are connected to hand seals. Sasuke and Gigi work sorting out inedible apricots, Gigi telling him a prisoner died of unknown causes after eating one. Sasuke spots a lake on the distance, and Gigi explains it's supposedly a meteor crater that filled with rainwater. There are no fish, and during the day, its shade of blue makes it look like the sky fell to earth. Sasuke realizes something and leaves, telling Gigi he'll take his next kitchen duty. Sasuke and Sakura meet at her office. She explains how the hands in Hoshinarabe are the hand seals required to reveal the polar particles, and he explains he discovered where the sky that fell to the earth is, asking her to accompany him that night. 
Sasuke leaves his cell at night, which Gigi notices. Sakura is concerned about Meno, but is assured it's fine. He holds her when she trips jumping down her office window. He takes her to the lake, reflecting the starry night sky. They hold hands, and he asks her if she wants a proper wedding ring, as a reminder of their marriage when they're apart. Sakura says she thought about it, but she'd have to take it off for work. He doesn't usually worry, but it gets to him when he sees Sarada has grown taller or Sakura has changed her hairstyle. Sakura feels the same when she notices faint wrinkles on him when he laughs. She performs the hand seals, and a pillar of light emerges from the lake. Sakura walks up to it and collects these sealed polar particles, causing the pillar to dissipate. She stores them, and an explosion goes off at the Institute. They notice several flying dragon beasts take off and wonder if those are the assets that Zansuru mentioned. Sasuke wants to capture one and instructs Sakura to capture Zansuru at the Institute. He leaves for the Institute and Zansuru lands on a dragon beast. He thanks Sasuke for recovering the polar particles. Sasuke realizes he had used the inmates to excavate the fossils, the chickens as vessels, and the apricots which had absorbed the particles' energy to resurrect the dragon beasts. Their uncovering of the particles allowed him to revive a large number of beasts at once. Zansuru claims to be acting on behalf of the nation, and Sasuke warns that using Kinjutsu as such will carry consequences. Zansuru doesn't know about impure world reincarnation when Sasuke mentions it. When Sasuke asks if he intends to support the Prime Minister, Zansuru realizes he has an ally near Prince Nanara. Noticing his true loyalty to the Minister, Sasuke finds it unlikely that Zansuru would release the Jutsu. He is surprised to see with his Sharingan that Zansuru has too little chakra to be a shinobi, so someone else brought back and is controlling the beasts. At the Institute, several beasts continue to appear and attack the inmates. Penjura is almost killed by one and is saved by Sakura, who punches a hole through one of the Institute's walls, allowing the inmates to flee, as well as punching one of the beasts nearby. She goes looking for Zansuru, but he's not there. Instead, she finds inmates hiding inside and tells him the exit she cleared. Gigi asks her what happened, and she tells him Zansuru is responsible. He claims he saw Zansuru in the courtyard earlier, but she came from there and she didn't see him. He hugs her close and stabs her with a poison kunai, which he recognizes as the one Sasuke was poisoned by with Meno. Gigi is working with Zansuru and allowed her to move freely so they could find the polar particles. He gets the particles from her. She tries to stop him, and he confesses he really did appreciate her, who reminds him of his girlfriend Margo, so he's sad that she has to die and leaves. He wants to use the particles to resurrect Margo and uses the reincarnation in Jutsu. The entire institute begins to crumble as the ground shifts, and an excited Zansuru leaves Sasuke fighting the flying beasts. A gigantic beast emerges from where the institute used to be. Sakura is paralyzed as debris falls around her. Sasuke fights his way back to the institute against the flying dinosaurs with Meno's help. He notices the titan's emergence, and recalling that Zansuro brought up Sasuke having an ally, Sasuke realizes Gigi is Zansuro's accomplice, and the only person he knew wasn't working alone. Zansuru thinks the Prime Minister will be pleased by the assets. Sasuke has Meno evacuate the prisoners while he goes after Sakura. He grows agitated when he can't sense her chakra. Sakura wakes up pinned and can't mold chakra because of the poison and passes out. She wakes up to Sasuke tending her wound. She apologizes for not stopping Gigi, but he tells her not to worry. She prepared a serum against the poison beforehand. Zansuru joins up with Gigi, who hands him the polar particles. Zansuru wants to kill all the inmates before joining the Minister to suppress Nanara's rebellion. Gigi tells him not to renege on his promise. Zansuru has Gigi target Gano, but Meno stops the dinosaur attacking him. They're surprised by it and deduce Sasuke took control of Meno. Sasuke and Sakura arrive, so Zansuru changes the dinosaur's focus to them. Sakura breaks the ground around the dinosaurs. Zansuru sends Gigi after her. Sasuke makes the flying dinosaurs crash against each other with Chidori Senbon. Meno climbs the Titan to attack Zansuru, who narrowly escapes, being picked up by a flying dinosaur. Sasuke continues attacking the dinosaurs with his sword, fire release, and Chidori. Sasuke receives a message by Hawk and shares that the minister has been imprisoned by King Nanara. Zansuru decides to keep fighting in the minister's name so he can grow his dinosaur army while in possession of the polar particles. Sakura helps more prisoners evacuate but is chased by Gigi. He blocks her escape with an Earth release Earth style wall. Sakura becomes paralyzed as a side effect of the serum, but Gigi gets likewise caught in a trap she lured him into. Sasuke lures the Titan into the lake where it struggles to move. Sasuke switches places with a flying dinosaur, getting close to Zansudu, who commands the one carrying him to flee. It drops him instead, crashing down into the ground dead. Sasuke switches with another dinosaur on the ground. Zansudu commanding the dinosaurs, despite not being in control of them, meant new orders to place old ones. Sasuke retrieves the polar particles, and he and Meno get back to Sasuke. He asks what Gigi's goal was. Sakura releases her trap, and Sasuke intends to hand over Gigi to the land of Radaku. Gigi reveals that he was a missing nin from Suna and joined the minister when asked to create a private army. He fell in love with his attendant Margo, turning away from war. However, while he was in prison, Margo died in an epidemic and he was approached with an offer. If he revived the dinosaurs, the country would release her corpse from him to resurrect. Sakura admits she might try the same in his situation, but her friends would stop her, and she doesn't believe that their deceased loved ones would approve. Sasuke reveals Gigi was deceived, as Margo is mentioned as cooperating with King Nanara. Gigi cries in joy and relief and releases the reincarnation in Jutsu, all the dinosaurs turning to dust. Sasuke bids Meno farewell. One of the dinosaurs attacks Sakura as it disappears, but Gigi protects her getting bitten. Sakura tries healing him, feeling that he has to go see Margo, but he doesn't think he deserves it. Later, Naruto has recovered in Konoha and asks about how Rodaku is doing to Kakashi. He updates him that Nanara is officially king now. Sakura catches up with Ino, who notes her ring. Sakura recalls how Sasuke found her in debris because of the ring. Nanara visits the ruins of the Institute and intends to rebuild it with Margo and Gigi's help. Still away in a mission, Sasuke and Sakura both miss each other but are not worried. Code's Assault Arc Ishiki's vanishing soul addresses Code, instructing him to carry on the Otsutsuki will. He tells Code to eat the chakra fruit from the god tree after freeing either Kawaki or Boruto to the Tentails and become an Otsutsuki himself. 
Code vows to fulfill Ishiki's wish. Yurito takes Kawaki to Sai and Shikamaru, who confirms to them that the marks that they found are Code's claw marks. Code makes his way to a still staff facility from Boro's Otsotsuki cult. Kawaki finds Boruto at the Hokage Rock and admonishes him for taking Amato's medicine. He tells Boruto about the claw marks and warns him that Code is special among the inners. At Boro's facility, the guards refuse to let Code in and attack him. Code uses his claw marks to evade and kill them. Kawaki explains Code's ability and reveals to Boruto that Code acquired a comma despite being unable to become a vessel. More guards show up to attack Code, including one who injects himself with multiple enhancer syringes to become more powerful. He still fails to land a blow on Code. Kawaki adds that unlike other inners, Code's comma combat abilities exceed Jigen, and asks that his modifiers restrain his strength so as not to undermine Jigen in deference to Ishiki's vessel. Amato created several cyborgs more powerful than Jigen, but Jigen ordered them to be destroyed. Code finishes killing the guards and enters the facility. Sai and Shikamaru notify Naruto of the claw marks, comparing them to the Flying Thunder God technique. They've assigned teams to monitor the four marks they found, but consider the possibility that they're meant as decoys to decrease their forces inside the village. They confirm that Sasuke has made no contact, and Naruto tells him to inform Sasuke about the claw marks. Sai is certain Code is hunting those involved in Ishiki's death. Shikamaru informs Amato that he'll have increased security, as he's the only one who can rescind Code's limiters. Amato thinks it's just another person to spy on him, but the increased protection is appreciated. He does warn Shikamaru that if he's captured, he's likely to comply to avoid torture. Shikamaru finds him a parasite, Amato retorting that it's the only way someone weak like him can survive. Code finds a facility member called Bug and asks him about Ada, a cyborg that Boro stored instead of destroying as ordered by Jigen. Bug caves to the implied threat and takes Code to storage. Kawaki suggests Boruto brand Code with the comma, which as survived before, making him into Boruto's vessel. This way they can get rid of Code and secure Boruto's life if Momoshiki takes him over. Kawaki chides Boruto for being apprehensive about sacrificing Code to save himself. Boruto decides to train. Bug takes Code to Ada. Code is surprised that Boro disobeyed Jigen and kept this transgression a secret because he wasn't sure of it himself until now, also disliking the idea of taking Boro down if Jigen ordered it. Bug thinks he would do it without blinking. Code only knows that Ada knows everything and wants Bug to wake her up, but he is apprehensive about it, explaining Code can't force her to obey him. Before Bug can explain further, Code slashes her storage open, figuring he can just kill her if she defies him. Ada wakes up and ignores Code. He threatens to kill her and she tells him to try. Code is unable to take action to hurt Ada. She explains she wasn't ignoring him, but was merely concerned with having bad breath after being asleep for so long. She has Bug take Code to the bar. While waiting for her, Code asks Bug if Ada is interested in him, Bug chastising him for being entranced by her already. One of the guards spots Ada, asking how she got out and aiming a weapon at her. He gets flustered when she asks not to tell anyone about her and he obeys her. Bug urges Code that they need to escape while they still can. Code feels enamored by Ada's eyes, but Bug explains it's not that. Ada arrives, explaining what she can and cannot see. She showcases her ability by looking into what Kawaki is doing, which is arguing with Team 7 about how to train. Kawaki is frustrated by training chakra control, which Sarada deems important and tries changing the combat training when Mitsuki asks for his suggestion. Mitsuki blocks Kawaki's attack, who changes the focus of Sarada. He blocks her fire release great fireball technique by changing his arm, and distracts her by allowing a shadow clone to be hit by her shuriken. Boruto protects her from his assault. He finds Kawaki to be impatient and wants an explanation for his attitude. Boruto and Kawaki agree to spar, and the winner gets to choose how they train. Code tries getting Ada's attention, who complains the good part was about to start. Ada knows he wants to know how to remove his power limiters and explains only Amato can do it. Code wants to kill Naruto and Sasuke. She explains he needs an iris scan and a voice command from Amato, though she doesn't know the code word. Ada stresses that Amato's eyes have been modified through scientific ninja tools in a way that the transformation technique can't replicate, so he needs Amato's cooperation or his actual eyes. Code thinks it would be short-sighted to just invade Konoha after Amato, and Ada admires Amato's intelligence, though she still intends to kill him. Code assumes it's because he modified her body, but that's only half correct. She wants Bug to show him out. Kawaki explains that Jigen put him through grueling combat training that he hated, and when he finally leaned into it, wanting the strength to kill Jigen, he started rapidly improving. Kawaki sends an energy blast, which Boruto absorbs as a comma. Code wants to know more about Ada, but she's not interested in him since he can't get her what she wants, because he's not Notsotsuki. She teases him by mentioning how pathetic she found Jigen's final moments to be. He's confused that he has not ripped her to pieces for insulting Jigen. Ada explains that his attraction to her is because of her other ability, and she shares his frustration of not knowing if others' feelings for her are genuine, even if they could naturally come to like her. That is why she hates Amato. Bug tries to leave, but Code doesn't allow it. He doesn't think Bug is captivated by Ada, but he confirms he is, Ada adding that Bug is just shy and scared. He realizes that this is why Boro didn't dispose of her, and asks why Jigen wasn't affected. Ada reveals that her ability can't captivate blood relatives or Otsotsuki. She expresses interest in Kawaki, as his almost full conversion into Otsotsuki means he could like her without her ability's interference. Kawaki notices Naruto observing them and Boruto goes on the offensive. His performance improved because of the Kama. Boruto attacks him with a lightning release thunderclap arrow kunai, which Kawaki tries to absorb out of habit, but he can't as he no longer has a Kama. 
Boruto defeats him, even slicing through his forehead protector. Kawaki finds himself pathetic and wonders how he can protect Naruto in such a sorry state. Boruto thinks he understands Kawaki's wish to protect those he cares about, as well as his point of view of using every power at his disposal. Kawaki tells Boruto he'll stop him himself if Momoshiki takes over again. Naruto wishes for them to get stronger. Boruto helps Kawaki up, and they're all surprised by the damaged forehead protector as it slips down. Ada tells Code she felt thrilled when Kawaki's ploy defeated Ishiki, something she hasn't experienced in a long while. Code points out that Boruto is also a viable candidate for a relationship with her. She concedes that he is cute and dreamy, but believes Code needs to sacrifice himself to cultivate a god tree. Ada just needs one person. Bug finds them both vile and crazy. Ada and Code toast cooperation towards reaching their goals. Boruto hopes in vain to repair Kawaki's forehead protector. Kawaki thinks to himself he can't afford to be picky about how he gets stronger either. Kawaki wakes up from a nightmare where as a young child he was chased around by Code, who is angry and jealous of Kawaki becoming Jigen's vessel. Sumire and Amato are done with his checkup. Kawaki complains that Code is still after him, even though he's no longer a vessel. Amato corrects him, pointing out that while Ishiki's soul has vanished and can no longer possess him, the Otsutsuki changes to his body remain. Kawaki gets hostile with Amato until he points out that Kawaki needs more power to protect Naruto from Code. Amato thinks Naruto would die against Code now that he's lost Kurama, and suggests that Kawaki get a new Kama that acts only as a weapon now that Ishiki's soul is gone. Kawaki hates the Kama, but Amato finds finds him rational enough to grasp for any available power to achieve his goals. He reminds Kawaki that they're both outsiders who will be tossed out when they're no longer useful. Ada finds Kawaki's situation a bit too painful to watch. Code refuses to spare Naruto in addition to Kawaki when Ada asks for it. Ada bosses Bug around, who reminds him that there's still many armed guards in the facility. He points out that they'll get nothing done if they stay there, secretly wishing for them to leave him behind. Ada is in no rush to act as the five villages are looking for Code. She's confident she can spot an opportunity with her Senra gun when it presents itself and sees it. Code wishes he could remove his limiters and thinks that he and Ada could take on Naruto and Sasuke. Ada says her combat abilities are low. She'll be Code's eyes and ears. Well, he'll be here night. He asks her what she'll do if Kawaki attacks her, pointing out that being immune to her entrancing, he and Boruto are capable of taking action against her. She invites Code to meet her other night. Team 10 spots Kawaki walking around with a grim expression, thinking back to Amato's words. Shigurai takes him aside when he starts drawing attention. They try to assure him of his place in Konoha. Himawari is training for an upcoming test. She asks him to spar with her. He refuses, concerned that the Kama will act up. Sumire asks Amato about his offer for Kawaki. He explains the situation comparing Ishiki, Kawaki, and the Kama to a homeowner house in a doorway. Sumire suspects Amato has an ulterior motive for wishing to restore Kawaki's Kama, something else he wants Kawaki to do. Amato admits it's a personal matter he's unwilling to share with her, but it doesn't concern her. He assures her he has no intention of harming Konoha. Sumire sees a container next to him. Code asks Ada about her other knight, who tells him that he's the only person other than an Otsutsuki who can kill her. Bug protests about waking that person up, but follows through. Damon immediately jumps on top of Code, and Ada warns him not to attack her younger brother. Damon teases Code. The armed guards arrive, and Bug warns them to stay away or they'll be killed. The guards' attacks backfire on them, and Damon begins the attack on them himself. Ada confirms to Code that Damon can reflect killing intent as tangible effects. Damon kills the remaining guards. Code attempts to mark Damon, but his ability activates regardless of his intent, reflecting the claw marks. Code demonstrates his ability to Damon. He asks Damon about his ability, and Ada has to stop Damon from explaining too much. Code wonders if Ada herself is keeping yet another ability hidden. Hinata asks Boruto about Kawaki, but he's still out. Shikamaru and Shikadai discuss Kawaki while playing Shogi. Naruto finds Kawaki at the Hokage Rock. Kawaki feels like an outsider, so Naruto takes him back home for a welcome dinner. Boruto gifts Kawaki his forehead protector after breaking his original one. Kawaki says Boruto won't have one, but Boruto points out that he has Sasuke's. After dinner, Himawari confides in Kawaki that she thinks Boruto is worried about something as he started training a lot. She feels she can't help Boruto yet and asks Kawaki to do it if he goes overboard. Kawaki says he will. Kawaki remains concerned despite Naruto's assurances that he belongs and that they'll do something about Code. He doesn't think he needs a comma and finds there's still something he can do to protect Konoha and Naruto. Boruto is frustrated by the constant surveillance as he and Kawaki spend time with Shigadai and Inujin. Kawaki notes Inujin's mention of the sensory team being able to locate any potential enemy unless they're able to erase their chakra signature. Amato joins Shikamaru and tries to assure him that Code, while powerful, isn't as bright. Shikamaru is still suspicious of Amato, thinking that events are unfolding according to some plan. Amato says most recent events have been unexpected, such as him defecting Konoha, and most of all Kawaki's attachment to Naruto. Shikamaru wonders if it's possible that Code's devotion to Ishiki could have wavered, explaining his lack of action against them, but they find it unlikely. At night, Kawaki takes out the trash under Nishi's watch, going through a shrub on his way back. Boruto finds something strange when he returns. He feels a presence from outside where the real Kawaki is waiting in the shrub. Nishi still senses Kawaki and Boruto inside. Ada reports to Code that Kawaki erased his chakra signature, something that comes naturally to all Otsutsuki, and wonders if he's up to something. Boruto tries talking to Kawaki in the bathroom, feeling he's up to something. He tries telling Naruto about sensing Kawaki's presence outside, but Nishi reports sensing Kawaki still inside the house. Boruto believes Kawaki is still using a shadow clone as a decoy, but Naruto points out those would still be sensed. Naruto asks to see Kawaki, who, opening the door, realizes it's a shadow clone. The real Kawaki goes outside the village. Ada informs Code about it. Code travels to a nearby claw mark and speaks to Ada through another, asking her to guide him to Kawaki. 
Code reaches Kawaki, marking him and using the claw mark to close a distance. Ino connects Naruto and Shikamaru, who discuss why Kawaki would leave when he was acclimating well to the village. Naruto tells Ino Kawaki erased his chakra signature, and Boruto tells him he can no longer sense Kawaki, finding he's too far away. Naruto wants Boruto to leave it to them, but Boruto leaves while they're distracted. Amato asks how they could have lost Kawaki, and Shikamaru says he ran away on his own, speculating on his motive. Boruto goes in the direction he last sensed Kawaki, hoping the sensors will track him while he tracks Kawaki. Kawaki and Code fight, Ada warning Code not to accidentally kill him. Code diverts a blast from Kawaki with a claw mark. Code asks why he's left the village, and Kawaki wants Code to just kill him as revenge for Ishiki, leaving Konoha out of it. Code refuses and beats Kawaki around despite Ada's protests. Code reveals he has inherited Ishiki's will to cultivate a god tree and eat its chakra fruit. He surprises Kawaki by saying he's off his revenge list because someone else wants to meet him and prepares to take Kawaki with him. Boruto arrives just in time to interfere. Ada informs Code that Boruto could still sense Kawaki and went after him. Boruto and Kawaki scold each other for getting themselves in danger, but Kawaki thinks that defeats the point of what he did, willing to die himself to protect Naruto. He wants Code to take him to whoever wants to meet him, since talking to Code is getting him nowhere. Ada is flustered about Kawaki wanting to meet her. Boruto and Kawaki argue over what's happening, and Boruto punches him when he says that Naruto wants and thinks doesn't matter to what Kawaki does to keep him safe. Ada also gets flustered by Boruto's commitment to Kawaki, calling him a brother. Boruto activates his Kama. Code introduces himself to Boruto and states his goal of feeding him to the Tentails. He intends to test Boruto's quality as a sacrifice. Kawaki wants Boruto to run away, but Boruto thinks Code will neither listen to him nor will allow him to run away. Ino updates Naruto that despite extending their search, they're unable to find Kawaki. Naruto Boruto recalls that Boruto could sense him, but he has left, Nishi confirming that he's nowhere near. Code and Boruto begin fighting, Code using his claw marks to dodge and counterattack. He deflects Boruto's shuriken, actually a transformed shadow clone who attacks him with lightning release thunderclap arrow. He escapes through a claw mark again and finds Boruto's ninja tactics fun. However, he finds him inept at using the Kama, activating his own white Kama. Code begins to pressure Boruto and explains that the Kama doesn't just make them stronger, it also grants them the accumulated battle experience of an Otsutsuki, if one knows how to draw from it. Boruto dodges a stomp and starts drawing more power from the Kama, pleasing Code. Kawaki is concerned about Momoshiki's emergence. Ada watches and Code wonders how Momoshiki could manage Manifests himself to this degree in a vessel yet to be revived. Boruto remains in control and charges at Code with Shadow Clones, who notes the increased strength. He marks a clone to retreat and attack, but Boruto pulls him to the mark. Code avoids another Rasengan through the marks. Kawaki wonders how Boruto stayed in control. Code consults Ada, who speculates Amato's drugs are responsible, but counsels him not to underestimate Boruto. Naruto wants Ino to search for Boruto, who he believes went after Kawaki. Shikamaru arrives, and because Naruto no longer has Kodama, he'll join him. Hinata wants to join them, but Naruto wants her to take care of Himawari. As he enters Sage mode, he reassures Himawari he'll bring Boruto and Kawaki back. Kawaki explaining that while made with chakra, they have enough iron from Code's blood to act as physical matter. Boruto and Kawaki both are unsure about Boruto's state, Kawaki distrusting Amato's meds. Code thinks that even with meds, Momoshiki isn't gone, and Boruto is still an Otsutsuki, viable for sacrifice. They're surprised about his awareness of the meds. He vows to return for Boruto and tries taking Kawaki with him. Kawaki retaliates with a shadow clone, forcing Code to slip away and avoid him and Boruto. Code asks about Kawaki's change of heart, and he says that everything he does is for Naruto. Naruto in Sage Mode finds Boruto along with a chakra signature he doesn't recognize. He and Shikamaru notify Ino and depart. Boruto and Kawaki fight Code. Sai notifies Amato that Kawaki is fighting Code, who finds it strange as Code has no sensory abilities to find him that fast. Sumire suggests a new outer ally, though Amato knows of no outer so skilled. Amato is deep in thought about what Kawaki might do. Boruto suddenly collapses in pain, Code using the opportunity to attack a distracted Kawaki. Boruto experiences another frozen time interaction with Momoshiki, who mocks his attempt to halt the Kama's extraction with medicine. He decides to kill Code and takes over Boruto, attacking with a giant Rasengan. Code evades Momoshiki's attack and is amazed by his strength as an Otsutsuki, understanding how Boruto lost to him. Momoshiki states that Code is next and resumes attacking, pressuring him. Ada contacts Code, warning him Momoshiki is too strong. Code immobilizes Kawaki, using him as a shield against Momoshiki, who needs an Otsutsuki to sacrifice for a chakra fruit. Momoshiki changes his Rasengan into a ranged precision attack, separating Code from Kawaki, who he grabs. Kawaki attempts to fight Momoshiki but is overwhelmed. Shikamaru arrives, pinning Momoshiki with his shadow, allowing Naruto to save Kawaki. Ada wonders how Code will retrieve Kawaki now. Kawaki is distressed about Naruto putting himself in danger. Shikamaru attempts to constrict Momoshiki with his shadow, but he's too strong. Code holds Shikamaru hostage and tells Momoshiki that this is an opportunity for him to take revenge on Naruto. Momoshiki revels in the opportunity for making the son kill his father. Kawaki fails to stop Momoshiki, who aims an ultra big ball Rasengan at them. Thinking on his wish for power to protect Naruto, Kawaki absorbs it, manifesting a new Kama to everyone's surprise. Ada tells Code Amato never intended to let Kawaki make a choice in the matter, probably restoring it along with his arm. Shikamaru wonders who Code is talking to. Momoshiki wonders what Amato is scheming and admonishes Kawaki for always being used by someone else. Kawaki manifests Ishiki's dojutsu and uses his abilities against Momoshiki, startling everyone. Kawaki confirms to Naruto he's himself and asks him not to interfere while he does what he does for Naruto. Kawaki and Momoshiki fight more evenly, Kawaki making hand seals for a fire release with Momoshiki's hand. They fight atop a disruption cube. Momoshiki flies to evade Kawaki's weapons and charges back with a Rasengan. Boruto begins to resurface, allowing Kawaki to hit Momoshiki with a chakra rod. He attempts to crush Momoshiki with a cube, but Naruto saves Boruto. Naruto tells Kawaki it's enough, but he's determined to kill Momoshiki. Naruto can't kill Boruto, so Kawaki 
will. Boruto stands up, disappointed the meds didn't work after all. Kawaki asks if Boruto remembers his promise, which Boruto confirms. He pushes Naruto away with Wind Release Gale Palm and asks Kawaki to do it. Kawaki transforms his arm, ramming it through Boruto's upper body to everyone's shock. Naruto thinks back to Boruto's life as he tries to wake him up in vain. Code is surprised by Boruto's death at Kawaki's hand and the return of his comma. Ada warns him against considering sacrificing Kawaki in Boruto's place for the God Tree. Code threatens to kill Shikamaru if Kawaki approaches. Kawaki is indifferent, so Code releases Shikamaru and tries to escape. Kawaki stops them by shrinking his claw marks so Code can't use them. Kawaki mocks Code, pointing out that killing Boruto should make it clear the lengths he'll go to to protect Naruto. He goes on the offensive and pressures Code. Shikamaru goes to check in on Naruto, still in disbelief and denial about what happened, and stresses that the battle still isn't over. Kawaki tells Code that if the person who wants to meet them is also against Naruto, then he won't show them any mercy either, and blasts him point blank. Kawaki is knocked out, Code having pulled Damon through the claw mark on his head to reflect the attack. Ada is angry that Code involved Damon without a permission, but he apologizes for waking him up. Damon wants to fight, but Code sends him back to Ada. She warns him he's been doing whatever he wants a lot and stresses that Kawaki better be okay. Code tells her she can see Kawaki herself, and she assures him that had Kawaki died, she'd send Damon to kill him. Code begrudgingly admits he's not strong enough to overcome Kawaki at the moment. Shikamaru tries pinning him when he moves to collect Kawaki, says that reinforcements are on the way. Code thinks it's a bluff but is unwilling to risk it when Shikamaru points out that fighting Kawaki exhausted him. Code leaves, wanting Shikamaru to inform Amato that he'll use him to have his limiters removed. Shikamaru asks Naruto what precautions should be taken with Kawaki, considering the extremes he'll go to to protect Naruto. Naruto refuses to blame Kawaki. Shikamaru struggles to believe that Naruto doesn't blame Kawaki for Boruto's death. Boruto moves and asks who's dead to their shock. Naruto cries with joy and hugs him. Boruto has new markings on his torso and Momoshiki communicates with him. Momoshiki explains that as his vessel, Boruto is the anchor of his soul and his death would extinguish him like Ishiki. He reveals that he had to use the still unextracted portion of his kama to reconstruct the destroyed portions of Boruto's body. Because of that, Momoshiki can no longer resurrect through kama. Boruto believes this means that he wins, but Momoshiki points out that the full extraction of kama means he's fully Otsutsuki now, so he can be sacrificed to grow a god tree, something Code will realize soon. Momoshiki adds that Boruto won't be revived like that again, and Boruto points out that he was wrong before, recalling his previous warnings. Momoshiki laughs, saying that the two matters are unrelated, eagerly waiting for it to play out. Boruto explains the nature of his resurrection in Naruto and Shikamaru. Ada notifies Code of these developments. She reminds Code of the terms of their deal and warns that if he remains useless after his limiters are removed or if she determines him to be a nuisance, she'll have no qualms disposing of him. He assures her that he's already taken measures. Kawaki wakes up in the hospital, Sumide taking care of him. He wonders why he's not in prison for killing Boruto and Sumide reveals that he's fine. Kawaki comments on Amato having restored his comma and admits that for the first time he was glad to have it, needing it as otherwise Naruto would be dead. Boruto and Kawaki later talk at Hokage Rock, discussing what everything means to both of them. Kawaki is determined to eliminate threats to Naruto, and Boruto is determined to prove Momoshiki wrong. A flash forward shows the start of their fight on Hokage Rock. Omnipotence Arc Boruto explains the details of his resurrection to Amato, Kitasuke, and Sai, according to what he learned from Momoshiki. While they understand that Momoshiki can no longer resurrect through Boruto, Amato stresses that the issue of his consciousness taking over remains. Kitasuke points out the meds have worked so far, but Boruto claims he doesn't need them anymore. Unable to explain himself properly, he says he feels a bit differently than before and better able to channel Momoshiki's power. Sumide, Shikamaru, Ibiki, and Naruto watch over Kawaki, still sleeping but healed of all injuries. Shikamaru and Sumide check on Kawaki because he's unwilling to let Amato near him before interrogating him. Ibiki questions the decision not to restrain Kawaki, but Shikamaru counters that between Sukuna Hikona and Kama, Kawaki can't escape any restraints they attempt to place on him, so all they can do is avoid antagonizing him. His goal is to simply protect Naruto, so they hope he remains their ally. Naruto intends to have a long walk with Kawaki when he wakes up. Sumire notices the heavy atmosphere and asks Shikamaru about it. He attributes it to Naruto just having avoided death. Sasuke arrives with intel on code, having discovered a secret facility and that Boro's Otsutsuki cult knew about it in the Land of Snow. He lists its supposed activities, including scientific ninja tool research Kara didn't know about. It also functioned as a disposal facility for the cyborgs Jigen ordered to be scrapped. Sasuke says an acquaintance of code named Bug is there. Sasuke says he heard all about Kawaki and Shikamaru confirms it, adding only Ino, Sai, Amato, and Kotasuke know about it, still deciding how to proceed. Sasuke wants to see Boruto. At the Land of Snow facility, Ada reviews the events after Code's retreat and reveals Boruto's resurrection through Momoshiki's comma. She could determine Boruto and Momoshiki communicated, speculating that they did so in some sort of spiritual plane her Senrigan can't monitor. Code takes it as good fortune and Ada warns her that she's displeased with him using Damon without her permission. She reminds him that his job is to bring Kawaki to her and that even if after he regains his strength she determines him to be a hindrance, she and Damon will dispose of him. Code claims sadness for she doesn't even consider them comrades and reminds her of the measures he took, hearing through a claw mark he placed on Shikamaru's nape. Shikamaru checks on Amato alone, whose analysis confirms Boruto's situation. Sarada and Mitsuki check on Boruto's scar and Mitsuki asks why Code would try to kill him. Unable to tell him the truth, Boruto claims Code has poor self-control and he didn't think too far ahead. Sarada is concerned that he'll be targeted as he's fully 
with Totsuki now. Sasuke arrives, adding that he shouldn't go anywhere alone. He also determines that since Kawaki can challenge Code, he'll want his power limiters lifted, so he'll target Amato. Shikamaru gets rough with Amato, asking why he restored Kawaki's Kama on his own without his consent. Amato says Kawaki loathes Kama and would never consent, but wanted power to protect Naruto nonetheless. The Kama's manifestation required Kawaki's will, so it ultimately is something he wanted, and points out Shikamaru is alive because of it. Unwilling to let him dodge the question, he asks why he's so obsessed with Kawaki's Kama. Code emerges from the claw mark on Shikamaru. Ada thinks the conversation was just getting interesting. Code slams Shikamaru by the wall and holds Amato by the throat. He orders Amato to lift his power limiters, and Amato says his intrusion will be instantly detected. Code surprises him by knowing all it takes for Amato to look him in the eyes and issue a command. Ino detects Code and contacts Shikamaru. He tells her to inform Naruto, but not to send anyone yet. Code came because it's just them, and asks her to keep monitoring them and wait for his signal. He paralyzes Code, who can still wiggle his fingers enough to kill Amato. Shikamaru reveals he was aware of Code's claw mark on him and commands a cyborg in Amato's lab to awaken, revealing a new Delta model, reprogrammed to protect Konoha. Shikamaru orders her to attack Code. She pins him against the wall with her leg. Shikamaru reveals he baited Code into coming. He spots Code reaching into a claw mark and forces his hand out to stop him from escaping. Code says he's not escaping and pulls Ada through, shocking Amato. Amato is surprised to see Ada alive. She mocks him, and Shikamaru notices Amato is terrified, wondering who and what Ada is. Considering her as an enemy as she's with Code, Delta prepares to kick her out with a free leg, but stops before hitting Ada. Ada points out that Delta is flashing her. She obeys Ada as she commands her to release Code, shocking Shikamaru. He asks Delta what's happening, but she has no idea. Shikamaru asks Ino for backup. Sasuke apologizes to Boruto for failing to keep his promise when Momoshiki took him over, which forced Kawaki to take on that role. Sasuke explains only a few people know Kawaki killed him, which he considers fortunate as many already disapprove of Kawaki. Boruto thinks they shouldn't hate Kawaki as he asked for it, but Sasuke counters that whoever kills him will be hated. Boruto says he could have only asked for Kawaki, and Kawaki was only able to do it because they're brothers. Boruto thanks Sasuke for his forehead protector, which helped him firm his resolve and attempts to return it. Since it helped, Sasuke gifts it to him, even if Boruto thinks it's a precious memento between Sasuke and Naruto. Boruto puts it on, elated. Sasuke is concerned that he'll be the next after show resolve. Sarada and Mitsuki watch from afar, wondering what they're talking about. They think Boruto could have died and Mitsuki gets chills before thinking of him being absent when Boruto needed help, and wonders what he'd do if someone tried to kill him. Sarada feels a mix of shock, relief, and anger over what's happened. She doesn't blame Boruto, but wonders if they're so undependable. Mitsuki asks if Sarada likes Boruto, catching her off guard, and she says her wanting to do more for him is independent on the presence or absence of her feelings. She points out that Mitsuki's eyes light up when it comes to Boruto and complains that Sasuke is her father first before being Boruto's teacher. Mitsuki says they need to get stronger to face the Otsutsuki, and she adds that she also needs to to become Hokage. Kawaki wakes up in a room with Sumire and Naruto, who comments that it reminds him of the first time they met. He asks Naruto if he came to talk about old memories, and Naruto asks Sumire to leave the room. Before she leaves, he asks Naruto if he condemns him for killing Boruto, shocking her. Naruto reveals Boruto is alive thanks to the Kama. Naruto is thankful he was there, otherwise they might all be dead, and adds that Boruto feels the same. As Naruto assures Kawaki he belongs in Konoha, Ino contacts him and Sasuke, reporting Code and Ada's invasion. Sasuke tells Boruto of the attack, and the two move out. Naruto claims to have forgotten an urgent matter, and confirms to Sumire that Boruto is fine. Kawaki focuses on his Kama, manifesting Ishiki's dojutsu. Shikamaru paralyzes Ada, who is surprised he can take action against her, reasoning it's possible because his attack inflicts no harm. Shikamaru notices they're all experiencing the consequences of Ada's ability, and asks Ino to connect him with Amato, which she does. He informs Amato of their communication and warns him not to give it away before asking about Ada and her ability. Amato informs him that they're all Ada's captives, having been enchanted by her, and that Ada herself has no control over it, and the effects last until she dies. Delta is infatuated with her. Shikamaru wants to kill her, but Amato says it's futile. She tells him to relax, and he struggles to maintain his jutsu, his will impressing her. Amato warns him that resistance might damage his mind. He drops his kunai and releases his jutsu. Shikamaru thinks of the danger if Naruto and Sasuke were to come into the room. Code begins torturing Amato. Shikamaru asks Ada her motive, if she has a grudge against Konoha. She answers Code's reasons are personal to him and admits that she's helping him because she likes Kawaki. In exchange for helping restore his power, he'll help her with Kawaki. Shikamaru asks Ino to change the access codes to the room and stall the backups they requested. Ada thinks Shikamaru finds her foolish, but he says he's just surprised and makes a proposition to her. If she comes over to Konoha, then they can help each other and she can tell Kawaki how she feels. Code is shocked by this. Ada pauses to consider Shikamaru's offer as he reiterates the Kawaki angle. She activates her Senragon and Code protests about being left behind, but Ada tells him she has every right to consider it. Shikamaru wonders what she's doing with her eye. Naruto arrives the door but is unable to open it. Shikamaru contacts him through Ino's jutsu, explaining it's a precaution against the enemy's jutsu, and asks him not to interfere or force his way through. Sasuke and Boruto arrive as well. Ada asks Shikamaru if she locked Naruto and the others outside to protect them from her ability, shocking him with her knowledge. In thought, he understands it's about her eye, and Amato chimes in, filling him in on the Senragon's abilities. Shikamaru is very glad for Ino's jutsu. Ada confesses being surprised by his offer, having assumed they'd see her as an enemy as being part of Kara and concedes that there's no cause for hostility between her and Konoha. Shikamaru adds if she continues to ally herself with Code, she will be considered an enemy. Sumide asks Kawaki how the situation is after what happened between him and Boruto. He says Amato restored the Kama without his permission, which Sumide speculates happened when his arm was repaired. He confesses he did want it back and was glad to have it for the first time, as Naruto would be dead otherwise, admitting he needs it. 
Sumire shares her suspicions about Amato. Code continues torturing Amato, blaming his stalling for the turn of events, and demands the command code. In thoughts, Amato warns Shikamaru that he won't last long, who instead points out that Code can't kill him before getting the code, otherwise he'll never get rid of the limiters. Ada suddenly tells Code they have to retreat because Kawaki is coming toward them. Shikamaru realizes that Kawaki can shrink himself and enter the room through an air vent. Code is frustrated by it, and Shikamaru attributes it to Kawaki being able to nullify his claw marks. Amato adds that Ada's enchantment doesn't work on blood relatives or Otsutsuki. Shikamaru is angry that he didn't share that before. Amato thinks Shikamaru could call Kawaki to fight, but he almost died before when it was just Code without Ada, and he can't risk Kawaki dying. He thinks that Shikamaru would find it advantageous if Code or Kawaki both died fighting each other. Ino reminds them that it's not time to argue. Amato wants to let Ada and Code retreat, as they'll have another chance. And in the meantime, both Boruto and Kawaki can get stronger. Code sends Amato through the claw mark, though he wishes he could avoid taking him to their base. Ada hurries him, but Shikamaru paralyzes Code with his shadow and asks Ino where Kawaki is. Ada asks Delta for help, so she kicks Shikamaru who dodges, but loses focus on his jutsu. As she leaves, Ada apologizes, thanking him for his offer and Delta for her help. She hopes to meet them again and tells Delta she loves her. Delta reciprocates. Code tells Shikamaru he's been added to his revenge list and leaves. Kawaki arrives and grows back to normal size. He notices the claw marks and asks where Code is. Shikamaru requests that he gets rid of the marks and believes Amato might already be dead when Kawaki asks about him. Back at their base, Damon greets Amato. He confirms that Code will most likely kill him after having the power limiters rescinded. Amato says that's poor motivation, but Code thinks that freedom from pain and peace and death are too good for him. Amato offers to remove his limiters without any resistance if he's spared. Code wonders if he has no pride, but Amato considers it a useless concept. Code tells him to stop wasting time, and Amato issues a command. Code releases some smoke, his appearance changing a bit, including his white eyelashes. He feels good, feeling like he can't lose to anyone. He asks Amato if his wounds hurt, but feeling good offers to free him from suffering with death, lifting his clawed arm. Amato wants to talk to Ada about Kawaki, which stays code. Amato explains that Kawaki is his ace in case Konoha abandons or tries to eliminate him. She asks for elaboration, but Code thinks he's bluffing and stalling for time. Ada tells Code not to interrupt, and he thinks Amato is trying to manipulate her. Code says that with Kawaki being off limits, she can't deny him Amato as well. Ada signals Damon to act, and he holds Code in place. Code's killing intent is reflected on him as a couple cuts. He evades Damon with a claw mark. Ada asks if Code attacked Damon with intent to kill, and he says she can't complain when he fired the first shot. She reminded him he said that she'd dispose of him if he ended up being a hindrance, which confuses him. Amato points out that she has an invitation from Konoha as a way of getting close to Kawaki, which is hindered by her association with Code. Code accuses him of tricking Ada and attacks him, but Damon gets in between them, reflecting his attack. Damon says if he can't understand when Ada tells him to stop, he needs to be disposed of. In Konoha, Shikamaru explains Ada's enchanting to Naruto, Sasuke, Boruto, and Kawaki. Sasuke wonders if she's a cyborg relic like Code, and Shikamaru recalls Amato explaining that several cyborgs stronger than Jigen had been scrapped. Ada seems to be one of those based on Amato's reaction, and not the only one, mentioning that Code used someone who wasn't Ada to counter Kawaki during their fight the previous night. Code asks Ada to rein Damon in. She says he's grateful for releasing her, which is why she helped restore his power, but it's time to call it a day. Code tells her he loves her and asks if she doesn't need his power. She doesn't care for his attitude, and real or not, she has enough of his feelings. Damon teases Code, saying that Otsutsuki or anyone else will protect his sister. Code realizes Ada only needs one knight, him. He intends to best Damon, who dares him to try. Bug reveals to Code that Damon's reflection ability only works when he's touching someone else with his hands, hoping that with that knowledge and his restored powers, Code and Damon can take each other out. Damon has the upper hand as they fight, mocking Code's earlier claim of feeling that he couldn't lose. He admits Code seems stronger than Jigen, so neither Naruto or Sasuke should trouble him, but Damon considers himself stronger than any of them. Code prepares to flee, and Ada is okay with it as long as he doesn't get in her way, promising to have him killed if warranted. Code states his goal, the will he inherited from Ishiki, and says that once he's an Otsutsuki and her ability doesn't work on him, he'll truly know if he loves her or wants her dead. He escapes, taking Bug with him. Ada mockingly commends Amato for getting out of a difficult situation and separating her and Code, though he points out that she also wanted a reason to cut Code off. She claims she just wants to hear the rest of his story, ready to kill him if he's bluffing. He reiterates Kawaki is his ace as Damon jumps to ride him. He continues, explaining that Kawaki has regained his comma and now has access to Ishiki's abilities, his power likely to keep growing. As such, no one in Konoha can oppose him except for Amato. She realizes Amato has given Kawaki something other than comma. Kawaki and Emergency Shutdown Command only he can see. Because Kawaki concerns not only Konoha but other villages as well, they would have no choice but to rely on Amato. Ada accuses him of solving problems he created, and asks why he didn't implant such a command before. He explains that Jigen forbade him from doing so due to his precious vessel. Damon is confident he can beat Kawaki, but she wonders if Amato died if Konoha could rely on them. Amato finds her point interesting, but adds its insurance for his standing, his goal being different, and requiring Kawaki's comma. She tells him that she hasn't answered her question, and he says it'll take a long time, asking if she can wait until they're in Konoha. He elaborates that they should accept Shikamaru's offer to build a relationship with Kawaki. She and Damon are puzzled by the idea, but Amato assures them he'll mediate. Elsewhere, Bug complains about Code taking him, though Code saw it as rescuing him instead of leaving him to die. 
Code blames Kawaki for everything, for taking everything he cares about. He vows to kill Kawaki and wreck everything he holds dear, including the Hokage, his friends, and Konoha. Kawaki stresses to Shikamaru he doesn't know about Amato's objectives, pointing out Amato restored his comma in secret. He believes Amato's motives no longer matter, confident that Code has killed him, which Naruto admonishes him for. He also antagonizes Shikamaru, drawing more censure from Naruto. A shinobi arrives, informing Shikamaru there's an urgent phone call to him now from Amato. Amato is calling from his station on the outskirts of the Land of Snow, where he is with Ada and Damon, three to four days away from Konoha. Shikamaru asks about Code, and Amato updates him that he talked to Ada, who severed ties with him and accepted Shikamaru's proposition. Shikamaru is concerned about Code's other ally, but Amato explains who Damon is and that he's coming with her. Shikamaru accuses him of not having the authority to make such deals, and Amato says that Ada is the final authority, reminding Shikamaru that he was the one who made the proposition. Amato makes it clear that they don't want Ada and Damon as enemies. He also reveals that he had to rescind Code's power limiters, but argues that the loss of Ada's favor more than makes up for it, and that Shikamaru knows how to use the game pieces. Shikamaru tells them that there will be questions when they arrive and they hang up. Ada is displeased with Amato calling them game pieces, but he defends himself, saying that figures of speech are effective with Shikamaru. She warns him to use that cleverness to help her with Kawaki, otherwise she'll kill him out of spite, barely able to contain her hatred of him for giving her this alluring ability. Damon interjects, saying that he'll be the one doing the killing. Shikamaru asks for Naruto and all of Team 7, including Kawaki. Boruto dresses up to answer the summons, paying attention to the new marks on his chest. Hinata confirms to Boruto that he has a new mission and cries, worried that this time he might not come back. Himawari watches them. Boruto apologizes for making her worry, promising her that he'll return, having done so even after he died once. Outside, Momoshiki manifests for Boruto, chiding him for making a promise he can't keep. Boruto asks why he's still around if he can't reincarnate anymore, and Momoshiki asks in return why he clings to an existence of despair that is fast approaching, reminding Boruto of his previous warning. Momoshiki claims that Boruto will lose the will to live enough to want to escape the world, which will allow Momoshiki to take him over completely and live in his stead, his possession functioning as a reincarnation. He jabs that Boruto was always meant to be his vessel in the end. Boruto shouts at Momoshiki, vowing to keep him shoved down and in despair. Momoshiki's manifestation dissipates. Sarada and Mitsuki arrive, thinking Boruto is pumped for a mission. Sarada finds Boruto's attitude strange, while Mitsuki thinks that no matter what happens, Boruto will always be the same. Himawari says that if she became a shinobi, she could help Boruto and asks Hinata if it would make her worry more instead. Code brings Bug to the Tentails pen, explaining what the place is to him. Code is concerned that while Sasuke can no longer get there, Boruto and Kawaki as full Otsutsuki might soon master the space-time ninjutsu necessary to reach the place. Bug asks about his plan, as even at full strength, he wasn't able to defeat Damon and lost Ada as an ally. Code admits that he was outclassed by Damon, which is why Bug attempted to stop him from waking Damon up. Code feels it's no use obsessing over the past and actually thinks things are okay. He proceeds to adjust the tentails into a more manageable size, covering it with several claw marks, being able to create many more once at his full power. Code claims he'll make it smaller and more useful, molding it like clay. Smaller portions of its body become humanoid, tailed creatures bearing Code's claw marks, able to use them to travel as well. Through the marks, Code is also able to see and talk through them, showing off their usefulness. Team 7 arrives at the Hokage's office, wondering what their mission might be since they've been out of action for so long. Mitsuki points out that it would be the debut of the team since Kawaki joined. Shikamaru, Kawaki, Sumire, and Konohamaru are in the office. Boruto notes it's his first time meeting Kawaki since resurrecting. The two try acting casual. Sumire recalls her talk with Kawaki and tries to ease the mood. Shikamaru gets straight into the point, explaining their current biggest threats are Boruto, who's a full Otsutsuki, being at risk of being possessed by Momoshiki, and Kawaki, who despite not being at risk of possession, is too powerful for them to control. Sarada stresses he's just stating out the status quo. Shikamaru reveals that Amato survived his encounter with Code, but had to rescind his power limiters, placing his capability abilities as above Jigans but below Ishiki's. Sarada wonders if their mission is to take him out with Boruto and Kawaki's Otsutsuki abilities. Shikamaru denies it and continues explaining who Ada is, her entrancing ability, and how as an Otsutsuki, Boruto and Kawaki are immune to it. Sarada asks if their mission is to take her out, but again Shikamaru denies it. On a train, Amato watches Ada watching the meeting. Shikamaru explains that while originally an enemy, Amato's plan worked. Code lost her as an ally, and she's on her way to Konoha. Underlining how Ada answers to no one, they have to avoid making her an enemy. Their mission is to cohabitate with her. Konohamaru explains that Boruto and Kawaki will live with her. Ada is shocked. The boys aren't looking up to it, but Sarada realizes it's a surveillance mission. Even if Ada herself doesn't try anything, other people on the mission might act on her behalf due to her ability. They're to determine how willing she is to cooperate with Konoha, otherwise she won't be allowed to stay. Shikamaru believes she'll agree and reveals her crush on Kawaki Kawaki to everyone's surprise and Ada's embarrassment. Amato asks her what's going on and Damon notices her heart racing. She feels that this is exactly what she wanted. Shikamaru tells Kawaki to be very mindful of how he acts with Ada. Boruto asks why she'd crush on Kawaki, who's immune to her ability, if she can have anyone else fall for her. Sumire proposes that Ada wants a genuine experience. Kawaki finds it all illogical. 
Kawaki proceeds to reveal Ada's clairvoyance and that they should consider everything in their conversation leaked, addressing Ada herself on the beginning of their diplomatic maneuvering. Kawaki would rather fight Code, and Shikamaru points out that his location is impossible to nail down, which is something Ada can help them with. Konohamaru adds that Boruto is to act as a mediator between Ada and Kawaki, which he finds annoying, while Konohamaru, Sarada, and Mitsuki report on them from afar, including if Boruto is acting normal. Shikamaru asks them if they'll do it, not if they can do it. Boruto asks that they don't really have the option to refuse. Sasuke discusses the mission with Naruto, considering it glorified house arrest. Naruto explains Shikamaru's logic, and that Boruto and Kawaki wouldn't stand aside to avoid fighting someone if they can't beat them or have ordered to do it, so giving them responsibility through a mission will covertly control them. Shikamaru says they might have to act without specific orders if something unexpected happens. Kawaki perceives Momoshiki's presence by Boruto for an instant. Sasuke also recognizes the feeling. Ada finds Shikamaru's ideas intriguing. Ada, Damon, and Amato arrive in Konoha. They're greeted by Sai and Shikamaru, Sai and other civilians becoming attracted to Ada. She informs Shikamaru she's aware of and accepts his cohabitation plan. Shikamaru notices Damon. Sai offers to take her to her lodgings, but she refuses, saying she doesn't need a guide and takes off flying, already knowing the destination. Damon riding her piggyback and says she doesn't like standing out. Shikamaru finds that flying makes her stand out. Amato tells him that flying is common among the Otsutsuki and they should expect Boruto and Kawaki to start flying soon. Shikamaru tells him it's time to say everything he knows. At the house they live in, Boruto admires it. Konohamaru admitting that they had a strong arm the future owner because of the mission. Kawaki is bothered by Boruto's cheeriness. Boruto retorting that their mission is to live there. Konohamaru stresses the importance of getting along with Ada. Kawaki recalls perceiving Momoshiki by Boruto. Sarada and Mitsuki watch the house from theirs, her finding it odd to do so in plain sight. Mitsuki assures her that they just have to apply a little bit of pressure, but she remains worried. Shigadai, Inujin, and Chocho arrive, curious about their mission. Inujin is interested in the beautiful woman who Chocho considers her rival over Kawaki. Mitsuki alerts Sarada of Ada's arrival, surprising her in her flight. Inujin, Chocho, and Mitsuki are attracted to her. Shigadai couldn't see her face clearly. Konohamaru informs the boys he'll return to his post and reminds them of the support from the sensor unit and the communications link. Sarada contacts Konohamaru, but he's surprised by Ada's arrival. Chocho, Inujin, and Mitsuki want to get closer to Ada. Sarada wonders if she and Shikadai weren't affected by Ada's ability over not seeing her well or individual variation. Moegi arrives, having told Team 10 not to go there and plans their punishment. She asks Sarada about Konohamaru, concerned for him. Ada comments on Moegi's concern for him, causing Konohamaru to faint. Boruto checks on him and asks Ada to come out so they can talk. Damon attacks, introducing himself as Ada's little brother, surprising them as they didn't know about him. Damon antagonizes them and goads Kawaki into attacking him, which Damon reflects. Kawaki uses Sukuni Hikona, but Damon reacts in time to grab the chakra rods to avoid being stabbed. Damon knocks both of them out. When Boruto wakes up, Ada is holding Kawaki unconscious on her lap and she apologizes for the harsh greeting. Damon said they had to show from the start that defying them wouldn't end well. Kawaki wakes up and Ada blushes when he looks at her. Damon asks if he agrees that Ada's lap is nice and soft. Shikamaru contacts Boruto through the intercom, asking if they met Ada and Damon. Boruto says that Damon baptized them by fire, and Shikamaru apologizes, having wished to make proper introductions, but Ada took off flying. Shikamaru and Naruto are with Amato, and they want him to tell them everything. Boruto thinks it'll be quite a mission. Amato summarizes Ada and Damon's abilities. Boruto is skeptical of Damon reflecting even murderous intent, but Kawaki tests it and confirms it, receiving a hit just by thinking about it. Naruto asks Amato how he developed such abilities, and he explains that he is only human, and didn't create the abilities, having merely transplanted them. Amato elaborates that these abilities were developed by Shibai Otsutsuki, who ascended to godhood by repeating consuming several chakra fruits and resurrecting through Kama, of whom only his corpse remains. Transplanting DNA from Shibai's remains sometimes grants the recipient one or more of his abilities. Shikamaru checks with Katasuke, while not confident that transplanting of such abilities can be achieved through human technology, the advanced technology he has witnessed in the airship and in Kawaki's body makes him consider the possibility. Giving examples of Shibai's abilities, he explains that they were not ninjutsu or senjutsu, but rather divine miracles called shinjutsu, of which he deems ninjutsu merely an attempt to replicate, which events Sarada. He clarifies which abilities from Ishiki and Code are also shinjutsu, including Kama. Shikamaru asks how Shibai is dead when Kama allows one to live forever and if he was killed. Amato admits he doesn't know and theorizes that Shibai might have evolved so much that he reached a form that foregoes the need for a physical body and he discarded it. Amato explains that Otsutsuki shinjutsu gives him hope to resurrect his daughter. Delta approaches Sarada and Mitsuki, asking permission to see Ada. Sarada refuses, seeing that she's partially affected by Ada's enchanting ability. Sumire arrives and issues Delta's shutdown code. They note that Ada's ability is very strong, able to overcome Delta's programming, causing her to disobey Katasuke and Sumire. Mitsuki notes he needs to be careful, and Sarada realizes Ada is more fearsome than she thought. Amato explains that his daughter Akabi, who died 12 years prior, suffered from a disease of unknown origin, for which there was no treatment or cure. He wasn't concerned about the illness, finding it better to give her a cloned body, which she already had more experience with instead of developing new medications, and having successfully preserved her brain, from which he was able to extract and digitize her memories. Nine months after her death, at age 24, he completed Delta, who, despite looking and sounding the same, and having all of her memories, had a completely different personality. He tried many times but failed to bring his daughter back, which finally broke him. At that time, Ishiki approached Amato as Jigen, promising him to reunite him with his daughter in exchange for helping him in his goal. He didn't know at the time that Ishiki's goal would doom the planet, making Akibi's resurrection moot. He still wants to resurrect his daughter, and having discovered Kama Resurrection, determined that that what it does is precisely what he wanted for his daughter. Sumire now understands Amato's goal. Amato added Akebi's data to Kawaki's restored Kama, wishing to apply it to a cloned body he'll prepare, hoping to finally get his daughter back. 
Boruto confesses that he thought Amato's goal was a lot more nefarious. Still suspicious, Shikamaru asks Ada to confirm Amato's claims. Momochigi contacts Boruto, their thoughts now able to cross over due to Boruto being restored with Momochigi's data. He asks not to let Kawaki catch on and voices his suspicion of Amato. He confirms the claims about Shibai and has deep knowledge about all extant Shinjutsu, confirming that the Senrigan is a Shinjutsu but that her enchanting ability is not. Ada confirms that Akebi existed and died according to Amato's claim. Boruto asks Momoshiki about their situation, Momoshiki claiming their thoughts are available to each other against their wills. Boruto suddenly has a vision of his friends and other Konoha nin chasing down Kawaki. Ada notices Boruto's expression. Boruto is confused by the visions. Momoshiki notes that Boruto saw fragments of the same thing he saw. Recalling Momoshiki's previous words, he wonders if they're versions of the future. Amato confirms what Naruto understood from his goal. Shikamaru asks Ada about Akebi's personality and if she might be hostile to Konoha. Ada finds it a strange question but confirms that she seemed normal and not at all like Delta. Amato says he's not even a shinobi and has no world toppling goals. Shikamaru finds it anticlimactic but understands as apparent. Since it doesn't endanger Konoha, Naruto won't interfere in matters between Kawaki and Amato but asks why Amato said nothing about it before. Amato answers that it was none of their business and there was nothing they could do to help. He wanted to push things carefully because Kawaki hates Kama. Kawaki confirms this having wanted him to get rid of it because he considered Kama as the source of all that happened to him, but he now understands that the Otsutsuki who embedded it into him are the ones to blame. They wouldn't have also threatened Naruto's life. He asks Amato if the process would turn Akebi into an Otsutsuki. He confesses he doesn't know and, exhausted, considers it his last resort. Ada says she's tired and asks to call it a day. They agree and she says they'll talk again the next day. At night, Boruto thinks about Momoshiki's warning. The next day, during a meal, Boruto asks why Ada picked Kawaki if he's also an eligible Otsutsuki. Damon teases Boruto, who has to control himself not to trigger Damon's ability. Ada explains she finds Boruto too young for her, Damon further teasing him. Kawaki asks her about using Code and his partnership to get close to him, understanding that Code didn't go after him in deference to her. He deduces that she sold Boruto out to Code for the agreement. Ada blushes through it all, elated that Kawaki used her name. Damon gives him a backhanded compliment on his intelligence. Kawaki thinks that all those who want things from him are scum. Damon threatens to attack him, and Boruto thinks that this is the worst situation. Ada slams her hands on the table and declares that there aren't enough girls so she can't express herself properly. She checks with the Senrigan and asks for Sarada and Sumide to join them. Sarada prepares to go, and Konohamaru advises Mitsuki against joining, pointing out how he was strongly affected by Ada's entrancing. Delta tries to join, but Sumide threatens to shut her down again. Shigadai offers to join over his earlier resistance, having gotten permission from his father. When they meet, Shigadai is affected, and Ada asks him to go home. Sarada deduces that his earlier resistance was on account of her not seeing her face well. Sarada notices Sumide's uneasiness when Ada welcomes them and invites them to talk away from the boys. Boruto watches them from a distance as Damon and Kawaki trade insults. Ada tells the girls how Kawaki makes her feel. Sarada finds her focus on love stupid and lies that everyone must feel it when Ada asks her opinion. Sumide asks Ada what she likes about Kawaki and she answers she doesn't quite know, beyond not being affected by her ability. Through the mind link, Sumide asks Sarada not to react and asks if she's not affected by Ada's entrancing. Looking past the tension, Sarada notices she's not, Sumide adding that she's not affected either and they wonder why. She warns Sarada not to let Ada realize this as their immunity means they can't attack her, telling her to act as if affected. Ada asks Sarada her opinion on Boruto and she passes off the hesitation as symptoms of the entrancing. Ada resents her ability, even robbing her of the possibility of real friends. Sumide contacts Shikamaru, informing her of their discovery. Boruto defeats Damon in video games. Shikamaru tells Sumide not to let Damon realize it either, and advises against informing Boruto and Kawaki, making it harder to leak accidentally. Sarada attempts to befriend Ada. If Konoha ever decides that Ada is an enemy, Shikamaru points out that they might be necessary to take her down. Boruto hears Momoshiki's thoughts, realizing the identity of Ada's entrancing ability. Momoshiki refuses to share when Boruto asks for details. Kawaki realizes from Boruto's expression that he's communicating with Momoshiki and addresses Momoshiki himself, telling him to come out. Boruto tries acting like Momoshiki isn't around, but Kawaki continues telling him to come out. The commotion draws Sarada and Sumide's attention, Sumide recalling the conversation from when he killed Boruto. Sarada stresses that there should be no infighting during a mission, which Kawaki counters that Otsutsuki don't care about the mission. Damon agrees while Ada observes. Shikamaru tells him to stand down. Kawaki assures them that his gut is telling him that Momoshiki's up to something. Shikamaru tells him to recall Naruto's face when he saw Boruto dead and consider that he actually needs to do. Kawaki lets go of Boruto and leaves for an errand. Shikamaru orders the sensors to keep track of Kawaki, but he erases his chakra signature. Boruto asks Mitsuki which way Kawaki went, but he saw nothing. Boruto deducing Kawaki shrank himself. Ada decides to go out as well. Shikamaru asks if Boruto can sense Kawaki like he did before. Boruto can sense his presence, but can't pinpoint his location. Konohamaru warns Mitsuki against looking for Ada. Ada isn't bothered by Kawaki's departure and asks the girls to go with her. She warns Boruto she doesn't want to butt heads. Boruto checks with Shikamaru who relents and instructs Boruto to accompany her while he and the sensors try looking for Kawaki. In Kara's dimension, Bug drinks, uneasy about Code's claw grime, and regrets learning Code has created over a thousand of them. Code wishes he could launch a surprise attack on Konoha, but Ada being there means he has no element of surprise. 
Ada notifies Shikamaru of the claw grime and explains Code's resentment of Kawaki, why he targets things that Kawaki loves. Ada can't decide on which clothes to buy. Sumide and Sarada agree that she looks good in everything. Boruto feels out of place waiting on them, but Damon teases him, finding everyone weak. He asks if there are any strong fighters, and upon him feeling something, rushes outside to find Himawari, asking who she is. Boruto pulls him off of Himawari, who explains that she's buying bread and tea their mother likes. Damon moves to attack Himawari, but stops, confused when she braces for impact instead of dodging. Boruto explains Himawari isn't even a shinobi and doesn't know how to fight, which leaves Damon puzzled by the intensity he felt from her. Boruto concedes that Himawari is scary when she snaps and immediately disapproves when he thinks Damon has a crush on her. A sensor keeps watch over Naruto's home while he and Hinata prepare for dinner. Hinata wishes Boruto and Kawaki could join them and asks how long their mission will take. Naruto thinks it'll be a while as they're all stubborn problem children. Kawaki appears and asks them not to alert the lookouts. He wants to talk to Naruto. He reiterates how much Naruto has changed him and how much Naruto means to him. His world revolves around Naruto, but he thinks that this world is crap because of the Otsutsuki and good people like Naruto are the first to die because of them. Naruto thinks it's a shinobi's job to deal with these kind of threats, but Kawaki disagrees, thinking that they're first to die. Not wanting Naruto to die, Kawaki has decided to use his Otsutsuki powers to destroy every last Otsutsuki and came here to properly inform Naruto. He confesses he felt guilty over failing to kill Boruto. Hinata slaps him, accusing him of being insane for thinking that, and he concedes that only someone insane would kill their brother. He assures them he's calm and thinking straight, and that since they would never be able to do it, he'll do it even if he has to bear their hate. Naruto says Kawaki would have to kill him before killing Boruto and asks him if he could still do it. He says that he's not asking them to understand and sends them away with a comma rift. They're welcome to kill him after he's done. Shikamaru is notified that Naruto and Hinata's chakra have vanished and wonders if Code is involved. One of the investigators mentioned that for a moment, Kawaki's chakra signature has registered. Himawari arrives home to find it being investigated. Boruto wonders if Kawaki would do it. Shikamaru asks Ada to verify it and she confirms that Kawaki was responsible but can't track him down when he shrunk. Boruto leaves to search for Kawaki. Ada reviews Kawaki's conversation with Naruto and announces Kawaki might be trying to kill Boruto again. Sarada is shocked to hear that Kawaki killed Boruto before, having thought it was code. Shikamaru explains to her that Boruto asked for it to protect them from Momoshiki, likely the same reason he'd try again. Sumire tries to stop her and Shikamaru warns that Kawaki can't be reasoned with as he's too unstable. Sarada is frustrated that she only learned Boruto was killed after he was resurrected, unaware that he was even in danger. She feels she can't do nothing when she does know and leaves against Shikamaru's orders. Kawaki intercepts Boruto on his way home on the Hokage Rock, trying to send him away as well. Boruto stops it with his comma. He returns to his normal size and explains where he sent Naruto and Hinata away with Dekokuten, the dimension that they're in frozen in time so they won't starve or die. Kawaki attacks Boruto with cubes and his transformed arm. Boruto tries reasoning with him, but Kawaki is focused on killing him over being an Otsutsuki. The two continue fighting. Sai updates a motto on the developments, Sukuna Hikona making it difficult to pin him down, and that Kawaki's non-cooperation may require use of extreme measures. Sarada arrives and attacks Kawaki, who absorbs her fire release. He tells her not to interfere, and Boruto wants her to run. Sarada thinks it's all more reason for her to stay, as a shinobi who aims to become Hokage. Kawaki thinks shinobi are truly fated to die early and slashes at her. Boruto jumps out in front of it, protecting her, but gets his right eye slashed. He wants her to move aside. Mitsuki extends his arm, holding Kawaki's, and Shikamaru paralyzes him with his shadow, which prevents Kawaki from shrinking. Mitsuki blocks Kawaki's arm so he can't absorb jutsu with his comma. Sasuke holds a sword to Kawaki's neck, warning him against resisting. Konohamaru helps Boruto. Shikamaru asks what Kawaki did to Naruto and Hinata. He says that he did what he had to for their sake and Konoha's. They can't reach an understanding. Momoshiki manifests through Boruto and absorbs Shikamaru's jutsu, freeing Kawaki to shrink away from Mitsuki. Momoshiki tells Kawaki he can't afford to have himself taken in if he wants to kill him. Kawaki is confused by Momoshiki's assistance, who urges him not to waste the opportunity. He shrinks again in time to evade Mitsuki. Shikamaru reasons that Kawaki's extensive of shrinking will take a toll on his chakra, and they should strike when he's recovering, ordering the shinobi to look for him. Sasuke wonders why Momoshiki would help Kawaki, who wants him dead. Boruto returns, and Sarada blames herself for his eye. Boruto blames Kawaki, which Mitsuki agrees with. Boruto sees Momoshiki, who tells him he lost one of his blue eyes already, adding that the ending has begun and can no longer be stopped. Boruto demands an explanation from Momoshiki, but he doesn't elaborate. Shikamaru leads the hunt for Kawaki, instructing the sensors to stay sharp for the moment Kawaki exhausts himself and his chakra signature returns. Team 10 wants to search for Kawaki before Moegi stops them. Konohamaru orders Sarada and Mitsuki to take Boruto to the hospital, where he and Sasuke join the search for Kawaki. After they leave, Mitsuki abandons Sarada to join the search. She recalls Mitsuki's words about what he'd do if someone tried killing Boruto. Boruto tells her not to leave Mitsuki alone as he's lost his cool, making him dangerous. Sarada goes after him. Kawaki no longer has enough chakra to maintain Tsukuni Hikona, returning to normal size near a search party. Ada finds him with the Senrigan and flies away after him, leaving Damon and Sumide behind. Amato contacts Shikamaru, asking him not to kill Kawaki, revealing he can issue a shutdown command like with Delta. Shikamaru admonishes him for still keeping secrets, and while sympathetic to Amato's need for Kawaki for Akebi, remains firm about considering Kawaki an enemy to be eliminated if he doesn't surrender completely, further distressing Amato. Ada finds Kawaki, telling him she's on his side. He complains that by being unable to erase her presence, she's broadcasting his. She vows to protect him. He elaborates he doesn't care about himself, just Naruto, stressing that if Momoshiki isn't taken out, Naruto and Konoha, which Naruto fought to protect, will be eliminated. Kawaki grabs Ada and agonizes over Boruto being Momoshiki's vessel, wondering who could bring themselves to kill the Hokage's son, making enemies out of so many allies, and wonders why it couldn't have been a nobody who no one would mourn. 
Something triggers between them as they float, sending a flash around the entire planet. Everyone notices it, including Damon, who is out looking for Ada. The search party finds Ada and Kawaki. Momoshiki sneers at Boruto. Kawaki prepares to attack the search party, but Ada holds him back, telling him something's off. Shikamaru is notified of their location, and immediately after of Boruto's location. Sarada finds it strange why Boruto's location would be shared. Momoshiki teases Boruto and tells him to turn around. Sarada and Mitsuki find him, and he asks Sarada what happened. She's also interested in finding out. Mitsuki tells her to maintain a distance and enters sage mode, preparing to attack Boruto, shocking them both. One of the shinobi asks Kawaki about his eye wound to his confusion. Ada asks about Naruto, referring to him as Kawaki's father. The shinobi answers the only thing they know is that Boruto did something. Boruto doesn't understand when Mitsuki asks what he did to Naruto, and Momoshiki warns him of Mitsuki's attack from below. Sarada doesn't understand how Mitsuki could attack Boruto. Momoshiki tells Boruto everyone is out to kill him and explains that this is the true nature of Ada's ability to entrance people, the omnipotent Shinjutsu she can't control herself. He describes it as a programming language gods have used to create worlds to make anything real. He elaborates that her charm was just a reflection of her desires made real by the Shinjutsu, something Amato had no way of truly knowing based on the observable effects. He reveals that through Ada, Kawaki's desire became reality, exchanging their positions in the collective memory. Shikamaru asks Ada for more information on how Naruto and Hinata disappeared, but she doesn't think it'll be useful. Useful. Kawaki tells her to say Naruto died by Boruto's hand. Momoshiki continues the explanation, saying that if everyone's consciousness is connected by chakra and a god can meddle with it, and asks if Boruto never wondered if an Otsutsuki who achieved godhood may have tampered with humanity's memory before. He adds that omnipotence doesn't affect those Otsutsukified, nor Ada as the user, and notes that Sarada doesn't seem to be affected either, noting that those immune to it are the ones who suffer the most. He summarizes that now Kawaki is the Hokage's son who was born and raised in Konoha, and Boruto is the ungrateful outsider being hunted. At Kawaki's behest, as he threatened her by grabbing her by the collar, Ada lies to Shikamaru that Boruto killed Naruto. Shikamaru relays the information to the search party. Sarada tries to convince Mitsuki not to go after Boruto. Sumide suspects the flash of light has something to do with it. Sarada is stunned by the news and Mitsuki goes searching for Boruto. Ada asks if he had to go this far. Kawaki is glad that now no one will interfere with him killing Boruto, planning to keep Naruto and Hinata sealed until he has killed Boruto and Code. Damon arrives, asking if he did something with his sister, annoying him. Sasuke finds Sarada, asking if she's okay, noting Mitsuki's absence. She is shocked when Sasuke comments on the situation with Boruto and Kawaki, his perception altered as everyone else's. Sumide contacts her and asks her if she's of sound mind. Team 10 ambushes Boruto, admonishing him for killing Naruto. Sarada is confused, but Sumide assures her that they are both fine. Sasuke is concerned by Sarada's disposition. Sumide shares her suspicion that Ada is somehow responsible for the change, pointing out that the two of them were likewise not affected and surmising a Shinjutsu was likely involved, a drastic measure to save Kawaki. Sarada is deeply anguished by Boruto's predicament. She he pleads with Sasuke that everyone is being deceived, but he believes that Boruto killed Naruto, something he can't ignore. Momoshiki taunts Boruto and offers to take over and kill Team 10 for him, but Boruto dismisses him. Sarada begs Sasuke to trust her, even if he doesn't understand, and asks him to help Boruto. Sasuke notices that she's awakened the monk Yakyo Sharingan. Momoshiki continues to needle Boruto, trying to convince him to give in to despair so he can take over. Sasuke rescues Boruto, confusing Team 10. As they leave the village, Sasuke shares his memories of Kawaki. Ada checks on something with her Senrigan and tells Kawaki to return without her, while she and Damon go somewhere else. Sasuke and Boruto rest for a bit beyond the reach of Konoha's sensors, though not Ada. Boruto asks why Sasuke is helping him if he believes he's the enemy. He explains that Boruto has the forehead protector he gave Kawaki, and he can feel Momoshiki's presence in him, despite remembering Momoshiki being in Kawaki. Several of the things bothering him are doing so less and less, fearing how undependable his memories might be. Sasuke has decided that if he doesn't trust his own memories, he'll believe Sarada, finding it worth risking his life to help him because she asked him. He tells Boruto to validate Sarada's belief. Momoshiki continues to bemean Boruto's situation, stressing that Ada's changes with omnipotence cannot be undone, even killing her wouldn't revert them. Boruto mocks Momoshiki's panic and desperation, telling him to stay quiet, dead as he is. Ada arrives with Damon and apologizes to Boruto. She checks what he already knows and explains that she only wanted to help Kawaki, but something else happened unintentionally. She compares it to when everyone first became captivated by her. Boruto explains what the Shinjutsu did, this change reflecting what Kawaki wanted. She notes how calm he is about it, thinking that he'd be more depressed. Boruto does feel crushed, but is thinking deeply about what Kawaki experienced since he was little. He realizes he might have angered Kawaki by trying to relate to him before. Ada tells him she thinks Kawaki does think of him as a brother. Sasuke tells Boruto that Naruto had been similarly shunned and had nothing, but turned it around through his actions, so he should do the same. Momoshiki is incensed by Boruto's determination. Boruto addresses him, pointing out he hasn't lost everything, stressing that he has the blood of his father, his Hyuga mother, and the Hokage grandfather in him, and most importantly, he's a Konoha shinobi with the will of fire. He considers himself responsible for pushing Kawaki into taking such drastic measures, and is determined to get as strong as possible to turn their situation into a mere sibling's quarrel, believing it to be what Naruto would do. Ada asks if he's really 12, and in an attempt to make up for her part in putting him in this situation, she promises not to look for him or Sasuke until they return to Konoha. She thinks it's her fault that Kawaki is acting like a coward, which makes her sick. Boruto thanks her, and asks her to thank Sarada for sending Sasuke to him. Damon wants Boruto to grow strong enough that he'd have to fight at full strength for the first time ever. Boruto doesn't think several lifetimes would be enough for that. Sasuke says they should get going. Konoha unlikely to give up on their pursuit. Boruto thanks him, but he credits it to Sarada. Sumide joins Sarada, who wishes Boruto to be safe.
Code continues to vow revenge on Boruto for stealing Jigen, Ishiki, and Ada from him. Kawaki is determined to kill Boruto as long as he's Otsutsuki. Boruto is determined to prove that he is indeed Boruto Uzumaki. Boruto, Two Blue Vortex, Boruto's Return Arc. Three years after Boruto and Sasuke left Konoha, Sarada once again tries to speak on Boruto's behalf to Shikamaru, now the 8th Hokage. He's resolute that Boruto crossed the line after being given many chances, and Konohamaru, now Shikamaru's attendant, adds that they have Ada's testimony with her Senrigan. Shikamaru adds that even if he rescinded kill orders for Boruto, many villagers would still hate him for killing Naruto, and tells her to return to her missions. She melts off to him, and he expresses concern for her shinobi career, saying she might stay a genin forever. She asks if that's because Sasuke is a traitor as well, but he denies it. She points out Naruto's own history of bringing back Sasuke, Sasuke, a missing nin, and becoming Hokage while still a genin, declaring that he's her role model, not Shikamaru. Kawaki visits the imprisoned Naruto and Hinata. Sarada discusses her meeting and outburst with Sumide, who recapitulates how they're the ones deemed weird, remembering true history. While some inconsistencies bothered others, and even Shikamaru at first, like Kawaki's body being modified by Kara, suddenly supposedly being born and raised in Konoha, and Momoshiki's absence in Kawaki, Omnipotent slowly dissipated these concerns over the years. They wonder how they could go against such an ability and visit Ada and Damon. Damon deems it an unwinnable game, and Ada seems to have started to understand how it worked. She summarizes what Omnipotence is and how it works. She doesn't know if there's a way to reverse it, but thinks it'll be useless to try convincing those affected. Sarada considers the truth reasonable enough to explain to others, but Ada points out that from everyone else's perspectives, hers and Subide's memories are the ones that come across as altered. Ada feels it would be more practical to rewrite new memories, which comes with its own risks. She's still puzzled by the retention of their memories when they're not Otsutsuki, raising the question if they're actually entranced by her. Recalling Shikamaru's warnings not to be found out, especially by Damon, they play it off as putting an effort to hide their feelings. Damon continues to watch them. Mitsuki checks on Kawaki, who is bothered by Mitsuki's killing intent. He believes Boruto still wants to kill Kawaki, and has likely developed the ability to erase his chakra signature. Kawaki reminds him that he can still sense Boruto. He's fine with Mitsuki wanting to protect him, but asks him not to follow him around like a pervert. Kawaki is notified that some claw marks were discovered and flies off, leaving Mitsuki to mutter to himself that Kawaki is his son. Himawari spars with Chocho. They're joined by Shigadai and Inajin, who praise Himawari's performance. She confesses that she doesn't want to get strong just for the sake of it, but because she wants to help Boruto. What everyone says about him doesn't match what she remembers, and she doesn't believe that he'd kill her father, recalling him protecting them before. She feels that there must be an explanation, which means Boruto is in deep trouble and believes that her father is still alive. Kawaki shrinks the newly discovered claw mark. The Konoha Shinobi wonder why Code never attacked despite becoming so close, and wonders if he's prioritizing Boruto, who he held a grudge against in his way from the village. Kawaki discovers a claw mark on one of their necks, getting rid of it. He notifies Shikamaru and wants to gather everyone who is investigated to check them for marks and shrink any they find. Claw Grimes emerge from Shinobi around the village and attack. The unknown chakra is detected. Shikamaru orders Konohamaru to coordinate evacuation and ponders why Code would attack now. Kawaki and Sarada fight the Grime, with more arriving through each other's claw marks. Code emerges and greets Sarada, telling her that he's looking for Boruto. She tells him that Boruto left three years ago, but he knows that, having chased him for almost two. Now he wants to draw Boruto in by attacking his friends in Konoha. Boruto arrives, stepping on Code's face, telling him that his attitude is why girls are creeped out by him. Kawaki senses him, as do the censors who notify Shigamaru. Ada begins watching with her Senrigan. Shigamaru prioritizes fighting Code, but wants everyone on alert to find out Boruto's plan. Boruto faces off against Code, while Kawaki is more interested in Boruto's resurgence. Code is surprised by how fast Boruto reappeared, forgetting not attacking Konoha sooner. Boruto threatens him to withdraw the claw grime. Code incredulous at that, believing it to be a bluff, recalling how Boruto fled two years prior. Boruto remains resolute, assuring Code that he'll lose more than just his left eye this time. Boruto asks Sarada to help the rest of the civilians, promising to talk later. Shigadai paralyzes three grimes for Chocho to attack. Another one emerges behind her, but Inojin catches it, arriving on an ink bird with Himawari. The grime slashes the bird's left wing with its tail, causing it to lose balance and toss Himawari off, the grime attempting to bite her. Kawaki arrives flying, yelling, at Inujin and Himawari to get out of the way, attacking the Grime. Inujin catches Himawari. On the ground, a Grime opens a Rinnegan, interested in Kawaki. Himawari thanks Kawaki, who berates her for calling him Big Brother despite his request not to do so. Shikamaru finds the Grime stronger than the rest. It jumps between Grimes to slam Kawaki into the ground from behind, referring to him as Otsutsuki. Shigadai paralyzes it, and Kawaki activates his Kama, angry at the Otsutsuki appellation, and blasts the Grime. Shigadai is concerned as more Grimes arrive. Kawaki determined to destroy them no matter what the outcome. Boruto effortlessly cuts down six Grimes surrounding him, somewhat validating his threat in Code's eyes. He is unconcerned with the Grimes, their number is so great, and considering them mere tools. Boruto doesn't think Code understands the horrors of the Ten Tails. Sarada defeats more Grimes with fire release, great fireball technique, and Chidori. Other Konoha Shinobi wonder if she's really a Genin, but she thinks that ranks don't matter. Another Grime attacks her from behind, attempting to bite her, but Soegi blocks it, being bitten instead. The Grime turns into a tree, growing around and consuming Soegi. The same happens with another bitten Shinobi. Code is aware that the Ten Tails attempt to bite anyone on instinct until they eat an Otsutsuki to turn into a god. 
God Tree. Boruto adds that Code's meddling with them changed that, telling him to scrap them while he still can control them. Otherwise, the worst possible future will come for everyone. Code is undeterred as his goal lies beyond the future of a dead planet through the consumption of a chakra fruit. Boruto once again offers to spare Code in exchange for guiding him to where the Tentail's main body is. He believes that killing Code is easy and is offering him a chance not to die in vain. Code finds Boruto to be insane, certain that he'll be the one to die. Boruto prepares to attack. Code thinks he recognizes Boruto's Rasengan, finding him a one-trick pony, but the swirling begins to envelop Boruto instead of just forming in his hand. Code wonders if Boruto's new Rasengan is his vanishing one, but discards the possibility. He uses claw marks to strike him from behind. Boruto dodges. Code grabs him by the wrist, but Boruto blocks Code's other hand with his sword. Code thinks Boruto can't hit him, but Boruto reveals his technique is already affecting him. The swirling begins to envelop Code, and Boruto asks him again where the Tentails is, threatening to kill him. Code attempts to strike him, but can't land a hit, finding Boruto's movements be beyond dodging, also ruling out clones and Genjutsu. Boruto has landed his Rasengan Uzuhiko. Watching, Ada is unimpressed by Boruto's jutsu, but Damon realizes it makes use of planetary spin, considering it nifty. Code tries to stand, but falls down due to vertigo. Boruto explains his jutsu, considering the planet's counterattack, the damage never stopping as long as the planet continues to spin. Boruto can rescind the effects if Code takes him to the Tentails. Kawaki attacks Boruto, arriving with Team Ten and Himawari. Shigadai asks what Boruto is doing, and Boruto tells him not to interrupt his attempt to make a deal. Code attempts to escape, but Kawaki shrinks the claw marks. Shikamaru asks for a report, and Kawaki tells him he has dealt with the last of Code's marks, cutting off his escape, and can likely kill him on account of how drained he is against Boruto. Kawaki antagonizes Boruto, giving Code an opening to call forth a claw grime with a mark on his face and escape through it. Shikamaru gives the order to kill every grime. Sarada and another shinobi check on the tree that grew around Soegi, believing to be a defective god tree, and determine that Soegi is still alive. Kawaki mocks Boruto's Uchiha-like outfit. Boruto is glad that Himori looks well. Kawaki thinks Boruto came home to die, and while dying in Konoha doesn't sound bad to him, Boruto still has things to do. A hidden toad in his collar reports to Boruto that Code returned to his base. Code stumbles past a tree with Bug before arriving at the pen with an emaciated Tentails. A toad Boruto planted on Code reports the Tentails' presence to Boruto. Code recalls Boruto's warnings about the claw grime, dismissing it as their only instinct is to devour others. The toad on Boruto hurries him, who replies that he's not as skilled as his grandfather. Kawaki notices Boruto talking, but not the toad. Boruto teleports to Code's location with the Flying Thunder God technique, surprising him. In the time it takes for Boruto to walk toward the pen, the Tentails has vanished. The toad planted on Code is puzzled, considering him incapable of taking such an action at that moment. Boruto notices a claw grime tree nearby, and a grime who Code mistakes for bug shows up. Boruto explains that what's in front of them is a god tree. It attacks Boruto, referring to him as an Otsutsuki, asking if he came to offer himself to be devoured. Boruto repels it with lightning release, but it changes its arm to a mouth to eat him. Boruto teleports back to Code's side, who demands an explanation as he falls down. Boruto rescinds the effects of the Rasengan Uzuhiko, telling him to prepare for an attack. He explains that everyone turned into a tree has become one such god tree. Another god tree shows up, floating above them, explaining that thanks to Code's interference, they have developed self-awareness. Another god tree, resembling a harlequin, shows up, berating Code for always ending up being used by someone else. The toad on Boruto advises him to retreat. Boruto notices another god tree. Kawaki reports the specifics of the encounter with Code and Boruto to Shikamaru, such that Boruto seemed to be chasing Code. Kawaki suspects that someone in the Konoha Barrier team is covertly aiding Boruto. Shikamaru dismisses the idea as all those communications are monitored. Sarada arrives, finding the idea ridiculous, saying that Boruto drove Code away, telling him to confirm it with Ada. Kawaki tells her that his motives don't matter and that Boruto should be killed on account of being an Otsutsuki, which Sarada also points out applies to him. Kawaki reiterates that he is an Otsutsuki who kills other Otsutsuki, perfectly willing to die after the job is done. Sarada assures him that she won't let him have his way with Konoha. Shikamaru tells him to stop and asks about the trees. Sarada explains the victims are still alive, and from the conversation with Code, Boruto knows something about them. She clarifies that since Boruto and Code are hostile to each other, and Code is hostile to Konoha, they should ally with Boruto against him. Despite the Toad's advice to retreat, Boruto prepares to fight, fending off an attack from a Sasuke god tree. It and Boruto clash Chidori and Rasengan. The bug god tree attacks, holding Boruto's sword in place, and the Harlequin one immobilizes him with Earth Release. Boruto appeals to Code's self-preservation, as the god trees will kill him as well, but he abandons Boruto, pointing out that they'll eat him without Code having to do anything, which works in his favor. Boruto Boruto escapes with the Flying Thunder God technique. The Flying God Tree considers Boruto lucky as their nascent curiosity currently outwears their devouring instinct, but is certain that Boruto can't escape his fate. Boruto rests against a tree, and Koji Kashin admonishes him for his rashness. Boruto apologizes that Sasuke, stuck in the tree, will have to wait a bit longer. And that is that. We've just speedrun the entire Naruto universe without any filler. What'd you think? Can you beat my time? Let us know what you're thinking down in the comments. Thanks for watching. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.